Preface of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Preface. Having taken more than ordinary pains in collecting the materials which compose the following history, we could not be satisfied with ourselves. If anything were wanting to it, which might render it entirely satisfactory to the public, it is for this reason we have subjoined to the work a short abstract of the laws now in force against pirates, and made choice of some particular cases, the most curious we could meet with, which have been heretofore tried, by which it will appear what actions have and what have not been adjudged piracy. It is possible this book may fall into the hands of some masters of ships, and other honest mariners, who frequently, by contrary winds or tempests, or other accidents incident to long voyages, find themselves reduced to great distresses, either through scarcity of provisions or want of stores. I say it may be a direction to such as those what lengths they may venture to go without violating the laws of nations, in case they should meet other ships at sea, or be cast on some inhospitable shore which should refuse to trade with them for such things as are absolutely necessary for the preservation of their lives or the safety of the ship and cargo. We have given a few instances in the course of this history of the inducements men have to engage themselves headlong in a life of so much peril to themselves and so destructive to the navigation of the trading world to remedy which evil there seems to be but two ways, either to find employment for the great numbers of seamen turned adrift at the conclusion of a war, and thereby prevent their running into such undertakings, or to guard sufficiently the coast of Africa, the West Indies, and other places whereto pirates resort. I cannot but take notice in this place that during this long peace I have not so much as heard of a Dutch pirate, it is not that I take them to be honester than their neighbors, but when we account for it, it will, perhaps, be a reproach to ourselves for our want of industry. The reason I take to be that after a war, when the Dutch ships are laid up, they have a fishery, where their seamen find immediate business and as comfortable bread as they had before. Had ours the same recourse in their necessities, I am certain we should find the same effect from it. For a fishery is a trade that cannot be overstocked. The sea is wide enough for us all. We need not quarrel for elbow room. Its stores are infinite and will ever reward the laborer. Besides, our own coast, for the most part, supply the Dutch, who employ several hundred sail constantly in the trade, and so sell to us our own fish. I call it our own, for the sovereignty of the British seas are to this day acknowledged us by the Dutch, and all the neighboring nations. Wherefore, if there was a public spirit among us, it would be well worth our while to establish a national fishery, which would be the best means in the world to prevent piracy, employ a number of the poor, and ease the nation of a great burthen, by lowering the price of provision in general, as well as several other commodities. I need not bring any proofs of what I advance, viz., that there are multitudes of seamen at this day unemployed, it is but too evident by their straggling and begging all over the kingdom. Nor is it so much their inclination to idleness as their own hard fate, in being cast off after their work is done, to starve or steal. I have not known a man of war commissioned for several years past, but three times her complement of men have offered themselves in twenty-four hours. The merchants take their advantage of this, lessen their wages, and those few who are in business are poorly paid, and but poorly fed. Such usage breeds discontents among them, and makes them eager for any change. I shall not repeat what I have said in the history concerning the privateers of the West Indies, where I have taken notice they live upon spoil, and as custom is a second nature, it is no wonder that, when an honest livelihood is not easily had, they run into one so like their own, so that it may be said that privateers in time of war are a nursery for pirates against a peace. 
Now we have accounted for their rise and beginning, it will be natural to inquire why they are not taken and destroyed, before they come to any head, seeing that they are seldom less than twelve men of war stationed in our American plantations, even in time of peace, a force sufficient to contend with a powerful enemy. This inquiry, perhaps, will not turn much to the honor of those concerned in that service. However, I hope I may be excused, if what I bent is with a design of serving the public. I say, tis strange that a few pirates should ravage the seas for years, without ever being light upon, by any of our ships of war, when in the meantime they, the pirates, shall take fleets of ships. It looks as if one was much more diligent in their affairs than the other. Roberts and his crew alone took four hundred sail before he was destroyed. This matter I may probably set right another time, and only observe for the present that the pirates at sea have the same sagacity with robbers at land, as the latter understand what roads are most frequented, and where it is most likely to meet with booty, so the former know what latitude to lie in, in order to intercept ships, and as the pirates happen to be in want of provision, stores, or any particular lading, they cruise accordingly for such ships, and are morally certain of meeting with them, and by the same reason, if the men of war cruise in those latitudes, they might be as sure of finding the pirates, as the pirates are to find the merchant ships. And if the pirates are not to be met with by the men of war in such a latitude, then surely down the same latitude may the merchant ships arrive safely to their port. To make this a little plainer to my country readers, I must observe that all our outward-bound ships, some time after they leave the land, steer into the latitude of the peace they are bound to. If to the West India Islands, or any part of the main of America, as New York, New England, Virginia, etc., because the latitude is the only certainty in those voyages to be found, and then they sail due west, till they come to their port, without altering their course. In this west way lie the pirates, whether it be to Virginia, etc., or Nevis, St. Christopher's, Montserrat, Jamaica, etc., so that if the merchant ships bound thither do not fall a prey to them one day, they must another. Therefore I say, if the men of war take the same track, the pirates must unavoidably fall into their mouths, or be frighted away. For where the game is, there will the vermin be. If the latter should be the case, the trading ships, as I said before, will pass unmolested and safe and the pirates be reduced to take refuge in some of their lurking holes about the uninhabited islands, where their fate would be like that of the fox in his den. If they should venture out, they would be hunted and taken, and if they stay within, they must starve. I must observe another thing, that the pirates generally shift their robings, according to the season of the year. In the summer they cruise mostly along the coast of the continent of America. But the winters there, being a little too cold for them, they follow the sun, and go towards the islands at the approach of cold weather. Every man who has used the West India trade knows this to be true. Therefore, since we are so well acquainted with all their motions, I cannot see why our men of war, under a proper regulation, may not go to the southward, instead of lying up all the winter useless. But I shall proceed too far in this inquiry. I shall therefore quit it, and say something of the following sheets, which the author may venture to assure the reader that they have one thing to recommend them, which is truth. Those facts which he himself was not an eye-witness of, he had from the authentic relations of the persons concerned in taking the pirates, as well as from the mouths of the pirates themselves, after they were taken, and he conceives no man can produce better testimonies to support the credit of any history. It will be observed that the account of the actions of Roberts runs into a greater length than that of any other pirate, for which we can assign two reasons. First, because he ravaged the seas longer than the rest, and of consequence there must be a greater sense of business in his life. Secondly, being resolved not to weary the reader with tiresome repetitions, when we found the circumstances in Roberts's life and other pirates, either as two piratical articles or anything else, to be the same, 
We thought it best give them but once, and chose Robert's life for that purpose, he having made more noise in the world than some others. As to the lives of our two female pirates, we must confess they may appear a little extravagant, yet they are nevertheless true for seeming so, but as they were publicly tried for their piracies, there are living witnesses enough to justify what we have laid down concerning them. It is certain we have produced some particulars which were not too publicly known. The reason is, we were more inquisitive into the circumstances of their past lives than other people, who had no other design than that of gratifying their own private curiosity. If there are some incidents and turns in their stories, which may give them a little the air of a novel, they are not invented or contrived for that purpose. It is a kind of reading this author is but little acquainted with, but as he himself was exceedingly diverted with them, when they were related to him, he thought they might have the same effect upon the reader. I presume we need make no apology for giving the name of a history in the following sheets, though they contain nothing but the actions of a parcel of robbers. It is bravery and stratagem in war which makes actions worthy of record, in which sense the adventures here related will be thought deserving that name. Plutarch is very circumstantial in relating the actions of Spartacus, the slave, and makes the conquest of him one of the greatest glories of Marcus Crassus. And it is probable, if this slave had lived a little longer, Plutarch would have given us his life at large. Rome, the mistress of the world, was no more at first than a refuge for thieves and outlaws, and if the progress of our pirates had been equal to their beginning, had they all united and settled in some of those islands, they might, by this time, have been honored with the name of a commonwealth, and no power in those parts of the world could have been able to dispute it with them. If we have seemed to glance with some freedom at the behavior of some governors of provinces abroad, it has been with caution and perhaps we have not declared as much as we knew. However, we hope those gentlemen in the same station, who have never given occasion for the like censure, will take no offense, though the word governor is sometimes made use of. P.S. It will be necessary to add a word or two to this preface in order to inform the reader that there are several material additions made to this second impression, which swelling the book in bulk must of consequence add a smaller matter to its price. The first impression, having been received with so much success by the public, occasioned a very earnest demand for a second. In the meantime, several persons who had been taken by the pirates, as well as others who had been concerned in taking of them, have been so kind to communicate several facts and circumstances to us, which had escaped us in the first impression. This occasioned some delay. Therefore, if we have not brought it out as soon as wished, it was to render it more complete. We shall not enter into a detail of all the new matter inserted here, but the description of the island St. Tom, etc., and that of Brazil are not to be passed by without a little notice. It must be observed that our speculative mathematicians and geographers, who are no doubt men of the greatest learning, seldom travel farther than their closets for their knowledge, etc., are therefore unqualified to give us a good description of countries. It is for this reason that all our maps and atlases are so monstrously faulty, for these gentlemen are obliged to take their accounts from the reports of illiterate men. It must be noted also that when the masters of ships make discoveries this way, they are not fond of communicating them. A man's knowing this or that coast better than others recommends him in his business, and makes him more useful and he'll no more discover it than a tradesman will the mystery of his trade. The gentleman who has taken the pains to make these observations is Mr. Atkins, a surgeon, an ingenious man in his own profession, and one who is not tied down by any narrow considerations from doing a service to the public, and has been pleased generously to communicate them for the good of others. I don't doubt but his observations will be found curious and very serviceable to such as trade to those parts. Besides, a method of trade is here laid down with the Portuguese, which may prove of great profit to some of our countrymen, if followed according to his plan. It is hoped these things will satisfy the public, that the author of the following sheets considered nothing so much as making the book useful. 
though he has been informed that some gentlemen have raised an objection against the truth of its contents, viz., that it seems calculated to entertain and divert, if the facts are related with some agreeableness and life, we hope it will not be imputed as a fault. But as to its credit, we can assure them that the seafaring men, that is all that know the nature of these things, have not been able to make the least objection to its credit. And he will be bold to affirm that there is not a fact or circumstance in the whole book, but he is able to prove by credible witnesses. There have been some other pirates, besides those whose history are here related, such as are hereafter named, and their adventures are as extravagant and full of mischief as those who are the subject of this book. The author has already begun to digest them into method, and as soon as he receives some materials to make them complete, which he shortly expects from the West Indies, if the public gives him encouragement, he intends to venture upon a second volume. End of Preface Introduction, Part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Introduction, Part 1. As the pirates in the West Indies have been so formidable and numerous that they have interrupted the trade of Europe into those parts, and our English merchants in particular have suffered more by their depredations than by the united force of France and Spain in the late war. We do not doubt, but the world will be curious to know the original and progress of these desperados who were the terror of the trading part of the world. But before we enter upon their particular history, it will not be amiss, by way of introduction, to show, by some examples drawn from history, the great mischief and danger which threaten kingdoms and commonwealths from the increase of these sort of robbers, when either by the troubles of particular times, or the neglect of governments, they are not crushed before they gather strength. It has been the case heretofore that when a single pirate has been suffered to range the seas, as not being worth the notice of a government, he has by degrees grown so powerful as to put them to the expense of a great deal of blood and treasure before he was suppressed. We shall not examine how it came to pass that our pirates in the West Indies have continually increased till of late. This is an inquiry which belongs to the legislature, or representatives of the people in Parliament, and to them we shall leave it. Our business shall be briefly to show what from beginnings as inconsiderable as these other nations have suffered. In the times of Marius and Scylla, Rome was in her greatest strength. Yet she was so torn in pieces by the factions of those two great men that everything which concerned the public good was altogether neglected. When certain pirates broke out from Sicilia, a country of Asia Minor, situate on the coast of the Mediterranean, betwixt Syria on the east, from whence it is divided by Mount Taurus, and Armenia Minor on the west. This beginning was mean and inconsiderable, having but two or three ships, and a few men, with which they cruised about the Greek islands, taking such ships as were very ill-armed or weakly defended. However, by the taking of many prizes, they soon increased in wealth and power. The first action of theirs which made a noise was the taking of Julius Caesar, who was as yet a youth, and who, being obliged to fly from the cruelties of Scylla, who sought his life, went into Bithynia, and sojourned a while with Nicodemus, king of that country. In his return back by sea, he was met with and taken by some of these pirates, near the island of Pharmacusa. These pirates had a barbarous custom of tying their prisoners back to back and throwing them into the sea. But supposing Caesar to be some person of a high rank, because of his purple robes, and the number of his attendants, they thought it would be more to their profit to preserve him, in hopes of receiving a great sum for his ransom. Therefore they told him he should have his liberty, provided he would pay them twenty talents, which they judged to be a very high demand, in our money about three thousand six hundred pounds sterling. 
He smiled, and of his own accord promised them fifty talents. They were both pleased and surprised at his answer, and consented that several of his attendants should go by his direction and raise the money, and he was left among these ruffians with no more than three attendants. He passed eight and thirty days, and seemed so little concerned or afraid, that often when he went to sleep he used to charge them not to make a noise, threatening, if they disturbed him, to hang them all. He also played at dice with them, and sometimes wrote verses and dialogues, which he used to repeat, and also caused them to repeat, and if they did not praise and admire them, he would call them beasts and barbarians, telling them he would crucify them. They took all these as the sallies of a juvenile humor, and were rather diverted than displeased at them. At length his attendants returned with his ransom, which he paid, and was discharged, he sailed for the port of Miletum, where, as soon as he was arrived, he used all his art and industry in fitting out a squadron of ships, which he equipped and armed at his own charges, and sailing in quest of the pirates, he surprised them as they lay at anchor among the islands, and took those who had taken him before with some others. The money he found upon them he made prize of, to reimburse his charges, and he carried the men to Pergamus or Troy, and there secured them in prison. In the meantime he applied himself to Junius, then governor of Asia, to whom it belonged to judge and determine of the punishment of these men. But Junius, finding there was no money to be had, answered Caesar that he would think at his leisure what was to be done with these prisoners. Caesar took his leave of him, returned back to Pergamus, and commanded that the prisoners should be brought out and executed according to law in that case provided, which is taken notice of in a chapter at the end of this book, concerning the laws in cases of piracy. And thus he gave them that punishment in earnest, which he had often threatened them with in jest. Caesar went straight to Rome, where, being engaged in the designs of his own private ambition, as were almost all the leading men in Rome, the pirates who were left had time to increase to a prodigious strength, for while the civil wars lasted, the seas were left unguarded, so that Plutarch tells us that they erected diverse arsenals full of all manner of warlike stores, made commodious harbors, set up watchtowers and beacons all along the coasts of Cilicia, that they had a mighty fleet, well equipped and furnished, with galleots of oars, manned not only with men of desperate courage, but also with expert pilots and mariners. They had their ships of force, and light pinnaces for cruising and making discoveries, in all no less than a thousand sail, so gloriously set out that they were as much to be envied for their gallant show as feared for their force, having the stern and quarters all gilded with gold, and their oars plated with silver as well as purple sails, as if their greatest delight had been to glory in their iniquity." nor were they content with committing piracies and insolencies by sea, they committed as great depredations by land, or rather made conquests, for they took and sacked no less than four hundred cities, laid several others under contributions, plundered the temples of the gods, and enriched themselves with the offerings deposited in them. They often landed bodies of men who not only plundered the villages along the sea coast, but ransacked the fine houses of the noblemen along the Tiber. A body of them once took Sextilius and Bellinus, two Roman praetors, in their purple robes, going from Rome to their governments, and carried them away with all their sergeants, officers, and vergers. They also took the daughter of Antonius, a counsellor person, and one who had obtained the honour of a triumph, as she was going to the country house of her father. But what was most barbarous was a custom they had when they took any ship, of inquiring of the person on board concerning their names and country. If any of them said he was a Roman, they fell down upon their knees, as if in a fright at the greatness of that name, and begged pardon for what they had done, and imploring his mercy. They used to perform the offices of servants about his person, and when they found they had deceived him into a belief of their being sincere, they hung out the ladder of the ship, and coming with a show of courtesy, told him he had his liberty, desiring him to walk out of the ship, and this in the middle of the sea, and when they observed him in surprise as was natural, 
they used to throw him overboard with mighty shouts of laughter, so wanton they were in their cruelty. Thus, while Rome was mistress of the world, she suffered insults and affronts, almost at her gates, from these powerful robbers. But what for a while made faction cease and roused the genius of that people, never used to suffer wrongs from a fair enemy, was an excessive scarcity of provisions in Rome, occasioned by all the ships loaden with corn and provisions from Sicily, Corsica, and other places, being intercepted and taken by these pirates, insomuch that they were almost reduced to a famine. Upon this Pompey the Great was immediately appointed general to manage this war. Five hundred ships were immediately fitted out. He had fourteen senators, men of experience in the war, for his vice-admirals. And so considerable an enemy were these ruffians become, that no less than an army of a hundred thousand foot and five thousand horse was appointed to invade them by land. But it happened very luckily for Rome, that Pompey sailed out before the pirate had intelligence of a design against them, so that their ships were scattered all over the Mediterranean, like bees gone out from a hive, some one way, some another, to bring home their lading. Pompey divided his fleet into thirteen squadrons, to whom he appointed their several stations, so that great numbers of the pirates fell into their hands, ship by ship, without any loss. Forty days he passed in scouring the Mediterranean, some of the fleet cruising along the coast of Africa, some about the islands, and some upon the Italian coasts, so that often those pirates who were flying from one squadron fell in with another. However, some of them escaped, and these making directly to Cilicia, and acquainting their confederates on shore with what had happened, they appointed a rendezvous of all the ships that had escaped at the port of Coracesium, in the same country. Pompey, finding the Mediterranean quite clear, appointed a meeting of all his fleet at the haven of Brundusium, and from thence, sailing around into the Adriatic, he went directly to attack these pirates in their hives. As soon as he came near the Coracesium in Cilicia, where the remainder of the pirates now lay, they had the hardiness to come and give him battle. But the genius of old Rome prevailed, and the pirates received an entire overthrow, being all either taken or destroyed. But as they made many strong fortresses upon the sea coast, and built castles and strongholds up the country, about the foot of Mount Taurus, he was obliged to besiege them with his army. Some places he took by storm, others surrendered to his mercy, to whom he gave their lives, and at length he made an entire conquest. But it is probable that had these pirates received sufficient notice of the Roman preparation against them, so as they might have had time to draw their scattered strength into a body to have met Pompey by sea, the advantage appeared greatly on their side, in numbers of shipping and of men. Nor did they want courage, as may be seen by their coming out of the port of Coracesium, to give the Romans battle, with a force much inferior to theirs. I say, had they overthrown Pompey, it is likely they would have made greater attempts, and Rome, which had conquered the whole world, might have been subdued by a parcel of pirates. This is a proof how dangerous it is to governments to be negligent, and not take an early care in suppressing the sea banditti before they gather strength. The truth of this maxim may be better exemplified in the history of Barbarossa, a native in the city of Mytilene, in the island of Lesbos, in the Aegean Sea, a fellow of ordinary birth, who being bred to the sea, first set out from thence upon the pirating account with only one small vessel. But by the prizes he took he gained immense riches, so that getting a great number of large ships, all the bold and dissolute fellows of those islands flocked to him, enlisted in his service for the hopes of booty, so that his strength was increased to a formidable fleet. With these he performed such bold and adventurous actions that he became the terror of the seas. About this time it happened that Salim Utemi, king of Algiers, having refused to pay the accustomed tribute to the Spaniards, was apprehensive of an invasion from thence. Wherefore he treated with Barbarossa upon the foot of an ally to come and assist him, and deliver him from paying this tribute. 
Barbarossa readily came into it, and sailing to Algiers with a great fleet, he put part of his men on shore, and having laid a plot to surprise the city, he effected it with great success, and murdered Selim in a bath, soon after which he was himself crowned king of Algiers. After this he made war upon Abdelabd, king of Tunis, and overthrew him in battle. He extended his conquests on all sides, and thus from a thief became a mighty king. And though he was at last killed in battle, yet he had so well established himself upon that throne, that, dying without issue, he left the inheritance of the kingdom to his brother, another pirate. I come now to speak of the pirates infesting the West Indies, where they are more numerous than in any other parts of the world, on several reasons. First, because there are so many uninhabited little islands and keys, with harbors convenient and secure for cleaning their vessels, and abounding with what they often want, provision. I mean water, sea-fowl, turtle, shell, and other fish, where, if they carry in but strong liquor, they indulge a time, and become ready for new expeditions before any intelligence can reach to hurt them. It may here, perhaps, be no unnecessary digression to explain upon what they call keys in the West Indies. These are small sandy islands, appearing a little above the surf of the water, with only a few bushes or weeds upon them, but abound, those most at any distance from the main, with turtle, amphibious animals, that always choose the quietest and most unfrequented place for laying their eggs, which are to a vast number in the seasons, and would seldom be seen but for this, except by pirates. Then vessels from Jamaica and the other governments make voyages, called turtling, for supplying the people, a common and approved food with them. I am apt to think these keys, especially those night islands, to have once been contiguous with them, and separated by earthquakes, frequently there, or inundations, because some of them that have been within continual view, as those nigh Jamaica, are observed within our time, to be entirely washed away and lost, and others daily wasting. There are not only of the use above taken notice of to pirates, but it is commonly believed where always in buccaneering piratical times the hiding places for their riches, and oftentimes a shelter for themselves, till their friends on the main had found means to obtain indemnity for their crimes. For you must understand, when acts of grace were more frequent, and the laws less severe, these men continually found favors and encouragers at Jamaica and perhaps they are not all dead yet. I have been told many of them still living have been of the same trade, and left it off only because they can live as well honestly, and gain now at the hazard of others' necks. Secondly, another reason why these seas are chose by pirates is the great commerce thither by French, Spaniards, Dutch, and especially English ships. They are sure in the latitude of these trading islands to meet with prizes, booties of provision, clothing, and naval stores, and sometimes money, there being great sums remitted this way to England. The returns of the Asiento, the private slave trade, to the Spanish West Indies, and in short, by some one or other, all the riches of Potost. A third reason is the inconveniency and difficulty of being pursued by the men of war, the many small inlets, lagoons, and harbors on these solitary islands and keys is a natural security. Tis generally here that the pirates begin their enterprises, setting out at first with a small force, and by infesting these seas, and those of the continent of North America, in a year's time, if they have good luck on their sides, they accumulate such strength as enables them to make foreign expeditions. The first is usually to Guinea taking the Azores and Cape de Verde islands on their way, and then to Brazil and the East Indies, where, if they meet with prosperous voyages, they set down at Madagascar or the neighboring islands and enjoy their ill-gotten wealth among their elder brethren with impunity. But that I may not give too much encouragement to the profession, I must inform my maritime readers that the far greater part of these rovers are cut short in the pursuit 
by a sudden precipitation into the other world. The rise of these rovers, since the Peace of Utrecht, or at least the great increase of them, may justly be computed to the Spanish settlements in the West Indies, the governors of which, being often some hungry courtiers, sent thither to repair or make a fortune, generally countenance all proceedings that bring in profit. They grant commissions to great numbers of vessels of war, on pretense of preventing an interloping trade, with orders to seize all ships or vessels whatsoever within five leagues of their coast, which our English ships cannot well avoid coming in their voyage to Jamaica. But if the Spanish captains chance to exceed this commission, and rob and plunder at discretion, the sufferers are allowed to complain, and exhibit a process in their court, and after great expense of suit, delay of time, and other inconveniences, obtain a decree in their favor. But then when the ship and cargo comes to be claimed, with costs of suit, they find, to their sorrow, that it has been previously condemned, and the plunder divided among the crew. The commander that made the capture, who alone is responsible, is found to be a poor rascally fellow, not worth a groat, and no doubt is placed in that station for the like purposes. The frequent losses sustained by our merchants abroad, by these pirates, was provocation enough to attempt something by way of reprisal, and a fair opportunity offering itself in the year 1716, the traders of the West Indies, took care not to slip it over, but made the best use of it their circumstances would permit. It was about two years before that the Spanish galleons, or plate fleet, had been cast away in the Gulf of Florida, and several vessels from the Havana were at work, with diving engines, to fish up the silver that was on board the galleons. The Spaniards had recovered some million of pieces of eight, and had carried it all to the Havana, but they had at present about 350,000 pieces of eight in silver, then upon the spot, and were daily taking up more. In the meantime, two ships and three sloops, fitted out from Jamaica, Barbados, etc., under Captain Henry Jennings, sailed to the Gulf and found the Spaniards there upon the wreck. The money before spoken of was left on shore, deposited in a storehouse, under the government of two commissaries and a guard of about sixty soldiers. The rovers came directly upon the place, bringing their little fleet to an anchor, and in a word, landing three hundred men, they attacked the guard, who immediately ran away, and thus they seized the treasure, which they carried off, making the best of their way to Jamaica. In their way they unhappily met with a Spanish ship, bound from Portobello to the Havana, with a great many rich goods, viz. bales of cochineal, casks of indico, and sixty thousand pieces of eight more, which their hands being in, they took, and having rifled the vessel, let her go. They went away to Jamaica with their booty, and were followed in view of the port by the Spaniards, who, having seen them thither, went back to the governor of the Havana, with the account of it, who immediately sent a vessel to the governor of Jamaica to complain of this robbery, and to reclaim the goods. As it was in full peace, and contrary to all justice and right, that this fact was committed, they were soon made sensible that the government at Jamaica would not suffer them to go unpunished, much less protect them. Therefore they saw a necessity of shifting for themselves. So, to make bad worse, they went to sea again, though not without disposing of their cargo to good advantage, and furnishing themselves with ammunition, provisions, etc., and being thus made desperate, they turned pirates, robbing not the Spaniards only, but their own countrymen, and any nation they could lay their hands on. It happened about this time, that the Spaniards, with three or four small men of war, fell upon our logwood cutters, in the Bay of Campeche, and Bay of Honduras, and after they had made prizes of the following ships and vessels, they gave the men belonging to them three sloops to carry them home. But these men, being made desperate by their misfortunes, and meeting with the pirates, they took on with them, and so increased their number. The list of ships and vessels taken by the Spanish men of war in the year 1716. The Stafford, Captain Knox, from New England, bound for London. Anne, Gurnish, for London. Dove, Grimstone, for New England. A sloop, Alden, 
for New England. A brigantine, Mosin, for New England. A brigantine, Turfield, for New England. A brigantine, Tennis, for New England. A ship, Porter, for New England. Indian Emperor, Wentworth, for New England. A ship, Rich, Master. A ship, Bay. A ship, Smith. A ship, Stockham. A ship, Saddley. A sloop, Richards, belonging to New England. Two sloops, belonging to Jamaica. One sloop of Barbados. Two ships, from Scotland. Two ships, from Holland. The rovers, being now pretty strong, they consulted together about getting some place of retreat, where they might lodge their wealth, clean and repair their ships, and make themselves a kind of abode. They were not long in resolving, but fixed upon the island of Providence, the most considerable of the Bahama Islands, laying in the latitude of about twenty-four degrees north, and to the eastward of the Spanish Florida. This island is about twenty-eight miles long, and eleven where broadest, and has a harbor big enough to hold five hundred sail of ships, before which lies a small island, which makes two inlets to the harbor, at either way there is a bar, over which no ship of five hundred ton can pass. The Bahama Islands were possessed by the English till the year 1700, when the French and Spaniards, from Petit Guavis, invaded them, took the fort and governor in the island of Providence, plundered and destroyed the settlements, etc., carried off half the blacks, and the rest of the people who fled to the woods retired afterwards to Carolina. End of Introduction, Part 1INTRODUCTION PART 2 OF THE GENERAL HISTORY OF THE PIRATES VOLUME 1 THIS IS A LIBRIVOX RECORDING. ALL LIBRIVOX RECORDINGS ARE IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. FOR MORE INFORMATION OR TO VOLUNTEER, PLEASE VISIT LIBRIVOX.ORG. RECORDING BY BARRY EADS THE GENERAL HISTORY OF THE PIRATES VOLUME 1 BY CHARLES JOHNSON INTRODUCTION PART 2 IN MARCH 1705-6 the House of Lords did an address to Her Late Majesty, set forth, that the French and Spaniards had twice, during the time of the war, overrun and plundered the Bahama Islands, that there was no form of government there, that the harbor of the Isle of Providence might be easily put in a posture of defense, and that it would be of dangerous consequence should those islands fall into the hands of the enemy. Wherefore the lords humbly besought Her Majesty to use such methods as she should think proper for taking the said islands into her hands, in order to secure the same to the crown of this kingdom, and to the security and advantage of the trade thereof. But however it happened, no means were used in compliance to that address, for securing the Bahama Islands till the English pirates had made Providence their retreat and general receptacle. Then t'was found absolutely necessary, in order to dislodge that troublesome colony, and information being made by the merchants to the government of the mischief they did, and were likely to do, His Majesty was pleased to grant the following order. Whitehall, September 15, 1716. Complaint having been made to His Majesty, by great number of merchants, masters of ships, and others, as well as by several governors of His Majesty's islands and plantations in the West Indies, that the pirates are grown so numerous that they infest not only the seas near Jamaica, but even those of the northern continent of America, and that, unless some effectual means be used, the whole trade from Great Britain to those parts will not be only obstructed, but in imminent danger of being lost." His Majesty has, upon mature deliberation in council, been pleased, in the first place, to order a proper force to be employed for the suppressing of the said pirates, which force so to be employed is as follows. A list of His Majesty's ships and vessels employed, and to be employed, at the British governments and plantations in the West Indies. Place where, Jamaica, five rates, ship adventure, Forty guns, now there. Jamaica, ship Diamond. Forty guns, sailed from hence thither fifth of last month. Jamaica, ship Ludlow Castle. Forty guns, to carry the governor. Jamaica, ship Swift Sloop, now there. Jamaica, six rate. 
Ship when Chelsea, 20 guns, surveying the coast of the West Indies and then to return home, but during her being at Jamaica is to join the others for security of the trade and intercepting pirates. Barbados, 5 rate, ship Scarborough, 30 guns, now there. Leeward Islands, 6 rate, ship Seaford, now there. Tyro Sloop, 6 guns. Virginia, 6 rate, ship Lime, 20 guns, now there. Virginia, 5 rate, ship Shoreham, 30 guns, ordered home. Virginia, ship Pearl, 40 guns, sailed thither from home the 7th of last month, and is to cruise about the Capes. New York, 6 rate, ship Phoenix, 30 guns, now there. New England, ship Squirrel, 20 guns. New England, ship Rose, 20 guns, ordered home. Those at Jamaica, Barbados, and the Leeward Islands are to join upon occasion for annoying the pirates and the security of the trade, and those at New England, Virginia, and New York are to do the like. Besides these frigates, two men of war were ordered to attend Captain Rogers, late commander of the two Bristol ships, called the Duke and Duchess, that took the rich Acapulco ship, and made a tour round the globe. This gentleman received a commission from His Majesty, to be governor of the island of Providence, and was vested with power to make use of all possible methods for reducing the pirates, and that nothing might be wanting, he carried with him the king's proclamation of pardon to those who should return to their duty by a certain time, the proclamation is as follows. By the King, a proclamation for suppressing of pirates. George R. Whereas we have received information that several persons, subjects of Great Britain, have since the 24th day of June, in the year of our Lord, 1715, committed divers piracy and robberies upon the high seas in the West Indies, or adjoining to our plantations, which hath and may occasion great damage to the merchants of Great Britain, and others trading into those parts, and though we have appointed such a force as we judge sufficient for suppressing the said pirates, yet the more effectually to put an end to the same, we have thought fit, by and with the advice of our privy council, to issue this our royal proclamation, and we do hereby promise and declare that in case any of the said pirates shall on or before the 5th of September, in the year of our Lord 1718, surrender him or themselves to one of our principal secretaries of state in Great Britain or Ireland, or to any governor or deputy governor of any of our plantations beyond the seas, every such pirate and pirates so surrendering him or themselves, as aforesaid, shall have our gracious pardon of and for such his or their piracy or piracies by him or them committed before the 5th of January next ensuing. And we do hereby strictly charge and command all our admirals, captains, and other officers at sea, and all our governors and commanders of any forts, castles, or other places in our plantations, and all other our officers, civil and military, to seize and take such of the pirates who shall refuse or neglect to surrender themselves accordingly. And we do hereby further declare that in case any person or persons on or after the sixth day of September 1718 shall discover or seize or cause or procure to be discovered or seized any one or more of the said pirates so refusing or neglecting to surrender themselves as aforesaid so as they may be brought to justice and convicted of the said offense such person or persons so making such discovery or seizure or causing or procuring such discovery or seizure to be made shall have and receive as a reward for the same viz for every commander of any pirate ship or vessel the sum of one hundred pounds for every lieutenant master boatswain carpenter and gunner the sum of forty pounds for every inferior officer the sum of thirty pounds and for every private man the sum of twenty pounds and if any person or persons belonging to and being part of the crew of any such pirate ship or vessel shall on or after the said sixth day of september seventeen eighteen seize and deliver or cause to be seized or delivered any commander or commanders of such pirate ship or vessel 
so as that he or they be brought to justice and convicted of the said offence, such person or persons, as a reward for the same, shall receive for every such commander the sum of two hundred pounds, which said sums the Lord Treasurer, or the Commissioners of our Treasury for the time being, are hereby required and desired to pay accordingly. Given at our court, at Hampton Court, the fifth day of September, 1717, in the fourth year of our reign. God save the King. Before Governor Rogers went over, the proclamation was sent to them, which they took as Teague took the covenant. That is, they made prize of the ship and proclamation too. However, they sent for those who were out a-cruising, and called a general council, but there was so much noise and clamor that nothing could be agreed on. Some were for fortifying the island to stand upon their own terms, and treating with the government upon the foot of a commonwealth. Others were also for strengthening the island for their own security, but were not strenuous for these punctilios, so that they might have a general pardon, without being obliged to make any restitution, and to retire with all their effects to the neighboring British plantations. But Captain Jennings, who was their commodore, and who always bore a great sway among them, being a man of good understanding, and a good estate, before this whim took him of going a-pirating, resolved upon surrendering without more ado to the terms of the proclamation, which so disconcerted all their measures, that the Congress broke up very abruptly without doing anything. And presently Jennings, and by his example about one hundred fifty more, came into the governor of Bermudas, and had their certificates, though the greatest part of them returned again, like the dog to the vomit. The commanders, who were then in the island, besides Captain Jennings aforementioned, I think were these, Benjamin Hornigold, Edward Teach, John Martell, James Fife, Christopher Winter, Nicholas Brown, Paul Williams, Charles Bellamy, Oliver Laboche, Major Penner, Ed England, T. Burgess, Thomas Cochlin, R. Sample, Charles Vane, and two or three others. Hornigold, Williams, Burgess, and Laboche were afterwards cast away. Teach and Penner killed, and their crews taken. James Fife killed by his own men. Martell's crew destroyed, and he forced on an uninhabited island. Cochlin, Sample, and Vane hanged. Winter and Brown surrendered to the Spaniards at Cuba, and England lives now at Madagascar. In the month of May or June 1718, Captain Rogers arrived at his government with two of His Majesty's ships, and found several of the above-said pirates there, who upon the coming of the men of war all surrendered to the pardon, except Charles Vane and his crew, which happened after this manner. I have before described the harbor to have two inlets, by means of a small island laying at the mouth of it, at one of which both the men of war entered and left the other open, so that Vane slipped his cable and set fire to a large prize they had there, and resolutely put out, firing at the man of war as he went off. As soon as Captain Rogers had settled himself in his government, he built a fort for his defense, and garrisoned it with the people he found upon the island, the quondam pirates, to the number of four hundred, he formed into companies, appointed officers of those whom he most confided in, and then set about to settle a trade with the Spaniards in the Gulf of Mexico, in one of which voyages Captain Burgess above mentioned died, and Captain Hornigold, another of the famous pirates, was cast away upon rocks, a great way from land, and perished, but five of his men got into a canoe and were saved. Captain Rogers sent out a sloop to get provisions, and gave the command to one John Auger, one of the pirates, who had accepted the act of grace. In their voyage they met with two sloops, and John and his comrades, not yet forgetting their former business, made use of their old freedom, and took out of them in money and goods, to the value of about five hundred pounds. After this they steered away for Hispaniola, not being satisfied whether the governor would admit them to carry on two trades at once, and so thought to have bidden farewell to the Bahama Islands. But as ill luck would have it, they met with a violent tornado wherein they lost their mast and were drove back to one of the uninhabited Bahamas and lost their sloop. The men got all ashore and lived up and down in the wood for a little time, 
till Governor Rogers, happening to hear of their expedition, and where they had got to, sent out an armed sloop to the aforesaid island, the master of which, with good words and fair promises, got them on board, and brought them all to Providence, being a eleven persons, ten of which were tried at a court of admiralty, convicted, and hanged by the other's evidence, in the sight of all their former companions and fellow thieves. The criminals would fain have spirited up the pardoned pirates, to rescue them out of the hands of the officers of justice, telling them from the gallows that they never thought to have seen the time when ten such men as they should be tied up and hanged like dogs, and four hundred of their sworn friends and companions quietly standing by to behold the spectacle. One Humphrey Maurice urged the matter further than the rest, taxing them with pusillanimity and cowardice, as if it were a breach of honor in them not to rise and save them from the ignominious death they were going to suffer. But twas all in vain. They were now told it was their business to turn their minds to another world, and sincerely to repent of what wickedness they had done in this. Yes, answered one of them, I do heartily repent. I repent I had not done more mischief, and that we did not cut the throats of them that took us, and I am extremely sorry that you ain't all hanged as well as we. So do I, says another, and I, says a third. And then they were all turned off, without making any other dying speeches, except one Dennis McCarty, who told the people, that some friends of his had often said he should die in his shoes, but that he would make them liars, and so kicked them off. And thus ended the lives, with their adventures, of those miserable wretches, who may serve as sad examples of the little effect mercy has upon men once abandoned to an evil course of life. Least I be thought severe in my animadversions upon the Spanish proceedings in the West Indies, in respect to their dealings with us, I shall mention an instance or two, wherein I shall be as concise as possible, and then transcribe some original letters from the governor of Jamaica, and an officer of a man of war, to the Alcades of Trinidad, on the island of Cuba, with their answers translated into English, and then proceed to the particular histories of the pirates and their crews, that have made most noise in the world in our own times." About March 1722, one of our men of war trading upon the coast, viz. the Greyhound Galley, Captain Walren, the said captain invited some of the merchants to dinner, who, with their attendants and friends, came on board to the number of sixteen or eighteen in all. And having concerted measures, about six or eight dined in the cabin, and the rest were waiting on the deck. While the captain and his guests were at dinner, the boatswain pipes, for the ship's company to dine. Accordingly, the men take their platters, receive their provisions, and down they go between decks, leaving only four or five hands besides the Spaniards above, who were immediately dispatched by them, and the hatches laid on the rest. Those in the cabin were as ready as their companions, for they pulled out their pistols and shot the captain, surgeon, and another dead, and grievously wounded the lieutenant." but he getting out of the window upon a side ladder, thereby saved his life, and so they made themselves masters of the ship in an instant. But by accidental good fortune she was recovered before she was carried off, for Captain Walren, having manned a sloop with thirty hands out of his ship's company, had sent her to windward some days before also for trade, which the Spaniards knew very well, and just as the action was over they saw this sloop coming down before the wind towards their ship upon which the Spaniards took about ten thousand pounds in specie, as I am informed, quitted the ship, and went off in their launch unmolested. About the same time, a guard lacoste of Puerto Rico, commanded by one Matthew Luke, an Italian, took four English vessels, and murdered all the crews. He was taken by the Lanston Man of War in May 1722, and brought to Jamaica, where they were all but seven deservedly hanged, it is likely the man of war might not have meddled with her, but that she blindly laid the lanson on board, thinking she had been a merchant ship, who thereupon catched a tartar. Afterwards in rummaging there was found a cartridge of powder made up with a piece of an English journal, belonging, I believe, to the cream snow, and upon examination at last it was discovered that they had taken this vessel and murdered the crew, and one of the Spaniards, when he came to die, 
confessed that he had killed twenty English men with his own hands. S. Jago de la Vega, February 20. A letter from His Excellency Sir Nicholas Laws, our governor, to the Alcades of Trinidado on Cuba, dated the 26th of January, 1721-22. Gentlemen, the frequent depredations, robberies, and other acts of hostility which have been committed on the king, my royal master's subjects, by a parcel of banditti who pretend to have commissions from you, and in reality are sheltered under your government, is the occasion of my sending the bearer Captain Chamberlain, commander of His Majesty's Snow Happy, to demand satisfaction of you for so many notorious robberies which your people have lately committed on the king's subjects of this island, particularly by those traitors Nicholas Brown and Christopher Winter, to whom you have given protection. Such proceedings as these are not only a breach of the law of nations, but must appear to the world of a very extraordinary nature, when considered that the subjects of a prince in amity and friendship with another shall give countenance and encourage such vile practices. I confess I have had long patience, and declined using any violent measures to obtain satisfaction, hoping the cessation of arms, so happily concluded upon between our respective sovereigns, would have put an effectual stop to those disorders. But on the contrary, I now find the port of Trinidado a receptacle to villains of all nations. I do therefore think fit to acquaint you, and assure you in the king my master's name, that if I do meet with any of your rogues for the future upon the coast of this island, I will order them to be hanged directly without mercy." and I expect and demand of you to make ample restitution to Captain Chamberlain of all the Negroes which the said Brown and Winter have lately taken off from the north side of this island, and also of such sloops and other effects as they may have taken and robbed of since the cessation of arms, and that you will deliver up to the bearer such English men as are now detained or otherwise remain at Trinidado, and also expect you will hereafter forbear granting any commissions or suffer any such notorious villains to be equipped and fitted out from your port. Otherwise you may depend upon it, those that I can meet with shall be esteemed pirates and treated as such, of which I thought proper to give you notice, and am, etc. A letter from Mr. Joseph Laws, Lieutenant of His Majesty's Ship, happy snow, to the Alcaldes of Trinidado. Gentlemen, I am sent by Commodore Vernon, Commander-in-Chief of all His Majesty's ships in the West Indies, to demand in the King Our Majesty's name all the vessels, with their effects, etc., and also the Negroes taken from Jamaica since the cessation of arms. Likewise all Englishmen now detained, or otherwise remaining in your port of Trinidado, particularly Nicholas Brown and Christopher Winter, both of them being traitors pirates, and common enemies to all nations. And the said Commodore hath ordered me to acquaint you that he is surprised that the subjects of a prince in amity and friendship with another should give countenance to such notorious villains. In expectation of your immediate compliance, I am, gentlemen, off the river Trinidado, February 8, 1720, your humble servant, Joseph Laws. The answer of the Alcaldes of Trinidado to Mr. Laws' letter. Captain Laws, in answer to yours, this serves to acquaint you that neither in this city nor port are there any negroes or vessels which have been taken at your island of Jamaica, nor on that coast, since the cessation of arms, and what vessels have been taken since that time have been for trading in an unlawful commerce on this coast. And as for those English fugitives you mention, they are here as other subjects of our Lord the King, being brought voluntarily to our holy Catholic faith, and have received the water of baptism, but if they should prove rogues, and should not comply with their duty, in which they are bound at present, then they shall be chastised according to the ordinances of our King, whom God preserve. And we beg you will weigh anchor as soon as possible, and leave this port and its coast, because upon no account you shall be suffered to trade, or anything else, for we have resolved not to admit thereof, God preserve you, we kiss your hand. Trinidada, February 8, 1722. Signed, Jeronimo de Fuentes. Benite Alfonso del Manzano. Mr. Law's reply to the Alcaldes's letter. Gentlemen, your refusing to deliver up the subjects of the king my master is somewhat surprising, it being in a time of peace, 
and the detaining them consequently against the law of nations. Notwithstanding your trifling pretense, for which you have no foundation but to forge an excuse, to prevent my making any inquiry into the truth of the facts I have alleged in my former, I must tell you my resolutions are to stay on the coast till I have made reprisals, and should I meet any vessels belonging to your port, I shall not treat them as the subjects of the crown of Spain, but as pirates. Finding it a part of your religion is this place to protect such villains. Off the River Trinidaro, February 8, 1720, Your Humble Servant, Joseph Laws the answer of one of the alcaldes to Mr. Law's reply. Captain Laws, you may assure yourself I will never be wanting in the duty of my post. The prisoners that are here are not in prison, but only kept here to be sent to the governor of the Havana. If you, as you say, command at sea, I command on shore. If you treat the Spaniards you should happen to take as pirates, I will do the same by every one of your people I can take up. I will not be wanting to good manners, if you will do the same. I can likewise act the soldier, if any occasion should offer that way, for I have very good people here for that purpose. If you pretend anything else, you may execute it on this coast. God preserve you. I kiss your hand. Trinidado, February 20, 1720. Signed, Benite Alfonso del Manzano. The last advices we have received from our plantations in America, dated June 9, 1724, gives us the following account, viz., that Captain Jones in the ship John and Mary, on the fifth of the said month, met with, near the Capes of Virginia, a Spanish guard del coast, commanded by one Don Benito, said to be commissioned by the governor of Cuba. She was manned with sixty Spaniards, eighteen Frenchmen, and eighteen English and had an English captain as well as Spanish, one Richard Holland, who formerly belonged to the Suffolk man of war, which he deserted at Naples, and took shelter in a convent. He served on board the Spanish fleet under Admiral Camock, in the war in the Mediterranean, and after the sensation of arms with Spain, settled with several of his countrymen, Irish, in the Spanish West Indies. This guard del coast made prize of Captain Jones's ship, and kept possession of her from 5th to the 8th, during which time she also took the prudent Hannah of Boston, Thomas Moussel, master, and the Dolphin of Topsham, Theodore Bear, master, both laden and bound for Virginia. The former they sent away together with three men and the mate, under the command of a Spanish officer and crew, the same day she was taken. The latter they carried off with them, putting the master and all the crew aboard Captain Jones's ship. They plundered Captain Jones's of thirty-six men slaves, some gold dust, all his clothes, four great guns and small arms, and about four hundred gallons of rum, besides his provisions and stores, computed in all to fifteen hundred pounds sterling. End of Introduction Part 2「Chapter 1, Part 1 of the General History of the Pirates » Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 1, Part 1. None of these bold adventurers were ever so much talked of for a while as Avery. He made as great a noise in the world as Merivice does now, and was looked upon to be a person of as great consequence. He was represented in Europe as one that had raised himself to the dignity of a king, and was likely to be the founder of a new monarchy, having, as it was said, taken immense riches, and married the great mogul's daughter, who was taken in an Indian ship which fell into his hands, and that he had by her many children, living in great royalty and state, that he had built forts, erected magazines, and was master of a stout squadron of ships, manned with able and desperate fellows of all nations, that he gave commissions out in his own name to the captains of his ships and to the commanders of his forts, and was acknowledged by them as their prince. A play was writ upon him, called The Successful Pirate, and these accounts obtained such belief that several schemes were offered to the council, for fitting out a squadron to take him, 
while others were for offering him and his companions an act of grace, and inviting them to England with all their treasures, lest his growing greatness might hinder the trade of Europe to the East Indies. Yet all of these were no more than false rumors, improved by the credulity of some and the humor of others who loved to tell strange things, for, while it was said, he was aspiring at a crown, he wanted a shilling, and at the same time it was given out he was in possession of such prodigious wealth in Madagascar. He was starving in England. No doubt but the reader will have a curiosity of knowing what became of this man, and what were the true grounds of so many false reports concerning him. Therefore I shall, in as brief a manner as I can, give his history. He was born in the west of England, near Plymouth, in Devonshire, being bred to the sea. He served as a mate of a merchantman in several trading voyages. It happened before the Peace of Ryswick, when there was an alliance betwixt Spain, England, Holland, and etc. against France, that the French in Martinico carried on a smuggling trade with the Spaniards on the continent of Peru, which by the laws of Spain is not allowed to friends in time of peace. For none but native Spaniards are permitted to traffic in those parts, or set their feet on shore, unless at any time they are brought as prisoners. Wherefore, they constantly keep certain ships cruising along the coast, whom they call the Guarda del Costa, who have the orders to make prizes of all ships they can light of within five leagues of the land. Now the French, growing very bold in trade, and the Spaniards being poorly provided with ships, and those they had being of no force, it often fell out that when they light of the French smugglers, they were not strong enough to attack them. Therefore it was resolved in Spain to hire two or three stout foreign ships for their service, which being known at Bristol, some of the merchants of that city fitted out two ships of thirty-odd guns and one hundred and twenty hands each, well furnished with provisions and ammunition, and all other stores, and the hire being agreed for by some agents of Spain, they were commanded to sail for Corona or the Groin, there to receive their orders and to take on board some Spanish gentlemen who were to go passengers to New Spain. One of these ships, which I take to be called the Duke, Captain Gibson commander, Avery was first mate, and being a fellow of more cunning than courage, he insinuated himself into the good will of several of the boldest fellows on board the other ship, as well as that which he was on board of. Having sounded their inclinations before he opened himself, and finding them ripe for his design, he at length proposed to them to run away with the ship, telling them what great wealth was to be had upon the coasts of India. It was no sooner said than agreed to, and they resolved to execute their plot at ten o'clock the following night. It must be observed, the captain was one of those who are mightily addicted to punch, so that he passed most of his time on shore in some little drinking ordinary. But this day he did not go on shore as usual. However, this did not spoil the design, for he took his usual dose on board, and so got to bed before the hour appointed for the business. The men also who were not privy to the design turned into their hammocks, leaving none upon deck but the conspirators, who indeed were the greatest part of the ship's crew. At the time agreed on, the Duchess's long boat appeared, which Avery hailing in the usual manner was answered by the men in her, Is your drunken boatswain on board? Which was the watchword agreed between them, and Avery replying in the affirmative, the boat came aboard with sixteen stout fellows and joined the company. When our gentry saw that all was clear, they secured the hatches, so went to work. They did not slip the anchor, but weighed it leisurely, and so put to sea without any disorder or confusion, though there were several ships then lying in the bay, and among them a Dutch frigate of forty guns, the captain of which was offered a great reward to go out after her. But Mynheer who perhaps would not have been willing to have been served so himself, could not be prevailed upon to give such usage to another, and so let Mr. Avery pursue his voyage, whither he had a mind to. The captain, who by this time was awakened, either by the motion of the ship or the noise of working the tackles, rung the bell, 
Avery and two others went into the cabin. The captain, half asleep and in a kind of fright, asked, What was the matter? Avery answered coolly, Nothing. The captain replied, Something's the matter with the ship. Does she drive? What weather is it? Thinking nothing less than it had been a storm and that the ship was driven from her anchors. No, no, answered Avery. We're at sea with a fair wind and good weather. At sea, says the captain. How can that be? Come, says Avery. Don't be in a fright, but put on your clothes and I'll let you into a secret. You must know that I am captain of this ship now, and this is my cabin. Therefore, you must walk out. I am bound to Madagascar with a design of making my own fortune and that of all the brave fellows who joined with me. The captain, having little recovered his senses, began to apprehend the meaning. However, his fright was as great as before, which Avery perceiving, bade him fear nothing, for, says he, if you have a mind to make one of us, we'll receive you. And if you'll turn sober and mind your business, perhaps in time I may make you one of my lieutenants. If not, here's a boat alongside, and you shall be set ashore. The captain was glad to hear this, and therefore accepted his offer, and the whole crew being called up to know who was willing to go on shore with the captain, and who to seek their fortunes with the rest. There were not above five or six men who were willing to quit this enterprise. Wherefore, they were put into the boat with the captain that minute, and made their way to the shore as well as they could. They proceeded on their voyage to Madagascar, but I do not find they took any ships in their way. When they arrived at the northeast part of that island, they found two sloops at anchor, who, upon seeing them, slipped their cables and ran themselves ashore, the men all landing and running into the woods. These were two sloops which the men had run away with from the West Indies, and seeing Avery, they supposed him to be some frigate sent to take them, and therefore, not being a force to engage him, they did what they could to save themselves." He guessed where they were, and sent some of his men on shore to let them know they were friends, and to offer they might join together for their common safety. The sloop's men were well armed, and had posted themselves in a wood, with sentinels just on the outside, to observe whether the ship landed her men to pursue them. And they, observing only two or three men to come towards them without arms, did not oppose them. But having challenged them, and they answering they were friends, they led them to their body, where they delivered their message. At first they apprehended it was a stratagem to decoy them on board, but when the ambassadors offered that the captain himself, and as many of the crew as they should name, would meet them on shore without arms, they believed them to be in earnest, and they soon entered into a confidence with one another, those on board going on shore, and some of those on shore going on board. The sloop's men were rejoiced at the new ally, for their vessels were so small that they could not attack a ship of any force, so that hitherto they had not taken any considerable prize. But now they hoped to fly at high game, and Avery was as well pleased at this reinforcement to strengthen them for any brave enterprise, and though the booty must be lessened to each, being divided into so many shares, and yet he found out an expedient not to suffer by it himself, as shall be shown in its place. Having consulted what was to be done, they resolved to sail out together upon a cruise, the galley and two sloops. They therefore fell to work to get the sloops off, which they soon effected, and steered towards the Arabian coast. Near the river Indus, the man at the masthead spied a sail, upon which they gave chase, and as they came nearer to her, they perceived her to be a tall ship, and fancied she might be a Dutch East Indiaman, homeward bound. But she proved to be a better prize. When they fired at her to bring two, she hoisted Mogul's colors, and seemed to stand upon her defense. Avery only cannonaded at a distance, and some of his men began to suspect that he was not the hero they took him for. However, the sloops made use of their time, and coming one on the bow and the other on the quarter of the ship, clapped her on board and entered her, upon which she immediately struck her colors and yielded. She was one of the great mogul's own ships, and there were in her several of the greatest persons of his court, among whom, it was said, 
was one of his daughters, who were going on a pilgrimage to Mecca, that Mahometans, thinking themselves obliged once in their lives to visit that place, and they were carrying with them rich offerings to present at the shrine of Mohammed. It is known that the eastern people travel with the utmost magnificence, so they had with them all their slaves and attendants, their rich habits and jewels, with vessels of gold and silver and great sums of money to defray the charge of their journey by land. Wherefore the plunder got by this prize is not easily computed. Having taken all the treasure on board their own ship, and plundered their prize of everything else they either wanted or liked, they let her go. She, not being able to continue her voyage, returned back. As soon as the news came to the Mogul, and he knew that they were English who robbed them, he threatened loud and talked of sending a mighty army, with fire and sword, to extirpate the English from all their settlements on the Indian coast. The East India Company in England were very much alarmed at it, however, by degrees they found means to pacify him, by promising to do their endeavors to take the robbers and deliver them into his hands. However, the great noise this thing made in Europe, as well as India, was the occasion of all these romantic stories which were formed of Avery's greatness. In the meantime, our successful plunderers agreed to make the best of their way back to Madagascar, intending to make that place their magazine of repository for all their treasure, and to build a small fortification there, and leave a few hands always ashore to look after it, and defend it from any attempts of the natives. But Avery put an end to this project, and made it altogether unnecessary. As they were steering their course, as has been said, he sends a boat on board of each of the sloops, desiring the chief of them to come on board of him, in order to hold a council. They did so, and he told them that he had something to propose to them for the common good, which was to provide against accidents. He bade them consider the treasure they were possessed of would be sufficient for them all if they could secure it some place on shore. Therefore, all they had to fear was some misfortune in the voyage. He bade them consider the consequences of being separated by bad weather, in which case the sloops, if either of them should fall in with any ship of force, must be either taken or sunk, and the treasure on board her lost to the rest. Beside the common accidents of the sea, as for his part, he was so strong, he was able to make his party good with any ship they were like to meet in those seas, that if he met with any ship of such strength, that he could not take her, he was safe from being taken, being so well manned, beside his ship was a quick sailor, and could carry sail, when the sloops could not. Wherefore, he proposed to them to put the treasure on board his ship, to seal up each chest with three seals, whereof each was to keep one, and to appoint a rendezvous in case of separation. Upon considering this proposal, it appeared so sensible to them that they readily came into it, for they argued to themselves that an accident might happen to one of the sloops, and the other escape. Wherefore, it was for the common good. The thing was done as agreed to, the treasure put on board of Avery, and the chests sealed. They kept company that day and the next, the weather being fair, in which time Avery tampered with his men, telling them they now had sufficient to make all easy, and what should hinder them from going to some country where they were not known and living on shore all the rest of their days in plenty. They understood what he meant, and in short, they all agreed to bilk their new allies, the sloop's men. Nor do I find that any of them felt any qualms of honor rising in his stomach, to hinder them from consenting to this piece of treachery. In fine, they took advantage of the darkness that night, and steered another course, and by morning lost sight of them. I leave the reader to judge what swearing and confusion there was among the sloop's men in the morning, when they saw that Avery had given them the slip, for they knew by the fairness of the weather and the course they had agreed to steer that it must have been done on purpose. But we leave them at the present to follow Mr. Avery. End of chapter 1, part 1 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 1, part 2 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 1, Part 2. Avery and his men, having consulted what to do with themselves, came to a resolution to make the best of their way towards America, and, none of them being known in those parts, they intended to divide the treasure, to change their names, to go ashore, some in one place, some in other, to purchase some settlements, and live at ease. The first land they made was the island of Providence, then newly settled, here they stayed some time, and having considered that when they should go to New England, the greatness of their ship would cause much inquiry about them, and possibly some people from England, who had heard the story of the ships being run away with from the groin, might suspect them to be the people. They therefore took a resolution of disposing of their ship at Providence, upon which Avery, pretending that the ship being fitted out upon the privateering account, and having no success, had received orders from the owners to dispose of her to the best advantage. He soon met with a purchaser, and immediately bought a sloop. In this sloop he and his companions embarked. They touched at several parts of America, where no person suspected them, and some of them went on shore and dispersed themselves about the country, having received such dividends as Avery would give them. For he concealed the greatest part of the diamonds from them, which in the first hurry of plundering the ship they did not much regard as not knowing their value. At length he came to Boston in New England, and seemed to have a desire of settling in those parts, and some of his companions went on shore there also. But he changed his resolution, and proposed to the few of his companions who were left to sail for Ireland, which they consented to. He found out that New England was not a proper place for him, because a great deal of his wealth lay in diamonds, and should he have produced them there, he would have certainly been seized on suspicion of piracy. In their voyage to Ireland, they avoided St. George's Channel, and sailing north about, they put into one of the northern ports of that kingdom. There they disposed of their sloop, and coming on shore, they separated themselves, some going to Cork, and some to Dublin, eighteen of whom obtained their pardons afterwards of K. William. When Avery had remained some time in this kingdom, he was afraid to offer his diamonds to sale, lest an inquiry into his manner of coming by them should occasion a discovery. Therefore, considering with himself what was best to be done, he fancied there were some persons at Bristol who he might venture to trust, upon which he resolved to pass over into England. He did so, and going into Devonshire, he sent to one of these friends to meet him at a town called Biddeford. When he had communicated himself to his friends, and consulted with him about the means of his effects, they agreed that the safest method would be to put them in the hands of some merchants, who, being men of wealth and credit in the world, no inquiry would be made how they came by them, this friend telling him he was very intimate with some who were very fit for the purpose, and if he would but allow them a good commission, would do the business very faithfully. Avery liked the proposal, for he found no other way of managing his affairs, since he could not appear in them himself. Therefore, his friend going back to Bristol and opening the matter to the merchants, they made Avery a visit at Biddeford, where, after some protestations of honor and integrity, he delivered them his effects, consisting of diamonds and some vessels of gold. They gave him a little money for his present subsistence, and so they parted. He changed his name and lived in Biddeford, without making any figure, and therefore there was no great notice taken of him. Yet let one or two of his relations know where he was, who came to see him, in some time his little money was spent, yet he heard nothing from his merchants. He writ to them often, and after much importunity they sent him a small supply, 
but scarce sufficient to pay his debts. In fine, the supplies they sent him from time to time were so small that they were not sufficient to give him bread, nor could he get that little without a great deal of trouble and importunity. Wherefore, being weary of his life, he went privately to Bristol to speak to the merchants himself, where instead of money he met a most shocking repulse, for when he desired them to come to an account with him, they silenced him by threatening to discover him, so that our merchants were as good pirates at land as he was at sea. Whether he was frightened by these menaces, or he had seen somebody else he thought knew him, is not known, but he went immediately over to Ireland, and from there solicited his merchants very hard for a supply, but to no purpose, for he was even reduced to beggary. In this extremity he was resolved to return and cast himself upon them, let the consequences be what it would. He put himself on board a trading vessel, and worked his passage over to Plymouth, from whence he traveled on foot to Biddeford, where he had been but a few days before he fell sick and died, not being worth as much as would buy him a coffin. Thus have I given all that could be collected of any certainty concerning this man, rejecting the idle stories which were made of his fantastic greatness, by which it appears that his actions were more inconsiderable than those of other pirates, since him, though he made more noise in the world. Now we shall turn back and give our readers some account of what became of the two sloops. We took notice of the rage and confusion which must have seized them upon their missing of Avery. However, they continued their course, some of them still flattering themselves that he had only outsailed them in the night, and that they should find him at the place of rendezvous. But when they came there, and could hear no tidings of him, there was an end of hope. It was time to consider what they should do with themselves. Their stock of sea provisions was almost spent, and though there was rice and fish, and fowl to be had ashore, yet these would not keep for sea, without being properly cured with salt, which they had no conveniency of doing. Therefore, since they could not go on a cruising any more, it was time to think of establishing themselves at land, to which purpose they took all things out of the sloops and made tents of the sails, and encamped themselves, having a large quantity of ammunition and abundance of small arms. Here they met with several of their countrymen, the crew of a privateer sloop which was commanded by Captain Thomas II, and since it will be but a short digression, we will now give an account of how they came here. Captain George Dew and Captain Thomas Too, having received commissions from then-governor of Bermudas to sail directly for the river Gambia in Africa, there, with the advice and assistance of the agents of the Royal African Company, to attempt the taking of the French factory at Gori, lying upon that coast. In a few days after they had sailed out, Dew, in a violent storm, not only sprung his mast, but lost sight of his consort. Dew, therefore, returned back to refit, and two, instead of proceeding on his voyage, made for the Cape of Good Hope, and doubling the said Cape, shaped his course for the Straits of Babel Mandel, being the entrance into the Red Sea. Here he came up with a large ship, richly laden, bound from the Indies to Arabia, with three hundred soldiers on board, besides seamen. Yet two had the hardiness to board her, and soon carried her, and, tis said by this prize, his men shared nearly three thousand pounds apiece. They had intelligence from the prisoners of five other rich ships to pass that way, which two would have attacked, though they were very strong, if they had not been overruled by the quartermaster and others. This differing of opinion created some ill blood amongst them, so that they resolved to break up pirating, and no place was so fit to receive them as Madagascar. Hither they steered, resolving to live on shore and enjoy what they got. As for Tu himself, he, with a few others in a short time, went off to Rhode Island, from whence he made his peace. Thus we have accounted for the company of our pirates met with here. It must be observed that the natives of Madagascar are a kind of negroes, 
They differ from those of Guinea in their hair, which is long, and their complexion is not so good a jet. They have innumerable little princes among them, who are continually making war upon one another. Their prisoners are their slaves, and they either sell them or put them to death, as they please. When our pirates first settled amongst them, the alliance was much courted by these princes, so they sometimes joined one, sometimes another, but wheresoever they sided, they were sure to be victorious, for the Negroes here had no firearms, nor did they understand their use, so that at length these pirates became so terrible to the Negroes that if two or three of them were only seen on one side when they were going to engage, the opposite side would fly without striking a blow. By these means they not only became feared but powerful. All the prisoners of war they took to be their slaves. They married the most beautiful of the Negro women, not one or two, but as many of them as they liked, so that every one of them had as great a seraglia as the grand seer at Constantinople. Their slaves they employed in planting rice, in fishing, hunting, and etc., besides which they had abundance of others who lived, as it were, under their protection, and to be secure from the disturbances or attacks of their powerful neighbors, they seemed to pay them a willing homage. Now they began to divide from one another, each living with his own wives, slaves, and dependents, like a separate prince, and as power and plenty naturally beget contention, they sometimes quarreled with one another, and attacked each other at the head of their several armies, and in these civil wars many of them were killed, but an accident happened which obliged them to unite again for their common safety. It must be observed that these sudden great men had used their power like tyrants. They grew wanton in cruelty, and nothing was more common than upon the slightest displeasure to cause one of their dependents to be tied to a tree and shot through the heart. Let the crime be what it would, whether little or great, this was always the punishment." Wherefore the Negroes conspired together to rid themselves of these destroyers, all in one night. And as they now lived separate, the thing might easily have been done, had not a woman, who had been wife or concubine to one of them, run nearly twenty miles in three hours to discover the matter to them. Immediately upon the alarm they ran together as fast as they could, so that when the Negroes approached them they found them all up in arms, wherefore they retired without making any attempt. The escape made them very cautious from that time, and it will be worth while to describe the policy of these brutish fellows, and to show what measures they took to secure themselves. They found that fear of their power could not secure them against the surprise, and the bravest man may be killed when he is asleep by one much as inferior in courage and strength. Therefore, as their first security they did all they could to form at war betwixt the neighboring negroes, remaining neuter themselves, by which means those who were overcome constantly fled to them for protection, otherwise they must be either killed or made slaves. They strengthened their party, and tied some to them by interest. When there was no war, they contrived to spirit up private quarrels among them, and upon every little dispute or misunderstanding, push on one side or the other to revenge, instruct them how to attack or surprise their adversaries, and lend them loaded pistols or firelocks to dispatch them with, the consequence of which was that the murderer was forced to fly to them for safety of his life, with his wives, children, and kindred. Such as these were fast friends, and their lives depended upon the safety of his protectors. For, as we observed before, our pirates were grown so terrible that none of their neighbors had resolution enough to attack them in an open war. By such arts as these, in the space of a few years, their body was greatly increased. They, then, began to separate themselves, and remove at a greater distance from one another, for the convenience of more ground, and were divided like Jews into tribes, each carrying with him his wives and children of which by this time they had a large family, and also their quota of dependents and followers, and if power and command be the thing which distinguish a prince, 
These ruffians had all the marks of royalty about them. Nay, more, they had the very fears which commonly disturb tyrants, as may be seen by the extreme caution they took in fortifying the places where they dwelt. In this plan of fortification they imitated one another. Their dwellings were rather citadels than houses. They made choice of a place overgrown with wood, and situated near a water. They raised a rampart or high ditch round it, so straight and high that it was impossible to climb it, especially by those who had not the use of scaling ladders. Over the ditch there was one passage into the wood, and the dwelling, which was a hut, was built in that part of the wood which the prince who inhabited it thought fit, but so covered that it could not be seen till you came at it. But the greatest cunning lay in the passage which led to the hut, which was so narrow that no more than one person could go abreast, and contrived in such an intricate manner that it was a perfect maze or labyrinth, it being round and round with several little crossways, so that a person that was not well acquainted with the way might walk several hours round and cross these ways without being able to find the hut. Moreover, all along the sides of these narrow paths, certain large thorns which grew upon a tree in that country were struck into the ground with their points uppermost, and the path itself being made crooked and serpentine. If a man should attempt to come near the hut at night, he would certainly have struck upon these thorns, though he had been provided with that clue which Ariadne gave to Theseus when he entered the cave of the Minotaur. Thus tyrant-like they lived, fearing and feared by all, and in this situation they were found by Captain Woods Rogers when he went to Madagascar in the Delicia, a ship of forty guns, with the design of buying slaves in order to sell to the Dutch at Batavia or New Holland. He happened to touch upon a part of the island where no ship had been seen for seven or eight years before, when he met with some of the pirates, at which time they had been upon the island above twenty-five years, having a large motley generation of children and grandchildren descended from them, there being about that time eleven of them remaining alive. Upon their first seeing a ship of this force and burthen, they supposed it to be a man of war sent to take them. Therefore they lurked within their fastness. But when some from the ship came ashore without any show of hostility, and offering to trade with the Negroes, they ventured to come out of their holes, attended like princes, since they actually are kings de facto, which is a kind of right. We ought to speak of them as such. Having been so many years upon this island, it may be imagined their clothes had long been worn out, so that their majesties were extremely out at the elbows. I cannot say that they were ragged, since they had no clothes. They had nothing to cover them, but with the skins of beasts, without any tanning, but with all the hair on, nor a shoe, nor stocking, so they looked like the picture of Hercules in the lion's skin. And being overgrown with beard and hair upon their bodies, they appeared the most savage figures that a man's imagination can frame. However, they soon got rigged, for they sold great numbers of those poor people under them, for clothes, knives, saws, powder and ball, and many other things, and became so familiar that they went aboard the Delicia, and were observed to be very curious, examining the inside of the ship, and very familiar with the men, inviting them ashore. Their design in doing this, as they afterward confessed, was to try, if it was not practical, to surprise the ship in the night, which they judged very easy, in case there was but a slender watch kept on board, they having boats and men enough at command but it seems the captain was aware of them, and kept so strong a watch upon deck that they found it was in vain to make any attempt. Wherefore, when some of the men went ashore, they were for inbigling them and drawing them into a plot, for seizing the captain and securing the rest of the men under the hatches, when they should have the night watch, promising a signal to come on board to join them, proposing, if they succeeded, to go a-pirating together, not doubting, but with that ship they should be able to take anything they met on the sea. But the captain, observing an intimacy growing betwixt them, and some of his men, thought it could be for no good, and therefore he broke it off in time, 
not suffering them so much as to talk together, and when he sent a boat on shore with an officer to treat with them about the sale of slaves, the crew remained on board the boat, and no man was suffered to talk with them, but the person deputed by him for that purpose. Before he sailed away, and they found that nothing was to be done, they confessed all the designs they had formed against him. Thus he left them as he found them, in a great deal of dirty state and royalty, but with fewer subjects than they had, having, as we observed, sold many of them, and if ambition be the darling passion of men, no doubt they were happy. One of these great princes had formerly been a waterman upon the Thames, where, having committed a murder, he fled to the West Indies, and was a number of those who run away with the sloops. The rest had been all foremast men, nor was there a man amongst them who could either read or write, and yet their secretaries of state had no more learning than themselves. This is all the account we can give of these kings of Madagascar, some of whom it is probable are reigning to this day. End of chapter 1, part 2 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 2 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Turritson. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 2 of Captain Martell and His Crew I come now to the pirates that have rose since the Peace of Utrecht. In wartime there is no room for any, because all those of a roving, adventurous disposition find employment in privateers, so there is no opportunity for pirates. Like our mobs in London, when they come to any height, our superiors order out the train bands, and when once they are raised, the others are suppressed, of course. I take the reason of it to be that the mob go into the tame army, and immediately from notorious breakers of the peace, become, by being put into order, solemn preservers of it. And should our legislators put some of the pirates into authority, it would not only lessen their number, but, I imagine, set them upon the rest, and they would be the likeliest people to find them out, according to the proverb, set a thief to catch a thief. To bring this about, there needs no other encouragement but to give all the effects taken aboard a pirate vessel to the captors, for in case of plunder and gain, they like it as well from friends as enemies, but are not fond, as things are carried, of ruining poor fellows, say the Creolians, with no advantage to themselves. The multitude of men and vessels employed this way in time of war in the West Indies is another reason for the number of pirates in a time of peace. This cannot be supposed to be a reflection on any of our American governments, much less on the king himself, by whose authority such commissions are granted, because of the reasonableness and absolute necessity there is for the doing of it. Yet the observation is just for so many idle people employing themselves in privateers for the sake of plunder and riches, which they always spend as fast as they get. For when the war is over and they can have no farther business in the way of life they have been used to, they too readily engage in acts of piracy, which being but the same practice without a commission, they make very little distinction betwixt the lawfulness of one and the unlawfulness of the other. I have not inquired so far back as to know the original of this rover, but I believe he and his gang were some privateer's men belonging to the island of Jamaica in the preceding war. His story is but short, for his reign was so, an end having been put to his adventures in good time when he was growing strong and formidable. We find him commander of a pirate sloop of eight guns and eighty men in the month of September 1716, cruising off Jamaica, Cuba, etc., about which time he took the Berkeley galley, Captain Saunders, and plundered him of one thousand pounds in money, and afterwards met with a sloop called the King Solomon, for which he took some money and provisions, 
besides goods to a good value. They proceeded after this to the port of Cavana at the island of Cuba, and in their way took two sloops, which they plundered and let go, and off the port fell in with a fine galley with twenty guns called the John and Martha, Captain Wilson, which they attacked under the piratical black flag and made themselves masters of her. They put some of the men ashore and others they detained, as they had done several times, to increase their company. But Captain Martell charged Captain Wilson to advise his owners that their ship would answer his purpose exactly. By taking one deck down, and as for the cargo, which consisted chiefly of logwood and sugar, he would take care it should be carried to a good market. Having fitted up the aforesaid ship as they designed, they mounted her with twenty-two guns, one hundred men, and left twenty-five hands in the sloop, and so proceeded to cruise off the leeward islands, where they met with but too much success. After the taking of the sloop and a brigantine, they gave chase to a stout ship, which they came up with, and at sight of the pirate's flag, she struck to the robbers, being a ship of twenty guns called the Dolphin, bound for Newfoundland. Captain Martell made the men prisoners and carried the ship with him. The middle of December, the pirates took another galley in her voyage home from Jamaica, called the Kent, Captain Lawton, and shifted her provisions aboard their own ship and let her go, which obliged her to sail back to Jamaica for a supply for her voyage. After this, they met with a small ship and a sloop belonging to Barbados. Out of both they took provisions and then parted with them, having first taken out some of their hands, who were willing to be forced to go along with them. The Greyhound Galley of London, Captain Evans, from Guinea to Jamaica, was the next that had the misfortune to fall in their way, which they did not detain long, for as soon as they could get out all of her gold dust, elephant's teeth, and forty slaves, they sent her onwards upon her voyage. They concluded now that twas high time to get into harbor and refit, as well as to get refreshments themselves, and wait an opportunity to dispose of their cargo. Therefore it was resolved to make the best of their way to Santa Crux, a small island in the latitude of eighteen thirty north, ten mile long and two broad, lying southeast of Puerto Rico, belonging to the French settlements. Here they thought they might lie privately for some time and fit themselves for further mischief. They met with a sloop by the way, which they took along with them, and in the beginning of the year 1716-17, to 17, they arrived at their port, having a ship of twenty guns, a sloop of eight, and three prizes, viz. another ship of twenty guns, a sloop of four guns, and another sloop last taken. With this little fleet they got into a small harbor, or road, to the northwest part of the island, and warped up two creeks, which were made by a little island lying in the bay. I am the more particular now, because I shall take leave of the gentlemen at this place. They had here bare sixteen foot water at the deepest, and but thirteen or fourteen at the shallowest, and nothing but rocks and sands without, which secured them from the wind and sea, and likewise from any considerable force coming against them. When they had all got in, the first thing they had to do was to guard themselves in the best manner they could. They made a battery of four guns upon the island and another battery of two guns on the north point of the road and warped in one of the sloops with eight guns at the mouth of the channel to hinder any vessels from coming in. When this was done, they went to work on their ship, unrigging and unloading, in order to clean where I shall leave them a while till I bring other company to them. In the month of November 1716, General Hamilton, commander-in-chief of all the leeward Caribbean islands, sent a sloop express to Captain Hume at Barbados, commander of His Majesty's ship, Scarborough, of 30 guns and 140 men, to acquaint him that the two pirate sloops of 12 guns each molested the colonies, having plundered several vessels. The Scarborough had buried 20 men, and had near forty sick, and therefore was but in ill state to go to sea. However, Captain Hume left his sick men behind and sailed to the other islands for a supply of men, taking twenty soldiers from Antigua. At Nevis he took ten, 
and ten at St. Christopher's, and then sailed to the island of Anguilla, where he learned that some time before two such sloops had been at Spanish town, otherwise called one of the Virgin Islands. Accordingly, the next day, the Scarborough came to Spanish town, but could hear no news of the sloops, only that they had been there about Christmas, it being then the 15th of January. Captain Hume, finding no account could be had of these pirates, designed to go back the next day to Barbados. But it happened that night that a boat anchored there from Santa Crux and informed him that he saw a pirate ship of 22 or 24 guns with other vessels going into the northwest part of the island aforesaid. The Scarborough weighed immediately, and the next morning came in sight of the rovers and their prizes and stood to them, but the pilot refused to venture in with the ship, all the while the pirates fired red-hot bullets from the shore. At length the ship came to an anchor alongside the reef near the channel and cannonaded for several hours, both the vessels and batteries. About four in the afternoon the sloop that guarded the channel was sunk by the shot of the man-of-war. Then she cannonaded the pirate ship of twenty-two guns that lay behind the island. The next night, viz. the 18th, it falling calm, Captain Hume weighed, fearing he might fall on the reef, and so stood off and on for a day or two to block them up. On the 20th, in the evening, they observed the man of war to stand off to sea, and took the opportunity to warp out in order to slip away from the island. But at 12 o'clock they run aground, and then seeing the Scarborough about, standing in again as their case was desperate, so they were put into the utmost confusion. They quitted the ship and set her on fire with twenty negroes in her, who were all burnt. Nineteen of the pirates made their escape in a small sloop, but the captain and the rest, with twenty negroes, betook to the woods, where twas probable they might starve, for we never heard what became of them afterwards. Captain Hume released the prisoners with the ship and sloop that remained, and then went after the two pirate sloops first mentioned. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3, Part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rain the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 3, Part 1 Of Captain Teach, alias Blackbeard Edward Teach was a Bristol man born, but had sailed some time out of Jamaica in privateers in the late French War. Yet though he had often distinguished himself for his uncommon boldness and personal courage, he was never raised to any command till he went a-pirating, which I think was at the latter end of the year 1716, when Captain Benjamin Hornigold put him into a sloop that he had made prize of, and with whom he continued in consortship till a little while before Hornigold surrendered. In the spring of the year 1717, Teach and Hornigold sailed from Providence for the main of America, and took in their way a billet from the Havana, with 120 barrels of flour, as also a sloop from Bermuda, Thurbar Master, from whom they took only some gallons of wine and then let him go, and a ship from Madeira to South Carolina, out of which they got plunder to a considerable value. After cleaning on the coast of Virginia, they returned to the West Indies, and in the latitude of twenty-four made a prize of a large French guinea man bound to Martinico, which by Hornigold's consent Teach went aboard of as captain and took a cruise in her. Hornigold returned with his sloop to Providence, where at the arrival of Captain Rogers, the governor, he surrendered to mercy, pursuant to the king's proclamation. Aboard of this guinea man, Teach mounted forty guns and named her the Queen Anne's Revenge, and cruising near the island of St. Vincent, took a large ship called the Great Allen, Christopher Taylor Commander. The pirates plundered her of what they thought fit, put all the men ashore upon the island above mentioned, and then set fire to the ship. A few days after, Teach fell in with the Scarborough Man of War, of thirty guns, who engaged him for some hours. But she, finding the pirate well manned and having tried her strength, gave over the engagement and returned to Barbados, the place of her station, 
and Teach sailed towards the Spanish America. In his way he met with a pirate sloop of ten guns, commanded by one Major Bonnet, lately a gentleman of good reputation and estate in the island of Barbados, whom he joined. But in a few days after, Teach, finding that Bonnet knew nothing of a maritime life, with the consent of his own men, put in another captain, one Richards, to command Bonnet's sloop, and took the major on board his own ship, telling him that, as he had not been used to the fatigue and care of such a post, it would be better for him to decline it, and live easy and at his pleasure, in such a ship as his, where he should not be obliged to perform duty, but follow his own inclinations. At Turniff, ten leagues short of the Bay of Honduras, the pirates took in fresh water, and while they were at anchor there, they saw a sloop coming in, whereupon Richards and the sloop called the Revenge slipped his cable and run out to meet her, who, upon seeing the black flag hoisted, struck his sail and came to under the stern of Teach the Commodore. She was called the Adventure from Jamaica, David Harriet Master. They took him and his men aboard the great ship, and sent a number of other hands with Israel Hands, master of Teach's ship, to man the sloop for the piratical account. The ninth of April they weighed from Turniff, having laid there about a week, and sailed to the bay, where they found a ship and four sloops. Three of the latter belonged to Jonathan Bernard of Jamaica, and the other to Captain James. The ship was of Boston, called the Protestant Caesar, Captain Wire Commander. Teach hoisted his black colors and fired a gun, upon which Captain Wire and all his men left their ship and got ashore in their boat. Teach's quartermaster and eight of his crew took possession of Wire's ship, and Richards secured all the sloops, one of which they burnt out of spite to the owner. The Protestant Caesar they also burnt, after they had plundered her, because she belonged to Boston, where some men had been hanged for piracy, and the three sloops belonging to Bernard they let go. From hence the rovers sailed to Turkill, and then to the Grand Caymans, a small island about thirty leagues to the westward of Jamaica, where they took a small turtler, and so to the Havana, and from thence to the Bahama wrecks, and from the Bahama wrecks they sailed to Carolina, taking a brigantine and two sloops in their way, where they lay off the bar of Charlestown for five or six days. They took here a ship as she was coming out, bound for London, commanded by Robert Clark, with some passengers on board for England. The next day they took another vessel coming out of Charlestown, and also two pinks coming into Charlestown, likewise a brigantine with fourteen negroes aboard, all which being done in the face of the town struck a great terror to the whole province of Carolina, having just before been visited by Vane, another notorious pirate, that they abandoned themselves to despair, being in no condition to resist their force. They were eight sail in the harbor, ready for the sea, but none dared to venture out, it being almost impossible to escape their hands. The inward-bound vessels were under the same unhappy dilemma, so that the trade of this place was totally interrupted. What made these misfortunes heavier to them was a long expensive war the colony had had with the natives, which was but just ended when these robbers infested them. Teach detained all the ships and prisoners, and being in want of medicines, resolves to demand the chest from the government of the province. Accordingly, Richards, the captain of the Revenge Sloop, with two or three more pirates, were sent up along with Mr. Marks, one of the prisoners, whom they had taken in Clark's ship, and very insolently made their demands, threatening that if they did not send immediately the chest of medicines, and let the pirate ambassadors return without offering any violence to their persons, they would murder all their prisoners, send up their heads to the governor, and set the ships they had taken on fire. Whilst Mr. Marks was making application to the council, Richards and the rest of the pirates walked the streets publicly, in the sight of all people, who were fired with the utmost indignation, looking upon them as robbers and murderers, and particularly the authors of their wrongs and oppressions, but durst not so much as think of executing their revenge, for fear of bringing more calamities upon themselves, and so they were forced to let the villains pass with impunity. The government were not long in deliberating upon the message, though t'was the greatest affront that could have been put upon them. Yet for the saving so many men's lives, among them Mr. Samuel Wragg, one of the council, they complied with the necessity, and sent aboard a chest, valued at between three and four hundred pounds, and the pirates went back safe to their ships. Blackbeard, for so Teach was generally called, as we shall hereafter show, as soon as he had received the medicines and his brother rogues, let go the ships and the prisoners, having first taken out of them in gold and silver about fifteen hundred pounds sterling, 
besides provisions and other matters. From the bar of Charlestown they sailed to North Carolina, Captain Teach and the ship which they called the Man of War, Captain Richards and Captain Hands and the sloops, which they termed privateers, and another sloop serving them as a tender. Teach began now to think of breaking up the company and securing the money and the best of the effects for himself and some others of his companions he had most friendship for, and to cheat the rest. Accordingly, on pretense of running into Topsail Inlet to clean, he grounded his ship, and then, as if it had been done undesignedly and by accident, he orders Hans' sloop to come to his assistance and get him off again, which he, endeavoring to do, ran the sloop on shore near the other, and so were both lost. This done, Teach goes into the tender sloop with forty hands and leaves the revenge there, then takes seventeen others and maroons them upon a small sandy island about a league from the main, where there was neither bird, beast, or herb for their subsistence, and where they must have perished if Major Bonnet had not, two days later, taken them off. Teach goes up to the governor of North Carolina with about twenty of his men, surrenders to His Majesty's proclamation, and receives certificates thereof from His Excellency. But it did not appear that their submitting to this pardon was from any reformation of manners, but only to wait a more favorable opportunity to play the same game over again, which he soon after effected with greater security to himself and with much better prospect of success, having in this time cultivated a very good understanding with Charles Eden, Esquire, the governor above mentioned. The first piece of service this kind governor did to Blackbeard was to give him a right to the vessel which he had taken when he was a pirating in the great ship called the Queen Anne's Revenge, for which purpose a court of vice-admiralty was held at Bathtown, and though Teach had never any commission in his life, and the sloop belonging to the English merchants, and taken in time of peace, yet was she condemned as a prize taken from the Spaniards by the said Teach. These proceedings show that governors are but men. Before he sailed upon his adventures, he married a young creature of about sixteen years of age, the governor performing the ceremony. As it is a custom to marry here by a priest, so it is there by a magistrate. And this, I have been informed, made teach his fourteenth wife, whereof about a dozen might still be living. His behavior in this state was something extraordinary, for while his sloop lay in Ocracoke Inlet, and he assured a plantation where his wife lived, with whom, after he had lain all night, it was his custom to invite five or six of his brutal companions to come ashore, and he would force her to prostitute herself to them all, one after another, before his face. In June 1718 he went to sea upon another expedition, and steered his course toward Bermudas. He met with two or three English vessels in his way, but robbed them only of provisions, stores, and other necessities for his present expense. But near the island aforementioned he fell in with two French ships. One of them was loaden with sugar and cocoa, and the other light, both bound to Martinico. The ship that had no lading he let go, and putting all the men of the loaded ship aboard her, he brought home the other with her cargo to North Carolina, where the governor and the pirates shared the plunder. When Teach and his prize arrived, he and four of his crew went to his excellency and made affidavit that they found the French ship at sea, without a soul on board her, and then a court was called and the ship condemned. The governor had sixty hogsheads of sugar for his dividend, and one Mr. Knight, who was his secretary and collector for the province, twenty, and the rest was shared among the other pirates. The business was not yet done, the ship remained, and it was possible one or other might come into the river that might be acquainted with her, and so discover the roguery. But Teach thought of a contrivance to prevent this, for upon a pretense that she was leaky and that she might sink, and so stop up the mouth of the inlet or cove where she lay, he obtained an order from the governor to bring her out into the river and set her on fire, which was accordingly executed, and she was burnt down to the water's edge, her bottom sunk, and with it their fears of her ever rifing in judgment against them. Captain Teach, alias Blackbeard, passed three or four months in the river, sometimes lying at anchor in the coves, at other times sailing from one inlet to another, trading with such sloops as he met for the plunder he had taken, and would often give them presents for stores and provisions took from them, that is, when he happened to be in a giving humor. At other times he made bold with them and took what he liked, without saying, By your leave, knowing well they dared not send him a bill for the payment. He often diverted himself with going ashore among the planters, where he reveled night and day. By these he was well received, but whether out of love or fear I cannot say. 
Sometimes he used them courteously enough and made them presents of rum and sugar in recompense of what he took from them. But as for liberties, which tis said he and his companions often took with the wives and daughters of the planters, I cannot take upon me to say whether he paid them ad valorem or no. At other times he carried it in a lordly manner towards them, and would lay some of them under contribution. Nay, he often proceeded to bully the governor, not that I can discover the least cause of quarrel betwixt them, but it seemed only to be done to shew he dared do it. The sloops trading up and down this river, being so frequently pillaged by Blackbeard, consulted with the traders and some of the best planters what course to take. They saw plainly it would be in vain to make any application to the governor of North Carolina, to whom it properly belonged to find some redress, so that if they could not be relieved from some other quarter, Blackbeard would be like to reign with impunity. Therefore, with as much secrecy as possible, they sent a deputation to Virginia to lay the affair before the governor of that colony and to solicit an armed force from the men of war lying there to take or destroy this pirate. This governor consulted with the captains of the two men of war, Vis, the Pearl, and Lime, who had lain in St. James's River about ten months. It was agreed that the governor should hire a couple of small sloops and the men of war should man them. This was accordingly done, and the command of them given to Mr. Robert Maynard, first lieutenant of the Pearl, an experienced officer and a gentleman of great bravery and resolution, as will appear by his gallant behavior in this expedition. The sloops were well manned and furnished with ammunition and small arms, but had no guns mounted. About the time of their going out, the governor called an assembly in which it was resolved to publish a proclamation, offering certain rewards to any person or persons who, within a year after that time, should take or destroy any pirate. The original proclamation being in our hands is as follows. By His Majesty's Lieutenant Governor and Commander-in-Chief of the Colony and Dominion of Virginia, a proclamation, publishing the rewards given for apprehending or killing pirates. Whereas, by an act of assembly, made at a session of assembly begun at the Capitol in Williamsburg, the 11th day of November, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign, entitled, An Act to Encourage the Apprehending and Destroying of Pirates. It is, amongst other things enacted, that all and every person or persons who, from and after the fourteenth day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1,718, and before the fourteenth day of November, which shall be in the year of our Lord, 1,719, shall take any pirate or pirates on the sea or land, or in case of resistance shall kill any such pirate or pirates between the degrees of 34 and 39 of northern latitude, and within 100 leagues of the continent of Virginia, or within the provinces of Virginia or North Carolina, upon the conviction or making due proof of the killing of all and every such pirate and pirates, before the governor and council, shall be entitled to have and receive out of the public money in the hands of the treasurer of this colony the several rewards following. That is to say, for Edward Teach, commonly called Captain Teach, or Blackbeard, 100 pounds. For every other commander of a pirate ship, sloop, or vessel, 40 pounds. For every lieutenant, master, or quartermaster, boatswain, or carpenter, 20 pounds. For every other inferior officer, 15 pounds. And for every private man taken on board such ship, sloop, or vessel, 10 pounds and that for every pirate which shall be taken by any ship, sloop, or vessel belonging to this colony or North Carolina, within the time aforesaid, in any place whatsoever, the like rewards shall be paid according to the quality and condition of such pirates. Wherefore, for the encouragement of all such persons as shall be willing to serve His Majesty and their country in so just and honorable an undertaking as the suppressing a sort of people who may be truly called enemies to mankind, I have thought fit, with the advice and consent of His Majesty's Council, to issue this proclamation, hereby declaring the said rewards shall be punctually and justly paid, in current money of Virginia, according to the directions of said act. And I do order and appoint this proclamation to be published by the sheriffs, at their respective county houses, and by all ministers and readers, in the several churches and chapels throughout this colony. Given at our council chamber at Williamsburg, this twenty-fourth day of November, 1718, in the fifth year of His Majesty's reign. God save the King. A. Spotswood End of Chapter 3, Part 1
Chapter 3, Part 2 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rain. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 3, Part 2. The 17th of November, 1718. The lieutenant sailed from Kikatan in James River, Virginia, and the 21st in the evening came to the mouth of Ocracoke Inlet, where he got sight of the pirate. This expedition was made with all imaginable secrecy, and the officer managed with all the prudence that was necessary, stopping all boats and vessels he met with in the river from going up, and thereby preventing any intelligence from reaching Blackbeard, and receiving at the same time an account from them all of the place where the pirate was lurking. But notwithstanding this caution, Blackbeard had information of the design from His Excellency of the Province, and his secretary, Mr. Knight, wrote him a letter particularly concerning it, intimating that he had sent him four of his men, which were all he could meet with in or about town, and so bid him be upon his guard. These men belonged to Blackbeard, and were sent from Bath Town to Ocracoke Inlet, where the sloop lay, which is about twenty leagues." Blackbeard had heard several reports, which happened not to be true, and so gave the less credit to this, nor was he convinced till he saw the sloops, whereupon he put his vessel in a posture of defense. He had no more than twenty-five men on board, though he gave out to all the vessels he spoke with that he had forty. When he had prepared for battle, he sat down, and spent the night in drinking with the master of a trading sloop, who, t'was thought, had more business with Teach than he should have had. Lieutenant Maynard came to an anchor, for the place being shoal and the channel intricate, there was no getting in where Teach lay that night. But in the morning he weighed and sent his boat ahead of the sloops to sound, and coming within gunshot of the pirate received his fire, whereupon Maynard hoisted the king's colors and stood directly towards him, with the best way that his sails and oars could make. Blackbeard cut his cable and endeavored to make a running fight, keeping a continual fire at his enemies with his guns. Mr. Maynard, not having any, kept a constant fire with small arms, while some of his men labored at their oars. In a little time Teach's sloop ran aground, and Mr. Maynard's drawing more water than that of the pirate, he could not come near him. So he anchored within half gunshot of the enemy, and, in order to lighten his vessel that he might run him aboard, the lieutenant ordered all his ballast to be thrown overboard, and all the water to be staved, and then weighed and stood for him, upon which Blackbeard hailed him in this rude manner. "'Damn you for villains! Who are you?' and from whence came you? The lieutenant made him answer, You may see by our colors we are no pirates. Blackbeard bid him send his boat on board that he might see who he was. But Maynard replied thus, I cannot spare my boat, but I will come aboard of you as soon as I can with my sloop. Upon this, Blackbeard took a glass of liquor and drank to him with these words, Damnation seize my soul if I give you quarters or take any from you in answer to which Mr. Maynard told him that he expected no quarters from him, nor should he give any. By this time Blackbeard's sloop fleeted, as Mr. Maynard's sloops were rowing towards him, which being not above a foot high in the waist, and consequently the men all exposed as they came near together, there being hitherto little or no execution done on either side, the pirate fired a broadside, charged with all manner of small shot. A fatal stroke to them, the sloop the lieutenant was in, having twenty men killed and wounded, and the other sloop nine. This could not be helped, for there being no wind, they were obliged to keep to their oars, otherwise the pirate would have gotten away from him, which it seems the lieutenant was resolute to prevent. After this unlucky blow, Blackbeard's sloop fell broadside to the shore. Mr. Maynard's other sloop, which was called the Ranger, fell astern, being for the present disabled. So the lieutenant, finding his own sloop had way, and would soon be on board of Teach, he ordered all his men down for fear of another broadside, which must have been their destruction and the loss of their expedition. Mr. Maynard was the only person that kept the deck, except the man at the helm, whom he directed to lie down snug, and the men in the hold were ordered to get their pistols and their swords ready for close fighting, and to come up at his command, in order to which two ladders were placed in the hatchway for the more expedition. When the lieutenant's sloop boarded the other, Captain Teach's men threw in several new-fashioned sort of granados, viz. case bottles filled with powder and small shot, slugs and pieces of lead or iron, with a quick match in the mouth of it, 
which being lighted without side, presently runs into the bottle to the powder, and as it is instantly thrown on board, generally does great execution, besides putting all the crew into a confusion. But by good providence they had not that effect here. The men being in the hold, and Blackbeard, seeing few or no hands aboard, told his men that they were all knocked on the head, except three or four, and therefore, says he, let's jump on board and cut them to pieces. Whereupon, under the smoke of one of the bottles just mentioned, Blackbeard enters with fourteen men over the bowels of Maynard's sloop, and were not seen by him till the air cleared. However, he just then gave a signal to his men, who all rose in an instant and attacked the pirates with as much bravery as ever was done upon such an occasion. Blackbeard and the lieutenant fired the first pistol at each other, by which the pirate received a wound, and then engaged with swords, till the lieutenants unluckily broke, and stepping back to cock a pistol, Blackbeard with his cutlass was striking at that instant that one of Maynard's men gave him a terrible wound in the neck and throat, by which the lieutenant came off with a small cut over his fingers. They were now closely and warmly engaged, the lieutenant and twelve men against Blackbeard and fourteen, till the sea was tinctured with blood round the vessel. Blackbeard received a shot into his body from the pistol that Lieutenant Maynard discharged, yet he stood his ground and fought with great fury, till he received five and twenty wounds, and five of them by shot. At length, as he was cocking another pistol, having fired several before, he fell down dead, by which time eight more of the fourteen dropped, and all the rest, much wounded, jumped overboard, and called out for quarters, which was granted, though it was only prolonging their lives for a few days. The sloop ranger came up and attacked the men that remained in Blackbeard's sloop with equal bravery, till they likewise cried for quarters. Here was an end of that courageous brute, who might have passed in the world for a hero, had he been employed in a good cause. His destruction, which was of such consequence to the plantations, was entirely owing to the conduct and bravery of Lieutenant Maynard and his men, who might have destroyed him with much less loss had they had a vessel with great guns. But they were obliged to use small vessels, because the holes and places he lurked in would not admit of others of greater draft. And it was no small difficulty for this gentleman to get to him, having grounded his vessel at least a hundred times in getting up the river, besides other discouragements, enough to have turned back any gentleman without dishonor, who was less resolute and bold than this lieutenant. The broadside that did so much mischief before they boarded, in all probability saved the rest from destruction, for before that Teach had little or no hopes of escaping, and therefore had posted a resolute fellow, a negro whom he had bred up, with a lighted match in the powder room, with commands to blow up when he should give him orders, which was as soon as the lieutenant and his men could have entered, that so he might have destroyed his conquerors. And when the negro found out how it went with Blackbeard, he could hardly be persuaded from the rash action by two prisoners that were then in the hold of the sloop. What seems a little odd is that some of these men, who behaved so bravely against Blackbeard, went afterwards a-pirating themselves, and one of them was taken along with Roberts. But I do not find that any of them were provided for, except one that was hanged. But this is a digression." The lieutenant caused Blackbeard's head to be severed from his body, and hung up at the bolt-spread end. Then he sailed to Bathtown to get relief for his wounded men. It must be observed that in rummaging the pirate's sloop they found several letters and written papers, which discovered the correspondence betwixt Governor Eden, the secretary and collector, and also some traders at New York, and Blackbeard. It is likely he had regard enough for his friends to have destroyed these papers before the action, in order to hinder them from falling into such hands, where the discovery would be of no use either to the interest or reputation of these fine gentlemen, if it had not been his fixed resolution to have blown up together when he found no possibility of escaping. When the lieutenant came to Bathtown, he made bold to seize in the governor's storehouse the sixty hogsheads of sugar, and from honest Mr. Knight twenty, which it seems was their dividend of the plunder taken in the French ship. The latter did not long survive this shameful discovery, for being apprehensive that he might be called to an account for these trifles, fell sick with the fright, and died in a few days. After the wounded men were pretty well recovered, the lieutenant sailed back to the men of war in James River in Virginia, with Blackbeard's head still hanging at the bolt spread end, and fifteen prisoners, thirteen of whom were hanged. It appearing upon trial that one of them, v. Samuel O'Dell, was taken out of the trading sloop but the night before the engagement. 
This poor fellow was a little unlucky at his first entering upon his new trade. There were appearing no less than seventy wounds upon him after the action, notwithstanding which he lived and was cured of them all. The other person that escaped the gallows was one Israel Hands, the master of Blackbeard's sloop and formerly captain of the same, before the Queen Anne's revenge was lost in Topsail Inlet. The aforesaid Hands happened not to be in the fight, but was taken afterwards ashore at Bath Town, having been some time before disabled by Blackbeard in one of his savage humors, after the following manner. One night, drinking in his cabin with Hands, the pilot, and another man, Blackbeard, without any provocation, privately draws out a small pair of pistols and cocks them under the table, which being perceived by the man, he withdrew and went up on deck, leaving Hands, the pilot, and the captain together. When the pistols were ready, they blew out the candle, and crossing his hands, he discharged them at his company. Hands, the master, was shot through the knee and lamed for life. The other pistol did no execution. Being asked the meaning of this, he only answered by damning them that if he did not now and then kill one of them, they would forget who he was. Hands being taken was tried and condemned, but just as he was about to be executed, a ship arrives at Virginia with a proclamation for prolonging the time of His Majesty's pardon to such of the pirates as should surrender by a limited time therein expressed. Notwithstanding the sentence, Hands pleaded the pardon and was allowed the benefit of it, and is alive at this time in London, begging his bread. Now that we have given some account of Teach's life and actions, it will not be amiss that we speak of his beard, since it did not a little contribute towards making his name so terrible in those parts. Plutarch and other grave historians have taken notice that several great men amongst the Romans took their surnames from certain odd marks in their countenances. As Cicero from a mark or vetch on his nose, so our hero, Captain Teach, assumed the cognomen of Blackbeard from that large quantity of hair which, like a frightful meteor, covered his whole face and frightened America more than any comet that has appeared there a long time. This beard was black, which he suffered to grow of an extravagant length. As to breadth, it came up to his eyes. He was accustomed to twist it with ribbons in small tails after the manner of our Ramillies wigs and turn them about his ears. In time of action, he wore a sling over his shoulders with three brace of pistols hanging in holsters like bandoliers, and stuck lighted matches under his hat, which appearing on each side of his face. His eyes, naturally looking fierce and wild, made him altogether such a figure that imagination cannot form an idea of a fury from hell to look more frightful. If he had the look of a fury, his humors and passions were suitable to it. We shall relate two or three more of his extravagancies, which we omitted in the body of his history, by which it will appear to what a pitch of wickedness human nature may arrive if its passions are not checked. In the commonwealth of pirates, he who goes the greatest length of wickedness is looked upon with a kind of envy amongst them, as a person of a more extraordinary gallantry, and is thereby entitled to be distinguished by some post, and if such a one has but courage, he must certainly be a great man. The hero of whom we are writing was thoroughly accomplished this way, and some of his frolics of wickedness were so extravagant as if he aimed at making his men believe he was a devil incarnate. For being one day at sea, and a little flushed with drink, Come, says he, let us make a hell of our own, and try how long we can bear it. Accordingly he, with two or three others, went down into the hold, and closing up all the hatches, filled several pots full of brimstone and other combustible matter, and set it on fire, and so continued till they were almost suffocated, when some of the men cried out for air. At length he opened the hatches, not a little pleased that he held out the longest. The night before he was killed, he sat up and drank till the morning with some of his own men and the master of a merchantman, and having had intelligence of the two sloops coming to attack him, as has before been observed. One of his men asked him, in case anything should happen to him in the engagement with the sloops, whether his wife knew where he had buried his money. He answered that nobody but himself and the devil knew where it was, and the longest liver should take all. Those of his crew who were taken alive told a story which may appear a little incredible. However, we think it will not be fair to omit it since we had it from their own mouths, that once upon a cruise they found out they had a man on board more than their crew. Such a one was seen several days amongst them, sometimes below and sometimes upon deck, yet no man in the ship could give an account who he was or from whence he came. 
but that he disappeared a little before they were cast away on their great ship, but it seems they verily believed it was the devil. One would think these things should induce them to reform their lives, but so many reprobates together encouraged and spirited one another up in their wickedness, to which a continual course of drinking did not a little contribute. For in Blackbeard's journal, which was taken, there were several memorandums of the following nature, found writ with his own hand. Such a day, rum all out. Our company somewhat sober. A damned confusion amongst us. Rogues applauding. Great talk of separation. So I looked sharp for a prize. Such a day took one with a great deal of liquor on board, so kept the company hot, damned hot, then all things went well again. Thus it was these wretches passed their lives, with very little pleasure or satisfaction, in the possession of what they violently take away from others, and sure to pay for it at last by an ignominious death. The names of the pirates killed in the engagement are as follow. Edward Teach, Commander. Philip Morton, Gunner. Garrett Gibbons, Boatswain. Owen Roberts, Carpenter. Thomas Miller, Quartermaster. John Husk, Joseph Curtis, Joseph Brooks, Nathaniel Jackson. All the rest, except the two last, were wounded and afterwards hanged in Virginia. John Carnes, Joseph Brooks, James Blake, John Gills, Thomas Gates, James White, Richard Stiles, Caesar, Joseph Phillips, James Robbins, John Martin, Edward Salter, Stephen Daniel, Richard Greensale, Israel Hands pardoned, Samuel O'Dell acquitted. There were in the pirate sloops and ashore in a tent near where the sloops lay, twenty-five hogshead of sugar, eleven tierces and one hundred forty-five bags of cocoa, a barrel of indigo, and a bale of cotton, which, with what was taken from the governor and secretary, and the sale of the sloop, came to twenty-five hundred pounds, besides the rewards paid by the governor of Virginia pursuant to his proclamation, all which was divided among the companies of the two ships, Lime and Pearl, that lay in James River, the brave fellows that took them coming in for no more than their dividend amongst the rest, and was paid it within these three months. End of chapter 3, part 2「Four, Part One, Section Nine of The General History of the Pirates, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. The General History of the Pirates, Volume One by Charles Johnson. Chapter Four, Part One of Major Steed Bonnet and His Crew. The Major was a gentleman of good reputation in the island of Barbados, was master of a plentiful fortune, and had the advantage of a liberal education. He had the least temptation of any man to follow such a course of life, from the condition of his circumstances. It was very surprising to everyone to hear of the Major's enterprise in the island where he lived, and, as he was generally esteemed and honored, before he broke out into open acts of piracy, so he was afterwards rather pitied than condemned by those that were acquainted with him, believing that this humor of going a-pirating proceeded from a disorder in his mind which had been but too visible in him some time before this wicked undertaking, and which is said to have been occasioned by some discomforts he found in a married state. Be that as it will, the Major was but ill-qualified for the business as not understanding maritime affairs. However, he fitted out a sloop with ten guns and seventy men entirely at his own expense, and in the night-time sailed from Barbados. He called his sloop the Revenge. His first cruise was off the Capes of Virginia, where he took several ships and plundered them of their provisions, clothes, money, ammunition, etc., in particular the Anne, Captain Montgomery from Glasgow, the Turbot from Barbados, which, for country's sake, after they had taken out the principal part of the lading, the pirate crew set her on fire. The Endeavour, Captain Scott from Bristol, and the Young from Leith. From hence they went to New York, and off the east end of Long Island, took a sloop bound for the West Indies, 
after which they stood in and landed some men at Gardner's Island, but in a peaceable manner, and bought provisions for the company's use, which they paid for, and so went off again without molestation. Some time after, which was in August 1717, Bonnet came off the bar of South Carolina and took a sloop and a brigantine bound in. The sloop belonged to Barbados, Joseph Palmer, master laden with rum, sugar, and negroes, and the brigantine came from New England, Thomas Porter, master, whom they plundered, and then dismissed. But they sailed away with the sloop, and at an inlet in North Carolina careened by her, and then set her on fire. After the sloop had cleaned, they put to sea, but came to no resolution what course to take. The crew were divided in their opinions, some being for one thing and some another, so that nothing but confusion seemed to attend all their schemes. The Major was no sailor, as was said before, and therefore had been obliged to yield to many things that were imposed on him during their undertaking, for want of a competent knowledge in maritime affairs. At length, happening to fall in company with another pirate, one Edward Teach, who for his remarkable black ugly beard was more commonly called Blackbeard, this fellow was a good sailor, but a most cruel hardened villain, bold and daring to the last degree and would not stick at the perpetrating of the most abominable wickedness imaginable, for which he was made chief of the execrable gang, that it might be said that his post was not unduly filled, Blackbeard being truly the superior in roguery of all the company, as has been already related. To him Bonnet's crew joined in consortship, and Bonnet himself was laid aside, notwithstanding the sloop was his own. He went aboard Blackbeard's ship, not concerning himself with any of their affairs, where he continued till she was lost in Topsail Inlet, and one Richards was appointed captain in his room. The Major now saw his folly, but could not help himself, which made him melancholy. He reflected upon his past course of life, and was confounded with shame, when he thought upon what he had done. His behavior was taken notice of by the other pirates, who liked him never the better for it and he often declared to some of them that he would gladly leave off that way of living, being fully tired of it, but he should be ashamed to see the face of any Englishman again. Therefore, if he could get to Spain or Portugal, where he might be undiscovered, he would spend the remainder of his days in either of those countries. Otherwise, he must continue with them as long as he lived. When Blackbeard lost his ship at Topsail Inlet and surrendered to the king's proclamation, Bonnet reassumed the command of his own sloop, Revenge, goes directly away to Bath Town in North Carolina, surrenders likewise to the king's pardon, and receives a certificate. The war was now broken out between the Triple Allies and Spain, so Major Bonnet gets a clearance for his sloop at North Carolina to go to the island of St. Thomas with a design, at least it was pretended so, to get the Emperor's commission to go a privateering upon the Spaniards when Bonnet came back to Topsail Inlet, he found that Teach and his gang were gone, and that had taken all the money, small arms and effects of value out of the great ship, and set ashore on a small sandy island above a league from the main, seventeen men, no doubt with a design they should perish, there being no inhabitant or provisions to subsist withal, nor any boat or materials to build or make any kind of launch or vessel to escape from that desolate place. They remained there two nights and one day without subsistence, or the least prospect of any, expecting nothing else but a lingering death, when to their inexpressible comfort they saw redemption at hand, for Major Bonnet happening to get intelligence of their being there, by two of the pirates who had escaped Teach's cruelty, and had got to a poor little village at the upper end of the harbor, sent his boat to make discovery of the truth of the matter, which the poor wretches seeing made a signal to them, and they were all brought on board Bonnet's sloop. Major Bonnet told all his company that he would take a commission to go against the Spaniards, and to that end was going to St. Thomas. Therefore, if they would go with him, they should be welcome. Whereupon they all consented, but as the sloop was preparing to sail, a bomb-boat that brought apples and cider to sell to the sloop's men informed them that Captain Teach lay at Ocracoke Inlet with only eighteen or twenty hands, Bonnet, who bore him a mortal hatred for some insults offered him, went immediately in pursuit of Blackbeard, but it happened too late, for he missed of him there, and after four days' cruise, hearing no further news of him, 
they steered their course towards Virginia. In the month of July these adventurers came off the capes, and meeting with a pink with a stock of provisions on board, which they happened to be in want of, they took out of her ten or twelve barrels of pork and about four hundred weight of bread, but because they would not have this set down to the account of piracy, they gave them eight or ten casks of rice and an old cable in lieu thereof. Two days afterwards they chased a sloop of sixty ton and took her two leagues off of Cape Henry. They were so happy here as to get a supply of liquor to their victuals, for they brought from her two hogsheads of rum and as many of molasses, which it seems they had need of, though they had not ready money to purchase them. What security they intended to give I can't tell, but Bonnet sent eight men to take care of the prize sloop, who, perhaps not caring to make use of those accustomed freedoms, took the first opportunity to go off with her, and Bonnet, who was pleased to have himself called Captain Thomas, saw them no more. After this the Major threw off all restraint, and though he had just before received His Majesty's mercy, in the name of Steed Bonnet he relapsed in good earnest into his old vocation, by the name of Captain Thomas, and recommenced a downright pirate by taking and plundering all the vessels he met with. He took off Cape Henry, two ships from Virginia, bound to Glasgow, out of which they had very little besides an hundred weight of tobacco. The next day they took a small sloop bound from Virginia to Bermudas, which supplied them with twenty barrels of pork, some bacon, and they gave her in return two barrels of rice and a hogshead of molasses. Out of this sloop two men entered voluntarily. The next they took was another Virginiaman bound to Glasgow, out of which they had nothing of value save only a few combs, pins, and needles, and gave her instead thereof a barrel of pork and two barrels of bread. From Virginia they sailed to Philadelphia, and in the latitude of 38 north they took a schooner coming from North Carolina, bound to Boston. They had out of her only two dozen of calf skins to make covers for guns, and two of their hands, and detained her some days. All this was but small game, and seemed as if they designed only to make provision for their sloop against they arrived at St. Thomas's, for they hitherto had dealt favorably with all that were so unhappy as to fall into their hands. But those that came after fared not so well, for in the latitude of thirty-two, off of Delaware River near Philadelphia, they took two snows bound to Bristol, out of whom they got some money, besides goods, perhaps to the value of one hundred fifty pounds. At the same time they took a sloop of sixty tons bound from Philadelphia to Barbados, which after taking some goods out they dismissed along with the snows. The twenty-ninth day of July Captain Thomas took a sloop of fifty tons, six or seven leagues off Delaware Bay, bound from Philadelphia to Barbados, Thomas Reed, master, loaden with provisions which they kept, and put four or five of their hands on board her. The last day of July they took another sloop of sixty tons commanded by Peter Mainwaring, bound from Antigua to Philadelphia, which they likewise kept with all the cargo, consisting chiefly of rum, molasses, sugar, cotton, indigo, and about twenty-five pound in money, valued in all to five hundred pounds. The last day of July our rovers with the vessels last taken left Delaware Bay, and sailed to Cape Fear River, where they stayed too long for their safety. For the pirate sloop, which they now new-named the Royal James, proved very leaky, so that they were obliged to remain here almost two months to refit and repair their vessel. They took in this river a small shallop, which they ripped up to mend the sloop, and retarded the further prosecution of their voyage, as before mentioned, till the news came to Carolina, of a pirate sloop's being there to careen with her prizes. Upon this information the Council of South Carolina was alarmed, and apprehended they should receive another visit from them speedily to prevent which Colonel William Reet, of the same province, waited on the governor and generously offered himself to go with two sloops to attack this pirate, which the governor readily accepted, and accordingly gave the colonel a commission and full power to fit such vessels as he thought proper to the design. In a few days two sloops were equipped and manned, the Henry with eight guns and seventy men, commanded by Captain John Masters, and the Sea Nymph, with eight guns and sixty men, commanded by Captain Ferrer Hall, both under the entire direction and command of the aforesaid Colonel Rett, who on the 14th of September went on board the Henry, and with the other sloops sailed from Charlestown to Swillivant's Island. 
to put themselves in order for the cruise. And just then arrived a small ship from Antigua, one cockmaster, with an account that in sight of the bar he was taken and plundered by one Charles Vane, a pirate, in a brigantine of twelve guns and ninety men, and who had also taken two other vessels bound in there, one a small sloop, Captain Dill, master from Barbados, the other a brigantine, Captain Thompson, master from Guinea, with ninety-odd negroes, which they took out of the vessel and put on board another sloop, then under the command of one Yeats, his consort with twenty-five men. This proved fortunate to the owners of the Guinea man, for Yeas, having often attempted to quit this course of life, took an opportunity in the night to leave Vane and to run into North Edisto River, to the southward of Charlestown, and surrendered to His Majesty's pardon. The owners got their negroes, and Yates and his men had certificates given them from the government. Vane cruised some time off the bar in hopes of catching Yates, and unfortunately for them took two ships coming out, bound to London, and while the prisoners were aboard, some of the pirates gave out that they designed to go into one of the rivers to the southward. Colonel Rhett, upon hearing this, sailed over the bar the 15th of September, with the two sloops before mentioned, and having the wind northerly went after the pirate Vane, and scoured the rivers and inlets to the southward, but not meeting with him, tacked and stood for Cape Fear River, in prosecution of his first design. On the 26th following, in the evening, the colonel with his small squadron entered the river, and saw over a point of land three sloops at an anchor, which were Major Bonnet and his prizes. But it happened that in going up the river the pilot run the colonel's sloops aground, and it was dark before they were on float, which hindered their getting up that night. The pirates soon discovered the sloops, but not knowing who they were, or upon what design they came into that river, they manned three canoes and sent them down to take them. But they quickly found their mistake and returned to the sloop with the unwelcome news. Major Bonnet made preparations that night for engaging, and took all the men out of the prizes. He showed Captain Manwaring, one of his prisoners, a letter he had just wrote, which he declared he would send to the governor of Carolina. The letter was to this effect, viz., that if the sloops which then appeared were sent out against him by the said governor, and he should get clear off, that he would burn and destroy all ships or vessels going in or out of South Carolina. The next morning they got under sail and came down the river, designing only a running fight. Colonel Rett's sloops got likewise under sail, and stood for him, getting upon each quarter of the pirate, with intent to board him, which he, perceiving, edged in toward the shore, and being warmly engaged, their sloop ran aground. The Carolina sloops, being in the same shoal water, were in the same circumstances. The Henry, in which Colonel Rett was, grounded within pistol-shot of the pirate, and on his bow the other sloop grounded right ahead of him, and almost out of gunshot, which made her of little service to the colonel while they lay aground. At this time the pirate had a considerable advantage, for their sloop, after she was aground, listed from Colonel Wright's by which means they were all covered, and the colonel's sloop listed the same way his men were much exposed, notwithstanding which they kept a brisk fire the whole time they lay thus aground, which was near five hours. The pirates made a whiff in their bloody flag, and beckoned several times with their hats in derision to the colonel's men, to come on board, which they answered with cheerful huzzas, and said that they would speak with them by and by, which accordingly happened, for the colonel's sloop being first afloat, he got into deeper water, and after mending the sloop's rigging, which was much shattered in the engagement, they stood for the pirate to give the finishing stroke, and designed to go directly on board him, which he prevented by sending a flag of truce, and after some time capitulating. They surrendered themselves prisoners. The colonel took possession of the sloop, and was extremely pleased to find that Captain Thomas, who commanded her, was the individual person of Major Steed Bonnet, who had done them the honor several times to visit their own coast of Carolina. They were killed in this action on board the Henry, ten men and fourteen wounded. On board the Sea Nymph, two killed and four wounded. The officers and sailors in both sloops behaved themselves with the greatest bravery, and had not the sloops so unluckily run aground, they had taken the pirate with much less loss of men. But as he designed to get by them, and so make a running fight, the Carolina sloops were obliged to keep near him, to prevent his getting away. 
Of the pirates there were seven killed and five wounded, two of which died soon after their wounds. Colonel Rhett weighed the 30th of September from Cape Fear River, and arrived at Charlestown the 3rd of October, to the great joy of the whole province of Carolina. Bonnet and his crew, two days after, were put ashore, and there not being a public prison, the pirates were kept at the watch-house, under a guard of militia. But Major Bonnet was committed into the custody of the marshal at his house, and in a few days after, David Harriet, the master, and Ignatius Pell, the boatswain, who were designed for evidence against the other pirates, were removed from the rest of the crew to the said marshal's house, and every night two centennials set about the said house, but whether through any corruption or want of care in guarding the prisoners I can't say. But on the 24th of October the Major and Harriet made their escape, the boatswain refusing to go along with them. This made a great noise in the province, and people were open in their resentments, often reflecting on the governor and others in the magistracy as though they had been bribed for conniving at their escape. These invectives arose from their fears that Bonnet would be capable of raising another company and prosecute his revenge against this country, for what he had lately, though justly, suffered. But they were in a short time made easy in these respects, for as soon as the governor had the account of Bonnet's escape, he immediately issued out a proclamation and promised a reward of seven hundred pounds to any that would take him and sent several boats with armed men both to the northward and southward in pursuit of him. End of chapter 4, part 1, recording by Mike Harris. Chapter 4, part 2, section 10 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 4, Part 2 Bonnet stood to the northward in a small vessel, but wanting necessaries and the weather being bad, he was forced back, and so returned with his canoe to Swivelance Island, near Charlestown, to fetch supplies but there being some information sent to the governor, he sent for Colonel Rhett, and desired him to go in pursuit of Bonnet, and accordingly gave him a commission for that purpose. Wherefore the colonel, with proper craft and some men, went away that night for Swillivan's Island, and, after a very diligent search, discovered Bonnet and Harriet together. The colonel's men fired upon them, and killed Harriet upon the spot, and wounded one negro and an Indian. Bonnet submitted and surrendered himself, and the next morning, being November the 6th, was brought by Colonel Rhett to Charlestown, and, by the governor's warrant, was committed into safe custody, in order for his being brought to his trial. On the 28th of October, 1718, a court of vice-admiralty was held at Charlestown in South Carolina, and, by several adjournments, continued to Wednesday the 12th of November following, for the trial of the pirates taken in a sloop formerly called the Revenge, but afterward the Royal James, before Nicholas Trott, Esquire, Judge of the Vice-Admiralty, and Chief Justice of the said province of South Carolina, and other assistant judges. The King's commission to Judge Trott was read, and a grand jury sworn for the finding of the several bills, and a learned charge given them by the said judge, wherein he first showed that the sea was given by God for the use of men and is subject to dominion and property as well as the land. Secondly, he particularly remarked to them the sovereignty of the King of England over the British seas. Thirdly, he observed that as commerce and navigation could not be carried on without laws, so there have been always particular laws for the better ordering and regulating marine affairs with an historical account of these laws and origin. Fourthly, he proceeded to show that there have been particular courts and judges appointed, to whose jurisdiction maritime causes do belong, and that in matters both civil and criminal. And then, fifthly, he particularly showed them the constitution and jurisdiction of that court of admiralty sessions. And lastly, the crimes cognizable therein, and particularly enlarged upon the crime of piracy, which was then brought before them. The indictments being found, a petite jury was sworn, and the following persons arraigned and tried. 
Steed Bonnet, alias Edwards, alias Thomas, late of Barbados, Mariner. Robert Tucker, late of the island of Jamaica, Mariner. Edward Robinson, late of Newcastle upon Tyne, Mariner. Neil Patterson, late of Aberdeen, Mariner. William Scott, late of Aberdeen, Mariner. William Eddy, alias Neddy, late of Aberdeen, Mariner. Alexander Anand, late of Jamaica, Mariner. George Rose, late of Glasgow, Mariner. George Duncan, late of Glasgow, Mariner. Thomas Nicholas, late of London, Mariner. John Ridge, late of London, Mariner. Matthew King, late of Jamaica, Mariner. Daniel Perry, late of Guernsey, Mariner. Henry Virgin, late of Bristol, Mariner. James Robbins, alias Rattle, late of London, Mariner. James Mullet, also Millet, late of London, Mariner. Thomas Price, late of Bristol, Mariner. James Wilson, late of Dublin, Mariner. John Lopez, late of Oporto, Mariner. Zachariah Long, late of the province of Holland, Mariner. Job Bailey, late of London, Mariner. John William Smith, late of Charlestown, Carolina, Mariner. Thomas Carmen, late of Maidstone in Kent, Mariner. John Thomas, late of Jamaica, Mariner. William Morrison, late of Jamaica, Mariner. Samuel Booth, late of Charlestown, Mariner. William Hewitt, late of Jamaica, Mariner. John Levitt, late of North Carolina, Mariner. William Levers, alias Evelis. John Brierley, alias Timberhead, late of Bathtown in North Carolina, Mariner. Robert Boyd, late of Bathtown aforesaid, Mariner. Roland Sharp of Bathtown, Mariner. John Clark, late of Charlestown, South Carolina, Mariner. Thomas Gerard, late of Antigua, Mariner. And all except the three last and Thomas Nicholas were found guilty and received sentence of death. They were most of them tried upon two indictments, as follows. The jurors for our sovereign lord the king do upon their oath present that Steed Bonnet, late of Barbados, Mariner, Robert Tucker, etc., the second day of August in the fifth year of the reign of our sovereign lord George, etc., by force of arms upon the high sea in a certain place called Cape James, etc., did piratically and feloniously set upon, break, board, and enter a certain merchant sloop called the Francis, Peter Manwaring, commander, by force, etc., upon the high sea, in a certain place called Cape James, alias Cape Inlope, about two miles distant from the shore, in the latitude of thirty-nine or thereabouts, and within the jurisdiction of the Court of Vice-Admiralty of South Carolina, being a sloop of certain persons, to the jurors unknown, and then and there piratically and feloniously did make an assault in and upon the said Peter Manwaring, and others, his mariners, whose names to the jurors aforesaid are unknown, in the same sloop against the peace of God, and of our said now sovereign lord the king, then and there being piratically and feloniously, did put the aforesaid Peter Manwaring and others, his mariners of the same sloop, in the sloop aforesaid, then being in corporal fear of their lives, then and there in the sloop aforesaid, upon the high sea, in the place aforesaid called Cape James, alias Cape Inlopen, about two miles from the shore, in the latitude of thirty-nine or thereabouts, as aforesaid, and within the jurisdiction aforesaid, piratically and feloniously did steal, take, and carry away the said merchant sloop called the Francis, and also twenty-six hogsheads, etc., 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 being found in the aforesaid sloop in the custody and possession of the said Peter Manwaring and others, his mariners of the said sloop, and from their custody and possession then and there upon the high sea aforesaid, called Cape James, alias Cape Inlopen, as aforesaid, and within the jurisdiction aforesaid against the peace of our now sovereign lord the king, his crown and dignity. This was the form of the indictments they were arraigned upon and though they might have proved several more facts upon the major part of the crew, the court thought fit to prosecute but two. The other was for seizing in a piratical and felonious manner the sloop Fortune, Thomas Reed, commander, which indictment, running in the same form with the above mentioned, it will be unnecessary to say more of it. 
all of the prisoners arraigned pleaded not guilty and put themselves upon their trials except James Wilson and John Levitt, who pleaded guilty to both indictments and Daniel Perry to one only. The major would have gone through both the indictments at once, which the court not admitting he pleaded not guilty to both indictments, but being convicted of one, he retracted his former plea to the second indictment and pleaded guilty to it. The prisoners made little or no defense, everyone pretending only that they were taken off a maroon shore and were shipped with Major Bonnet to go to St. Thomas's, but being out at sea and wanting provisions, they were obliged to do what they did by others, and so did Major Bonnet himself pretend that t'was force, not inclination, that occasioned what had happened. However, the facts being plainly proved, and that they had all shared ten or eleven pounds a man, excepting the three last, and Thomas Nichols, they were all but they found guilty. The judge made a very grave speech to them, setting forth the enormity of their crimes, the condition they were now in, and the nature and necessity of an unsigned repentance, and then recommended them to the ministers of the province for more ample directions to fit them for eternity. For, concluded he, the priests' lips shall keep knowledge, and you shall seek the law at their mouths, for they are the messengers of the Lord, Matthew 2.57, and the ambassadors of Christ, and unto them is committed the word or doctrine of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 19 and 20, and then pronounced sentence of death upon them. On Saturday, November 8, 1711, Robert Tucker, Edward Robinson, Neil Patterson, William Scott, Job Bailey, John William Smith, John Thomas, William Morrison, Samuel Booth, William Hewitt, William Eddy, alias Neddy, Alexander Anand, George Ross, George Duncan, Matthew King, Daniel Perry, Henry Virgin, James Robbins, James Mullet, alias Millet, Thomas Price, John Lopez, and Zachariah Long were executed at the White Point near Charlestown pursuant to their sentence. As for the captain, his escape protracted his fate and spun out his life a few days longer, for he was tried on the 10th, and being found guilty received a sentence in like manner as the former, before which Judge Trott made a most excellent speech to him, rather somewhat too long to be taken into our history, yet I could not tell how to pass by so good and useful a piece of instruction, not knowing whose hands this book may happen to fall into. The Lord Chief Justice's speech upon his pronouncing sentence on Major Steed Bonnet. Major Steed Bonnet, you stand here convicted upon two indictments of piracy, one by the verdict of the jury and the other by your own confession. Although you were indicted but for two facts, yet you know that at your trial it was fully proved, even by an unwilling witness, that you piratically took and rifled at no less than thirteen vessels since you sailed from North Carolina so that you might have been indicted and convicted of eleven more acts of piracy since you took the benefit of the king's act of grace and pretended to leave that wicked course of life, not to mention the many acts of piracy you committed before, for which if your pardon from man was never so authentic, yet you must expect to answer for them before God. You know that the crimes you have committed are evil in themselves and contrary to the light and law of nature, as well as the law of God, by which you are commanded that you shall not steal, Exodus 20.15, and the Apostle St. Paul expressly affirms that thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6.10. But to theft you have added a greater sin, which is murder. How many you may have killed of those that resisted you in the committing of your former piracies I know not. But this we all know, that besides the wounded, you killed no less than eighteen persons out of those that were sent by lawful authority to suppress you and put a stop to those rapines that you daily acted. And however you may fancy that that was killing men fairly in open fight, yet this know that the power of the sword not being committed into your hands by any lawful authority, you were not empowered to use any force or fight anyone, and therefore those persons that fell in that action and doing their duty to their king and country, were murdered, and their blood now cries out for vengeance and justice against you. For it is the voice of nature, confirmed by the law of God, that whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Genesis 9, chapter 6. 
and considering that death is not the only punishment due to murderers, for they are threatened to have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelations 21, 8, see chapter 22, 15, words which carry that terror with them, that considering your circumstance and your guilt, surely the sound of them must make you tremble, for who can dwell with everlasting burnings? Chapter 33, 14. As the testimony of your conscience must convince you of the great and many evils you have committed, by which you have highly offended God, and provoked most justly his wrath and indignation against you. So I suppose I need not tell you that the only way of obtaining pardon and remission of your sins from God is by a true and unfeigned repentance and faith in Christ, by whose meritorious death and passion you can only hope for salvation. You being a gentleman that have had the advantage of a liberal education, and being generally esteemed a man of letters, I believe it will be needless for me to explain to you the nature of repentance and faith in Christ, they being so fully and so often mentioned in the Scriptures that you cannot but know them. And therefore, perhaps for that reason, it might be thought by some improper for me to have said so much to you, as I have already upon this occasion. Neither should I have done it but that, considering the course of your life and actions, I have just reason to fear that the principles of religion that had been instilled into you by your education have been at least corrupted, if not entirely defaced, by the skepticism and infidelity of this wicked age, and that what time you allowed for study was rather applied to the polite literature and the vain philosophy of the times than a serious search after the law and will of God, as revealed unto us in the Holy Scriptures." For had your delight been in the law of the Lord, and that you had meditated therein day and night, Psalms 1 and 2, you would then have found that God's word was a lamp unto your feet, and a light to your path, Psalm 119, 105, and that you would account all other knowledge but loss, in comparison of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, Phil 3.8 who to them that are called is the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 24, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the word, chapter 2, verse 7. You would then have esteemed the scriptures as the great charter of heaven, and which delivered to us not only the most perfect laws and rules of life, but also discovered to us the acts of pardon from God wherein they have offended those righteous laws. For in them only is to be found the great mystery of fallen man's redemption, which the angels desire to look into. 1 Pet 1.2 And they would have taught you that sin is the debasing of human nature as being a derivation from that purity, rectitude, and holiness in which God created us and that virtue and religion and walking by the laws of God were altogether preferable to the ways of sin and Satan, for that the ways of virtue are ways of pleasantness and all their paths are peace. Proverbs 3.17 But what you could not learn from God's word by reason of your carelessly or but superficially considering the same, I hope the course of his providence and the present afflictions that he hath laid upon you hath now convinced you of the same. For however in your seeming prosperity you might make a mock at your sins, Proverbs 3.17, yet now that you see that God's hand hath reached you and brought you to public justice, I hope your present unhappy circumstances hath made you seriously reflect upon your past actions and course of life, and that you are now sensible of the greatness of your sins and that you find the burden of them intolerable and that therefore being thus laboring and heavy laden with sin, Matthew 11:28, you will esteem that as the most valuable knowledge that can shew you how you can be reconciled to that supreme God that you have so highly offended, and that can reveal to you him who is not only the powerful advocate with the Father for you, 1 John 2, 1, but also who hath paid that debt that is due for your sins by his own death upon the cross for you, and thereby made full satisfaction for the justice of God. And this is to be found nowhere but in God's word, 
which discovers to us that Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world, John 1.29, which is Christ the Son of God. For this know and be assured that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12, but only by the name of the Lord Jesus. But then consider how he invites all sinners to come unto him, and that he will give them rest, Matthew 11.28. For he assures us that he came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10, Matthew 18.11. And hath promised that he that cometh unto him he will in no wise cast out, John 6.37. So that if now you will sincerely turn to him, though late, even at the eleventh hour, Matthew 26, 9, he will receive you. But surely I need not tell you that the terms of his mercy is faith and repentance. And do not mistake the nature of repentance to be only a bare sorrow for your sins, arising from the consideration of the evil and punishment that have now been brought upon you. But your sorrow must arise from the consideration of your having offended a gracious and merciful God. But I shall not pretend to give you any particular directions as to the nature of repentance. I consider that I speak to a person whose offenses have proceeded not so much from his not knowing as his slighting and neglecting his duty. Neither is it proper for me to give advice out of the way of my own profession. You may have that better delivered to you by those who have made divinity their particular study and who by their knowledge as well as their office as being the ambassadors of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20, are best qualified to give you instructions therein. I only heartily wish that what in compassion to your soul I have now said to you upon this sad and solemn occasion, by exhorting you in general to faith and repentance, may have that due effect upon you, that thereby you may become a true penitent. And therefore, having now discharged my duty to you as a Christian, to give you the best counsel I can, with respect to the salvation of your soul, I must now do my office as a judge. The sentence that the law hath appointed to pass upon you for your offenses, and which this court doth hereby award, is that you, the said staid bonnet, shall go from hence to the place from whence you came, and from thence to the place of execution, where you shall be hanged by the neck till you are dead. And the God of infinite mercy be merciful to your soul. End of chapter 4, part 2. Recording by Mike Harris. Chapter 5, part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 5, Part 1. Captain Edward England and His Crew. Edward England went mate of a sloop that sailed out of Jamaica and was taken by Captain Winter, a pirate, just before their settlement at Providence, from whence England had the command of a sloop in the same laudable employment. It is surprising that men of good understanding should engage in a course of life that so much debases human nature and sets them upon a level with the wild beasts of the forest who live and prey upon their weaker fellow creatures. A crime so enormous that it includes almost all others, as murder, rapine, theft, ingratitude, and etc. And though they make these vices familiar to them by their daily practice, yet these men are so inconsistent with themselves that a reflection made upon their honor, their justice, or their courage is looked upon as an offense that ought to be punished with the life of him that commits it. England was one of these men, who seemed to have such a share of reason as should have taught him better things. He had a great deal of good nature, and did not want for courage. He was not avaricious, and always adverse to the ill usage prisoners received. He would have been contented with a moderate plunder, 
and less mischievous pranks could his companions have been brought to the same temper, but he was generally overruled, and, as he was engaged in that abominable society, he was obliged to be a partner in all their vile actions. Captain England sailed to the coast of Africa, after the island of Providence was settled by the English government, and the pirates surrendered to His Majesty's proclamation, and took several ships and vessels, particularly the Cadogan Snow, belonging to Bristol, at Sierra Leone, one Skinner master, who was inhumanely murdered by some of the crew, that had lately been his own men, and served in that said vessel. It seems some quarrel had happened between them, so that Skinner thought fit to remove these fellows on board of a man of war, and at the same time refuse them their wages. Not long afterwards they found means to desert that service, and shipping themselves aboard a sloop in the West Indies, was taken by a pirate, and brought to Providence, and sailed upon the same account along with Captain England. As soon as Skinner had struck to the pirate, he was ordered to come on board in his boat, which he did, and the person that he first cast his eye upon proved to be his old boatswain, who stared him in the face like his evil genius, and accosted him in this manner. "'Ah, Captain Skinner, is it you? The only man I wish to see. I am much in your debt, and now I shall pay you all in your own coin.' The poor man trembled every joint when he found into what company he had fallen, and dreaded the event, as he had reason enough to do so, for the boatswain immediately called to his consorts, laid hold of the captain, made him fast to the windlass, and there pelted him with glass bottles, which cut him in a sad manner, after which they whipped him about the deck till they were weary, being deaf to all his prayers and entreaties. And at last, because he had been such a good master to his men, they said he should have an easy death, so they shot him through the head. They took some few things out of the snow, but gave the vessel and all her cargo to Howell Davis, the mate, and the rest of the crew, as will be hereafter mentioned in the chapter of Captain Davis. Captain England took a ship called the Pearl, Captain Tizard, commander, for which he exchanged his own sloop, fitted her up for the piratical account, and new christened her the Royal James, with which he took several ships and vessels of different nations at the Azores and Cape de Verde Islands. In the spring of 1719, the rovers returned to Africa, and, beginning at the river Gambia, sailed all down the coast, and between that and Cape Corso, took the following ships and vessels. The Eagle Pink, Captain Ricketts, commander, belonging to Cork, taken the 25th of March, having six guns and seventeen men on board, seven of which turned pirates. The Charlotte, Captain Olson of London, taken May the 26th, having eight guns and eighteen men on board, thirteen of which turned pirates. The Sarah, Captain Stunt of London, taken the 27th of May, having four guns and eighteen men on board, three of which turned pirates. The Bentworth, Captain Gardiner of Bristol, taken the 27th of May, having twelve guns and thirty men on board, twelve of which turned pirates. The Buck Sloop, Captain Sylvester of Gambia, taken the 27th of May, having two guns and two men on board, both turned pirates. The Carteret, Captain Snow of London, taken the 28th of May, having four guns and eighteen men on board, five of which turned pirates. The Mercury, Captain Maggot of London, taken the 29th of May, having four guns and eighteen men on board, five of which turned pirates. The Coward Galley, Captain Creed of London, taken the 17th of June, having two guns and thirteen men on board, four of which turned pirates. The Elizabeth and Catherine, Captain Bridge of Barbados, taken June the 27th, having six guns and fourteen men on board, four of which turned pirates. The Eagle Pink, being bound to Jamaica, the Sarah to Virginia, and the Buck to Maryland, they let them go, but the Charlotte, the Bentworth, the Cataret, 
and the coward galley they burnt, and the Mercury and the Elizabeth and Catherine were fitted up for pirate ships. The former was new-named Queen Anne's Revenge, and commanded by one lane, and the other was called the Klein King, of which Robert Sample was appointed captain. These two left England upon the coast, sailed to the West Indies, where they took some prizes, cleaned and sailed to Brazil in November. They took several Portuguese ships there, and did a great deal of mischief. But in the height of their undertakings, a Portuguese man of war, which was an excellent sailor, came a very unwelcome guest to them, and gave them chase. The Queen Anne's revenge got off, but was lost a little while after upon that coast, and the flying king, giving herself over for lost, ran ashore. There were seventy men on board, twelve of which were killed, and the rest taken prisoners, of whom the Portuguese hanged thirty-eight, of which thirty-two were English, three Dutch, two French, and one of their own nation. England, in going down the coast, took the Peterborough galley of Bristol, Captain Owen, and the Victory, Captain Rideout. The former they detained, but plundered the latter and let her go. In Cape Corso Road they saw two sails at anchor, but before they could reach them they slipped their cables and got close under Cape Corso Castle. These were the Wida, Captain Prince, and the John, Captain Ritter. The pirates upon this made a fire ship of a vessel they had lately taken, and attempted to burn them, as though they had been a common enemy, which, if effected, they could not have been one farthing the better for it. But the castle, firing warmly upon them, they withdrew, and sailed down to Wida Road, where they found another pirate, one Captain Labouche, who, getting thither before England arrived, had forestalled the market and greatly disappointed their brethren. Captain England, after this balk, went into a harbor, cleaned his own ship, and fitted up the Peterborough, which he called the Victory. They lived there very wantonly for several weeks, making free with the Negro women, and committing such outrageous acts that they came to an open rupture with the natives, several of whom they killed, and one of their town they set on fire. When pirates came out to sea, they put it to a vote what voyage to take, and the majority carrying it for the East Indies, they shaped their course accordingly, and arrived at Madagascar the beginning of the year 1720. They stayed not long there, but after taking in water and provisions, sailed for the coast of Malabar, which is a fine, fruitful country in the East Indies, in the empire of the Mogul, but immediately subject to its own princes. It reaches from the coast of Canara to Cape Cameron, which is between 7 degrees 30 and 12 degrees north latitude, and in about 75 degrees east longitude, counting from the meridian of London. The old natives are pagans, but there is a great number of Mohammedans inhabiting among them, who are merchants and generally rich. On the same coast, but in a province to the northwest, lies Goa, Surat, Bombay, where the English, Dutch, and Portuguese have settlements. Hither our pirates came, having made a tour of half the globe, as the psalmists say of the devils, going about like roaring lions and seeking whom they might devour. They took several country ships, that is, Indian vessels, and one European, a Dutch ship, which they exchanged for one of their own, and then came back to Madagascar. They sent several of their hands on shore with tents, powder, and shot to kill hogs, venison, and such other fresh provisions as the island afforded. And a whim came into their heads to seek out for the remains of Avery's crew, who they knew to be settled somewhere in the island. Accordingly, some of them traveled several days' journey without hearing any intelligence of them, and so were forced to return with the loss of their labor for these men were settled on the other side of the island, and has been taking notice of under the chapter of Avery. They stayed not long here, after they had cleaned their ships, but sailing to Juana, they met two English and one Austin Indian men, coming out of that harbor, one of which, after a desperate resistance, they took. 
the particulars of which action is at length related in the following letter, wrote by the captain from Bombay. A letter from Captain Macra, dated at Bombay, November 16th, 1720. We arrived the 25th of last July in company of the Greenwich at Juana, an island not far from Madagascar, and putting in there to refresh our men, we found fourteen pirates that came in their canoes from the Mayota, where the pirate ship to which they belonged, these the Indian Queen, 250 tons, 28 guns, and 90 men, commanded by Captain Oliver de la Bouche, bound from the Guinea coast to the East Indies, had been boogled and lost. They said they left the captain and forty of their men building a new vessel to proceed on their wicked design. Captain Kirby and I, concluding it might be of great service to the East India Company to destroy such a nest of rogues, were ready to sail for that purpose the 17th of August, about eight o'clock in the morning, when we discovered two pirate ships standing into the bay of Juana, one of thirty-four and the other of thirty guns. I immediately went on board the Greenwich, where they seemed very diligent in preparations for an engagement, and I left Captain Kirby with mutual promise of standing by each other. I then unmoored and got under sail, and brought two boats ahead to row me close to the Greenwich. But he, being open to a valley and a breeze, made the best of his way from me, which an Ostender in our company of twenty-two guns seen did the same, though the captain had promised heartily to engage with us, and I believe would have been as good as his word if Captain Kirby had kept his. About in half an hour after twelve, I called several times to the Greenwich to bear down to our assistance, and fired shot at him, but to no purpose. For though we did not doubt but he would join us, because when he got about a league from us, he brought his ship to, and looked on. Yet both he and the Ostender basely deserted us, and left us engaged with barbarous and inhumane enemies, with their black and bloody flags hanging over us, without the least appearance of escaping being cut to pieces. But God in his good providence determined otherwise, for notwithstanding their superiority, we engaged them both about three hours, during which the biggest received some shot betwixt wind and water, which made her keep off a little to stop her leaks. The other endeavored all she could to board us, by rowing with her oars, being within half a ship's length of us above an hour. But by good fortune we shot all her oars to pieces, which prevented them, and by consequence saved our lives. About four o'clock most of the officers and men posted on the quarter-deck, being killed and wounded, the largest ship making up to us with all diligence, being still within a cable's length of us, often giving us a broadside, and no hopes of Captain Kirby's coming to our assistance, we endeavored to run ashore, and though we drew four-foot water more than the pirate, it pleased God that he struck fast on a higher ground than we happily fell in with, so was disappointed a second time from boarding us. Here we had a more violent engagement than before. All my officers and most of my men behaved with unexpected courage, and as we had a considerable advantage by having a broadside to his bow, we did him great damage. So that had Captain Kirby come in then, I believe we should have taken both, for we had one of them sure, but the other pirate, who was still firing at us, Seeing the Greenwich did not offer to assist us, he supplied his consort with three boatfuls of fresh men. About five in the evening the Greenwich stood clear away to sea, leaving us struggling hard for life in the very jaws of death, which the other pirate that was afloat, seeing, got a warp out, and was hauling under our stern, by which time many of my men being killed and wounded and no hopes left from being all murdered by enraged barbarous conquerors, I ordered all that could to get into the longboat under the cover of the smoke of our guns, so that with what some did in boats and others by swimming, most of us that were able got ashore by seven o'clock. When the pirates came aboard, they cut three of our wounded men to pieces. I, with a few of my people, made what haste I could 
to the Kingstown, twenty-five miles from us, where I arrived next day, almost dead with fatigue and loss of blood, having been sorely wounded in the head by a musket ball. At this town I heard that the pirates had offered ten thousand dollars to the country people to bring me in, which many of them would have accepted, only they knew the king and all his chief people were in my interest. Meantime, I caused a report to be spread that I was dead of my wounds, which much abated their fury. About ten days after, being pretty well recovered, and hoping the malice of our enemies was nigh over, I began to consider the dismal condition we were reduced to, being in a place where we had no hopes of getting a passage home, all of us in a manner naked, not having had time to get another shirt or a pair of shoes. Having obtained leave to go on board the pirates, and a promise of safety, several of the chief of them knew me, and some of them had sailed with me, which I found of great advantage, because, notwithstanding their promise, some of them would have cut me, and all that would not enter with them to pieces, had it not been for the chief captain, Edward England, and some others I knew. They talked of burning one of their ships, which we had so entirely disabled, as to be no further useful to them, and to lift the Cassandra in her room. But in the end I managed my tack so well that they made me a present of the said shattered ship, which was Dutch-built, called the Fancy, about three hundred tons, and also a hundred and twenty-nine bales of the company's cloth, though they would not give me a rag of my clothes." They sailed the 3rd of September, and with jury masts and such old sails as they left me, I made shift to do the like on the 8th, together with 43 of my ship's crew, including two passengers and 12 soldiers, having but five tons of water aboard, and after a passage of 48 days, I arrived here, October 26, almost naked and starving, having been reduced to a pint of water a day, and almost in despair of ever seeing land, by reason of the calms we met with between the coast of Arabia and Malabar. We had in all thirteen men killed and twenty-four wounded, and were told that we had destroyed about ninety or a hundred of the pirates. When they left us, they were about three hundred whites and eighty blacks in both ships. I am persuaded, had our confort the Greenwich done his duty, we had destroyed both of them, and got two hundred thousand pounds for our owners and selves, whereas to his deserting us the loss of the Cassandra may justly be imputed. I have delivered all the bales that were given to me into the company's warehouse, for which the governor and council have ordered me a reward. Our governor, Mr. Boone, who is extremely kind and civil to me, has ordered me home with his packet, but Captain Harvey who had a prior promise being come in with the fleet, goes in my room. The governor has promised me a country voyage to help make me up my losses, and would have me stay to go home with him next year. Captain Macra certainly run a great hazard in going aboard the pirate, and began quickly to repent his credulity, for though they had promised that no injury should be done to his person, he found their words were not to be trusted and it may be supposed that nothing but the desperate circumstances Captain Macra imagined himself to be in could have prevailed upon him to fling himself and company into their hands, perhaps not knowing how firmly the natives of the island were attached to the English nation. For about twenty years ago, Captain Cornwall, commodore of an English squadron, assisted them against another island called Mohila, for which they have ever since communicated all the grateful offices in their power, insomuch that it became a proverb that an Englishman and a Juana man were all one. England was inclined to favor Captain Macra, but he was so free to let him know that his interest was declining amongst them, and that the pirates were so provoked at the resistance he had made against them that he was afraid he should hardly be able to protect him. He therefore advised him to sooth up, and manage the temper of Captain Taylor, a fellow of a most barbarous nature, who was become a great favorite amongst them, for no other reason 
than because he was a greater brute than the rest. Macra did what he could to soften this beast, and plied him with warm punch, notwithstanding which they were in a tumult whether they should make an end to him or no, when an accident happened which turned to the favor of the poor captain. A fellow with a terrible pair of whiskers and a wooden leg, being struck around with pistols like the man in an almanac with darts, comes swearing and vaporing upon the quarter-deck, and asks in a damning manner which was Captain Macra. The captain expected no less than that this fellow would be his executioner, but when he came near him he took him by the hand, swearing, damn him, he was glad to see him, and show me the man, says he, that offers to hurt Captain Macra, for I'll stand by him, and so with many oaths he told him he was an honest fellow, and they had formerly sailed with him. This put an end to the dispute, and Captain Taylor was so mellowed with the punch that he consented that the old pirate ship and so many bales of cloth should be given to Captain Macra, and so he fell asleep. England advised Captain Macra to get off with all expedition, lest when the beast should awake he might repent his generosity, which advice was followed by the captain. Captain England, having sided so much to Captain Macra's interest, was a means of making him many enemies among the crew, they thinking such good usage inconsistent with their polity, because it looked like procuring favor at the aggravation of their crimes. Therefore, upon imagination or report that Captain Macra was fitting out against them with the company's force, he was soon abdicated or pulled out of his government and marooned with three more on the island of Mauritius, an island, indeed, not to be complained of. Had they accumulated any wealth by their villainies, that would have afforded some future comfortable prospect, for it abounds with fish, deer, hogs, and other flesh. Sir Thomas Herbert says, The shores with coral and ambergris, but I believe the Dutch had not deserted it, had there been much of these commodities to have been found. It was in 1722 resettled by the French, who have a fort at another neighboring island called Don Mascarine, and are touched at for water, wood, and refreshments by French ships bound to or for India, as St. Helena and Cape Bon Esperance are by us and the Dutch. From this place, Captain England and his companions, having made a little boat of staves and old pieces of deal left there, went over to Madagascar, where they subsist at present on the charity of some of their brethren, who had made better provisions for themselves than they had done. The pirates detained some officers and men belonging to Captain Macra, and, having repaired the damages received in their rigging, they sailed for India. The day before they made land saw two ships to the eastward, who at first sight they took to be English, and ordered one of the prisoners who had been an officer with Captain Macra, to tell them the private signals between the company's ships, the captain swearing he would cut him in pound pieces if he did not do it immediately, but unable was forced to bear their scrutiny till they came up with them and found they were two more ships from Muscat with horses. They brought the captain of them and the merchants on board, torturing them and rifling the ships in order to discover riches, as believing they came from Mocha. But being balked in their expectation, and next morning seeing land, and at the same time a fleet in shore plying to windward, they were puzzled how to dispose of them. To let them go was to discover and ruin the voyage, and it was cruel to sink the men and horses with the ships, as many of them were inclined to. Therefore, as a medium, they brought them to anchor, threw all their sails overboard, and cut one of the ship's masts half through. While they lay at anchor, and were all the next day employed in taking out water, one of the after-mentioned fleet bore towards them, with English colors, answered with a red ensign from the pirates, but did not speak with one another. At night they left the Muscat ships, weighed with the sea wind, and stood to the northward after this fleet. About four next morning, just as they were getting under sail with the land wind, the pirates came amongst them, 
made no stop, but fired their great and small guns very briskly till they got through, and as daylight cleared, were in a great consternation in their minds, having all along taken them for Angria's fleet. What to do was the point, whether to run or pursue. They were sensible of their inferiority of strength, having no more than three hundred men in both ships, and forty of them negroes besides. The victory had them four pumps at work, and must inevitably been lost, had it not been for some hand pumps and several pair of standards brought out of the Cassandra to relieve and strengthen her. But observing the indifferency of the fleet, chose rather to chase than run, and though the best way to save themselves was to play at bull-beggar with the enemy. So they came up with a sea-wind, about gunshot to leeward, the great ships of the fleet ahead, and some others astern, which latter they took for fire-vessels. And these ahead gaining from them, by cutting away their boats, they could do nothing more than continue their course all night, which they did, and found them next morning out of sight, excepting a catch and some few gallivants. Small sort of vessels, something like the Falecas of the Mediterranean, and hoists like them triangular sails. They bore down, which the catch perceiving, transported her people on board a gallivant, and set fire to her. The others proved too nimble and made off. The same day they chased another gallivant, and took her, being come from Gogo, bound for Calicut, with cotton. Of these men they inquired concerning the fleet, supposing they must have been in it, and although they protested they had not seen a ship or boat since they left Gogo, and pleaded very earnestly for favor, yet they threw all their cargo overboard, and squeezed their joints in a vice to extort confession. But they, entirely ignorant of who or what this fleet should be, were obliged not only to sustain this torment, but next day, a fresh easterly wind having split the Galvin's sails, they put her company into the boat with nothing but a trysail, no provisions, and only four gallons of water, half of it salt, and then, out of sight of land, to shift for themselves. End of Chapter 5, Part 1 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Real Medina, Texas Chapter 5, Part 2 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Harris. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 5, Part 2. For the better elucidating of this story, it may be convenient to inform the reader why Angria is, and what the fleet were, that had so scurvily behaved themselves. Angria is a famous Indian pirate, of considerable strength and territories, that gives continual disturbance to the European, especially the English, trade. His chief hold is Calaba, not many leagues from Bombay, and has one island in sight of that port, whereby he gains frequent opportunities of annoying the company. It would not be so insuperable a difficulty to suppress him if the shallowness of the water did not prevent ships of war coming nigh. And a better art he has of bribing the Mughal's ministers for protection when he finds an enemy too powerful. In the year 1720 the Bombay fleet consisted of four grabs, ships built in India by the company, which have three masts, a prow like a row galley, instead of a boat sprit, about 150 tons, are officered and armed like a man of war for the defense and protection of the trade. The London, Chandois, and two other ships with gallivats, who, besides their proper complements, carry down a thousand men to bombard and batter Gera, a fort belonging to Angria, on the Malabar coast, which they have performed ineffectually, were returning to Bombay, and, to make amends, fell in with the pirates, to the purpose has been already related. Captain Uppen, commodore of that fleet, prudently objecting to Mr. Brown, who went general, that the ships were not to be hazarded, since they sailed without their governor Boone's orders to engage, 
and besides, that they did not come out with such a design. This favorable opportunity of destroying the pirates angered the governor, and he transferred the command of the fleet to Captain Macrab, who had orders immediately to pursue and engage wherever he met them. The Viceroy of Goa, assisted by the English company's fleet from Bombay, did attempt the reduction of Calaba, his principal place, landed eight or ten thousand men the next year, the English squadron of men of war being then in those seas, but having viewed the fortification well and expended some of their army by sickness and the fatigues of a camp, carefully withdrew again. I returned to the pirates, who, after they had sent away the Galavats people, resolved to cruise to the southward, and the next day, between Goa and Karwar, heard several guns which brought them to an anchor, and they sent their boat on the scent, who returned about two in the morning, and brought word of two grabs lying at anchor in the road. They weighed and ran toward the bay till daylight gave the grabs sight of them, and was but just time enough to get under India Diva Castle out of their reach. This displeased the pirates the more, in that they wanted water, and some were for making a descent that night and taking the island. But it not being approved of by the majority, they proceeded to the southward, and took next in their way a small ship out of Honor Road, with only a Dutchman and two Portuguese on board. They sent one of these on shore to the captain to acquaint him, if he would supply them with some water and fresh provisions, he should have his ship again and the master returned for answer by his mate Frank Harmless, that if they would deliver him possession over the bar, he would comply with their request. The proposal the mate thought was collusive, and they rather jumped into Harmless's opinion, who very honestly entered with them, and resolved to seek water at the Lacadiva Islands. So, having sent the other persons on shore with threats, that he should be the last man they would give quarter to, by reason of this uncivil usage, they put directly for the islands, and arrived there in three days, where, being informed by a Minshaw, they took with the governor of Canwar's pass, of there being no anchor ground among them, and Melinda being the next convenient island, they sent their boats on shore to see if there was any water, and whether it was inhabited or not, who returned with an answer to their satisfaction, viz. that there was abundance of good water, and many houses, but deserted by the men, who had fled to the neighboring islands on the approach of ships, and left only the women and children to guard one another. The women they forced in a barbarous manner to their lusts, and, to require them, destroyed their cocoa trees, and fired several of their houses and churches, I suppose built by the Portuguese who formerly used there in their voyages to India. While they were at this island, they lost three or four anchors by the rockiness of the ground, freshness of winds, and, at last were forced thence by a harder gale than ordinary, leaving seventy people, blacks and whites, and most of their water casks. In ten days they regained the island again, filled their water, and took the people on board. Provisions were very scarce, and they now resolved to visit their good friends the Dutch at Cochin, who, if you will believe these rogues, never fail to supply gentlemen of their profession. After three days' sail they arrived off Telicherry, and took a small vessel belonging to Governor Adams, John Talk Master, whom they brought on board very drunk, and he giving an account of Captain Macra's fitting out, put them in a tempest of passion. A villain, say they, that we have treated so civilly as to give him a ship and other presents, and now to be armed against us he ought to be hanged, and since we cannot show our resentment on him, let us hang the dogs his people who wish him well, and would do the same, if clear. If it be in my power, says the quartermaster, both masters and officers of ships shall be carried with us for the future, only to plague them, damned England. Hence they proceeded to Calicut, where they endeavored to take a large moor ship out of the road, but was prevented by some guns mounted on shore and discharged at them. Mr. Lazenby, who was one of Captain Macraw's officers and detained, was under the deck at this time, and commanded both by the captain and quartermaster of the pirates to tend the braces on the booms, in hopes, it was believed, a shot would take him before they got clear, asking the reason why he was not there before, and when he would have excused himself, threatened on the like neglect to shoot him, at which the other, beginning to expostulate further, and claim their promise of putting him ashore, got an unmerciful beating from the quartermaster. 
Captain Taylor, who was now successor to Captain England, and whose privilege it was to do so, being lame of his hands and unable. The next day, in their passage down, came up with a Dutch galliot, bound for Calicut with limestone, and aboard of her they put Captain Talk and sent him away, and several of the people interceded for Lazenby in vain. For, says Taylor and his party, if we let this dog go, who has heard our designs and resolutions, we overset all our well-advised projections, and particularly this supply we are now seeking for at the hands of the Dutch. It was but one day more before they arrived off Cochin, where, by a fishing canoe, they sent a letter on shore, and in the afternoon, with the sea-breeze, ran into the road and anchored, saluting the fort with eleven guns each ship, and received the return in an equal number. A good omen of the welcome reception they found, for at night there came on board a large boat deeply laden with fresh provisions and liquors, and with it a servant, of a favorable inhabitant, called John Trumpet. He told them they must immediately weigh and run farther to the southward, where they should be supplied with all things they wanted, naval stores or provisions. They had not been long at anchor again before they had several canoes on board with both black and white inhabitants, who continued without interruption all good offices during their stay. Particularly John Trumpet brought a large boat of arrack, than which nothing could be more pleasing, about ninety ledgers, as also sixty bales of sugar, an offering, it's presumed, from the governor and his daughter, who in return had a fine table-clock sent him, the plunder of Captain Macraw's ship, and she a large gold watch, earnests of the pay they designed to make. When they had all on board, they paid Mr. Trumpet to his satisfaction. It was computed six or seven thousand pounds. It gave him good three cheers, eleven guns each ship, and throwed ducatoons into his boat by the handfuls, for the boatman to scramble for. That night, being little wind, did not weigh, and Trumpet in the morning waked them to the sight of more arrack, chests of peace goods, and ready-made clothes, bringing the fiscal of the place also with him. At noon, while those were on board, saw a sail to the southward, which they weighed and chased after, but she having a good off, got to the northward of them, and anchored a small distance from Cochin Fort. The aforementioned gentlemen, assuring them that they would not be molested in taking her from under the castle, solicited beforehand for the buying her, and advised them to stand in, which they did boldly, to board her. But when they came within a cable's length or two of the chase, now near shore, the fort fired two small guns, whose shot falling nigh their muzzles, they instantly bore out of the road, made an easy sail to the southward, and anchored at night in their former berth, where John Trumpet, to engage their stay a little longer, informed them that in a few days a very rich ship was to pass by, commanded by the general of Bombay's brother. This governor is an emblem of foreign power. What inconvenience and injury must the master's subjects sustain under one who can truckle to such treacherous and base means as corresponding and trading with pirates to enrich himself? Certainly such a man will stickle at no injustice to repair or make a fortune. He has the argumentum basiluma always in his hands, and can convince when he pleases in half the time of other arguments that fraud and oppression is law, that he employs instruments in such dirty work, expresses the guilt and shame, but no way mitigates the crime. John Trumpet was the tool, but, as the dog said in the fable on another occasion, what is done by the master's orders is the master's actions. I cannot but reflect on this occasion what a vile government Sancho Pancho had of it. He had not only such perquisites rescinded, but was really almost starved the victuals taken from him almost every day, and only under a pretense of preserving His Excellency's health. But governments differ. From Cochin, some were for proceeding to Madagascar directly, others thought it proper to cruise till they got a store-ship, and these being the majority, they plied to the southward, and after some days saw a ship in shore, which being to windward of them they could not get nigh, till the sea-wind and night favoring they separated one to the northward, the other to the southward, thinking to enclose her between. But to their astonishment, and contrary to expectation, when day broke, instead of the chase, found themselves very near five sail of tall ships, 
who, immediately making a signal for the pirates to bear down, put them in the utmost confusion, particularly Taylor's ship, because their consort was at a distance from them, at least three leagues to the southward, they stood to one another and joined, and then together made the best of their way from the fleet, whom they judged to be commanded by Captain Macraw, of whose courage, having experience, they were glad to shun any further taste of. In three hours' chase, none of the fleet gaining upon them, excepting one grab, their dejected countenances cleared up again, the more in that a calm succeeded for the remainder of that day, and in the night, with the land wind, they ran directly off shore, and found, next day, to their great consolation, that they had lost sight of all the fleet. This danger escaped, they proposed to spend Christmas, the Christmas of 1720, in carousing and forgetfulness, and kept it for three days in a wanton and riotous way, not only eating, but wasting their fresh provisions in so wretched and inconsiderable a manner, that when they had agreed after this to proceed to Mauritius, they were in that passage at an allowance of a bottle of water per diem, and not above two pounds of beef and a small quantity of rice for ten men for a day. So that had it not been for the leaky ship, which once they were about to have quitted and had done, but for a quantity of arrack and sugar she had on board, they most of them would have perished. In this condition they arrived at the island of Mauritius about the middle of February, sheathed and refitted the victory, and on the 5th of April sailed again, leaving this terrible inscription on one of the walls, Left this place the 5th of April to go to Madagascar for limes, and this least, like lawyers and men of business, any visits should be paid in their absence. However, they did not sail directly for Madagascar, but the island Mascarene, and luckily, as rogues could wish, they found at their arrival on the 8th a Portuguese ship at anchor of seventy guns, but most of them thrown overboard, her masts lost, and so much disabled by a violent storm they had met in the latitude of thirteen degrees south, that she became a prize to the pirates, with very little or no resistance, and a glorious one indeed, having the Conde de Arecra, viceroy of Goa, who made that fruitless expedition against Angria the Indian, and several other passengers on board, who, as they could not be ignorant of the treasure she had in, did assert that in the single article of diamonds there was to the value of between three and four millions of dollars. The viceroy, who came on board that morning in expectation of the ship's being English, was made a prisoner, and obliged to ransom. But, in consideration of his great loss, the prize being part his own, they agreed after some demurrings to accept two thousand dollars, and set him and the other prisoners ashore, with promises to leave a ship that they might transport themselves, because the island was not thought in a condition to maintain so great a number, and though they had learned from them the account of an Ostender being to leeward of the island, which they took on that information, being formerly the Greyhound Galley of London, and could conveniently have complied with so reasonable a request, Yet they sent the Ostander with some of their people to Madagascar with news of their success, and to prepare masts for the prize, and followed themselves soon after, without regard to the sufferers carrying two hundred Mozambique negroes with them in the Portuguese ship. Madagascar is an island larger than Great Britain, most of it within the Tropic of Capricorn, and lays east from the eastern side of Africa. It abounds with provisions of all sorts oxen, goats, sheep, poultry, fish, citrons, oranges, tamarinds, dates, coconuts, bananas, wax, honey, rice, or, in short, cotton, indigo, or any other thing they will take pains to plant, and have understanding to manage. They have likewise ebony, a hard wood like Brazil, of which they make their lances, and gum of several sorts, bends in dragon blood, aloes, etc., what is most incommodious are the numerous swarms of locusts on the land, and crocodiles or alligators in their rivers. Hither, in St. Augustine's Bay, the ships sometimes touch for water, when they take the inner passage for India, and do not design to stop at Joanna. And we may observe from the sixth general voyage set forth by the East India Company, in confirmation of what is hereafter said in relation to currents in general, that this inner passage, or channel, has its northern and southern currents strongest 
where the channel is narrowest, and is less and varies on different points of the compass as the sea comes to spread again in the passage across the line. Since the discovery of this island by the Portuguese, A.D. 1506, the Europeans, and particularly pirates, have increased a dark mulatto race. There, though still few in comparison with the natives, who are negroes with curled short hair, active and formerly represented malicious and revengeful, now tractable and communicable, perhaps owing to the favors and generosity in clothing and liquors they from time to time have received from these fellows, who live in all possible friendship, and can, any single man of them, command a guard of two or three hundred at a minute's warning. This is farther the native's interest to cultivate with them, because the island being divided into petty governments and commands, the pirates settled here, who are now a considerable number and have little castles of their own, can preponderate wherever they think fit to aside. When Taylor came with the Portuguese prize here, they found the Ostender had played their men a trick, for they took advantage of their drink, rise upon them, and, as they heard afterwards, carried the ship to Mozambique, whence the governor ordered her for Goa. Here the pirates came, cleaned the Cassandra, and divided their plunder, sharing forty-two small diamonds a man, or in less proportion according to their magnitude, an ignorant or a merry fellow who had only one in this division as being judged equal in value to forty-two small, muttered very much at the lot, and went and broke it in a mortar, swearing afterwards he had a better share than any of them, for he had beat it, he said, into forty-three sparks. Those who were not for running the hazard of their necks with forty-two diamonds, besides other treasure in their pockets, knocked off and stayed with their old acquaintance in Madagascar, on mutual agreements the longer livers to take all, the residue having, therefore, no occasion for two ships, the victory being leaky, she was burnt. The men, as many as would, coming into the Cassandra under the command of Taylor, whom we must leave for a time, projecting either for Cochin to dispose of their diamonds among their old friends the Dutch, or else for the Red or China Seas, to avoid the men of war that continually clamoured in their ears a noise of danger and give the little account we are able of that squadron, who arrived in India early in the year 1721. At Cape Good Hope, in June, the Commodore met with a letter which was left for him by the Governor of Madras, to whom it was wrote by the Governor of Pondicherry, a French factory on the Coromandel coast, signifying the pirates at the writing of it, were then strong in the Indian seas, having eleven sail and fifteen hundred men but that many of them went away about that time for the coast of Brazil and Guinea. Others settled and fortified themselves at Madagascar, Mauritius, Joanna, and Mohilla, and that others under Condon in a ship called the Dragon took a large Moors vessel coming from Iuda and Moco, with thirteen lackeys of rupees on board, i.e. a million three hundred thousand half-crowns, who, having divided the plunder, burnt their ship and prize, and sat down quietly with their other friends at Madagascar. The account contains several other things which we have before related. Commodore Matthews, upon receiving this intelligence, and being fond of the service he came out for, hastened to those islands as the most hopeful places of success. At St. Mary's would have engaged England with promises of favor, if he would communicate what he knew concerning the Cassandra and the rest of the pirates, and assist in the pilotage, but Captain England was wary, and thought this was to surrender at discretion, so they took up the Judah ship's guns that was burnt, and the men of war dispersed themselves on several voyages and cruises afterwards, as was thought likeliest to succeed, though to no purpose. Then the squadron went down to Bombay, were saluted by the fort, and came home. The pirates, I mean those of the Cassandra, now Captain Taylor, fitted the Portuguese man-of-war, and resolved upon another voyage to the Indies, notwithstanding the riches they had heaped up. But as they were preparing to sail, they heard of four men-of-war coming after them to those seas. Therefore they altered their minds, sailed for the main of Africa, and put in at a little place called Delagoa, near the river de Spiritu Sancto, on the coast of Monomotapa, in 268 south latitude, they believed this to be a place of security, 
in regard that the squadron could not possibly get intelligence of them, there being no correspondence over land, nor any trade carried on by sea, between that and the Cape, where the men of war were then supposed to be. The pirates came to in the evening, and were surprised with a few shot from the shore, not knowing of any fortification or European settlement in that part of the world. So they anchored at a distance that night, and, perceiving in the morning a small fort of six guns, they ran up to it and battered it down. This fort was built and settled by the Dutch East India Company a few months before, for what purpose I know not, and having left one hundred fifty men upon the place, they were then dwindled to a third part by sickness and casualties, and never after received any relief or necessaries, so that sixteen of those that were left upon their humble petition were admitted on board the pirates, and all the rest would have had the same favor, they said, had they been any other than Dutch. I mention this as an instance of their ingratitude, who had been so much obliged to their countrymen for support. Here they stayed above four months, careened both their ships, and took their diversions with security, till they had expended all their provisions, and then put to sea, leaving considerable quantities of muslins, chintzes, and such goods behind, to the half-starved Dutchmen, which enabled them to make good pennyworths to the next that came, to whom they bartered for provisions at the rate of three farthings an English yard. They left Delagoa the latter end of December, 1722, but not agreeing where or how to proceed, they concluded to part. So those who were for continuing that sort of life went on board the Portuguese prize, and steered for Madagascar to their friends, with whom I hear they are now settled, and the rest took the Cassandra and sailed for the Spanish West Indies. The mermaid, man of war, happening then to be down on the main with a convoy about thirty leagues from these pirates, would have gone and attacked them, but on a consultation of the masters, whose safety he was particularly to regard, they agreed their own protection was of more service than destroying the pirate, and so the commander was unwillingly withheld. He dispatched a sloop to Jamaica with the news which brought down the Lanceston only a day or two too late, they having just before he came surrendered with all their riches to the governor of Portobello. Here they sat down to spend the fruits of their dishonest industry, dividing the spoil and plunder of nations among themselves, without the least remorse or compunction, satisfying their conscience with this salvo, that other people would have done as much had they the like opportunities. I can't say, but that if they had known what was doing in England at the same time by the South Sea directors, and their directors, they would certainly have had this reflection for their consolation is that whatever robberies they had committed, they might be pretty sure they were not the greatest villains then living in the world. It's a difficult matter to make a computation of the mischief that was done by this crew in about five years' time, which is much more than the plunder they gained, for they often sunk or burnt the vessel they took, as it suited their humor or circumstances, sometimes to prevent giving intelligence, sometimes because they did not leave men to navigate them, and at other times out of wantonness, or because they were displeased at the master's behavior. For one of these it was but to give the word, and down went the ships and cargoes to the bottom of the sea. Since their surrender to the Spaniards, I am informed several of them have left the place and dispersed themselves elsewhere. Eight of them were shipped about November last in one of the South Sea Company's Asiento sloops, and passed for shipwrecked men, came to Jamaica, and there sailed in other vessels, and I know one of them that came to England this spring from that island. Tis said that Captain Taylor has taken a commission in the Spanish service, and commanded the man-of-war that lately attacked the English logwood cutters in the Bay of Honduras. End of chapter 5, part 2, recording by Mike Harris. Chapter 6 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suzanne Houghton The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 6 of Captain Charles Vane and his crew. 
Charles Vane was one of those who stole away the silver which the Spaniards had fished up from the wrecks of the galleons in the Gulf of Florida. And was it Providence, as has been before hinted, when Governor Rogers arrived there with two men of war? All the pirates who were found at this colony of rogues submitted and received certificates of their pardon, except Captain Vane and his crew, who, as soon as they saw the men of war enter, slipped their cable, set fire to a prize they had in the harbor, and sailed out with their piratical colors flying, firing at one of the men of war as they went off. Two days after they went out, they met with a sloop belonging to Barbados, which they made prize of, and kept the vessel for their own use, putting aboard five-and-twenty hands, with one Yates to command them. A day or two afterwards, they fell in with a small interloping trader with a quantity of Spanish pieces of eight aboard, bound into Providence, called the John and Elizabeth which they also took along with them. With these two sloops, Vane went to a small island and cleaned, where they shared their booty, and spent some time in a riotous manner of living, as is the custom of pirates. The latter end of May 1718 they sailed, and being in want of provisions, they beat up for the Windward Islands, and met with a Spanish sloop bound from Puerto Rico to the Havana, which they burnt, and stowed the Spaniards in a boat, and left them to get to the island by the light of their vessel. But steering between St. Christopher's and Anguilla, they fell in with a brigantine and a sloop with the cargo they wanted, from whom they got provisions for sea store. Sometime after this, standing to the northward in the track the old England ships take in their voyage to the American colonies, they took several ships and vessels, which they plundered of what they thought fit, and let them pass. The latter end of August, Vane, with his consort, Yates, came off South Carolina, and took a ship belonging to Ipswich, one Coggershall commander, laden with logwood, which was thought convenient enough for their own business, and therefore ordered their prisoners to work and throw all the lading overboard. But when they had more than half cleared the ship, the whim changed, and then they would not have her. So Coggershall had his ship again, and he was suffered to pursue his voyage home. In this cruise the rover took several other ships and vessels, particularly a sloop from Barbados, Dill, master, a small ship from Antigua, Cock, master, a sloop belonging to Curacao, Richards, master, and a large brigantine, Captain Thompson from Guinea, with ninety-odd negroes aboard. The pirates plundered them all and let them go, putting the negroes out of the brigantine aboard of Yates' vessel, by which means they came back again to the right owners. For Captain Vane, having always treated his consort with very little respect, assuming a superiority over Yates and his small crew, and regarding the vessel but as a tender to his own, gave them a disgust, who thought themselves as good pirates and as great rogues as the best of them. So they caballed together and resolved to take the first opportunity to leave the company, and accept of His Majesty's pardon or set up for themselves, either of which they thought more honorable than to be servants to the former. And the putting aboard so many negroes, where they found so few hands to take care of them, still aggravated the matter, though they thought fit to conceal or stifle their resentments at that time. A day or two afterwards, the pirates lying off at anchor, Yates, in the evening, slipped his cable and put his vessel under sail, standing into the shore, which, when Vane saw, he was highly provoked, and got his sloop under sail to chase his consort, who he plainly perceived had a mind to have no further affairs with him. Vane's brigantine sailing best, he gained ground of Yates, and would certainly have come up with him had he had a little longer run for it. But just as he got over the bar, when Vane came within gunshot of him, he fired a broadside at his old friend, which did him no damage, and so took his leave. Yates came into North Edisto River about ten leagues southward of Charlestown, and sent an express to the governor to know if he and his comrades might have the benefit of His Majesty's pardon and they would surrender themselves to his mercy with the sloops and negroes, which, being granted, they all came up and received certificates, and Captain Thompson, from whom the negroes were taken, had them restored to him for the use of his owners. Vane cruised some time off the bar in hopes to catch Yates at his coming out again, but therein he was disappointed. However, he, unfortunately for them, took two ships from Charlestown, bound home to England. It happened that just at this time, two sloops, well manned and armed, were equipped to go after a pirate, which the governor of South Carolina was informed lay then in Cape Fear River a-cleaning. 
but Colonel Red, who commanded the sloops, meeting with one of the ships that Vane had plundered going back over the bar for such necessaries as had been taken from her, and she giving the colonel an account of her being taken by the pirate Vane, and also that some of her men, while they were prisoners on board of him, had heard the pirates say they should clean in one of the rivers to the southward, he altered his first design, and instead of standing to the northward in pursuit of the pirate in Cape Fear River, he turns to the southward after Vane, who had ordered such reports to be given out on purpose to send any force that should come after him upon a wrong scent, for in reality he stood away to the northward, so that the pursuit proved to be the contrary way. Colonel Rhett's speaking with this ship was the most unlucky thing that could have happened, because it turned him out of the road which in all probability would have brought him into the company of Vane, as well as of the pirate he went after, and so they might have been both destroyed, whereas by the colonel's going a different way he not only lost the opportunity of meeting with one, but if the other had not been infatuated to lie six weeks together at Cape Fear, he would have missed of him likewise. However, the colonel having searched the rivers and inlets as directed for several days without success, at length failed in prosecution of his first design, and met with the pirate accordingly, whom he fought and took, as has been before spoken of in the history of Major Bonnet. Captain Vane went into an inlet to the northward, where he met with Captain Thatch or Teach, otherwise called Blackbeard, whom he saluted, when he found who he was, with his great guns loaded with shot, as is the custom among pirates when they meet, which are fired wide or up into the air. Blackbeard answered the salute in the same manner, and mutual civilities passed for some days, when about the beginning of October Vane took leave and sailed further to the northward. On the 23rd of October, off of Long Island, he took a small brigantine bound from Jamaica to Salem in New England, John Shattuck, master, and a little sloop. They rifled the brigantine and sent her away. From hence they resolved on a cruise between Cape Mace and Cape Nicholas, where they spent some time without seeing or speaking with any vessel, till the latter end of November. Then they fell upon a ship, which, t'was expected, would have struck as soon as their black colors were hoisted. But instead of that, she discharged a broadside upon the pirate, and hoisted colors which showed her to be a French man of war. Vane desired to have nothing further to say to her, but trimmed his sails and stood away from the French man. But Monsieur, having a mind to be better informed who he was, set all his sails and crowded after him. During this chase, the pirates were divided in their resolutions what to do. Vane, the captain, was for making off as fast as he could, alleging the man of war was too strong to cope with. But one John Rackham, who was an officer that had a kind of a check upon the captain, rose up in defense of a contrary opinion, saying that though she had more guns and a greater weight of metal, they might board her, and then the best boys would carry the day. Rackham was well seconded, and the majority was for boarding, but Vane urged that it was too rash and desperate an enterprise, the man of war appearing to be twice their force, and that their brigantine might be sunk by her before they could reach on board. The mate, one Robert Deal, was of Vane's opinion, as were about fifteen more, and all the rest joined with Rackham, the quartermaster. At length, the captain made use of his power to determine this dispute, which in these cases is absolute and uncontrollable, by their own laws, viz. in fighting, chasing, or being chased. In all other matters whatsoever he is governed by a majority. So the brigantine having the heels, as they term it, of the French man, she came clear off. But the next day the captain's behavior was obliged to stand the test of a vote, and a resolution passed against his honor and dignity, branding him with the name of coward, deposing him from the command, and turning him out of the company with marks of infamy and with him went all those who did not vote for boarding the French man-of-war. They had with them a small sloop that had been taken by them some time before, which they gave to Vane and the discarded members, and that they might be in a condition to provide for themselves by their own honest endeavors, they let them have a sufficient quantity of provisions and ammunition along with them. John Rackham was voted captain of the brigantine in Vane's room, and proceeded towards the Caribbee Islands, where we must leave him till we have finished our story of Charles Vane. The sloop sailed for the Bay of Honduras, and Vane and his crew put her into as good a condition as they could, by the way, to follow the old trade. They cruised two or three days off the northwest part of Jamaica, and took a sloop and two pettiagas, and all the men entered with them. The sloop they kept, and Robert Deal went captain of her. 
On the 16th of December, the two sloops came into the bay where they found only one at an anchor called the Pearl of Jamaica, Captain Charles Rowling, master, who got under sail at the sight of them, but the pirate sloops coming near Rowling and showing no colors, he gave them a gun or two, whereupon they hoisted the black flag and fired three guns each at the Pearl. She struck, and the pirates took possession and carried her away to a small island called Barnaco. And there they cleaned, meeting in the way with a sloop from Jamaica, Captain Walden Commander, going down to the bay, which they also made prize of. In February, Vane sailed from Barnaco in order for a cruise, but some days after he was out, a violent tornado overtook him, which separated him from his consort, and after two days' distress, threw his sloop upon a small, uninhabited island near the Bay of Honduras, where she was staved to pieces, and most of her men drowned. Vane himself was saved, but reduced to great straits for want of necessaries, having no opportunity to get anything from the wreck. He lived here some weeks, and was subsisted chiefly by fishermen who frequented the island with small craft from the main to catch turtles, etc. While Vane was upon this island, a ship put in from Jamaica for water, the captain of which, one Holford, an old buccaneer, happened to be Vane's acquaintance. He thought this a good opportunity to get off, and accordingly applied to his old friend, but he absolutely refused him, saying to him, Charles, I shan't trust you aboard my ship unless I carry you a prisoner, for I shall have you caballing with my men, knock me on the head, and run away with my ship a-pirating. Vane made all the protestations of honor in the world to him, but it seems Captain Holford was too intimately acquainted with him to repose any confidence at all in his words or oaths. He told him he might easily find a way to get off if he had a mind to it. I am now going down the bay, says he, and shall return hither in about a month, and if I find you upon the island when I come back, I'll carry you to Jamaica and hang you. Which way can I get away, answers Vane. Are there not fishermen's dories upon the beach? Can't you take one of them, replies Holford. What, says Vane, would you have me steal a dory then? Do you make it a matter of conscience, said Holford, to steal a dory? When you have been a common robber and pirate, stealing ships and cargoes and plundering all mankind that fell in your way? Stay there and be damned if you were so squeamish. And so left him. After Captain Holford's departure, another ship put into the same island in her way home for water, none of whose company knowing Vane, he easily passed upon them for another man, and so was shipped for the voyage. One would be apt to think that Vane was now pretty safe, and likely to escape the fate which his crimes had merited, but here a cross-accident happened that ruined all. Holford, returning from the bay, was met with by this ship, the captains being very well acquainted together. Holford was invited to dine aboard of him, which he did, and as he passed along to the cabin he chanced to cast his eye down the hold and there saw Charles Vane at work. He immediately spoke to the captain, saying, Do you know who you have got aboard here? Why, says he, I have shipped a man at such an island who was cast away in a trading sloop. He seems to be a brisk hand. I tell you, says Captain Holford, it is Vane, the notorious pirate. If it be him, replies the other, I won't keep him. Why then, says Holford, I'll send and take him aboard and surrender him at Jamaica. Which being agreed to, Captain Holford, as soon as he returned to his ship, sent his boat with his mate, armed, who coming to Vane showed him a pistol and told him he was his prisoner, which, none opposing, he was brought aboard and put in irons, and when Captain Holford arrived at Jamaica, he delivered his old acquaintance into the hands of justice, at which place he was tried, convicted, and executed, as was some time before Vane's consort, Robert Deal, brought thither by one of the men of war. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7, Part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suzanne Houghton The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 7, Part 1 Chapter 7 Of Captain John Rackham and His Crew this John Rackham, as has been mentioned in the last chapter, was quartermaster to Vane's company till they were divided, 
and Vane turned out for refusing to board and fight the French man of war. Then Rackham was voted captain of that division that remained in the brigantine. The 24th of November, 1718, was the first day of his command, and his first cruise was among the Caribbean Islands, where he took and plundered several vessels. We have already taken notice that when Captain Woods Rogers went to the island of Providence with the king's pardon to such as should surrender, this brigantine, which Rackham now commanded, made its escape through another passage, bidding defiance to mercy. To windward of Jamaica, a Madeira man fell into the pirate's way, which they detained two or three days till they had made their market out of her, and then gave her back to the master, and permitted one Hosea Tisdall, a tavern keeper at Jamaica, who had been picked up in one of their prizes, to depart in her, she being then bound for that island. After this cruise they went into a small island and cleaned, and spent their Christmas ashore drinking and carousing as long as they had any liquor left, and then went to sea again for more, where they succeeded but too well, though they took no extraordinary prize for above two months, except a ship laden with thieves from Newgate, bound for the plantations, which in a few days was retaken with all her cargo by an English man of war. Rackham stood off toward the island of Bermudas, and took a ship bound to England from Carolina, and a small pink from New England, and brought them to the Bahama Islands, where with the pitch, tar, and stores they cleaned again, and refitted their own vessel. But staying too long in that neighborhood, Captain Rogers, who was governor of Providence, hearing of these ships being taken, sent out a sloop, well manned and armed, which retook both the prizes, and in the meanwhile the pirate had the good fortune to escape. From hence they sailed to the back of Cuba, where Rackham kept a little kind of a family, at which place they stayed a considerable time, living ashore with their Delilahs till their money and provision were expended, and then they concluded it time to look out. They repaired to their vessel, and was making ready to put sea, when a guarda del costa came in, with a small English sloop, which she had taken as an interloper on the coast. The Spanish guard ship attacked the pirate, but Rackham being close in behind a little island, she could do but little execution where she lay. Therefore the Spaniard warps into the channel that evening in order to make sure of her the next morning. Rackham, finding his case desperate, and hardly any possibility of escaping, resolved to attempt the following enterprise. The Spanish prize lying for better security close into the land, between the little island and the main, Rackham takes his crew into the boat with their pistols and cutlasses, rounds the little island, and falls aboard their prize silently in the dead of the night without being discovered, telling the Spaniards that were aboard of her that if they spoke a word or made the least noise they were dead men, and so became master of her. When this was done he slipped her cable and drove out to sea. The Spanish man of war was so intent upon their expected prize that they minded nothing else, and as soon as day broke, made a furious fire upon the empty sloop, but it was not long before they were rightly apprised of the matter, and cursed themselves for fools to be bit out of a good rich prize, as she proved to be, and to have nothing but an old crazy hull in the room of her. Rackham and his crew had no occasion to be displeased at the exchange, that enabled them to continue some time longer in a way of life that suited their depraved tempers. In August 1720 we find him at sea again scouring the harbors and inlets of the north and west parts of Jamaica, where he took several small craft, which proved no great booty to the rovers, but they had but few men, and therefore they were obliged to run at low game till they could increase their company. In the beginning of September they took seven or eight fishing boats in Harbor Island, stole their nets and other tackle, and then went off the French part of Hispaniola, and landed and took cattle away, with two or three French men they found near the waterside, hunting of wild hogs in the evening. The Frenchmen came on board, whether by consent or compulsion, I can't say. They afterwards plundered two sloops and returned to Jamaica, on the north coast of which island, near Porto Maria Bay, they took a schooner, Thomas Spenlow Master. It was then the 19th of October. The next day, Rackham, seeing a sloop in Dry Harbor Bay, he stood in and fired a gun. The men all ran ashore, and he took the sloop and lading, but when those ashore found them to be pirates, they hailed the sloop and let them know they were all willing to come aboard of them. Rackham's coasting the island in this manner proved fatal to him, for intelligence came to the governor of his expedition, by a canoa which he had surprised ashore in Ocho Bay, upon which a sloop was immediately fitted out, 
and sent round the island in quest of him, commanded by Captain Barnett, with a good number of hands. Rackham, rounding the island and drawing near the westernmost point, called Point Negro, saw a small petty auger, which at sight of the sloop run ashore and landed her men. When one of them hailed her, answer was made they were Englishmen, and desired the petty auger's men to come on board and drink a bowl of punch, which they were prevailed upon to do. Accordingly, the company came all aboard of the pirate, consisting of nine persons, in an ill hour. They were armed with muskets and cutlasses, but what was their real design by so doing I shall not take upon me to say. But they had no sooner laid down their arms and taken up their pipes, but Barnett's sloop, which was in pursuit of Rackham's, came in sight. The pirates, finding she stood directly towards her, feared the event, and weighed their anchor, which they but lately let go, and stood off. Captain Barnett gave them chase, and having the advantage of little breezes of wind which blew off the land, came up with her, and after a very small dispute, took her, and brought her into Port Royal in Jamaica. In about a fortnight after the prisoners were brought ashore, viz. November 16, 1720, a court of admiralty was held at St. Iago de la Vega, before which the following persons were convicted and sentence of death passed upon them by the President, Sir Nicholas Laws, viz. John Rackham, Captain, George Featherston, Master, Richard Corner, Quartermaster, John Davis, John Howell, Patrick Carty, Thomas Earl, James Dobbin, and Noah Harwood. The five first were executed the next day at Gallows Point, at the town of Port Royal, and the rest the day after at Kingston. Rackham, Feverston, and Corner were afterwards taken down and hanged up in chains, one at Plum Point, one at Bush Key, and the other at Gun Key. But what was very surprising was the conviction of the nine men that came aboard the sloop the same day she was taken. They were tried at an adjournment of the court on the 24th of January, waiting all that time, it is supposed, for evidence to prove the piratical intention of going aboard the said sloop. For it seems there was no act of piracy committed by them, after their coming on board, as appeared by the witnesses against them, who were two Frenchmen taken by Rackham, off from the island of Hispaniola, and deposed in the following manner. That the prisoners at the bar, viz. John Eaton, Edward Warner, Thomas Baker, Thomas Quick, John Cole, Benjamin Palmer, Walter Rouse, John Hanson, and John Howard, came aboard the pirate sloop at Negro Point, Rackham sending his canoe ashore for that purpose, that they brought guns and cutlasses on board with them, that when Captain Barnett chased them, some were drinking and others walking the deck, that there was a great gun and a small arm fired by the pirate sloop at Captain Barnett's sloop when he chased her, and that when Captain Barnett's sloop fired at Rackham's sloop, the prisoners at the bar went down under deck, that during the time Captain Barnett chased them, some of the prisoners at the bar, but which of them he could not tell, helped to row the sloop in order to escape from Barnett that they all seemed to be consorted together. This was the substance of all that was evidenced against them. The prisoners answered in their defense that they had no witnesses, that they had bought a petty auger in order to go a-turtling, and being at Negro Point and just got ashore, they saw a sloop with a white pennant coming towards them, upon which they took their arms and hid themselves in the bushes that one of them hailed the sloop, who answered they were Englishmen, and desired them to come on board and drink a bowl of punch, which they at first refused, but afterwards, with much persuasion, they went on board, in the sloop's canoe, and left their own petty auger at anchor, that they had been but a short time on board when Captain Barnett's sloop heaved in sight, that Rackham ordered them to help to weigh the sloop's anchor immediately, which they all refused, that Rackham used violent means to oblige them, and that when Captain Barnett came up with them, they all readily and willingly submitted. When the prisoners were taken from the bar and the persons present being withdrawn, the court considered the prisoners' cases, and the majority of the commissioners being of opinion that they were all guilty of the piracy and felony they were charged with, which was the going over with a piratical and felonious intent to John Rackham, etc., then notorious pirates, and by them known to be so, they all received sentence of death, which, everybody must allow, proved somewhat unlucky to the poor fellows. On the 17th of February, John Eaton, Thomas Quick, and Thomas Baker were executed at Gallows Point, at Port Royal, and the next day John Cole, John Howard, and Benjamin Palmer were executed at Kingston. 
Whether the other three were executed afterwards or not, I never heard. Two other pirates were tried that belonged to Rackham's crew, and being convicted were brought up and asked if either of them had anything to say why sentence of death should not pass upon them, in like manner as had been done to all the rest. And both of them pleaded their bellies, being quick with child, and prayed that execution might be stayed, whereupon the court passed sentence, as in cases of piracy, but ordered them back till a proper jury should be appointed to inquire into the matter. End of chapter 7, part 1 Chapter 7, part 2 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Suzanne Houghton The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 7, Part 2 The Life of Mary Reed Now we are to begin a history full of surprising turns and adventures. I mean that of Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, alias Bonn, which were the true names of these two pirates. The odd incidents of their rambling lives are such that some may be tempted to think the whole story no better than a novel or romance. But since it is supported by many thousand witnesses, I mean the people of Jamaica, who were present at their trials and heard the story of their lives upon the first discovery of their sex, the truth of it can be no more contested than that there were such men in the world as Roberts and Blackbeard who were pirates. Mary Reed was born in England. Her mother was married young to a man who used the sea, who, going a voyage soon after their marriage, left her with child, which child proved to be a boy. As to the husband, whether he was cast away or died in the voyage, Mary Reed could not tell, but, however, he never returned more. Nevertheless, the mother, who was young and airy, met with an accident, which has often happened to women who are young and do not take a great deal of care, which was she soon proved with child again, without a husband to father it. But how or by whom, none but herself could tell, for she carried a pretty good reputation among her neighbors. Finding her burthen grow, in order to conceal her shame, she takes a formal leave of her husband's relations, giving out that she went to live with some friends of her own in the country. Accordingly, she went away and carried with her her young son, at this time not a year old. Soon after her departure, her son died. But Providence, in return, was pleased to give her a girl in his room, of which she was safely delivered, in her retreat, and this was our Mary Reed. Here the mother lived three or four years, till what money she had was almost gone. Then she thought of returning to London, and considering that her husband's mother was in some circumstances, she did not doubt but to prevail upon her to provide for the child, if she could but pass it upon her for the same. But the changing a girl into a boy seemed a difficult piece of work, and how to deceive an experienced old woman in such a point was altogether as impossible. However, she ventured to dress it up as a boy, brought it to town, and presented it to her mother-in-law as her husband's son. The old woman would have taken it to have bred it up, but the mother pretended it would break her heart to part with it. So it was agreed betwixt them that the child should live with the mother, and the supposed grandmother should allow a crown a week for its maintenance. Thus the mother gained her point. She bred up her daughter as a boy, and when she grew up to some sense— she thought proper to let her into the secret of her birth, to induce her to conceal her sex. It happened that the grandmother died, by which means the subsistence that came from that quarter ceased, and they were more and more reduced in their circumstances. Wherefore, she was obliged to put her daughter out to wait on a French lady as a footboy, being now thirteen years of age. Here she did not live long, for growing bold and strong, and having also a roving mind, she entered herself on board a man of war, where she served some time, then quitted it, went over into Flanders, and carried arms in a regiment of foot, as a cadet, and though upon all actions she behaved herself with a great deal of bravery, yet she could not get a commission, they being generally bought and sold. Therefore she quitted the service, and took on an regiment of horse. She behaved so well in several engagements, that she got the esteem of all her officers. 
But her comrade, who was a Fleming, happening to be a handsome young fellow, she falls in love with him, and from that time grew a little more negligent in her duty, so that it seems Mars and Venus could not be served at the same time. Her arms and accoutrements, which were always kept in the best order, were quite neglected. Tis true when her comrade was ordered out upon a party, she used to go without being commanded, and frequently run herself into danger where she had no business only to be near him. The rest of the troopers, little suspecting the secret cause which moved her to this behavior, fancied her to be mad. And her comrade himself could not account for this strange alteration in her. But love is ingenious, and as they lay in the same tent, and were constantly together, she found a way of letting him discover her sex, without appearing that it was done with design. He was much surprised at what he found out, and not a little pleased, taking it for granted that he should have a mistress solely to himself which is an unusual thing in a camp, since they're scarce one of those campaign ladies that is ever true to a troop or company, so that he thought of nothing but gratifying his passions with very little ceremony. But he found himself strangely mistaken, for she proved very reserved and modest, and resisted all his temptations, and at the same time was so obliging and insinuating in her carriage that she quite changed his purpose. So far from thinking of making her his mistress, he now courted her for a wife. This was the utmost wish of her heart. In short, they exchanged promises, and when the campaign was over, and the regiment marched into winter quarters, they bought woman's apparel for her, with such money as they could make up betwixt them, and were publicly married. The story of two troopers marrying each other made a great noise, so that several officers were drawn by curiosity to assist at the ceremony, and they agreed among themselves that every one of them should make a small present to the bride, towards housekeeping, in consideration of her having been their fellow-soldier. Thus being set up, they seemed to have a desire of quitting the service, and settling in the world. The adventure of their love and marriage had gained them so much favor that they easily obtained their discharge, and they immediately set up an eating-house, or ordinary, which was the sign of the three horseshoes, near the castle of Breda, where they soon ran into a good trade, a great many officers eating with them constantly. But this happiness lasted not long, for the husband soon died, and the peace of Reswick being concluded, there was no resort of officers to Breda, as usual, so that the widow, having little or no trade, was forced to give up housekeeping, and her substance being by degrees quite spent, she again assumes her man's apparel, and going into Holland, there takes on in a regiment of foot, quartered in one of the frontier towns. Here she did not remain long, there was no likelihood of preferment in time of peace. Therefore she took a resolution of seeking her fortune another way, and withdrawing from the regiment ships herself on board of a vessel bound for the West Indies. It happened this ship was taken by English pirates, and Mary Reed was the only English person on board, they kept her amongst them, and having plundered the ship let it go again. After following this trade for some time the king's proclamation came out, and was published in all parts of the West Indies, for pardoning such pirates who should voluntarily surrender themselves by a certain day therein mentioned. The crew of Mary Reed took the benefit of this proclamation, and, having surrendered, lived quietly on shore. But money beginning to grow short, and hearing that Captain Woods Rogers, governor of the island of Providence, was fitting out some privateers to cruise against the Spaniards, she with several others embarked for that island in order to go upon the privateering account being resolved to make her fortune one way or other. These privateers were no sooner sailed out, but the crews of some of them who had been pardoned rose against their commanders and turned themselves to their old trade. In this number was Mary Reed. It is true she often declared that the life of a pirate was what she always abhorred, and went into it only upon compulsion, both this time and before, intending to quit it, whenever a fair opportunity should offer itself. Yet some of the evidence against her, upon her trial, who were forced men and had sailed with her, deposed upon oath that in times of action no person amongst them were more resolute, or ready to board or undertake anything that was hazardous, as she and Anne Bonny, and particularly at the time they were attacked and taken, when they came to close quarters, none kept the deck except Mary Reed and Anne Bonny and one more upon which she, Mary Reed, called to those under deck to come up and fight like men, and finding they did not stir, fired her arms down the hold amongst them, killing one and wounding others. 
This was part of the evidence against her, which she denied. Which, whether true or no, thus much is certain, that she did not want bravery, nor indeed was she less remarkable for her modesty, according to her notions of virtue. Her sex was not so much as suspected by any person on board, till Anne Bonny, who was not altogether so reserved in point of chastity, took a particular liking to her. In short, Anne Bonny took her for a handsome young fellow, and for some reasons best known to herself, first discovered her sex to Mary Reed. Mary Reed, knowing what she would be at, and being very sensible of her own incapacity that way, was forced to come to a right understanding with her. And so, to the great disappointment of Anne Bonny, she let her know she was a woman also. But this intimacy so disturbed Captain Rackham, who was the lover and gallant of Anne Bonny, that he grew furiously jealous, so that he told Anne Bonny he would cut her new lover's throat, therefore, to quiet him, she let him into the secret also. Captain Rackham, as he was enjoined, kept the thing a secret from all the ship's company, yet notwithstanding all her cunning and reserve, love frowned her out in this disguise and hindered her from forgetting her sex. In their cruise they took a great number of ships belonging to Jamaica, and other parts of the West Indies, bound to and from England. And whenever they met any good artist or other person that might be of any great use to their company, if he was not willing to enter it was their custom to keep him by force. Among these was a young fellow of a most engaging behavior, or at least he was so in the eyes of Mary Reed, who became so smitten with his person and address that she could neither rest night or day. But, as there is nothing more ingenious than love, it was no hard matter for her, who had before been practiced in these wiles, to find a way to let him discover her sex. She first insinuated herself into his liking by talking against the life of a pirate, which he was altogether averse to, so they became messmates and strict companions. When she found he had a friendship for her, as a man, she suffered the discovery to be made by carelessly showing her breasts, which were very white. The young fellow who was made of flesh and blood had his curiosity and desire so raised by this sight that he never ceased importuning her till she confessed what she was. Now begins the scene of love. As he had a liking and esteem for her under her supposed character, it was now turned into fondness and desire. Her passion was no less violent than his, and perhaps she expressed it by one of the most generous actions that ever love inspired. It happened this young fellow had a quarrel with one of the pirates, and their ship then lying at an anchor near one of the islands they had appointed to go ashore and fight, according to the custom of the pirates. Mary Reed was to the last degree uneasy and anxious for the fate of her lover. She would not have had him refuse the challenge because she could not bear the thoughts of his being branded with cowardice. On the other side, she dreaded the event and apprehended the fellow might be too hard for him. When love once enters into the breast of one who has any sparks of generosity, it stirs the heart up to the most noble actions. In this dilemma she showed that she feared more for his life than she did for her own, for she took a resolution of quarreling with this fellow herself, and having challenged him ashore, she appointed the time two hours sooner than that when he was to meet her lover, where she fought him at sword and pistol and killed him upon the spot. It is true she had fought before, when she had been insulted by some of those fellows. But now it was altogether in her lover's cause, she stood, as it were, betwixt him and death, as if she could not live without him. If he had no regard for her before, this action would have bound him to her forever. But there was no occasion for ties or obligations. His inclination towards her was sufficient. In fine, they applied their troth to each other, which Mary Reed said she looked upon to be as good a marriage in conscience as if it had been done by a minister in church and to this was owing her great belly, which she pleaded to save her life. She declared she had never committed adultery or fornication with any man. She commended the justice of the court, before which she was tried, for distinguishing the nature of their crimes. Her husband, as she called him, with several others being acquitted, and being asked who he was, she would not tell, but said he was an honest man and had no inclination to such practices, and that they had both resolved to leave the pirates the first opportunity, and apply themselves to some honest livelihood. It is no doubt, but many had compassion for her. Yet the court could not avoid finding her guilty, for, among other things, one of the evidences against her deposed, 
that being taken by Rackham and detained some time on board, he fell accidentally into discourse with Mary Reed, whom he, taking for a young man, asked her what pleasure she could have in being concerned in such enterprises where her life was continually in danger by fire or sword, and not only so, but she must be sure of dying an ignominious death if she should be taken alive. She answered that as to hanging she thought it no great hardship, for were it not for that every cowardly fellow would turn pirate and so infest the seas that men of courage must starve that if it was put to the choice of the pirates, they would not have the punishment less than death, the fear of which kept some dastardly rogues honest, that many of those who are now cheating the widows and orphans and oppressing their poor neighbors, who have no money to obtain justice, would then rob at sea, and the ocean would be crowded with rogues like the land, and no merchant would venture out, so that the trade in a little time would not be worth following. Being found quick with child, as has been observed, her execution was respited, and it is possible she would have found favor. But she was seized with a violent fever soon after her trial, of which she died in prison. End of chapter 7, part 2 Chapter 7, part 3 Of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 7, Part 3. The Life of Anne Bonny. As we have been more particular in the lives of these two women than those of other pirates, it is incumbent on us as a faithful historian to begin with their birth. Anne Bonny was born at a town near Cork, in the Kingdom of Ireland, her father being an attorney at law. But Anne was not one of his legitimate issue, which seems to cross an old proverb, which says that bastards have the best luck. Her father was a married man, and his wife, having been brought to bed, contracted an illness in her lying in, and in order to recover her health, she was advised to remove for change of air. The place she chose was a few miles distant from her dwelling, where her husband's mother lived. Here she sojourned some time, her husband staying at home to follow his affairs. The servant-maid, whom she left to look after the house and attend the family, being a handsome young woman, was courted by a young man of the same town, who was a tanner. This tanner used to take his opportunities, when the family was out of the way, of coming to pursue his courtship and being with the maid one day as she was employed in the household business, not having the fear of God before his eyes, he takes his opportunity, when her back was turned, of whipping three silver spoons into his pocket. The maid soon missed the spoons, and knowing that nobody had been in the room but herself and the young man since she saw them last, she charged him with taking them. He very stiffly denied it, upon which she grew outrageous, and threatened to go to a constable in order to carry him before a justice of peace. These menaces frightened him out of his wits, well knowing that he could not stand search, wherefore he endeavored to pacify her by desiring to examine the drawers and other places, and perhaps she might find them. In this time he slips into another room where the maid usually lay, and puts the spoons betwixt the sheets, and then makes his escape by a back door, concluding she must find them when she went to bed, and so next day he might pretend he did it only to frighten her, and the thing might be laughed off for a jest. As soon as she'd missed him, she gave over her search, concluding he had carried them off, and went directly to the constable in order to have him apprehended. The young man was informed that a constable had been in search of him, but he regarded it little, not doubting, but all would be well next day. Three or four days passed, and still he was told the constable was upon the hunt for him. This made him lie concealed. He could not comprehend the meaning of it, he imagined no less than that the maid had a mind to convert the spoons to her own use, and put the robbery upon him. It happened at this time that the mistress, being perfectly recovered of her late indisposition, was returned home, in company with her mother-in-law. The first news she heard was of the loss of the spoons, with the manner how the maid telling her at the same time that the young man was run away. The young fellow had intelligence of the mistress's arrival, 
and considering with himself that he could never appear again in his business unless this matter was got over, and she being a good-natured woman, he took a resolution of going directly to her, and of telling her the whole story, only with this difference that he did it for a jest. The mistress could scarce believe it. However, she went directly to the maid's room, and turning down the bedclothes, there, to her great surprise, found the three spoons. Upon this she desired the young man to go home and mind his business, for he should have no trouble about it. The mistress could not imagine the meaning of this. She never had found the maid guilty of any pilfering, and therefore it could not enter her head that she designed to steal the spoons herself. Upon the whole she concluded the maid had not been in her bed from the time the spoons were missed. She grew immediately jealous upon it, and suspected that the maid supplied her place with her husband during her absence, and this was the reason why the spoons were no sooner found. She called to mind several actions of kindness her husband had showed the maid, things that passed unheeded by when they happened, but now she had got that tormentor, jealousy, in her head, amounted to proofs of their intimacy. Another circumstance which strengthened the whole was that though her husband knew she was to come home that day, and had had no communication with her in four months, which was before her last lying in, yet he took an opportunity of going out of town that morning, upon some slight pretense. All these things put together confirmed her in her jealousy. As women seldom forgive injuries of this kind, she thought of discharging her revenge upon the maid. In order to this, she leaves the spoons where she found them, and orders the maid to put clean sheets upon the bed, telling her she intended to lie there herself that night, because her mother-in-law was to lie in her bed, and that she, the maid, must lie in another part of the house. The maid, in making the bed, was surprised with the sight of the spoons, but there were very good reasons why it was not proper for her to tell where she found them, and therefore she takes them up, puts them in her trunk, intending to leave them in some place where they might be found by chance. The mistress, that everything might look to be done without design, lies that night in the maid's bed, little dreaming of what an adventure it would produce. After she had been abed some time, thinking on what had passed, for jealousy kept her awake, she heard somebody enter the room. At first she apprehended it to be thieves, and was so frightened she had not courage enough to call out. But when she heard these words, Mary, are you awake? She knew it to be her husband's voice. Then her fright was over, yet she made no answer lest he should find her out, if she spoke. Therefore she resolved to counterfeit sleep, and take what followed. The husband came to bed, and that night played the vigorous lover. But one thing spoiled the diversion on the wife's side, which was the reflection that it was not designed for her. However, she was very passive, and bore it like a Christian. Early before day she stole out of bed, leaving him asleep, and went to her mother-in-law, telling her what had passed, not forgetting how he had used her as taking her for the maid. The husband also stole out, not thinking it convenient to be catched in that room. In the meantime, the revenge of the mistress was strongly against the maid, and without considering that to her she owed the diversion of the night before, and that one good turn should deserve another, she sent for a constable and charged her with stealing the spoons. The maid's trunk was broke open, and the spoons found, upon which she was carried before a justice of peace, and by him committed to jail. The husband loitered about till twelve o'clock at noon, then comes home, pretended he was just come to town. As soon as he heard what had passed in relation to the maid, he fell into a great passion with his wife. This set the thing into a greater flame. The mother takes the wife's part against her own son, insomuch that the quarrel increasing, the mother and wife took horse immediately and went back to the mother's house, and the husband and wife never bedded together after. The husband loitered about till twelve o'clock at noon, then comes home, pretended he was just come to town. As soon as he heard what had passed in relation to the maid, he fell into a great passion with his wife. This set the thing into a greater flame, the mother taking the wife's part against her own son, insomuch that the quarrel increasing, the mother and wife took horse immediately and went back to the mother's house, and the husband and wife never bedded together after. The maid lay a long time in the prison, it being near half a year to the assizes. But before it happened, it was discovered she was with child. When she was arraigned at the bar, she was discharged for want of evidence. The wife's conscience touched her, and as she did not believe the maid guilty of any theft except that of love, she did not appear against her. 
Soon after her acquittal, she was delivered of a girl. But what alarmed the husband most was that it was discovered that the wife was with child also, he taking it for granted he had had no intimacy with her, since her last lying in grew jealous of her in his turn, and made this a handle to justify himself for his usage of her, pretending now he had suspected her long, but that here was proof she was delivered of twins, a boy and a girl. The mother fell ill, sent to her son to reconcile him to his wife, but he would not hearken to it. Therefore she made a will, leaving all she had in the hands of certain trustees, for the use of the wife and two children lately born, and died a few days after. This was an ugly turn upon him, his greatest dependence being upon his mother. However, his wife was kinder to him than he deserved, for she made him a yearly allowance out of what was left, though they continued to live separate. It lasted near five years, at this time having a great affection for the girl he had by his maid, he had a mind to take it home to live with him, but as all the town knew it to be a girl, the better to disguise the manner from them as well as from his wife, he had it put into breeches as a boy, pretending it was a relation's child he was to breed up to be his clerk. The wife heard he had a little boy at home he was very fond of, but as she did not know any relation of his that had such a child, she employed a friend to inquire further into it. This person, by talking with the child, found it to be a girl, discovered that the servant-maid was its mother, and that the husband still kept up his correspondence with her. Upon this intelligence, the wife being unwilling that her children's money should go towards the maintenance of bastards, stopped the allowance. The husband, enraged, in a kind of revenge, takes the maid home and lives with her publicly, to the great scandal of his neighbors, but he soon found the bad effect of it, for by degrees lost his practice, so that he plainly saw he could not live there. Therefore he thought of removing, and turning what effects he had into ready money, he goes to court, and there with his maid and daughter embarks for Carolina. At first he followed the practice of the law in that province, but afterwards fell into merchandise, which proved more successful to him, for he gained by it sufficient to purchase a considerable plantation. His maid, who passed for his wife, happened to die, after which his daughter, Ariane Bonny, now grown up, kept his house. She was of a fierce and courageous temper, wherefore, when she lay under condemnation, several stories were reported of her, much to her disadvantage as that she had killed an English servant-maid once in her passion with a cape knife, while she looked after her father's house, but upon further enquiry I found this story to be groundless. It was certain she was so robust that once, when a young fellow would have lain with her against her will, she beat him so that he lay a, she beat him so that he lay ill of it a considerable time. While she lived with her father, she was looked upon as one that would be a good fortune. Wherefore it was thought that her father expected a good match for her, but she spoilt it all, for without his consent she marries a young fellow who belonged to the sea, and was not worth a groat, which proved her father, which provoked her father to such a degree that he turned her out of doors, upon which the young fellow who married her, finding himself disappointed in his expectation, shipped himself and his wife for the island of Providence, expecting employment there. Here she became acquainted with Rackham the pirate, who, making courtship to her, soon found means of withdrawing her affections from her husband, so that she consented to elope with him, and go to sea with Rackham in men's clothes. She was as good as her word, and after she had been at sea some time, she proved with child. And, beginning to grow big, Rackham landed her on the island of Cuba, and, recommending her to and recommending her there to some friends of his, they took care of her till she was brought to bed. When she was up and well again, he, set, he sent for her to bear him company. The king's proclamation being out for pardoning of pirates, he took the benefit of it and surrendered. Afterwards being sent upon the privateering account, he returned to his old trade, as has already been hinted in the story of Mary Reed. In all these expeditions Anne Bonny bore him company, and when any business was to be done in their way nobody was more forward or courageous than she, and, particular with, and particularly when they were taken, she and Mary Reed, with one more, were all the persons that durst keep the deck, as has before been hinted. Her father was known to a great many gentlemen, painters of Jamaica, who had dealt with him, 
and among whom he had a good reputation, and some of them who had been in Carolina remembered to have seen him, remembered to have seen her in his house, wherefore they were inclined to show her favor. But the action of leaving her husband was an ugly circumstance against her. The day that Rackham was executed, by special favor, he was admitted to see her, but all the comfort she gave him was that she was sorry to see him there, but if he had fought like a man he need not have been hanged like a dog. She was continued in prison to the time of her lying in, and afterwards reprieved from time to time, but what has become of her since we cannot tell. Only this we know, that she was not executed. End of chapter 7, part 3 Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman Chapter 8, Part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson Chapter 8 of Captain Hal Davis and his Crew, Part 1 Captain Hal Davis was born at Milford in Monmouthshire and was from a boy brought up to the sea. The last voyage he made from England was in the Cadogan Snow of Bristol, Captain Skinner, commander, bound for the coast of Guinea, of which snow Davis was chief mate. They were no sooner arrived at Sierra Leone on the aforesaid coast, but they were taken by the pirate England, who plundered them, and Skinner was barbarously murdered, as has been related before in the story of Captain England. After the death of Captain Skinner, Davies pretended that he was mightily solicited by England to engage with him, but that he resolutely answered he would sooner be shot to death than sign the pirate's articles. Upon which England, pleased with his bravery, sent him and the rest of the men again on board the snow, appointing him captain of her in the room of Skinner, commanding him to pursue his voyage. He also gave him a written paper sealed up with orders to open it when he should come into a certain latitude, and at the peril of his life follow the orders therein set down. This was an air of grandeur like what princes practise to their admirals and generals. It was punctually complied with by Davis, who read it to the ship's company. It contained no less than a generous deed of gift of the ship and cargo to Davis and the crew, ordering him to go to the Brazil and dispose of the lading to the best advantage, and to make a fair and equal dividend with the rest. Davis proposed to the crew whether they were willing to follow their directions, but to his great surprise found the majority of them altogether averse to it, wherefore in a rage he bade them be damned and go where they would. They knew that part of their cargo was consigned to certain merchants at Barbados, wherefore they steered for that island. When they arrived, they related to these merchants the unfortunate death of Skinner and the proposal which had been made to them by Davis, upon which Davis was seized and committed to prison, where he was kept three months. However, as he had been in no act of piracy, he was discharged without being brought to any trial, yet he could not expect any employment there, wherefore knowing that the island of Providence was a kind of rendezvous of pirates, he was resolved to make one amongst them, if possible, and to that purpose found means of shipping himself for that island. But he was again disappointed, for when he arrived there, the pirates had newly surrendered to Captain Woods Rogers, and accepted of the act of grace which he had just brought from England. However, Davis was not long out of business, for Captain Rogers, having fitted out two sloops for trade, one called the Buck, the other the Munville Trader, Davis found an employment on board of one of them. The lading of these sloops was of considerable value, consisting of European goods, in order to be exchanged with the French and Spaniards, and many of the hands on board of them were the pirates lately come in upon the late act of grace. The first place they touched at was the island of Martinico, belonging to the French, where Davis, having conspired with some others, rise in the night, secured the master, and seized the sloop. As soon as this was done, they called to the other sloop, which lay a little way from them, among whom they knew there were a great many hands ripe for rebellion, and ordered them to come on board of them. They did so, and the greatest part of them agreed to join with Davis. Those who were otherwise inclined were sent back on board the Munville sloop, to go where they pleased, Davis having first taken out of her everything which he thought might be of use. 
After this, a council of war was called over a large bowl of punch, at which it was proposed to choose a commander. The election was soon over, for it fell upon Davis, by a great majority of legal polos. There was no scrutiny demanded, for all acquiesced in the choice. As soon as he was possessed of his command, he drew up articles, which were signed and sworn to by himself and the rest. Then he made a short speech, the sum of which was a declaration of war against the whole world. After this, they consulted about a proper place where they might clean their sloop, a light pair of heels being of great use either to take or escape being taken. For this purpose, they made choice of Coxon's Hole, at the east end of the island of Cuba, a place where they might secure themselves from surprise, the entrance being so narrow that one ship might keep out a hundred. Here they cleaned with much difficulty, for they had no carpenter in their company, a person of great use upon such exigencies. From hence they put to sea, making to the north side of the island of Hispaniola. The first sail which fell in their way was a French ship of twelve guns. It must be observed that Davis had but thirty-five hands, yet provisions began to grow short with him, wherefore he attacked this ship. She soon struck, and he sent twelve of his hands on board of her in order to plunder. This was no sooner done, but a sail was spied a great way to windward of them. They inquired of the Frenchman what she might be. He answered that he had spoke with his ship the day before of twenty-four guns and sixty men, and he took this to be the same. Davis then proposed to his men to attack her, telling them she would be a rare ship for their use, but they looked upon it to be an extravagant attempt, and discovered no fondness for it. But he assured them he had a stratagem in his head would make all safe wherefore he gave chase, and ordered his prize to do the same. The prize being a slow sailor, Davis first came up with the enemy, and standing alongside of them, showed his piratical colours. They, much surprised, called to Davis, telling him they wondered at his impudence in venturing to come so near them, and ordered him to strike. But he answered that he intended to keep them in play, till his consort came up, who was able to deal with them and that if they did not strike to him, they should have but bad quarters, whereupon he gave them a broadside, which they returned. In the meantime the prize drew near, who obliged all the prisoners to come upon deck in white shirts to make a show of force, as they had been directed by Davis. They also hoisted a dirty tarpaulin by way of black flag, they having no other, and fired a gun. The Frenchmen were so intimidated by this appearance of force that they struck, Davis called out to the captain to come on board of him, with twenty of his hands. He did so, and they were all for the greater security clapped into irons, the captain accepted. Then he sent four of his own men on board the first prize, and in order still to carry on the cheat, spoke aloud that they should give his service to the captain, and desire him to send her some hands on board the prize to see what they had got, but at the same time gave them a written paper with instructions what to do. Here he ordered them to nail up the guns in the little prize, to take out all the small arms and powder, and to go every man of them on board the second prize. When this was done, he ordered that more of the prisoners should be removed out of the great prize, into the little one, by which he secured himself from any attempt which might be feared from their numbers. For those on board of him were fast in irons, and those in the little prize had neither arms nor ammunition. Thus the three ships kept company for two days, when finding the great prize to be a very dull sailor, he thought she would not be fit for his purpose, wherefore he resolved to restore her to the captain with all his hands. But first he took care to take out all her ammunition, and everything else which he might possibly want. The French captain was in such a rage at being so outwitted, that when he got on board his own ship he was going to throw himself overboard, but was prevented by his men. Having let go both his prizes, he steered northward, in which course he took a small Spanish sloop. After this he made towards the western islands, but met with no booty thereabouts. Then he steered for the Cape de Verde islands. They cast anchor at St. Nicholas, hoisting English colours. The Portuguese, inhabiting there, took him for an English privateer, and Davis going ashore, they both treated him very civilly, and also traded with him. Here he remained five weeks, in which time he and half his crew, for their pleasure, took a journey to the chief town of the island, which was nineteen miles up the country. Davis, making a good appearance, was caressed by the governor and the inhabitants, and no diversion was wanting which the Portuguese could show or money could purchase. 
After about a week's stay, he came back to the ship, and the rest of the crew went to take their pleasure up to the town, in their turn. At their return they cleaned their ship, and put to sea, but not with their whole company, for five of them, like Hannibal's men, were so charmed with the luxuries of the place, and the free conversation of some women, that they stayed behind, and one of them, whose name was Charles Franklin, a monmature man, married and settled himself, and lives there to this day. From hence they sailed to Bonavista, and looked into that harbour, but finding nothing, they steered for the Isle of May. When they arrived here, they met with a great many ships and vessels in the road, all which they plundered, taking out of them whatever they wanted, and also strengthened themselves with a great many fresh hands, who most of them entered voluntarily. One of the ships they took to their own use, mounted her with twenty-six guns, and called her the King James. There being no fresh water hereabouts, they made towards St. Jago, belonging to the Portuguese, in order to lay in a store. Davis, with few hands, going ashore to find the most commodious place to water at, the governor, with some attendants, came himself and examined who they were, and whence they came. And not liking Davis' account of himself, the governor was so plain to tell them he suspected them to be pirates. Davis seemed mightily affronted, standing much upon his honour, replying to the governor, he scorned his words. However, as soon as his back was turned, for fear of accidents, he got on board again as fast as he could. Davis related what had happened, and his men seemed to resent the affront which had been offered him. Davis, upon this, told them he was confident he could surprise the fort in the night. They agreed with him to attempt it, and, accordingly, when it grew late, they went ashore well armed, and the guard which was kept was so negligent that they got within the fort before any alarm was given. When it was too late, there was some little resistance made, and three men killed on Davis's side. Those in the fort, in their hurry, run into the governor's house to save themselves, which they barricaded so strongly that Davis's party could not enter it. However, they threw in grenado shells, which not only ruined all the furniture, but killed several men within. When it was day, the whole country was alarmed and became to attack the pirates. Wherefore, it not being their business to stand a siege, they made the best of their way on board their ship again, after having dismounted the guns of the fort. By this enterprise they did a great deal of mischief to the Portuguese, and but very little good to themselves. Having put to sea, they mustered their hands, and found themselves near seventy strong. Then it was proposed what course they should steer, and differing in their opinions, they divided, and by a majority it was carried for Gambia on the coast of Guinea. Of this opinion was Davis. He, having been employed in that trade, was acquainted with the coast. He told them that there was a great deal of money always kept in Gambia Castle, and that it would be worth their while to make an attempt upon it. They asked him how it was possible, since it was garrisoned. He desired they would leave the management of it to him, and he would undertake to make them masters of it. They began now to conceive so high an opinion of his conduct, as well as courage, that they thought nothing impossible to him. Therefore they agreed to obey him, without inquiring further into his design. Having come within sight of the place, he ordered all his men under deck, except as many as were absolutely necessary for working the ship, that those from the fort seeing a ship with so few hands might have no suspicion of her being any other than a trading vessel. Then he ran close under the fort, and there cast anchor, and having ordered out the boat, he commanded six men in her, in old ordinary jackets, while he himself, with the master and doctor, dressed themselves like gentlemen, his design being that the men should look like common sailors, and they like merchants. In rowing ashore he gave his men instructions what to say in case any questions should be asked them. Being come to the landing-place, he was received by a file of musketeers, and conducted into the fort, where the governor, accosting them civilly, asked them who they were, and whence they came. They answered they were of Liverpool, bound for the river of Senegal, to trade for guns and elephants' teeth, but that they were chased on that coast by two Frenchmen of war, and narrowly escaped being taken, having a little the heels of them. But now they were resolved to make the best of a bad market, and would trade here for slaves. Then the governor asked them what was the chief of their cargo. They answered iron and plate, which were good things there. The governor told them he would slave them to the full value of their cargo, and asked them if they had any European liquor on board. They answered a little for their own use. However, a hamper should be at his service. 
The governor then very civilly invited them all to stay and dine with him. Davis told him that being commander of the ship he must go on board to see her well moored, and give some other orders, but those two gentlemen might stay, and that he himself would also return before dinner and bring the hamper of liquor with him. While he was in the fort, his eyes were very busy in observing how things lay. He took notice there was a sentry at the entrance, and a guard-house just by it, where the soldiers upon duty commonly waited, their arms standing in a corner, in a heap. He saw also a great many small arms in the governor's hall. Now when he came on board, he assured his men of success, desiring them not to get drunk, and that as soon as they saw the flag upon the castle struck, they might conclude he was master, and send twenty hands immediately ashore. In the meantime, there being a sloop at anchor near them, he sent some hands in a boat to secure the master and all the men, and bring them on board of him, lest they observing any bustle or arming in his ship might send ashore and give intelligence. These precautions being taken, he ordered his men, who were to go in the boat with him, to put two pair of pistols each under their clothes, he doing the like himself, and gave them directions to go into the guard-room and to enter into conversation with the soldiers and observe when he should fire a pistol through the governor's window to start up at once and secure the arms in the guard-room. When Davis arrived, dinner not being ready, the governor proposed that they should pass their time in making a bowl of punch till dinner-time. It must be observed that Davis's coxswain waited upon them, who had an opportunity of going about all parts of the house to see what strength they had. He whispered Davis, there being no person then in the room, but he, Davis, the master, the doctor, the coxswain, and governor. Davis on a sudden drew out a pistol, clapped it to the governor's breast, telling him he must surrender the fort and all the riches in it, or he was a dead man. The governor, being no ways prepared for such an attack, promised to be very passive, and do all they desired, therefore they shut the door, took down all the arms that hung in the hall, and loaded them. Davis fires his pistol through the window, upon which his men, without, executed their part of the scheme, like heroes, in an instant, getting betwixt the soldiers and their arms, all with their pistols cocked in their hands, while one of them carried the arms out. When this was done, they locked the soldiers into the guard-room and kept guard without. In the meantime, one of them struck the Union flag on the top of the castle, at which signal those on board sent on shore a reinforcement of hands, and they got possession of the fort without the least hurry or confusion, or so much as a man lost of either side. Davis harangued the soldiers, upon which a great many of them took on with him. Those who refused, he sent on board the little sloop, and because he would not be at the trouble of a guard for them, he ordered all the sails and cables out of her which might hinder them from attempting to get away. This day was spent in a kind of rejoicing, the castle firing her guns to salute the ship, and the ship the castle. But the next day they minded their business, that is, they fell to plundering. But they found things fall vastly short of their expectation, for they discovered that a great deal of money had been lately sent away. However, they met with the value of about two thousand pounds sterling in bar gold, and a great many other rich effects. Everything they liked, which was portable, they brought aboard their ship, some things which they had no use for, they were so generous to make a present of to the master and crew of the little sloop, to whom they also returned his vessel again, and then they fell to work in dismounting the guns and demolishing the fortifications. After they had done as much mischief as they could, and were weighing anchor to be gone, they spied a ship bearing down upon them in full sail. They soon got their anchors up, and were in readiness to receive her. This ship proved to be a French pirate of fourteen guns and sixty-four hands, half French, half Negroes. The captain's name was La Bousse. He expected no less than the rich prize which made him so eager in the chase, but when he came near enough to see their guns and the number of their hands upon deck, he began to think he should catch a Tartar, and supposed her to be a small English man-of-war. However, since there was no escaping, he resolved to do a bold and desperate action, which was to board Davis. As he was making towards her, for this purpose, he fired a gun, and hoisted his black collars. Davis returned the salute, and hoisted his black collars also. The Frenchman was not a little pleased at this happy mistake. They both hoisted out their boats, and the captains went to meet and congratulate one another with a flag of truce in their sterns. A great many civilities passed between them, and La Bousse desired Davis that they might sail down the coast together, that he, La Bousse, might get a better ship. Davis agreed to it, and very courteously promised him the first ship he took, fit for his use, 
he would give him as being willing to encourage a willing brother. The first place they touched at was Sierra Leone, where at first going in they spied a tall ship at anchor. Davis, being the best sailor, first came up with her, and wondering that she did not try to make off, suspected her to be a ship of force. As soon as he came alongside of her, she brought a spring upon her cable, and fired a whole broadside upon Davis, at the same time hoisted a black flag. Davis hoisted his black flag in like manner, and fired one gun to leeward. In fine, she proved to be a pirate ship of twenty-four guns, commanded by one Cochlin, who, expecting these two would prove prizes, let them come in, lest his getting under sail might frighten them away. This satisfaction was great on all sides, at this junction of confederates and brethren in iniquity. Two days they spent in improving their acquaintance and friendship. The third day Davis and Cochlin agreed to go in La Bousse's brigantine and attack the fort. They contrived it so as to get up thither by high water. Those in the fort suspected them to be what they really were, and therefore stood upon their defence. When the brigantine came within musket shot, the fort fired all their guns upon her. The brigantine did the like upon the fort, and so held each other in play for several hours, when the two confederate ships were come up to the insistence of the brigantine. Those who defended the fort, seeing such a number of hands on board these ships, had not the courage to stand it any longer, but, abandoning the fort, left it to the mercy of the pirates. They took possession of it, and continued there near seven weeks, in which time they all cleaned their ships. We should have observed that a galley came into the road while they were there, which Davis insisted should be yielded to La Bousse, according to his word of honour, before given. Cochlin did not oppose it, so La Bousse went into her with his crew, and cutting away her half-deck, mounted her with twenty-four guns. Having called a council of war, they agreed to sail down the coast together, and for the greater grandeur appointed a commodore, which was Davis. But they had not kept company long, when drinking together on board of Davis, they had liked to have fallen together by the ears, the strong liquor stirring up a spirit of discord among them, and they quarrelled. But Davis put an end to it by this short speech. Hark ye, you Cochlin and La Bousse, I find by strengthening you, I have put a rod into your hands to whip myself, but I am still able to deal with you both. But since we met in love, let us part in love, for I find that three of a trade can never agree. Upon which the other two went on board their respective ships, and immediately parted, each steering a different course. Davis held on his way down the coast, and making Cape Apollonia, he met with two Scotch and one English vessel, which he plundered, and then let go. About five days after, he fell in with a Dutch interloper of thirty guns and ninety men, half being English, off Cape Three Points Bay. Davis, coming up alongside of her, the Dutchman gave the first fire, and pouring in a broadside upon Davis, killed nine of his men. Davis returned it, and a very hot engagement followed, which lasted from one o'clock at noon till nine next morning, when the Dutchman struck and yielded herself their prize. Davis fitted up the Dutch ship for his own use, and called her the Rover, aboard of which he mounted thirty-two guns and twenty-seven swivels, and proceeded with her and the King James to Anamabo. He entered the bay with sixty hours of twelve and one at noon, and found there three ships lying at anchor, who were trading for negroes, gold, and teeth. The names of these ships were the Hink Pink, Captain Hall Commander, the Princess, Captain Plumb, of which Roberts, who will make a considerable figure in the sequel of this history, was second mate, and the Morris sloop, Captain Finn. He takes these ships without any resistance, and, having plundered them, he makes a present of one of them, that is, the Morris sloop, to the Dutchman, on board of which alone were found a hundred and forty negroes, besides dry goods and a considerable quantity of gold dust. It happened there were several canoes alongside of this last, when Davis came in, who saved themselves and got ashore. These gave notice at the fort that these ships were pirates, upon which the fort fired upon them, but without any execution, for their metal was not of weight enough to reach them. Davis, therefore, by way of defiance, hoisted his black flag and returned their compliment. The same day he sailed with his three ships, making his way down the coast towards Princess, a Portuguese colony but before we proceed any farther in Davis's story, we shall give our reader an account of the Portuguese settlements on this coast, 
which other curious remarks, as they were communicated to me by an ingenious gentleman lately arrived from those parts. End of chapter 8, part 1《ラプタイトパート2の The General History of the Pirates、Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.Recording by Anna Simon。The General History of the Pirates、Volume 1 by Charles Johnson。Chapter 8、Part 2。A Description of the Islands of St. Thome, Del Principe, and Anabono。As the Portuguese were the great improvers of navigation, and the first Europeans who traded to and settled on the coasts of Africa, even round to India, and made those discoveries which now turn so much to the advantage of other nations, it may not be amiss, previously to the description of those islands, to hint on that wonderful property of the lodestone that a little before had been found out, and enabled them to pursue such new and daring navigations. The attractive power of the lodestone was universally known with the ancients, as may be believed by its being a native fossil of the Grecians, Magnus a Magnesia. But its directive, or polar virtue, has only been known to us within these 350 years, and said to be found out by John Goya of Malfi, in the kingdom of Naples, Prima dedit nautis usu magnetis Amalfi. Though others think, and as sure as it was transported by Paulus Venetus from China to Italy, like the other famous arts of modern use with us, printing and the use of guns. The other properties of improvements of the magnet, that is, variation, or its deflection from an exact north or south line, variation of that variation, and its inclination, were the inventions of Sebastian Cabot, Mr. Gellibrand, and Mr. Norman. The inclination of the needle, or that property whereby it keeps an elevation above the horizon in all places but under the equator, where it is parallel, is as surprising a phenomenon as any, and was the discovery of our countrymen, and could it be found regular, I imagine would very much help towards the discovery of longitude, at least would point out better methods than hitherto known, when ships drew nigh land, which would answer as useful an end. Before the verticity and use of the compass, the Portuguese navigations had extended no farther than Cape Non, it was their ne plus ultra, and therefore so called. Distress of weather, indeed, had drove some coasters to Porto Santo and Madeira, before any certain method of steering was invented. But after the needle was seen thus inspired, navigation every year improved under the great encouragements of Henry, Alphonsus, and John the Second, kings of Portugal, in part of the fourteenth and in the fifteenth century. King Alphonsus was not so much at leisure as his predecessor to pursue these discoveries, but having seen the advantages accrued to Portugal by them, and that the Pope had confirmed the perpetual donation of all they should discover between Cape Bayadora and India, inclusively, he resolved not to neglect the proper assistance and farm the profits that did or might ensue to one Bernard Gomez, a citizen of Lisbon, who was every voyage obliged to discover one hundred leagues, still farther on, and about the year 1470 made these islands, the only places, of all the considerable and large colonies they had in Africa, that do now remain to that crown. St. Thom is the principal of the three, whose governor is still captain-general of the islands, and from whom the other at princes receives his commission, though nominated by the court of Portugal. It is a bishopric with a great many secular clergy, who appear to have neither learning nor devotion, as may be judged by several of them being negroes. One of the chief of them invited us to hear mass, as a diversion to pass time away, where he and his inferior brethren acted such affected gestures and strains of voice as showed to their dishonour. They had no other aim than pleasing us, and what I think was still worse, it was not without a view of interest." for as these clergy are the chief traders, they stoop to pitiful and scandalous methods for ingratiating themselves. They and the government, on this trading account, maintain as great harmony, being ever jealous of each other, and practising little deceitful arts to monopolise what strangers have to offer for sale, whether toys or clothes, which of all sorts are ever commodious with the Portuguese in all parts of the world. An ordinary suit of black will sell for seven or eight pound, a turnstile wig of four shillings for a moido, 
a watch of forty shillings for six pound, etc. The town is of mean building, with large and populous, the residents of the greater part of the natives, who, through the whole island, are computed at ten thousand, the militia at three thousand, and are in general a rascally, thievish generation, as an old grave friend of mine can witness, for he, having carried a bag of second-hand clothes on shore to truck for provisions, seated himself on the sand for that purpose, presently gathered a crowd round him to view them, one of which desired to know the price of a black suit that unluckily lay uppermost and was the best of them, agreeing to the demand with little hesitation, provided it would but fit him. He put them on immediately, in as much hurry as possible, without any colicencia seigneur, and when my friend was about to commend the goodness of the suit and exactness they sat with, not dreaming of the impudence of running away from a crowd, the rascal took to his heels, my friend followed and bowled very much, and though there was five hundred people about the place, it served to no other end but making him a clear stage that the best pair of heels might carry it. So he lost the suit of clothes, and before he could return to his bag, others of them had beat off his servant and shared the rest." Most of the ships from Guinea, of their own nation, and frequently those of ours, call at one or other of these islands to recruit with fresh provisions and take in water, which on the coast are not so good, nor so conveniently to come by. Their own ships, likewise, when they touch here, are obliged to leave the king his custom for their slaves, which is always in gold, at so much a head, without any deduction at Brazil for the mortality that may happen afterwards. This, by being a constant bank to pay off civil and military charges of the government, prevents the inconveniency of remittances, and keeps both it and Princess Isle rich enough to pay ready money for everything they want of Europeans. Their beefs are small and lean, two hundred weight or a little more, but the goats, hogs, and fowls very good, their sugar coarse and dirty, and rum very ordinary, as these refreshments lay most with people who are in want of other necessaries, they come to us in way of bartering, very cheap. A good hog for an old cutlash, a fat fowl for a span of Brazil tobacco, no other sort being valued, etc. But with money you give eight dollars per head for cattle, three dollars for a goat, six dollars for a grown hog, a test tune and a half for a fowl, a dollar per gallon for rum, two dollars a roux for sugar, and half a dollar for a dozen of parakeets. Here is plenty likewise of corn and farine, of limes, citrons, and yams. The island is reckoned nigh square, each side eighteen leagues long, hilly, and lays under the equinoctial, a wooden bridge just without the town being set not to deviate the least part of a minute, either to the southward or northward. And notwithstanding this warm situation and continual vertical suns, the islanders are very healthy." imputed by those who are disposed to be merry, in a great measure to the want of even so much as one surgeon or physician amongst them. Il del Principe, the next in magnitude, a pleasant and delightful spot to the grave and thoughtful disposition of the Portuguese, an improvement of country retirement, in that this may be a happy and uninterrupted retreat from the whole world. I shall divide what I have to say on this island into observations made on our approach to it, on the seas round it, the harbour, produce of the island, and seasons, way of living among the inhabitants, some custom of the negroes, with such proper deductions on each as may illustrate the description and inform the reader. We were bound hither from Waida, at the latter part of the month July, when the rains are over, and the winds hang altogether south-west, as they do before the rains south-east. Yet, with this wind, when at sea, we found the ship gained unexpectedly so far to the southward, that is, windward, that we could with ease have weathered any of the islands, and this seems next to impossible should be if the currents, which were strong to leeward, in the road of Waida, had extended in like manner across the bight of Benin. Now, it must then have been very difficult to have weathered even Cape Formosa. On this occasion I shall farther expatiate upon the currents on the whole coast of Guinea. The southern coast of Africa runs in a line of latitude, the northern on an easter line, but both straight with the fused inlets, gulfs, or bays, of either of the four continents. The only large and remarkable one is that of Benin and Calabar, towards which the currents of each coast tend, and is strongest from the southward, because more open to a larger sea, whose rising it is, though little and indiscernible at any distance from the land, that gives rise to these currents close in shore, 
which are nothing but tides altered and disturbed by the make and shape of lands. For proof of this, I shall lay down the following observations as certain facts. That in the rivers of Gambia and Sierra Leone, in the straits and channels of Benin, and in general along the whole coast, the flowings are regular on the shores, with this difference, that in the above-mentioned rivers and in the channels of Benin, where the shore contract the waters into a narrow compass, the tides are strong and high, as well as regular, but on the dead coast, where it makes an equal reverberation, slow and low, not to above two or three foot, increasing as you advance towards Benin, and this is farther evident in that at Cape Corso, Secondo, and Comenda, and where the land rounds and gives any stop, the tides flow regularly to four foot and upwards, when on an evener coast, though next adjoining, they shall not exceed two or three foot, and ten leagues out at sea, where no such interruption is, they become scarcely, if at all, perceptible. What I would deduce from this, besides the confirmation of that ingenious theory of the tides by Captain Halley, is first that the ships bound to Angola, Cabenda, and other places on the southern coast of Africa should cross the equinoctial from Cape Palmas and run into a southern latitude without keeping too far to the westward. And the reason seems plain, for if you endeavour to cross it about the islands, you meet calms, southerly winds, and opposite currents. And if too far to the westward, the trade winds are strong and unfavourable, for it obliges you to stand into twenty-eight or thirty degrees southern latitude till they are variable. Secondly, on the northern side of Guinea, if ships are bound from the gold coast to Sierra Leone, Gambia, or elsewhere to windward, considering the weakness of these currents, and the favourableness of land breezes, and southerly in the rains, tornadoes, and even of the trade wind, when abreast of Cape Palmas, it is more expeditious to pursue the passage this way, than by a long perambulatory course of four or five hundred leagues to the westward, and as many more to the northward, which must be before a wind can be obtained that could recover the coast. Lastly, it is, in a great measure, owning to this want of inlets, and the rivers being small and unnavigable, that the seas rebound with so dangerous a surf through the whole continent. Round the shores of this island, and at this season, July, August, and September, there is a great resort of whale-fish, tame, and spawning very nigh the ships as they sail in, always in pairs, the female much the smaller, and often seen to turn on their backs for dalliance, the prologue to engendering. It has an enemy, called the thresher, a large fish too, that has its haunts here at this season, and encounters the whale, raising himself out of the water a considerable height, and falling again with great weight and force. It is commonly said also that there is a swordfish in these battles, who pricks the whale up to the surface again. But without this, I believe, he would suffocate when put to quick motions, unless frequently approaching the air, to ventilate and remove the impediments to a swifter circulation. Nor do I think he is battled for prey, but to remove him from what is perhaps the food of both. The number of whales here has put me sometimes on thinking an advantageous fishery might be made of it. But I presume they, no more than those of Brazil, are the sort which yield the profitable part, called whalebone. All, therefore, that the islanders do, is now and then to go out with two or three canoes, and set on one for diversion. The rocks and outer lines of the island are the haunts of a variety of sea-birds, especially boobies and noddies. The former are of the big of a gull, and a dark collar, named so from their simplicity, because they often sit still and let the sailors take them up in their hands but I fancy this succeeds more frequently from their wariness and the largeness of their wings, which, when they once have rested, cannot have the scope necessary to raise and float them on the air again. The noddies are smaller and flat-footed also. What I would remark more of them is the admirable instinct in these birds for the proper seasons and the proper places for support. In the aforementioned months, when the large fish were here, numerous flocks of fowl attend for the spawn and superfluity of their nourishment, and in January few of either. For the same reason there are scarce any sea-fowl seen on the African coast, rocks and islands being generally their best security and subsistence. The harbour of Princes is at the east-southeast point of the island. The north side has gradual soundings, but here deep water, having no ground at a mile off with 140 fathom of line. The port, when in, is a smooth, narrow bay, safe from winds, unless a little swell from one southerly, and drafted into other smaller and sandy ones, convenient for raising of tents, watering, and hauling the seam, the whole protected by a fort, 
or rather battery, of a dozen guns on the larboard side. At the head of the bay stands the town, about a mile from the anchoring place, and consists of two or three regular streets, of wooden-built houses, where the governor and chief men of the island reside. Here the water grows shallow for a considerable distance, and the natives, at every ebb, having before encompassed every convenient angle with a rise of stones, something like weirs in England, resort for catching of fish, which, with them, is a daily diversion, as well as a subsistence, five hundred attending with sticks and wicker baskets, and if they cannot dip them with one hand, they knock them down with the other. The tides rise regularly six foot in the harbour, and yet not half that height without the capes that make the bay. Here are constantly two missionaries who are sent for six years to inculcate the Christian principles, and more especially attend the conversion of the Negroes. The present are Venetians, ingenious men, who seem to despise the loose morals and behaviour of the seculars, and complain of them as of the slaves, ut color mores sunt nigri. They have a neat conventual house and a garden appropriated, which, by their own industry and labour, not only thrives with the several natives of the soil, but many exotics and curiosities, a fruit in particular, larger than a chestnut, yellow, containing two stones, with a pulp or clammy substance about them, which, when sucked, exceeds in sweetness, sugar or honey, and has this property beyond them, of giving a sweet taste to every liquid you swallow for the whole evening after. The only plague infesting the garden is a vermin called land crabs, in vast numbers, of a bright red colour, in other respects like the sea ones, which burrow in these sandy soils like rabbits, and are as shy. The island is a pleasant intermixture of hill and valley, the hills spread with palms, coconuts, and cotton trees, with numbers of monkeys and parrots among them, the valleys with fruitful plantations of yams, kulalu, papas, variety of salating, ananas, or pineapples, guavas, plantains, bonanas, maniocos, and Indian corn, with fowls, guinea hens, muscovy ducks, goats, hogs, turkeys, and wild beefs, with each a little village of negroes, who, under the direction of their several masters, manage the cultivation, and exchange or sell them for money, much after the same rates with the people of St. Thome. End of chapter 8, part 2「Chapter 8, Part 3 I shall run a description of the vegetables with their properties, not only because they are the produce of this island, but most of them of Africa in general. The palm trees are numerous on the shores of Africa, and may be reckoned the first of their natural curiosities, in that they afford them meat, drink, and clothing. They grow very straight to forty and fifty foot high, and at the top only have three or four circles of branches that spread and make a capacious umbrella. The trunk is very rough with knobs, either excrescencies or the healings of those branches that were lopped off to forward the growth of the tree, and make it answer better in its fruit. The branches are strongly tied together with a cortex, which may be unraveled to a considerable length and breadth. The inward lamella of this cortex, I know, are wove like a cloth at Benin, and afterwards dyed and worn. Under the branches, and close to the body of the tree, hang the nuts, thirty bunches perhaps on a tree, and each of thirty pound weight, with prickly films from between them, not unresembling hedgehogs. Of these nuts comes a liquid and pleasant scented oil, used as food and sauce all over the coast, but chiefly in the windward parts of Africa, where they stamp, boil, and skim it off in great quantities. Underneath, where the branches fasten, they tap for wine, called cochra, in this manner. The negroes, who are mostly limber, active fellows, encompass themselves and the trees with a hoop of strong width, and run up with a great deal of agility. At the bottom of a branch of nuts, he makes an excavation of an inch and a half over, and tying fast his calabash, leaves it to distill, which it does to two or three quarts in a night's time. When done, he plugs it up, and chooses another. 
for if suffered to run too much or in the daytime the sap is unwarily exhausted and the tree spoiled the liquor thus drawn is of a wayish colour intoxicating and sours in twenty-four hours but when new drawn is pleasantest to thirst and hunger both it is from these wines they draw their arak in india on the very top of the palm grows a cabbage called so i believe from some resemblance its taft is thought to have with ours and is used like it the covering has a down that makes the best of tinder and the weavings of other parts are drawn out into strong threads coconut trees are branched like but not so tall as palm trees the nut like them growing under the branches and close to the trunk the milky liquor they contain to half a pint or more is often drank to quench thirst but surfeiting and this may be observed in their way of nourishment that when the quantity of milk is large the shell and meat are very thin and harden and thicken in proportion as that loses cotton trees also are the growth of all parts of africa as well as the islands of vast bigness yet not so incremental as the shrubs or bushes of five or six foot high these bear a fruit if it may be so called about the bigness of pigeon's eggs which as the sun swells and ripens bursts forth and discovers three cells loaded with cotton and seeds in the middle of them this in most parts the negroes know how to spin and here at nikongo and the island st jago how to weave into cloths thames are a common root sweeter but not unlike potatoes kulalu a herb like spinach papa a fruit less than the smallest pumpkins they are all three for boiling and to be eat with meat the latter are improved by the english into a turnip or an apple tart with a due mixture of butter or limes guavas a fruit as large as a pippin with seeds and stones in it of an uncouth astringing taste though never so much be said in commendation of it at the west indies it is common for creolians who has tasted both to give it a preference to peach or nectarine no amazing thing when men whose tastes are so degenerated as to prefer a toad in a shell as ward calls turtle to venison and negroes to fine english ladies plantains and bananas are fruit of oblong figure that i think differ only secundum major et minus if any the latter are preferable and by being less are juicier they are usually when stripped of their coat eat at meals instead of bread the leaf of this plantain is an admirable detergent and externally applied i have seen cure the most obstinate scorbutic ulcers manioco a root that shoots its branches about the height of a currant bush from this root the islanders make a farine or flour which they fell at three riles a roof and drive a considerable trade for it with the ships that call in the manner of making it is first to press the juice from it which is poisonous done here with engines and then the negro women upon a rough stone rub it into a granulated flour reserved in their houses either to boil as we do our wheat and is a hearty food for the slaves or make it into a bread fine white and well tasted for themselves one thing worth taking notice about manioco in this island is that the woods abound with a wild poisonous and more mortiferous sort which sometimes men unskilled in the preparation of it feed on to their destruction this the missionaries assured me they often experimented in their hogs and believed we did in the mortality of our sailors indian corn is likewise as well as the farine the manioco and rice the common victualling of our slave ships and is afforded here at one thousand heads for two dollars this corn grows eight or nine foot high on a hard reed or stick shooting forth at every six inches height some long leaves it has always an ear or rather head at top of perhaps four hundred fold increase and often too three or more midway here are some tamarind trees another called cola whose fruit or nut about twice the bigness of a chestnut and bitter is chewed by the portuguese to give a sweet gust to their water which they drink but above all i was shown the bark of one whose name i do not know 
gravely affirmed to have a peculiar property of enlarging the virile member. I am not fond of such conceits, nor believe it in the power of any vegetables, but must acknowledge I have seen sights of this kind among the negroes very extraordinary. Yet that there may be no wishes amongst the ladies for the importation of this bark, I must acquaint them that they are found to grow less merry as they increase in bulk. I'd like to have forgot their cinnamon trees. There's only one walk of them, and is the entrance of the governor's villa. They thrive extremely well, and the bark not inferior to our cinnamon from India. Why they and other spice in a soil so proper receive no farther cultivation is, probably, their suspicion that so rich a produce might make some potent neighbor take a fancy to the island. They have two winters, or rather springs, and two summers. Their winters, which are the rainy seasons, come in September and February or March, and hold two months, returning that fatness and generative power to the earth as makes it yield a double crop every year, with little sweat or labor. Hic ver avidum actque alignis mensibus aestas, bis gravida pecudes, bis pomis utilis arbos. Their first coming is with travados, that is, sudden and hard gusts of wind, with thunder, lightning, and heavy showers, but short, and the next new or full moon at those times of the year infallibly introduces the rains, which, once begun, fall with little intermission, and are observed coldest in February. Similar to these are rainy seasons also over all the coast of Africa, if there may be allowed any general way of calculating their time, they happen from the course of the sun as it respects the equinoctial only. For if these equinoxes prove rainy seasons all over the world, as I am apt to think they are, whatever secret cause operates with that station of the sun to produce them will more effectually do it in those vicine latitudes. And therefore, as the sun advances, the rains are brought on the wider and gold coast by April, and on the windward most part of Guinea by May. The other seasons of the suns, returning to the southward, make them more uncertain and irregular in northern Africa, but then to the southward again. They proceed in like manner, and are at Cape Lopez in October, at Angola in November, etc., the manner of living among the Portuguese here is, with the utmost frugality and temperance, even to penury and starving. A familiar instance of proof is in the voracity of their dogs, who, finding such clean cupboards at home, are wild in a manner with hunger, and tear up the graves of the dead for food, as I have often seen. They themselves are lean with covetousness, and that Christian virtue which is often the result of it, self-denial and would train up their cattle in the same way, could they fetch as much money, or had not they their provision more immediately of providence. The best of them, excepting the governor now and then, neither pay nor receive any visits of escapade or recreation. They meet and sit down at each other's doors in the street every evening, and as few of them, in so small an island, can have their plantations at any great distance, than that they may see every day if they will, so the subject of their talk is mostly how affairs went there, with their negroes, or their ground, and then part with one another innocently, but empty. The negroes have yet no hard duty with them. They are rather happy in slavery, for as their food is chiefly vegetables, that could no way else be expended, there is no murmurs bred on that account, and as their business is domestic, either in the services of the house, or in gardening, sowing, or planting, they have no more than what every man would prefer for health and pleasure. The hardest of their work is the carriage of their patroons or their wives to and from the plantations. This they do in hammocks, called at wider serpentines, flung cross a pole, with a cloth over, to screen the person so carried from sun and weather. And the slaves are at each end, and yet even this, methinks, is better than the specious liberty a man has for himself and his heirs to work in a coal-mine. The Negroes are, most of them, through the care of their patroons, Christians, at least nominal, but excepting to some few, they adhere still to many silly pagan customs in their mournings and rejoicings, and in some measure powerful majority has introduced them with the vulgar of the mulatto and Portuguese race. 
If a person die in that collar, the relations and friends of him meet at the house, where the corpse is laid out decently on the ground and covered, all except the face, with a sheet. They fit round it, crying and howling dreadfully, not unlike what our countrymen are said to do in Ireland. This mourning lasts for eight days and nights, but not equally intense, for as the friends who compose the chorus go out and in, are wary and unequally affected, the tone lessens daily, and the intervals of grief are longer. In rejoicings and festivals they are equally ridiculous. They are commonly made on some friend's escape from shipwreck or other danger. They meet in a large room of the house, with a strum-strum, to which one of the company, perhaps, sings woefully. The rest, standing round the room close to the petitions, take it in their turns, one or two at a time, to step round, called dancing the whole clapping their hands continually, and hooping out every minute a beau, which signify no more than how do you. And this foolish mirth will continue three or four days together at a house, and perhaps twelve or sixteen hours at a time. The Portuguese, though eminently abstemious and temperate in all other things, are unbounded in their lusts and perhaps they substitute the former in room of a surgeon as a counterpoison to the mischiefs of a promiscuous celesty. They have most of them venereal taints, and with age become meagre and hectic. I saw two instances here of venereal ulcers that had cancerated to the bowels, spectacles that would have effectually persuaded men, I think, how salutary the restriction of laws are. Anabono is the last and of the least consequence of the three islands, there are plenty of fruits and provisions, exchanged to ships for old clothes and trifles of any sort. They have a governor nominated from Synthome, and two or three priests, neither of which are minded, every one living at discretion, and filled with ignorance and lust. To return to Davis, the next day after he left Anamabo, early in the morning, the man at the masthead espied a sail. It must be observed they keep a good lookout, for, according to their articles, he who first espies a sail, if she proves a prize, is entitled to the best pair of pistols on board, over and above his dividend, in which they take a singular pride, and a pair of pistols has sometimes been sold for thirty pounds from one to another. Immediately they gave chase, and soon came up with her. The ship proved to be a Hollander, and being betwixt Davis and the shore, she made all the sail she could, intending to run aground. Davis guessed her design, and putting out all his small sails, came up with her before she could effect it, and fired a broadside, upon which she immediately struck, and called for quarter. It was granted, for according to Davis's articles, it was agreed that quarter should be given whenever it was called for, upon pain of death. This ship proved a very rich prize, having the governor of Accra on board, with all his effects, going to Holland. There was in money to the value of fifteen thousand pounds sterling, besides other valuable merchandises, all which they brought on board of themselves. Upon this new success they restored Captain Hall and Captain Plum, before mentioned, their ships again, but strengthened their company with thirty-five hands, all white men, taken out of these two in the Maurice sloop. They also restored the Dutch their ship, after having plundered her, as is mentioned. Before they got to the island of Princes, one of their ships, that is, that called the King James, sprung a leak. Davis ordered all hands out of her, on board his own ship, with everything else of use, and left her at an anchor at High Cameroon. As soon as he came in sight of the island, he hoisted English colours. The Portuguese, observing a large ship sailing towards them, sent out a little sloop to examine what she might be. This sloop hailing of Davis, he told them he was an English man of war, in quest of pirates, and that he had received intelligence that there were some upon that coast. Upon this they received him as a welcome guest, and piloted him into the harbour. He saluted the fort, which they answered, and he came to an anchor just under their guns, and hoisted out the pinnace, man of war fashion, ordering nine hands and a coxswain in it, to row him ashore. The Portuguese, to do him the greater honour, sent down a file of musketeers to receive him and conduct him to the governor. The governor, not in the least suspecting what he was, received him very civilly, promising to supply him with whatever the island afforded. Davis thanked him, telling him the King of England would pay for whatever he should take. 
so after several civilities passed between him and the governor, he returned again on board. It happened a French ship came in there to supply itself with some necessaries, which Davis took into his head to plunder, but to give the thing a colour of right, he persuaded the Portuguese that she had been trading with the pirates, and that he found several pirate goods on board, which he seized for the king's use. This story passed so well upon the governor that he commended Davis's diligence. A few days after, Davis, with about fourteen more, went privately ashore, and walked up the country towards a village, where the governor and the other chief men of the island kept their wives, intending, as we may suppose, to supply their husbands' places with them. But being discovered, the women fled to a neighbouring wood, and Davis and the rest retreated to their ship, without effecting their design. The thing made some noise, but as nobody knew them, it passed over. Having cleaned his ship, and put all things in order, his thoughts now were turned upon the main business, that is, the plunder of the island, and not knowing where the treasure lay, a stratagem came into his head, to get it, as he thought, with little trouble, he consulted his men upon it, and they liked the design. His scheme was to make a present to the governor of a dozen negroes, by way of return for the civilities received from him, and afterwards to invite him, with the chief men and some of the friars, on board his ship, to an entertainment. The minute they came on board they were to be secured in irons, and there kept till they should pay a ransom of forty thousand pounds sterling. But... This stratagem proved fatal to him, for a Portuguese negro swam ashore in the night and discovered the whole plot to the governor, and also let him know that it was Davis who had made the attempt upon their wives. However, the governor dissembled, received the pirate's invitation civilly, and promised that he and the rest would go. The next day Davis went on shore himself, as if it were out of greater respect to bring the governor on board. He was received with the usual civility, and he and other principal pirates, who, by the way, had assumed the title of lords, and as such, took upon them to advise or counsel their captain upon any important occasion, and likewise held certain privileges, which the common pirates were debarred from, as walking the quarter-deck, using the great cabin, going ashore at pleasure, and treating with foreign powers, that is, with the captains of ships they made prize of, I say, Davis and some of the lords were desired to walk up to the governor's house to take some refreshment before they went on board. They accepted it without the least suspicion, but never returned again. For an ambuscade was laid, a signal being given, a whole volley was fired upon them. They, every man, dropped, except one. This one fled back and escaped into the boat and got on board the ship. Davis was shot through the bowels, yet he rise again, and made a weak effort to get away. But his strength soon forsook him, and he dropped down dead. Just as he fell, he perceived he was followed, and drawing out his pistols, fired them at his pursuers. Thus, like a gamecock giving a dying blow, that he might not fall unrevenged. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9, Part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 1 of Captain Bartholomew Roberts and His Crew. Bartholomew Roberts sailed in an honest employ from London aboard of the Princess captain plum commander of which ship he was second mate he left england november seventeen nineteen and arrived at guinea about february following and began at anamabo taking in slaves for the west indies was taken in the said ship by captain howell davis as mentioned in the preceding chapter in the beginning he was very averse to this sort of life and would certainly have escaped from them had a fair opportunity presented itself yet afterwards he changed his principles as many besides him have done upon another element and perhaps for the same reason too these preferment and what he did not like as a private man he could reconcile to his conscience as a commander davis being cut off in the manner before mentioned the company found themselves under a necessity of filling up his post for which there appeared two or three candidates among the select part of them that were distinguished by the title of lords 
such were simpson ashplant anstice etc and on canvassing this matter how shattered and weak a condition their government must be without a head since davis had been removed in the manner before mentioned my lord dennis proposed it said over a bowl to this purpose that it was not of any great signification who was dignified with title for really and in truth all good governments had like theirs the supreme power lodged with the community who might doubtless depute and revoke a suited interest or humour we are the original of this claim says he and should a captain be so saucy as to exceed prescription at any time why down with him it will be a caution after he is dead to his successors of what fatal consequence any sort of assuming may be however it is my advice that while we are sober we pitch upon a man of courage and skilled in navigation one who by his counsel and bravery seems best able to defend this commonwealth and ward us from the dangers and tempests of an instable element and the fatal consequences of anarchy and such a one i take roberts to be a fellow i think in all respects worthy your esteem and favour this speech was loudly applauded by all but lord simpson who had secret expectations himself but on this disappointment grew sullen and left them swearing he did not care who they chose captain so it was not a papist for against them he had conceived an irreconcilable hatred for that his father had been a sufferer in monmouth's rebellion roberts was accordingly elected though he had not been above six weeks among them the choice was confirmed both by the lords and commoners and he accepted of the honour saying that since he had dipped his hands in muddy water and must be a pirate it was better being a commander than a common man as soon as the government was settled by promotion other officers in the room of those that were killed by the portuguese the company resolved to revenge captain davis's death he being more than ordinarily respected by the crew for his affability and good nature as well as his conduct and bravery upon all occasions and pursuant to this resolution about thirty men were landed in order to make an attack upon the fort which must be ascended by a steep hill against the mouth of the cannon these men were headed by one kennedy a bold daring fellow but very wicked and profligate they marched directly up under the fire of their ship guns and as soon as they were discovered the portuguese quitted their post and fled to the town and the pirates marched in without opposition set fire to the fort and threw all the guns off the hill into the sea which after they had done they retreated quietly to their ship but this was not looked upon as a sufficient satisfaction for the injury they received therefore most of the company were for burning the town which robert said he would yield to if any means could be proposed of doing it without their own destruction for the town had a securer situation than the fort a thick wood coming almost close to it affording cover to the defendants who under such an advantage he told them it was to be feared would fire and stand better to their arms besides that bare houses would be but a slender reward for their trouble and loss this prudent advice prevailed however they mounted the french ship they seized at this place with twelve guns and lightened her in order to come up to the town the water being shoal and battered down several houses after which they all returned on board gave back the french ship to those that had most right to her and sailed out of the harbour by the light of two portuguese ships which they were pleased to set on fire there roberts stood away to the southward and met with a dutch guinea man which he made prize of but after having plundered her the skipper had his ship again two days after he took an english ship called the experiment captain cornet at cape lopez the men went all into the pirate service and having no occasion for the ship they burnt her and then steered for st thomas but meeting with nothing in their way they sailed for annabona and there watered took in provisions and put it to a vote of the company whether their next voyage should be to the east indies or to brazil the latter being resolved on they sailed accordingly and in twenty-eight days arrived at ferdinando an uninhabited island on that coast here they watered boot-topped their ship and made ready for the designed cruise now that we are upon this coast i think it will be the proper place to present our readers with a description of this country and some ingenious remarks of a friend how beneficial a trade might be carried on here by our west india merchants at a little hazard end of chapter nine part one recording by kate mackenzie chapter nine part two of the general history of the pirates volume one 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 2. A Description of Brazil, etc. Brazil, a name signifying the Holy Cross, was discovered for the King of Portugal by Alvarez Cabral, Anno Domini 1501, extending almost from the equinoctial to 28 degrees south. The air is temperate and cool, in comparison of the West Indies, from stronger breezes and an opener country, which gives less interruption to the winds. The northernmost part of it, stretching about 180 leagues, a fine fertile country, was taken from the Portuguese by the Dutch West India Company, anno 1637 or thereabouts, but the conquerors, as is natural where there is little or no religion subsisting, made such heavy exactions on the Portuguese, and extended such cruelty to the natives, that prepared them both easily to unite for a revolt, facilitated by the Dutch mismanagement. For the states, being at this time very intent on their India settlements, not only recalled Count Maurice, their governor, but neglected supplies to their garrisons. However, though the others were countenanced with a fleet from Portugal, and had the affection of the natives, yet they found means to withstand and struggle with this superior power from 1643 to 1660, and then was wholly abandoned by them, on articles dishonourable to the Portuguese, viz. that the Dutch, on relinquishing, should keep all the places they had conquered in India from Portugal, that they should pay the states eight hundred thousand pounds, and permit them still the liberty of trade to Africa and Brazil on the same custom and duties with the King of Portugal's subjects. But, since that time, new stipulations and treaties have been made, wherein the Dutch, who have been totally excluded the Brazil trade, have, in lieu thereof, a composition of ten per cent for the liberty of trading to Africa, and this is always left by every Portuguese ship, before she begins her slaving, with the Dutch general of the Gold Coast, at Desminas. There are only three principal towns of trade on the Brazil coast, San Salvador, San Sebastian, Pernambuco. San Salvador, in the Baia los Todos Santos, is an archbishopric and seat of the viceroy, the chief port of trade for importation, where most of the gold from the mines is lodged, and whence the fleets for Europe generally depart. The seas about it abound with whalefish, which in the season they catch in great numbers. The flesh is salted up generally to be the victualling of their slave ships and the train reserved for exportation at thirty and thirty-five mil rays a pipe. Rio Janeiro, the town St. Sebastian, is the southernmost of the Portuguese, the worst provided of necessaries, but commodious for a settlement because neither mine and convenient to supervise the slaves who, as I have been told, do usually allow their master a dollar per diem and have the overplus of their work, if any, to themselves. The gold from hence is esteemed the best, for being of a copperish colour, and they have a mint to run it into coin, both here and at Bahia, the moijos of either having the initial letters of each place upon them. Pernambuco, though mentioned last, is the second in dignity, a large and populous town, and has its rise from the ruins of Olinda, or the Hampson, a city of a far pleasanter situation six miles up the river, but not so commodious for traffic and commerce. Just above the town, the river divides itself into two branches, not running directly into the sea, but to the southward. And in the nook of the island made by that division stands the governor's house, a square plain building of Prince Maurice's, with two towers, on which are only this date inscribed, anno 1641. The avenues to it are every way pleasant, through vistas of tall coconut trees. Over each branch of the river is a bridge. That leading to the country is all of timber, but the other to the town, of twenty-six or twenty-eight arches, is half of stone, made by the Dutch, who in their time had little shops and gaming-houses on each side for recreation. The pavements also of the town are in some places of broad tiles, the remaining fragments of their conquest. The town has the outer branch of the river behind it, and the harbour before it, jetting into which latter are close keys for the weighing and receiving of customage on merchandise, and for the meeting and conferring of merchants and traders. The houses are strong-built, but homely, lettuce like those of Lisbon, for the admission of air, 
without closets and, what is worse, hearths, which makes their cookery consist all in frying and stewing upon stoves, and that they do till the flesh become tender enough to shake it to pieces, and one knife is then thought sufficient to serve a table of half a score. The greatest inconvenience of Pernambuca is that there is not one public house in it, so that strangers are obliged to hire any ordinary one they can get at a guinea a month, and others who come to transact affairs of importance must come recommended if it were only for the sake of privacy. The market is stocked well enough, beef being at five farthings per pound, a sheep or goat at nine shillings, a turkey four shillings, and fowls two shillings, the largest I ever saw, and may be procured much cheaper by hiring a man to fetch them out of the country. The dearest in its kind is water, which being setched in vessels from Olinda, will not be put on board in the road under two cruzados a pipe. The Portuguese here are darker than those of Europe, not only from a warmer climate, but their many intermarriages with the Negroes, who are numerous there, and some of them of good credit and circumstances. The women, not unlike the mulatto generation everywhere else, are fond of strangers. Not only the courtesans, whose interest may be supposed to wind up their affections, but also the married women, who think themselves obliged when you favour them with the secrecy of an appointment. But the unhappiness of pursuing a moors is that the generality of both sexes are touched with venerable taints, without so much as one surgeon among them, or anybody skilled in physic, to cure or palliate the progressive mischief. The only person pretending that way is an Irish father, whose knowledge is all comprehended in the virtues of two or three simples, and those, with the salubrity of the air and temperance, is what they depend on for subduing the worst of malignity. And it may not be unworthy notice that though few are exempted from the misfortune of a running, eruptions, or the like, yet I could hear of none precipitated into those deplorable circumstances we see common in unskilful mercurial processes. There are three monasteries and about six churches, none of them rich or magnificent, unless one dedicated to St. Antonio, the patron of their kingdom, which shines all over with exquisite pieces of paint and gold. The export of Brazil, besides gold, is chiefly sugars and tobacco. The latter are sent off in rolls of a quintal weight, kept continually moistened with molasses, which, with the soil it springs from, imparts a strong and peculiar scent more sensible in the snuff made from it, which, though under prohibition of importing to Lisbon, sells here at two shillings per pound, as the tobacco does at about six mirais a roll. The finest of their sugar sells at eight shillings per rouve, and a small ill-tasted rum drawn from the dregs and molasses at two testunes a gallon. Besides these, they send off great quantities of Brazil wood, and whale oil, some gums and parrots, the latter are different from the African in colour and bigness, for as they are blue and larger, these are green and smaller, and the females of them ever retain the wild note and cannot be brought to talk. In lieu of this produce, the Portuguese, once every year by their fleet from Lisbon, import all manner of European commodities, and whoever is unable or negligent of supplying himself at that season buys at a very advanced rate before the return of another. To transport passengers, slaves, or merchandise from one settlement to another, or in fishing, they make use of bark logs, by the Brazilians called fingadas. They are made of four pieces of timber, the two outermost longest, pinned and fastened together, and sharpened at the ends. Towards each extremity, a stool is fixed to sit on for paddling, or holding by, when the agitation is more than ordinary. With these odd sort of engines, continually washed over by the water, do these people with a little triangular sail spreated about the middle of it, venture out of sight of land, and along the coasts for many leagues in any sort of weather, and, if they overset with a squall, which is not uncommon, they swim, and presently turn it upright again. The natives are of the darkest copper colour, with thin hair, of a square, strong make, and muscular, but not so well looking as the woolly generation. They acquiesce patiently to the Portuguese government, who use them much more humanly and Christian-like than the Dutch did, and by that means have extended quietness and peace, as well as their possessions, three or four hundred miles into the country. A country abounding with fine pastures and numerous herds of cattle, and yields a vast increase from everything that is sown. 
hence they bring down to us parrots small monkeys armadillos and sanguines and i have been assured they have far inland a serpent of a vast magnitude called seboya able they say to swallow a whole sheep i have seen myself here the skin of another species full six yards long and therefore think the story not improbable the harbour of pernambuco is perhaps singular it is made of a ledge of rocks half a cable's length from the main and but little above the surface of the water running at that equal distance and height several leagues towards cape augustine a harbour running between them capable of receiving ships of the greatest burthen the northernmost end of this wall of rock is higher than any part of the contiguous line on which a little fort is built commanding the passage either of boat or ship as they come over the bar into the harbour on the starboard side that is the main after you have entered a little way stands another fort a pentagon that would prove of small account i imagine against a few disciplined men and yet in these consists all their strength and security either for the harbour or town they have begun indeed a wall since their removing from olinda designed to surround the latter but the slow progress they make in raising it leaves room to suspect it will be a long time in finishing the road without is used by the portuguese when they are nigh sailing for europe and wait for the convoy or are bound to baia to them and by strangers only when necessity compels the best of it is in ten fathom water near three miles west northwest from the town nigher in is foul with the many anchors lost there by the portuguese ships and farther out in fourteen fathom corally and rocky july is the worst and winter season of this coast the trade winds being then very strong and dead bringing in a prodigious and unsafe swell into the road intermixed every day with squalls rain and a hazy horizon but at other times serener skies and sunshine in these southern latitudes is a constellation which from some resemblance it bears to a jerusalem cross has the name of croziers the brightest of this hemisphere and are observed by as the north star is in northern latitudes but what i mention this for is to introduce the admirable phenomenon in these seas of the magellanic clouds whose risings and sittings are so regular that i have been assured the same nocturnal observations are made by them as by the stars they are two clouds small and whitish no larger in appearance than a man's hat and are seen here in july in the latitude of eighty eight degrees south about four of the clock in the morning if their appearance should be said to be the reflection of light from some celery bodies above them yet the difficulty is not easily answered how these beyond others become so durable and regular in their motions from these casual observations on the country the towns coast and seas of brazil it would be an omission to leave the subject without some essay on an interloping slave trade here which none of our countrymen are adventurous enough to pursue though it very probably under a prudent manager would be attended with safety and very great profit and i admire the more it is not struck at because ships from the southern coast of africa don't lengthen the voyage to the west indies a great deal by taking a part of brazil in their way the disadvantages the portuguese are under for purchasing slaves are these that they have very few proper commodities for guinea and the gold which was their chiefest by an edict in july seventeen twenty two stands now prohibited from being carried thither so that the ships employed therein are few and insufficient for the great mortality and call of their minds besides should they venture at breaking so destructive a law as the above mentioned as no doubt they do or they could make little or no purchase yet gold does not raise its value like merchandise in travelling especially to africa and when the composition with the dutch is also paid they may be said to buy their negroes at almost double the price the english dutch or french do which necessarily raises their value extravagantly at brazil those who can purchase one buying a certain annuity than south sea stock thus far of the call for slaves at brazil i shall now consider and obviate some difficulties objected against any foreigners suppose english interposing in such a trade and they are some on theirs and some on our side on their side it is prohibited under pain of death a law less effectual to the prevention of it than pecuniary munichs would be because a penalty so inadequate and disproportioned is only in terrorum and makes it merciful in the governor or his instruments to take a composition of eight or ten moidores when any subject is catched 
and is the common custom so to do as often as they are found out. On our side it is confiscation of what they can get, which, considering they have no men of war to guard the coast, need be very little, without supine neglect and carelessness. I am a man of war, or privateer, and being in want of provisions, or in search of pirates, put in to Pernambuca for intelligence, to enable me for the pursuit. The dread of pirates keeps every one off, till you have first sent an officer, with the proper compliments to the governor, who immediately gives leave for your buying every necessary you are in want of, provided it be with money, and not an exchange of merchandise, which is against the laws of the country. On this first time of going on shore depends the success of the whole affair, and requires a cautious and discreet management in the person entrusted. He will be immediately surrounded at landing with the great and the small rabble, to inquire who, and whence he comes, and whether bound, etc., and the men are taught to answer, from guinea, denying anything of a slave on board, which are under hatches, and make no show, nor need they, for those who have money to lay out will conclude on that themselves. By that time the compliment is paid to the governor, the news has spread all round the town, and some merchant addresses you as a stranger to the civility of his house, but privately desires to know what negroes he can have, and what price. A governor may possibly use an instrument in sifting this, but the appearance of the gentleman, and the circumstance of being so soon engaged after leaving the other, will go a great way in forming a man's judgment, and leaves him no room for the suspicion of such a snare. However, to have a due guard, intimations will suffice and bring him, and friends enough to carry off the best part of a cargo in two nights' time, from twenty to thirty moidos a boy, and from thirty to forty a man-slave. The hazard is less at Rio Janeiro. There has been another method attempted of settling a correspondence with some Portuguese merchant or two, who, as they may be certain within a fortnight of any vessels arriving on their coast with slaves, might settle signals for the debarking them at an unfrequented part of the coast, but whether any exceptions were made to the price, or that the Portuguese dread discovery and the severest prosecution on so notorious a breach of the law, I cannot tell, but it has hitherto proved abortive. However, stratagems laudable and attended with profit at no other hazard as i can perceive than loss of time are worth attempting it is what is every day practised with the spaniards from jamaica end of chapter nine part two recording by kate mackenzie chapter nine part three of the general history of the pirates volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 3. Upon this coast our rovers cruised for about nine weeks, keeping generally out of sight of land, but without seeing a sail, which discouraged them so that they determined to leave the station and steer for the West Indies, and in order thereto stood in to make the land for the taking of their departure, and thereby they fell in, unexpectedly, with a fleet of forty-two sail of Portuguese ships off the bay of Los Toros Santos, with all their lading in for Lisbon, several of them of good force, who lay to waiting for two men of war of seventy guns each, their convoy. However, Roberts thought it should go hard with him, but he would make up his market among them, and thereupon mixed with the fleet, and kept his men hid till proper resolutions could be formed. That done, they came close up to one of the deepest, and ordered her to send the master on board quietly, threatening to give them no quarters if any resistance or signal of distress was made. The Portuguese, being surprised at these threats, and the sudden flourish of cutlasses from the pirates submitted without a word, and the captain came on board. Robert saluted him after a friendly manner, telling him that they were gentlemen of fortune, but that their business with him was only to be informed which was the richest ship in that fleet, and, if he directed them right, he should be restored to his ship without molestation. Otherwise, he must expect immediate death. Whereupon this Portuguese master pointed to one of forty guns and a hundred and fifty men, a ship of greater force than the rover, but this no ways dismayed them. They mere Portuguese, they said, and so immediately steered away for him. When they came within hail, 
The master whom they had prisoner was ordered to ask how Signor Capitaine did, and to invite him on board, for that he had a matter of consequence to impart to him, which being done, he returned for answer, that he would wait upon him presently. But by the bustle that immediately followed, the pirates perceived they were discovered, and that this was only a deceitful answer to gain time to put their ship in a posture of defence. So, without further delay, they poured in a broadside, boarded and grappled her. The dispute was short and warm, wherein many of the Portuguese fell, and two only of the pirates. By this time the fleet was alarmed, signals of top-gallant sheets flying and guns fired to give notice to the men of war who rid still at an anchor, and made but scurvy haste out to their assistance. And if what the pirates themselves related be true, the commanders of those ships were blamable to the highest degree, and unworthy the title, or so much as the name of men. For Roberts, finding the prize to sail heavy, and yet resolving not to lose her, lay by for the headmost of them, which much outsailed the other, and prepared for battle, which was ignominiously declined, though of such superior force, for not daring to venture on the pirate alone, he tarried so long for his consort as gave them both time leisurely to make off. They found this ship exceeding rich, being laden chiefly with sugar, skins, and tobacco, and in gold forty thousand moidos, beside chains and trinkets of considerable value, particularly a cross set with diamonds, designed for the King of Portugal, which they afterwards presented to the governor of Guiana, by whom they were obliged. Elated with this booty, they had nothing now to think of but some safe retreat, where they might give themselves up to all the pleasures that luxury and wantonness could bestow, and for the present pitched upon a place called the Devil's Islands, in the river of Surinam, on the coast of Guyana, where they arrived, and found the civilest reception imaginable, not only from the governor and factory, but their wives, who exchanged wares, and drove a considerable trade with them. They seized in this river a sloop, and by her gained intelligence, that a brigantine had also sailed in company with her, from Rhode Island, laden with provisions for the coast. A welcome cargo! They, growing short in the sea-store, and, as Sancho says, no adventures to be made without belly-timber. One evening as they were rummaging, their mine of treasure, the Portuguese prize, this expected vessel was descried at masthead, and Roberts, imagining no body could do the business so well as himself, takes forty men in the sloop, and goes in pursuit of her. But a fatal accident followed this rash, though inconsiderable adventure, for Roberts, thinking of nothing less than bringing in the brigantine that afternoon, never troubled his head about the sloop's provision, nor inquired what there was on board to subsist such a number of men. But out he sails after his expected prize, which he not only lost further sight of, but after eight days contending with contrary winds and currents, found themselves thirty leagues to leeward. The current still opposing their endeavours, and perceiving no hopes of beating up to their ship, they came to an anchor, and inconsiderately sent away the boat to give the rest of the company notice of their condition, and to order the ship to them. But, too soon, even the next day, their wants made them sensible of their infatuation, for their water was all expended, and they had taken no thought how they should be supplied, till either the ship came or the boat returned, which was not likely to be under five or six days. Here, like Tantalus, they almost famished in sight of the fresh streams and lakes. Being drove to such extremity at last, that they were forced to tear up the floor of the cabin, and patch up a sort of tub or tray with rope-yarns, to paddle ashore, and fetch off immediate supplies of water to preserve life. After some days, the long-wished-for boat came back, but with the most unwelcome news in the world, for Kennedy, who was lieutenant and left in absence of Roberts to command the privateer and prize, was gone off with both. This was mortification with a vengeance, and you may imagine they did not depart without some hard speeches from those that were left and had suffered by their treachery. And that there need be no further mention of this Kennedy, I shall leave Captain Roberts for a page or two with the remains of his crew to vent their wrath in a few oaths and execrations and follow the other, whom we may reckon from that time as steering his course towards execution dock. Kennedy was now chosen captain of the revolted crew, but could not bring his company to any determined resolution. 
Some of them were for pursuing the old game, but the greater part of them seemed to have inclinations to turn from those evil courses and get home privately, for there was no act of pardon in force. Therefore they agreed to break up, and every man to shift for himself, as he should see occasion. The first thing they did was to part with the great Portuguese prize, and having the master of the sloop, whose name I think was Cain, aboard, who they said was a very honest fellow, for he had honoured them upon every occasion, told them of the brigantine that Roberts went after. And when the pirates first took him, he complimented them at an odd rate, telling them they were welcome to his sloop and cargo, and wished that the vessel had been larger, and the loading richer for their sakes. To this good-natured man they gave the Portuguese ship, which was then above half-loaded, three or four negroes, and all his own men, who returned thanks to his kind benefactors, and departed. Captain Kennedy, in the rover, sailed to Barbados, near which island they took a very peaceable ship belonging to Virginia. The commander was a Quaker, whose name was Knott. He had neither pistol, sword, nor cutlass on board. And Mr. Knott, appearing so very passive to all they said to him, some of them thought this a good opportunity to go off, and accordingly eight of the pirates went aboard, and he carried them safe to Virginia. They made the Quaker a present of ten chests of sugar, ten rolls of Brazil tobacco, thirty moidos, and some gold dust, in all to the value of about two hundred and fifty pounds. They also made presents to the sailors, some more, some less, and lived a jovial life all the while they were upon their voyage, Captain Knott giving them their way, nor indeed could he help himself, unless he had taken an opportunity to surprise them when they were either drunk or asleep. For a week they wore arms aboard the ship, and put him in a continual terror, it not being his principle or the sex to fight, unless with art and collusion. He managed these weapons well, till he arrived at the Capes, and afterwards four of the pirates went off in a boat, which they had taken with them for the more easily making their escapes, and made up the bay towards Maryland, but were forced back by a storm into an obscure place of the country, where, meeting with good entertainment among the planters, they continued several days without being discovered to be pirates. In the meantime, Captain Knott, leaving four others on board his ship, who intended to go to North Carolina, made what haste he could to discover to Mr. Spotswood the governor what sort of passengers he had been forced to bring with him, who by good fortune got them seized. And search being made after the others who were reveling about the country, they were also taken, and all tried, convicted, and hanged, two Portuguese Jews who were taken on the coast of Brazil, and whom they brought with them to Virginia, being the principal evidences. The latter had found means to lodge part of their wealth with the planters, who never brought it to account. But Captain Knott surrendered up every thing that belonged to them, that were taken aboard, even what they presented to him, in lieu of such things as they had plundered him of in their passage, and obliged his men to do the like. Some days after the taking of the Virginia, man last mentioned, in cruising in the latitude of Jamaica, Kennedy took a sloop bound thither from Boston, loaded with bread and flour. Aboard of this sloop went all the hands who were for breaking the gang, and left those behind that had a mind to pursue further adventures. Among the former were Kennedy, their captain, of whole honour they had such a despicable notion that they were about to throw him overboard, when they found him in the sloop, as fearing he might betray them all at their return to England. He, having in his childhood been bred a pickpocket, and before he became a pirate, a housebreaker. Both professions that these gentlemen have a very mean opinion of. However, Captain Kennedy, by taking solemn oaths of fidelity to his companions, was suffered to proceed with them. In this company there was but one that pretended to any skill in navigation, for Kennedy could neither write nor read, he being preferred to the command merely for his courage, which indeed he had often signalised, particularly in taking the Portuguese ship, and he proved to be a pretender only, for shaping their course to Ireland, where they agreed to land, they ran away to the northwest coast of Scotland, and there were tossed about by hard storms of wind for several days, without knowing where they were, and in great danger of perishing. At length, they pushed the vessel into a little creek, and went all ashore, leaving the sloop at an anchor for the next comers. The whole company refreshed themselves at a little village, about five miles from the place where they left the sloop, and passed there for shipwrecked sailors, and no doubt might have travelled on without suspicion, 
but the mad and righteous manner of their living on the road occasioned their journey to be cut short, as we shall observe presently. Kennedy and another left them here, and travelling to one of the seaports shipped themselves for Ireland, and arrived there in safety. Six or seven wisely withdrew from the rest, travelled at their leisure, and got to their much-desired port of London without being disturbed or suspected. But the main gang alarmed the country wherever they came, drinking and roaring at such a rate that the people shut themselves up in their houses in some places, not daring to venture out among so many mad fellows. In other villages they treated the whole town, squandering their money away, as if, like Aesop, they wanted to lighten their burdens. This expensive manner of living procured two of their drunken stragglers to be knocked on the head, they being found murdered in the road, and their money taken from them. All the rest, to the number of seventeen as they drew nigh to Edinburgh, were arrested and thrown into jail, upon suspicion of they knew not what. However, the magistrates were not long at a loss for proper accusations, for two of the gang offering themselves for evidences were accepted of, and the others were brought to a speedy trial, whereof nine were convicted and executed. Kennedy, having spent all his money, came over from Ireland, and kept a common bawdy house on Deptford Road, and, now and then, t'was thought, made an excursion abroad in the way of his former profession, till one of his household wenches gave information against him for a robbery, for which he was committed to Bridewell. But because she would not do the business by halves, she found out a mate of a ship that Kennedy had committed piracy upon, as he foolishly confessed to her. This mate, whose name was Grant, paid Kennedy a visit in Bridewell, and knowing him to be the man, procured a warrant, and had him committed to the Marshalsea prison. The game that Kennedy had now to play was to turn evidence himself. Accordingly, he gave a list of eight or ten of his comrades, but, not being acquainted with their habitations, one only was taken, who, though condemned, appeared to be a man of a fair character, was forced into their service, and took the first opportunity to get from them, and therefore received a pardon. But Walter Kennedy, being a notorious offender, was executed the 19th of July, 1721, at Execution Dock. The rest of the pirates who were left in the ship Rover stayed not long behind, for they went ashore to one of the West India Islands. What became of them afterwards, I can't tell, but the ship was found at sea by a sloop belonging to St. Christopher's, and carried into that island with only nine negroes aboard. Thus we see what a disastrous fate ever attends the wicked, and how rarely they escape the punishment due to their crimes, who, abandoned to such a profligate life, rob, spoil, and prey upon mankind, contrary to the light and law of nature as well as the law of God. It might have been hoped that the examples of these deaths would have been as marks to the remainder of this gang how to shun the rocks their companions had split on, that they would have surrendered to mercy, or divided themselves forever from such pursuits, as in the end they might be sure would subject them to the same law and punishment which they must be conscious they now equally deserved, impending law which never let them sleep well unless when drunk. But all the use that was made of it here was to commend the justice of the court that condemned Kennedy, for he was a sad dog, they said, and deserved the fate he met with. End of chapter 9, part 3, read by Kate McKenzie. Chapter 9, part 4 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 4. But to go back to Roberts, whom we left on the coast of Guyana, in a grievous passion at what Kennedy and the crew had done, and who was now projecting new adventures with his small company in the sloop, but, finding hitherto they had been but as a rope of sand, they formed a set of articles, to be signed and sworn to for the better conservation of their society and doing justice to one another excluding all irish men from the benefit of it to whom they had an implacable aversion upon the account of kennedy how indeed roberts could think that an oath would be obligatory where defiance had been given to the laws of god and man i can't tell but he thought their greatest security lay in this 
that it was every one's interest to observe them if they were minded to keep up so abominable a combination. The following is the substance of the articles, as taken from the pirate's own informations. Number one. Every man has a vote in affairs of moment, has equal title to the fresh provisions or strong liquors at any time seized, and use them at pleasure, unless a scarcity, no uncommon thing among them, make it necessary for the good of all to vote a retrenchment. Number two. Every man to be called fairly in turn, by list, on board of prizes, because, over and above their proper share, they were on these occasions allowed a shift of clothes. But, if they defrauded the company to the value of a dollar, in plate, jewels, or money, marooning was their punishment. This was a barbarous custom of putting the offender on shore, on some desolate or uninhabited cape or island, with a gun, a few shot, a bottle of water, and a bottle of powder, to subsist with or starve. If the robbery was only between one another, they contented themselves with slitting the ears and nose of him that was guilty, and set him on shore, not in an uninhabited place, but somewhere where he was sure to encounter hardships. Number three. No person to game at cards or dice for money. Number four. The lights and candles to be put out at eight o'clock at night. If any of the crew, after that hour, still remained inclined for drinking, they were to do it on the open deck, which Roberts believed would give a check to their debauches, for he was a sober man himself, but found at length that all his endeavours to put an end to this debauch proved ineffectual. Number five. To keep their piece, pistols, and cutlass clean, and fit for service. In this they were extravagantly nice, endeavouring to outdo one another in the beauty and richness of their arms, giving sometimes at an auction, at the mast, thirty or forty pounds a pair for pistols. These were slung in time of service, with different coloured ribbons over their shoulders, in a way peculiar to these fellows, in which they took great delight. Number six. No boy or woman to be allowed amongst them. If any man were found seducing any of the latter sex, and carried her to sea disguised, he was to suffer death so that when any fell into their hands, as it chanced in the Onslow, they put a sentinel immediately over her to prevent ill consequences from so dangerous an instrument of division and quarrel. But then here lies the roguery. They contend who shall be sentinel, which happens generally to one of the greatest bullies, who, to secure the lady's virtue, will let none lie with her but himself. Number seven. To desert the ship or their quarters in battle was punished with death or marooning. Number eight. No striking one another on board, but every man's quarrels to be ended on shore, at sword and pistol. Thus, the quartermaster of the ship, when the parties will not come to any reconciliation, accompanies them on shore with what assistance he thinks proper, and turns the disputants back to back at so many paces distance. At the word of command, they turn and fire immediately, or else the piece is knocked out of their hands. If both miss, they come to their cutlasses, and then he is declared victor who draws the first blood. Number nine. No man to talk of breaking up their way of living till each had a share of a thousand pounds. If in order to this any man should lose a limb or become a cripple in their service, he was to have eight hundred dollars out of the public stock and for lesser hurts proportionably. Number ten. The captain and quartermaster to receive two shares of a prize. The master, boatswain, and gunner, one share and a half, and other officers, one and a quarter. Number eleven. The musicians to have rest on the Sabbath day, but the other six days and nights, none without special favour. These, we are assured, were some of Roberts's articles, but as they had taken care to throw overboard the original they had signed and sworn to, there is a great deal of room to suspect the remainder contained something too horrid to be disclosed to any, except such as were willing to be sharers in the iniquity of them. Let them be what they will, they were together the test of all newcomers who were initiated by an oath taken on a Bible, reserved for that purpose only, and were subscribed to in presence of the worshipful Mr. Roberts. And, in case any doubt should arise concerning the construction of these laws, and it should remain a dispute whether the party had infringed them or no, a jury is appointed to explain them, and bring in a verdict upon the case in doubt. 
Since we are now speaking of the laws of this company, I shall go on and, in as brief a manner as I can, relate the principal customs and government of this roguish commonwealth, which are pretty near the same with all pirates. For the punishment of small offences, which are not provided for by the articles, and which are not of consequence enough to be left to a jury, there is a principal officer among the pirates, called the quartermaster, the men's own choosing, who claims all authority this way, excepting in time of battle. If they disobey his command, a quarrelsome and mutinous with one another, misuse prisoners, plunder beyond his order, and in particular, if they be negligent of their arms, which he musters at discretion, he punishes at his own arbitrament, with drubbing or whipping, which no one else dare do, without incurring the lash from all the ship's company. In short, this officer is trustee for the whole, is the first on board any prize, separating for the company's use what he pleases, and returning what he thinks fit to the owners, excepting gold and silver, which they have voted not returnable. After a description of the quartermaster and his duty, who acts as a sort of a civil magistrate on board a pirate ship, I shall consider their military officer, the captain, what privileges he exerts in such anarchy and unruliness for the members, why truly very little, they only permit him to be a captain, on condition that they may be captain over him. They separate to his use the great cabin, and sometimes vote him small parcels of plate and china, for it may be noted that Roberts drank his tea constantly, but then every man, as the humour takes him, will use the plate and china, intrude into his apartment, swear at him, seize a part of his victuals and drink if they like it, without his offering to find fault or contest it. Yet Roberts, by a better management than usual, became the chief director in everything of moment, and it happened thus. The rank of captain being obtained by the suffrage of the majority, it falls on one superior for knowledge and boldness, pistol-proof, as they call it, and can make those fear who do not love him. Roberts is said to have exceeded his fellows in these respects, and, when advanced, enlarged the respect that followed it, by making a sort of privy council of half a dozen of the greatest bullies, such as were his competitors, and had interest enough to make his government easy. Yet even those, in the latter part of his reign, he had run counter to in every project that opposed his own opinion, for which, and because he grew reserved, and would not drink and roar at their rate, a cabal was formed to take away his captainship, which death did more effectually. The captain's power is uncontrollable in chase or in battle, drubbing, cutting, or even shooting any one who dares deny his command. The same privilege he takes over prisoners, who receive good or ill usage, mostly as he approves of their behaviour, for though the meanest would take upon them to misuse a master of a ship, yet he would control her in, when he see it, and merrily over a bottle, give his prisoners this double reason for it. First, that it preserved his precedence, and secondly, that it took the punishment out of the hands of a much more rash and mad set of fellows than himself. When he found that rigour was not expected from his people, for he often practised it to appease them, then he would give strangers to understand that it was pure inclination that induced him to a good treatment of them, and not any love or partiality to their persons. For, says he, there is none of you but will hang me, I know, whenever you can clinch me within your power. And now, seeing the disadvantages they were under for pursuing the account, viz. a small vessel ill-prepared, and without provisions or stores, they resolved, one and all, with the little supplies they could get, to proceed for the West Indies, not doubting to find a remedy for all these evils, and to retrieve their loss. In the latitude of Deseda, one of the islands, they took two sloops, which supplied them with provisions and other necessaries, and a few days afterwards, took a brigantine belonging to Rhode Island, and then proceeded to Barbados, off of which island they fell in with a Bristol ship of ten guns in her voyage out, from whom they took abundance of clothes, some money, twenty-five bales of goods, five barrels of powder, a cable, hawser, ten casks of oatmeal, six casks of beef, and several other goods besides five of their men. And after they had detained her three days, let her go, who being bound for the above said island, she acquainted the governor with what had happened as soon as she arrived. Whereupon a Bristol galley that lay in the harbour was ordered to be fitted out with all imaginable expedition of twenty guns and eighty men, there being then no man of war upon that station, 
and also a sloop with ten guns and forty men. The galley was commanded by one Captain Rogers of Bristol, and the sloop by Captain Graves of that island, and Captain Rogers, by a commission from the governor, was appointed commodore. The second day after Rogers sailed out of the harbour, he was discovered by Roberts, who, knowing nothing of their design, gave them chase. The Barbados ships kept an easy sail till the pirates came up with them, and then Roberts gave them a gun, expecting they would have immediately struck to his piratical flag, but instead thereof he was forced to receive the fire of a broadside with three huzzas at the same time, so that an engagement ensued, but Roberts, being hardly put to it, was obliged to crowd all the sail the sloop would bear to get off. The galley sailing pretty well kept company for a long while, keeping a constant fire which galed the pirate. However, at length, by throwing over their guns and other heavy goods, and thereby lightening the vessel, they, with much ado, got clear. But Roberts could never endure a Barbados man afterwards, and when any ships belonging to that island fell in his way, he was more particularly severe to them than others. Captain Roberts sailed in the sloop to the island of Dominica, where he watered and got provisions of the inhabitants, to whom he gave goods in exchange. At this place he met with thirteen Englishmen, who had been set ashore by a French guard de la Coste, belonging to Martinique, taken out of two New England ships that had been seized as prize by the said French sloop. The men willingly entered with the pirates, and it proved a seasonable recruit. They stayed not long here, though they had immediate occasion for cleaning their sloop, but did not think this a proper place, and herein they judged right, for the touching at this island had like to have been their destruction, because they having resolved to go away to the Granada Islands for the aforesaid purpose, by some accident it came to be known to the French colony, who, sending word to the governor of Martinique, he equipped and manned two sloops to go in quest of them. The pirates sailed directly for the Granadillos, and hauled into a lagoon at Corvacou, where they cleaned with unusual dispatch, staying but a little above a week, by which expedition they missed of the Martinique sloops only a few hours, Robert sailing overnight, that the French arrived the next morning. This was a fortunate escape, especially considering that it was not from any fears of their being discovered that they made so much haste from the island, but, as they had the impudence themselves to own, for the want of wine and women. Thus narrowly escaped, they sailed for Newfoundland, and arrived upon the banks the latter end of June, 1720. They entered the harbour of Trapassi, with their black colours flying, drums beating, and trumpets sounding. There were two and twenty vessels in the harbour, which the men all quitted upon the sight of the pirate, and fled ashore. It is impossible particularly to recount the destruction and havoc they made here, burning and sinking all the shipping, except a Bristol galley, and destroying the fisheries and stages of the poor planters, without remorse or compunction. For nothing is so deplorable as power in mean and ignorant hands. It makes men wanton and giddy, unconcerned at the misfortunes they are imposing on their fellow creatures, and keeps them smiling at the mischiefs that bring themselves to no advantage. They are like madmen, that cast firebrands, arrows, and death, and say, Are not we in sport? Roberts manned the Bristol galley he took in the harbour, and mounted sixteen guns on board her, and, cruising out upon the banks, he met with nine or ten sail of French ships, all which he destroyed, except one of twenty-six guns, which they seized, and carried off for their own use. This ship they christened the Fortune, and leaving the Bristol galley to the Frenchmen, they sailed away in company with the sloop on another cruise, and took several prizes, viz. the Richard of Biddeford, Jonathan Whitfield Master, the Willing Mind of Poole, the Expectation of Topsom, and the Samuel, Captain Carey of London. Out of these ships they increased their company, by entering all the men they could well spare in their own service. The Samuel was a rich ship, and had several passengers on board, who were used very roughly, in order to make them discover their money, threatening them every moment with death if they did not resign everything up to them. They tore up the hatches, and entered the hold like a parcel of furies, and with axes and cutlasses, cut and broke open all the bales, cases, and boxes they could lay their hands on, and, when any goods came upon deck, that they did not like to carry aboard, instead of tossing them into the hold again, threw them overboard into the sea. All this was done with incessant cursing and swearing, 
more like fiends than men. They carried with them sails, guns, powder, cordage, and eight or nine thousand pounds worth of the choicest goods, and told Captain Carey that they should accept of no act of grace, that the K and P might be damned with their acts of God for them. Neither would they go to Hope Point to be hanged up a sun drying as kids and Bradish's company were, but if they should ever be overpowered, they would set fire to the powder with a pistol and go all merrily to hell together. After they had brought all the booty aboard, a consultation was held whether they should sink or burn the ship, but whilst they were debating the matter, they spied a sail, and so left the Samuel to give a chase. At midnight they came up with the same, which proved to be a snow from Bristol, bound for Boston, Captain Bowles' master. They used him barbarously, because of his country, Captain Rogers, who attacked them off Barbados, being of the city of Bristol. July the 16th, which was two days afterwards, they took a Virginia man called the Little York, James Phillips' master, and the love of Liverpool, which they plundered and let go. The next day a snow from Bristol, called the Phoenix, John Richard's master, met with the same fate from them, as also a brigantine, Captain Thomas, and a sloop called the Sudbury. They took all the men out of the brigantine and sunk the vessel. When they left the banks of Newfoundland, they sailed for the West Indies, and the provisions growing short, they went for the latitude of the island Deseda, to cruise, it being esteemed the likeliest place to meet with such ships as, they used in their mirth to say, were consigned to them with supplies. And it has been very much suspected that ships have loaded with provisions at the English colonies on pretense of trading on the coast of Africa, when they have in reality been consigned to them. And though a show of violence is offered to them when they meet, yet they are pretty sure of bringing their cargo to a good market. However, at this time they missed with their usual luck, and provisions and necessaries becoming more scarce every day, they retired towards St. Christopher's, where, being denied all succour or assistance from the government, they fired in revenge on the town, and burnt two ships in the road, one of them commanded by Captain Cox of Bristol, and then retreated farther to the island of St. Bartholomew, where they met with much handsomer treatment. The governor, not only supplying them with refreshments, but he and the chiefs caressing them in the most friendly manner, and the women, from so good an example, endeavoured to outvie each other in dress and behaviour to attract the good graces of such generous lovers that paid well for their favours. End of chapter 9, part 4Chapter 9, Part 5 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 5. Sated at length with these pleasures, and having taken on board a good supply of fresh provisions, they voted unanimously for the coast of Guinea, and in the latitude of twenty-two degrees north in their voyage thither, met with a French ship from Martinique, richly laden and, which was unlucky for the master, had a property of being fitter for their purpose than the banker. Exchange was no robbery, they said, and so after a little mock complaisance to Monsieur for the favour he had done them, they shifted their men and took leave. This was their first royal fortune. In this ship Roberts proceeded on his design voyage, but before they reached Guinea, he proposed to touch at Brava, the southernmost of Cape Verde Islands, and clean. But here again by an intolerable stupidity and want of judgment, they got so far to leeward of their port, that, despairing to regain it or any of the windward parts of Africa, they were obliged to go back again with the trade wind for the West Indies which had very near been the destruction of them all. Surinam was the place now designed for, which was at no less than seven hundred leagues distance, and they had but one hogshead of water left to supply a hundred and twenty-four souls for that passage, a sad circumstance that eminently exposes the folly and madness among pirates, and he must be an inconsiderate wretch indeed, who, if he could separate the wickedness and punishment from the fact would yet hazard his life amidst such dangers as their want of skill and forecast made them liable to. 
their sins we may presume were never so troublesome to their memories as now that inevitable destruction seemed to threaten them without the least glimpse of comfort or alleviation to their misery for with what face could wretches who had ravaged and made so many necessitous look up for relief they had to that moment lived in defiance of the power that now alone they must trust for their preservation and indeed without the miraculous intervention of providence there appeared only this miserable choice viz a present death by their own hands or a lingering one by famine they continued their course and came to an allowance of one single mouthful of water for twenty-four hours many of them drank their urine or sea-water which instead of allaying gave them an inextinguishable thirst that killed them others pined and wasted a little more time in fluxes and apyrexes so that they dropped away daily those that sustained the misery best were such as almost starved themselves forbearing all sorts of food unless a mouthful or two of bread the whole day so that those who survived were as weak as it was possible for men to be and alive but if the dismal prospect they set out with gave them anxiety trouble or pain what must their fears and apprehensions be when they had not one drop of water left or any other liquor to moisten or animate this was their case when by the working of divine providence no doubt they were brought into soundings and at night anchored in seven fathom water this was an inexpressible joy to them and as it were fed the expiring lamp of life with fresh spirits but this could not hold long when the morning came they saw land from the masthead but it was at so great a distance that it afforded but an indifferent prospect to men who had drunk nothing for the two last days however they dispatched their boat away and late the same night it returned to their no small comfort with a load of water informing them that they had got off the mouth of Meriwinga River on the coast of Suriname. One would have thought so miraculous an escape should have wrought some reformation, but, alas, they had no sooner quenched their thirst, but they had forgot the miracle till scarcity of provisions awakened their senses and bid them guard against starving. Their allowance was very small, and yet they would profanely say, that providence which had gave them drink would no doubt bring them meat also if they would use but an honest endeavour in pursuance of these honest endeavours they were steering for the latitude of barbados with what little they had left to look out for more or starve and in their way met a ship that answered their necessities and after that a brigantine the former was called the greyhound belonging to st christopher's and bound to philadelphia the mate of which signed the pirate's articles and was afterwards captain of the ranger consort to the royal fortune out of the ship and brigantine the pirates got a good supply of provisions and liquor so that they gave over the designed cruise and watered at tobago and hearing of the two sloops that had been fitted out and sent after them at corvacou they sailed to the island of martinique to make the governor some sort of an equivalent for the care and expedition he had shown in that affair it is the custom at martinique for the dutch interlopers that have a mind to trade with the people of the island to hoist their jacks when they come before the town roberts knew the signal and being an utter enemy to them he bent his thoughts upon mischief and accordingly came in with his jack flying which as he expected they mistook for a good market and thought themselves happiest that could soonest dispatch off their sloops and vessels for trade when roberts had got them within his power one after another he told them he would not have it said that they came off for nothing and therefore ordered them to leave their money behind for that they were a parcel of rogues and hoped they would always meet with such a dutch trade as this was he reserved one vessel to set the passengers on shore again and fired the rest to the number of twenty roberts was so enraged at the attempts that had been made for taking of him by the governors of barbados and martinique that he ordered a new jack to be made which they ever after hoisted with his own figure portrayed standing upon two skulls and under them the letters a b h and a m h signifying a barbadian's and martinican's head as may be seen in the plate of captain roberts at domenico the next island they touched at 
they took a Dutch interloper of twenty-two guns and seventy-five men, and a brigantine belonging to Rhode Island, one Norton master. The former made some defence, till some of his men being killed, the rest were discouraged and struck their colours. With these two prizes, they went down to Guadeloupe, and brought out a sloop and a French flyboat laden with sugar. The sloop they burnt, and went on to Mune, another island, thinking to clean, but, finding the sea ran too high there to undertake it with safety, they bent their course for the north part of Hispaniola, where, at Bennett's Kev, in the Gulf of Samina, they cleaned both the ship and the brigantine, for, though Hispaniola be settled by the Spaniard and French, and is the residence of a president from Spain who receives and finally determines appeals from all the other Spanish West India islands, yet is its people by no means proportioned to its magnitude, so that there are many harbours in it, to which pirates may securely resort without fear of discovery from the inhabitants. Whilst they were here, two sloops came in, as they pretended, to pay Roberts a visit. The masters, whose names were Porter and Tuckerman, addressed the pirate, as the Queen of Sheba did Solomon to wit, that, having heard of his fame and achievements, they had put in there to learn his art and wisdom in the business of pirating, being vessels on the same honourable design with himself, and, hoped with the communication of his knowledge, they should also receive his charity, being in want of necessaries for such adventures. Roberts was won upon by the peculiarity and bluntness of these two men, and gave them powder, arms, and whatever else they had occasion for, spent two or three merry nights with them, and, at parting, said he hoped the Lord would, would prosper their handy works. They passed some time here, after they had got their vessel ready in their usual debaucheries, and had taken a considerable quantity of rum and sugar, so that liquor was as plenty as water, and few there were who denied themselves the immoderate use of it. Nay, sobriety brought a man under a suspicion of being in a plot against the commonwealth, and in their sense he was looked upon to be a villain that would not be drunk. This was evident in the affair of Harry Glasby, chosen master of the royal fortune who with two others laid hold of the opportunity at the last island they were at to move off without bidding farewell to his friends glasby was a reserved sober man and therefore gave occasion to be suspected so that he was soon missed after he went away and a detachment being sent in quest of the deserters they were all three brought back again the next day this was a capital offence and for which they were ordered to be brought to an immediate trial here was the form of justice kept up, which is as much as can be said of several other courts that have more lawful commissions for what they do. Here was no feeing of counsel and bribing of witnesses was a custom not known among them, no packing of juries, no torturing and resting the sense of the law, for by ends and purposes, no puzzling or perplexing the cause with unintelligible counting terms and useless distinctions nor was their sessions burthened with numberless officers the ministers of rapine and extortion with ill-boding aspects enough to fright a tra from the court the place appointed for their trials was the steerage of the ship in order to which a large bowl of rum punch was made and placed upon the table the pipes and tobacco being ready the judicial proceedings began the prisoners were brought forth and articles of indictment against them read they were arraigned upon a statute of their own making, and the letter of the law being strong against them, and the fact plainly proved, they were about to pronounce sentence, when one of the judges moved that they should first smoke to the pipe, which was accordingly done. All the prisoners pleaded for arrest of judgment very movingly, but the court had such an abhorrence of their crime that they could not be prevailed upon to show mercy, till one of the judges, whose name was Valentine Ashplant, stood up, and, taking his pipe out of his mouth, said he had something to offer to the court on behalf of one of the prisoners, and spoke to this effect. By God, Glasby shall not die. Damn me if he shall. After this learned speech, he sat down in his place and resumed his pipe. This motion was loudly opposed by all the rest of the judges in equivalent terms, but Ashplant, who was resolute in his opinion, made another pathetical speech in the following manner. God damn ye, gentlemen, I am as good a man as the best of you. Damn my soul if I ever turn my back to any man in my life or ever will, by God. 
Glasby is an honest fellow, notwithstanding this misfortune, and I love him. Double damn me if I don't. I hope he'll live and repent of what he has done, but damn me if he must die. I will die along with him. And thereupon he pulled out a pair of pistols, and presented them to some of the learned judges upon the bench, who, perceiving his argument so well supported, thought it reasonable that Glasby should be acquitted, and so they all came over to his opinion, and allowed it to be law. But all the mitigation that could be obtained for the other prisoners was that they should have the liberty of choosing any four of the whole company to be their executioners. The poor wretches were tied immediately to the mast, and there shot dead, pursuant to their villainous sentence. When they put to sea again, the prizes which had been detained only for fear of spreading any rumour concerning them, which had like to have been so fatal at Corvacou, were thus disposed of. They burnt their own sloop, and manned Norton's brigantine, sending the master away in the Dutch interloper, not dissatisfied. With the royal fortune and the brigantine, which they christened the good fortune, they pushed towards the latitude of Deseada, to look out for provisions, being very short again, and, just to their wish, Captain Hingston's ill fortune brought him in their way, richly laden for Jamaica. Him they carried to Bermuda, and plundered, and stretching back again to the West Indies, they continually met with some consignment or other, chiefly French, which stored them with plenty of provisions, and recruited their starving condition, so that stocked with this sort of ammunition, they began to think of something worthy of their aim, for these robberies that only supplied what was in constant expenditure by no means answered their intentions. And, accordingly, they proceeded again for the coast of Guinea, where they thought to buy gold dust very cheap. In their passage thither, they took numbers of ships of all nations, some of which they burnt or sunk as the carriage of characters of the master displeased them. Notwithstanding the successful adventures of this crew, yet it was with great difficulty they could be kept together, under any kind of regulation, for, being almost always mad or drunk, their behaviour produced infinite disorders, every man being in his own imagination a captain, a prince, or a king. When Robert saw there was no managing of such a company of wild, ungovernable brutes by gentle means, nor to keep them from drinking to excess, the cause of all their disturbances, he put on a rougher deportment, and a more magisterial carriage towards them, correcting whom he thought fit, and, if any seemed to resent his usage, he told them, they might go ashore and take satisfaction of him, if they thought fit, at sword and pistol, for he neither valued or feared any of them. About four hundred leagues from the coast of Africa, the brigantine who had hitherto lived with them, in all amicable correspondence, thought fit to take the opportunity of a dark night and leave the commodore which leads me back to the relation of an accident that happened at one of the islands of the west indies where they watered before they undertook this voyage which had like to have thrown their government such as it was off the hinges and was partly the occasion of the separation the story is as follows captain roberts having been insulted by one of the drunken crew whose name I have forgot, he, in the heat of his passion, killed the fellow on the spot, which was resented by a great many others, but particularly one Jones, a brisk, active young man, who died lately in the Marshalsea, and was his messmate. This Jones was at that time ashore a-watering the ship, but as soon as he came on board, was told that Captain Roberts had killed his comrade, upon which he cursed Roberts, and said he ought to be served so himself. Roberts, hearing Jones's invective, ran to him with a sword, and ran him into the body, who, notwithstanding his wound, seized the captain, threw him over a gun, and beat him handsomely. This adventure put the whole company in an uproar, and some taking part with the captain and others against him, there had like to have ensued a general battle with one another, like my lord Thormont's cox, However, the tumult was at length appeased by the meditation of the quartermaster, and, as the majority of the company were of opinion that the dignity of the captain ought to be supported on board, that it was a post of honour, and therefore the person whom they thought fit to confer it on should not be violated by any single member, wherefore they sentenced Jones to undergo two lashes from every one of the company for his misdemeanour, which was executed upon him as soon as he was well of his wound. This severe punishment did
did not at all convince Jones that he was in the wrong, but rather animated him to some sort of a revenge. But not being able to do it upon Roberts's person on board the ship, he and several of his comrades correspond with Anstis, captain of the brigantine, and conspire with him and some of the principal pirates on board that vessel to go off from the company. What made Anstis a malcontent was the inferiority he stood in with respect to Roberts, who carried himself with a haughty and magisterial air to him and his crew, he regarding the brigantine only as a tender, and, as such, left them no more than the refuse of their plunder. In short, Jones and his consort go on board of Captain Anstis, on pretense of a visit, and there consulting with their brethren, they find a majority for leaving of Roberts, and so came to a resolution to bid a soft farewell, as they call it, that night, and to throw overboard whosoever should stick out. But they proved to be unanimous, and effected their design as above mentioned. I shall have no more to say of Captain Anstis till the story of Roberts is concluded. Therefore I return to him in the pursuit of his voyage to Guinea. The loss of the brigantine was a sensible shock to the crew, she being an excellent sailor, and had seventy hands aboard. However, Roberts, who was the occasion of it, put on a face of unconcern at this, his ill-conduct and mismanagement, and resolved not to alter his purposes upon that account. Roberts fell into Windward nigh the Senegal, a river of great trade for gum, on this part of the coast, monopolised by the French, who constantly keep cruisers to hinder the interloping trade. At this time they had two small ships on that service, one of ten guns and sixty-five men, and the other of sixteen guns and seventy-five men, who, having got a sight of Mr. Roberts, and supposing him to be one of these prohibited traders, chased with all the sail they could make to come up with him. But their hopes, which had brought them very nigh, too late deceived them, for on the hoisting of Jolly Roger, the name they gave their black flag, their French hearts failed, and they both surrendered without any, or at least very little, resistance. With these prizes, they went into Sierra Leone, and made one of them their consort by the name of the Ranger and the other a storeship to clean by. Sierra Leone River disgorges with a large mouth, the starboard side of which drafts into little bays, safe and convenient for cleaning and watering. What still made it preferable to the pirates is that the traders settled here are naturally their friends. There are about thirty English men in all, men who in some part of their lives have either been privateering, buccaneering, or pirating, and still retain and love the riots and humours common to that sort of life. They live very friendly with the natives, and have many of them of both sexes to be their grammetas, or servants. The men are faithful, and the women so obedient, that they are very ready to prostitute themselves to whomsoever their masters shall command them. The Royal African Company has a fort on a small island called Bent's Island, but tis of little use, besides keeping their slaves the distance making it incapable of giving any molestation to their starboard shore. Here lives at this place an old fellow, who goes by the name of Crackers, who was formerly a noted buccaneer, and, while he followed the calling, robbed and plundered many a man. He keeps the best house in the place, has two or three guns before his door, with which he salutes his friends, the pirates when they put in, and lives a jovial life with him all the while they are there. Here follows a list of the rest of those lawless merchants and their servants who carry on a private trade with the interlopers, to the great prejudice of the Royal African Company, who, with extraordinary industry and expense, have made and maintain settlements without any consideration from those who, without such settlements and forts, would soon be under an incapacity of pursuing any such private trade. Wherefore, tis to be hoped, proper means will be taken to root out a pernicious set of people who have, all their lives, supported themselves by the labours of other men. Two of these fellows entered with Robert's crew, and continued with them till the destruction of the company. A list of the white men, now living on the high land of Sierra Leone, and the craft they occupy. John Ledston, Three Boats and Periago his man Tom, his man John Brown. Alexander Middleton, one longboat, his man Charles Hawkins. 
John Pierce, partners, one longboat. William Mead, partners, one longboat. Their man, John Vernon. David Chapmers, one longboat. John Chapmers, one longboat. Richard Richardson, one longboat. Norton, partners, two longboats and two small boats. Richard Warren, partners, two longboats and two small boats. Roberts Glynn, partners, two longboats and two small boats. His man, John Franks. William Waits and one young man. John Bonneman. John England, one longboat. Robert Samples, one longboat. William Pressgrove, one sloop, two longboats, a small boat, and Periago. Harry, one sloop, two longboats, a small boat, and Periago. Davis, one sloop, two longboats, a small boat, and Periago. Mitchell, one sloop, two longboats, a small boat, and Periago. Richard Lamb, with Rocky Rodrigues, a Portuguese. George Bishop. Peter Brown. John Jones, one longboat. His Irish young man. At Rio Pongo, Benjamin Gunn. At Kidham, George Yates. At Galenius, Richard Lemons. The harbour is so convenient for wooding and watering that it occasions many of our trading ships, especially those of Bristol, to call in there with large cargoes of beer, cider, and strong liquors, which they exchange with these private traders for slaves and teeth, purchased by them at the Rio Nunes and other places to the northward, so that here was what they call good living. End of chapter 9, part 5"'Chapter Nine, Part Six of the General History of the Pirates, Volume One. "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. "'For more information or to volunteer, "'please visit LibriVox.org. "'Recording by Kate McKenzie. "'The General History of the Pirates, Volume One by Charles Johnson. "'Chapter Nine, Part Six. "'Hither Roberts came the end of June, 1721, "'and had intelligence that the Swallow and Weymouth two men of war of fifty guns each, had left that river about a month before, and designed to return about Christmas, so that the pirates could indulge themselves with all the satisfaction in the world, in that they knew they were not only secure whilst there, but that in going down the coast after the men of war, they should always be able to get such intelligence of their rendezvous as would serve to make their expedition safe. So, after six weeks' stay, the ships being cleaned and fitted, and the men weary of whoring and drinking, they bethought themselves of business, and went to see the beginning of August, taking their progress down the whole coast as low as Jacquin, plundering every ship they met, of what was valuable in her, and sometimes to be more mischievously wicked, they would throw what they did not want overboard, accumulating cruelty to theft. In this range, they exchanged their old friendship for a fine frigate-built ship called the Onslow, belonging to the Royal African Company, Captain G. Commander, which happened to lie at Sestos to get water and necessaries for the company. A great many of Captain G.'s men were ashore when Roberts bore down, and so the ship consequently surprised into his hands, though had they all been on board it was not likely the case would have been otherwise, the sailors most of them voluntarily joining the pirates, and encouraging the same disposition in the soldiers, who were going passengers with them to Cape Corso Castle, whose ears, being constantly tickled with the feats and gallantry of those fellows, made them fancy that to go was only being bound on a voyage of night errantry, to relieve the distressed and gather up fame, and so they likewise offered themselves. But here the pirates were at a stand. They entertained so contemptible a notion of landmen, that they put him off with refusals for some time, till at length, being wearied with solicitations, and pitying a parcel of stout fellows, which they said were going to starve upon a little Cancian plantain, they accepted of them, and allowed them one quarter share, as it was then termed, out of charity. There was a clergyman on board the Onslow, sent from England, to be chaplain of Cape Corso Castle. Some of the pirates were for keeping him, alleging merrily that their ship wanted a chaplain. Accordingly, they offered him a share to take on with them, promising he should do nothing for his money but make punch and say prayers. Yet, however brutish they might be in other things, they bore so great a respect to his order that they resolved not to force him against his inclinations, 
and the parson having no relish for this sort of life excused himself from accepting the honour they designed him they were satisfied and generous enough to deliver him back everything he owned to be his the parson laid hold of this favourable disposition of the pirates and laid claim to several things belonging to others which were also given up to his great satisfaction in fine they kept nothing which belonged to the church except three prayer-books and a bottle-screw the pirates kept the onslow for their own use and gave captain g the friendship and then fell to making such alterations as might fit her for a sea-rover pulling down her bulkheads and making her flush so that she became in all respects as complete a ship for their purpose as any they could have found they continued to her the name of the royal fortune and mounted her with forty guns she and the ranger proceeded as i said before to jacquois and from thence to old calabar where they arrived about october in order to clean their ships a place the most suitable along the whole coast for there is a bar with not above fifteen foot water upon it and the channel intricate so that had the men of war been sure of their being harboured there they might still have bid defiance to their strength for the depth of water at the bar as well as the want of a pilot was a sufficient security to the rovers and invincible impediments to them here therefore they sat easy and divided the fruits of their dishonest industry and drank and drove care away the pilot who brought them into this harbour was captain l who for this and other services was extremely well paid according to the journal of their own accounts which do not run in the ordinary and common way of debtor contra creditor but much more concise lumping it to their friends and so carrying the debt in their heads against the next honest trader they meet they took at calabar captain lone and two or three bristol ships the particulars of all which would be an unnecessary prolixity therefore i come now to give an account of the usage they received from the natives of this place the calabar negroes did not prove so civil as they expected for they refused to have any commerce or trade with them when they understood they were pirates an indication that these poor creatures in the narrow circumstances they were in and without the light of the gospel or the advantage of an education have notwithstanding such a moral innate honesty as would upbraid and shame the most knowing christian but this did but exasperate these lawless fellows and so a party of forty men would attach to force a correspondence or drive the negroes to extremities and they accordingly landed under the fire of their own cannon the negroes drew up in a body of two thousand men as if they intended to dispute the matter with them and stayed till the pirates advanced within pistol shot but finding the loss of two or three made no impression on the rest the negroes thought fit to retreat which they did with some loss the pirates set fire to the town and then returned to their ships this terrified the natives and put an entire stop to all the intercourse between them so that they could get no supplies which obliged them as soon as they had finished the cleaning and trimming of their ships to lose no time but went for cape lopez and watered and at annabona took aboard a stock of fresh provisions and then sailed for the coast again this was their last and fatal expedition which we shall be more particular in because it cannot be imagined that they could have had assurance to have undertaken it but upon a presumption that the men of war whom they knew were upon the coast were unable to attack them or else pursuant to the rumour that had indiscretionally obtained at sierra leone gone thither again it is impossible at this time to think they could know of the weak and sickly condition they were in and therefore founded the success of this second attempt upon the coast on the latter presumption and this seems to be confirmed by their falling in with the coast as low as cape la Hoo, and even that was higher than they designed in the beginning of january and took the ship called the king solomon with twenty men in their boat and a trading vessel both belonging to the company the pirate ship happened to fall about a league to leeward of the king solomon at cape apollonia and the current and wind opposing their working up with the ship they agreed to send the longboat with a sufficient number of men to take her the pirates are all volunteers on these occasions the word being always given who will go and presently the stanch and firm men offer themselves because by such readiness they recommend their courage and have an allowance also of a shift of clothes from head to foot out of the prize they rode towards the king solomon with a great deal of alacrity and being hailed by the commander of her answered defiance 
Captain Traherne, before this, observing a great number of men in the boat, began not to like his visitors, and prepared to receive them, firing a musket as they came under his stern, which they returned with a volley, and made greater speed to get on board. Upon this, he applied to his men, and asked them whether they would stand by him to defend the ship, it being a shame they should be taken by half their number, without any repulse. But his boatswain, Phillips, took upon him to be the mouth of the people, and put an end to the dispute. He said, plainly, he would not, laid down his arms in the king's name, as he was pleased to term it, and called out to the boat for quarters, so that the rest, by his example, were misled to the losing of the ship. When they came on board, they brought her under sail, by an expeditious method, of cutting the cable. Walden, one of the pirates, telling the master, this yo hope of heaving up the anchor was a needless trouble, when they designed to burn the ship. They brought her under Commodore Roberts's stern, and not only rifled her of what sails, cordage, etc. they wanted for themselves, but wantonly throwed the goods of the company overboard, like spendthrifts, that neither expected or designed any account. On the same day also, they took the Flushing, a Dutch ship, robbed her of masts, yards and stores, and then cut down her foremast. But what sat as heavily as anything with the skipper was, their taking some fine sausages he had on board, of his wife's making, and stringing them in a ludicrous manner round their necks, till they had sufficiently showed their contempt of them, and then threw them into the sea. Others chopped the heads of his fowls off, to be dressed for their supper, and courteously invited the landlord, provided he would find liquor. It was a melancholy request to the man, but it must be complied with, and he was obliged, as they grew drunk, to sit quietly, and hear them sing French and Spanish songs out of his Dutch prayer-books, with other profaneness that he, though a Dutchman, stood amazed at. In chasing too near in, they alarmed the coast, and expresses were sent to the English and Dutch factories giving an account of it. They were sensible of this error immediately, and because they would make the best of a bad market, resolved to keep out of sight of land, and lose the prizes they might expect between that and wider, to make the more sure of that port where commonly is the best booty. All nations trading thither, especially Portuguese, who purchased chiefly with gold, the idol their hearts were bent upon. And, notwithstanding this unlikely course, they met and took several ships between Axim and that place, the circumstantial stories of which, and the panic terrors they struck into his majesty's subjects, being tedious and unnecessary to relate, I shall pass by, and come to their arrival in that road. They came to Wider with a St. George's ensign, a black silk flag flying at their mizzen peak, and a jack and pendant of the same. The flag had a death in it, with an hourglass in one hand and crossbones in the other, a dart by it, and underneath a heart dropping three drops of blood. The jack had a man portrayed in it, with a flaming sword in his hand, and standing on two skulls, subscribed A B H and A M H, that is, a Barbadian's and a Martinican's head as has been before taken notice of. Here they found eleven sail in the road, English, French, and Portuguese. The French were three stout ships of thirty guns, and upwards of a hundred men each, yet when Roberts came to fire, they, with the other ships, immediately struck their colours and surrendered to his mercy. One reason, it must be confessed, of his easy victory, was the commanders and a good part of the men being ashore, according to the custom of the place, to receive the cargoes, and return the slaves, they being obliged to watch the seasons for it, which otherwise, in so dangerous a sea as here, would be impracticable. These all, except the porcupine, ransomed with him for eight pound of gold dust, a ship, not without the trouble of some letters passing and repassing from the shore before they could settle it, and notwithstanding the agreement and payment, they took away one of the French ships, though with a promise to return her, if they found she did not sail well taking with them several of her men for that end. Some of the foreigners, who never had dealing this way before, desired for satisfaction to their owners that they might have receipts for their money, which were accordingly given, a copy of one of them I have here subjoined, viz. This is to certify whom it may or doth concern that we, gentlemen of fortune, have received eight pounds of gold dust for the ransom of the hardy Captain Ditwit commander, so that we discharge the said ship. Witness our hands, this 13th of January, 1721-2, to Bat Roberts, 
Harry Glasby. Others were given to the Portuguese captains, which were in the same form, but being signed by two waggish fellows, viz. Sutton and Simpson, they subscribed by the names of Aaron Whifflingpin, Sin Tugmutu. But there was something so singularly cruel and barbarous done here to the porcupine Captain Fletcher, as must not be passed over without special remark. This ship lay in the road, almost slaved, when the pirates came in, and the commander being on shore settling his accounts, was sent to for the ransom, but he excused it, as having no orders from the owners, thought the true reason might be that he thought it dishonourable to treat with robbers, and that the ship, separate from the slaves, towards whom he could mistrust no cruelty, was not worth the sum demanded. Hereupon Robert sends the boat to transport the negroes, in order to set her on fire, but being in haste and finding that unshackling them cost much time and labour, they actually set her on fire, with eighty of those poor wretches on board, chained two and two together, under the miserable choice of perishing by fire or water. Those who jumped overboard from the flames were seized by sharks, a voracious fish, in plenty in this road, and, in their sight, tore limb from limb alive, a cruelty unparalleled and for which, had every individual been hanged, few, I imagine, would think that justice had been rigorous. The pirates, indeed, were obliged to dispatch their business here in haste, because they had intercepted a letter from General Phipps to Mr. Baldwin, the Royal African Company's agent at Wider, giving an account that Roberts had been seen to windward of Cape Three Points, that he might the better guard against the damages to the company's ships, if he should arrive at that road before the swallow man of war, which he assured him, at the time of the letter, was pursuing them to that place. Roberts called up his company, and desired they would hear Phipps's speech, for so he was pleased to call the letter, and, notwithstanding their vapouring, persuaded them of the necessity of moving, for, says he, such brave fellows cannot be supposed to be frightened at this news, yet that it were better to avoid dry blows, which is the best that can be expected if overtaken. This advice weighed with them, and they got under sail, having stayed only from Thursday to Saturday night, and, at sea, voted for the island of Annabona. But the winds, hanging out of the way, crossed their purpose, and brought them to Cape Lopez, where I shall leave them for their approaching fate, and relate some further particulars of His Majesty's ship the Swallow, viz. where it was she has spent her time, during the mischief that was done, and by what means unable to prevent it what also was the intelligence she received, and the measures thereon formed that at last brought two such strangers as Mr. Roberts and Captain Ogle to meet in so remote a corner of the world. The Swallow and Weymouth left Sierra Leone, May 28th, where, I have already taken notice, Roberts arrived about a month after, and doubtless learned the intent of their voyage, and cleaning on the coast which made him set down with more security to his diversion, and furnish him with such intimations as made his first range down the coast in August following more prosperous, the Swallow and Weymouth being then at the Port of Princes a cleaning. End of chapter 9, part 6 Chapter 9, part 7 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson Chapter 9, Part 7 Their stay at Prince's was from July 28 to September 20, 1721, where, by a fatality, common to the irregularities of seamen, who cannot in such cases be kept under due restraints, they buried one hundred men in three weeks' time, and reduced the remainder of the ship's companies into so sickly a state that it was with difficulty they brought them to sail. And this misfortune was probably the ruin of Roberts, for it prevented the men of war's going back to Sierra Leone, as it was intended, there being a necessity of leaving His Majesty's ship, Weymouth, in much the worst condition of the two, under the guns of Cape Corso, to impress men, being unable at this time either to hand the sails or weigh her anchor, and Roberts, being ignorant of occasion or alteration of the first design, fell into the mouth of danger, 
when he thought himself the farthest from it. For the men of war not endeavouring to attain further to windward, when they came from princes, than to secure Cape Corso Road under their lee, they luckily hovered in the track he had took. The Swallow and Weymouth fell in with the continent of Cape Apollonia, October 20th, and there received the ungrateful news from one Captain Bird, a notice that awakened and put them on their guard, but they were far from expecting any temerity should ever bring him a second time on the coast while they were there. Therefore the Swallow, having seen the Weymouth into Cape Corso Road November 10th, she plied to windward as far as Basim, rather as an airing to recover a sickly ship's company, and show herself to the trade, which was found everywhere undisturbed, and were, for that reason, returning to her consort, when accidentally meeting a Portuguese ship, she told her that the day before she saw two ships chase into junk, an English vessel, which she believed must have fallen into their hands. On this story the swallow clung her wind, and endeavoured to gain that place, but receiving soon after, October the 14th, a contrary report from Captain Plummer, an intelligent man in the Jason of Bristol, who had come farther to windward, and neither saw or heard anything of this. She turned her head down the second time, anchored at Cape Apollonia the 23rd, at Cape Tre Puntas the 27th, and in Corso Road, January the 7th, 1721 or 2. They learned that their consort, the Weymouth, was, by the assistance of some soldiers from the castle, gone to windward, to demand restitution of some goods or men belonging to the African company that were illegally detained by the Dutch at De Minas. And while they were regretting so long a separation, an express came to Captain Phipps, from Axum, the ninth, and followed by another, from Dick's Cove, an English factory, with information that three ships had chased and taken a galley nigh Axum Castle, and a trading boat belonging to the company. No doubt was made concerning what they were, it being taken for granted they were pirates, and supposed to be the same that had the August before infested the coast. The natural result, therefore, from these two advices was to hasten the Wida, for it was concluded the prizes they had taken had informed them how nigh the Swallow was, and withal how much better in health than she had been for some months past, so that unless they were very mad indeed, they would, after being discovered, make the best of their way for Wida, and secure the booty there, without which their time and industry had been entirely lost, most of the gold lying in that corner. The swallow weighed from Cape Corso January the 10th, but was retarded by waiting some hours on the Margaret, a company ship, at Accra, again on the Portugal, and a whole day at Apong, on a person they used to style Miss Betty, a conduct that Mr. Phipps blamed, when he heard the pirates were missed at Wida, although he had given it as his opinion they could not be passed by, and intimated that to stay a few hours would prove no prejudice. This, however, hindered the swallows catching them at Wida, for the pirates came into that road with a fresh gale of wind, the same day the swallow was at Apong, and sailed the 13th of January from thence, that she arrived the 17th. She gained notice of them by a French shallop from Grand Papa the 14th at night, and from Little Papa next morning by a Dutch ship, so that the man of wars was on all sides, as she thought, sure of her purchase, particularly when she made the ships, and discovered three of them to get under sail immediately at sight of her, making signals to one another as though they designed a defence, but they were found to be three French ships, and those at anchor Portuguese and English, all honest traders who had been ransacked and ransomed. This disappointment chagrined the ship's company, who were very intent upon their market, which was reported to be an armed chest full of gold, and kept with three keys, though in all likelihood had they met with them in that open road, one or both would have made their escapes, or if they had thought sit to have fought, an emulation in their defence would probably have made it desperate. While they were contemplating on the matter, a letter was received from Mr. Baldwin, governor here for the company, signifying that the pirates were at Jaquin, seven leagues lower. The swallow weighed at two next morning, January the 16th, and got to Jaquin by daylight, but to no other end than frightening the crews of two Portuguese ships on shore, who took her for the pirate that had struck such terror at Wida. She returned, therefore, that night, 
and having been strengthened by thirty volunteers, English and French, the discarded crews of the Porcupine and the French ship they had carried from hence, she put to sea again January the 19th, conjecturing that either Calabar, Princes, the River Gabon, Cape Lopez, or Annabona must be touched at for water and refreshment, though they should resolve to leave the coast. As to the former of those places I have before observed, it was hazardous to think of, or rather impracticable. Princes had been a sour grape to them, but being the first in the way she came before the harbour the twenty-ninth, where learning no news, without losing time, steered for the river Gabon, and anchored at the mouth of it February the first. This river is navigable by two channels, and has an island about five leagues up, called Popoguays, or Parrots, where the Dutch cruisers, for this coast, generally clean, and where sometimes pirates come in to look for prey, or to refit, it being very convenient, by reason of a soft mud about it, that admits a ship's line on shore, with all her guns and stores in, without damage. Hither Captain Ogle sent his boat and a lieutenant, who spoke with a Dutch ship, above the island, and from whom he had this account, viz., that he had been four days from Cape Lopez, and had left no ship there. However, they beat up for the Cape, without regard to this story, and on the fifth, at dawning, was surprised with the noise of a gun, which, as the day brightened, they found was from Cape Lopez Bay, where they discovered three ships at anchor, the largest with the king's colors and pendant flying, which was soon concluded to be Mr. Roberts and his consorts. But the swallow being to windward, and unexpectedly deep in the bay, was obliged to steer off for avoiding a sand, called the Frenchman's Bank, which the pirates observed for some time, and rashly interpreting it to be fear in her, righted the French ranger, which was then on the heel, and ordered her to chase out in all haste, bending several of their sails in the pursuit. The man of war, finding they had foolishly mistaken her design, humoured the deceit, and kept off to sea as if she had been really afraid, and managed her steerage so, under the direction of Lieutenant Sun, an experienced officer, as to let the ranger come up with her, when they thought they had got so far as not to have their guns heard by her consort at the Cape. The pirates had such an opinion of their own courage, that they could never dream anybody would use a stratagem to speak with them, and so was the more easily drawn into the snare. The pirates now drew nigh enough to fire their chase-guns, they hoisted the black flag that was worn in wider road, and got their spritsail yard along ships with intent to board, no one having ever asked all this while what country ship they took the chase to be. They would have her to be a Portuguese, sugar being then a commodity among them, and were swearing every minute at the wind or sails to expedite so sweet a chase. But, alas, all turned sour in an instant. It was with the utmost consternation they saw her suddenly bring to and haul up her lower ports, now within pistol-shot, and struck their black flag upon it directly. After the first surprise was over, they kept firing at a distance, hoisted it again, and vapored with their cutlashes on the poop, though wisely endeavoring at the same time to get away. Being now at their wit's end, boarding was proposed by the heads of them, and so to make one desperate push. But the motion not being well seconded, and their main top mast coming down by a shot, after two hours firing, it was declined. They grew sick, struck their colors, and called out for quarters, having had ten men killed outright and twenty wounded, without the loss or hurt of one of the king's men. She had thirty-two guns, manned with sixteen Frenchmen, twenty negroes, and seventy-seven English. The colors were thrown overboard, that they might not rise in judgment, nor be displayed in triumph over them. While the Swallow was sending their boat to fetch the prisoners, a blast and smoke was seen to pour out of the great cabin, and they thought they were blowing up, but upon inquiry afterwards, found that half a dozen of the most desperate, when they saw all hopes fled, had drawn themselves round what powder they had left in the steerage, and fired a pistol into it. But it was too small a quantity to effect anything more than burning them in a frightful manner. This ship was commanded by one Scrim, a Welchman, who, though he had lost his leg in the action, would not suffer himself to be dressed or carried off the deck, but, like Widrington, fought upon his stump. The rest appeared gay and brisk, most of them with white shirts, watches, and a deal of silk vests, but the gold dust belonging to them, 
was most of it left in the little ranger in the bay, this company's proper ship, with the royal fortune. I cannot take notice of two among the crowd, of those disfigured with the blast of powder just before mentioned, viz., William Maine and Roger Ball, an officer of the ship seeing a silver call hung at the west of the former, said to him, I presume you are bosun of this ship. Then you presume wrong, answered he, for I am bosun of the royal fortune, Captain Roberts' commander. Then, Mr. Bosun, you will be hanged, I believe, replies the officer. That is as your honor pleases, answered he again, and was for turning away. But the officer desired to know of him, how the powder, which had made them in that condition, came to take fire. By God, says he, they are all mad and bewitched, for I have lost a good hat by it, the hat and he being both blown out of the cabin gallery into the sea. But what signifies a hat, friend, says the officer? Not much, answered he, the men being busy in stripping him of his shoes and stockings. The officer then inquired of him whether Roberts's company were as likely fellows as these. There are one hundred twenty of them, answered he, as clever fellows as ever trod shoe-leather. Would I were with them. No doubt on it, says the officer. By God, it is the naked truth, answered he, looking down and seeing himself by this time quite stripped. The officer then approached Roger Ball, who was seated in a private corner, with a look as sullen as winter, and asked him how he came blown up in that frightful manner. Why, says he, John Morris fired a pistol into the powder, and if he had not done it, I would, bearing his pain without the least complaint. The officer gave him to understand he was surgeon, and if he desired it he would dress him, but he swore it should not be done, and that if anything was applied to him he would tear it off. Nevertheless, the surgeon had good nature enough to dress him, though with much trouble. At night he was in a kind of delirium, and raved on the bravery of Roberts, saying he should shortly be released, as soon as they should meet him, which procured him a lashing down upon the forecastle, which, he resisting with all his force, caused him to be used with the more violence, so that he was tied down with so much severity, that his flesh being sore and tender with the blowing up, he died next day of a mortification. They secured the prisoners with pinions and shackles, but the ship was so much disabled in the engagement that they had once thoughts to set her on fire, but this would have given them the trouble of taking the pirates' wounded men on board themselves, and that they were certain the royal fortune would wait for their consort's return. They lay by her two days, repairing her rigging and other damages, and sent her into princes with the Frenchmen, and four of their own hands. On the ninth in the evening the Swallow gained the cape again, and saw the Royal Fortune standing into the bay with the Neptune, Captain Hill, of London. A good presage of the next day's success, for they did not doubt but the temptation of liquor and plunder they might find in this their new prize, would make the pirates very confused, and so it happened. On the tenth in the morning the man-of-war bore away to round the cape. Roberts's crew, discerning their masts over the land, went down into the cabin to acquaint him of it, he being then at breakfast with his new guest, Captain Hill, on a savory dish of Solomon Gunday, and some of his own beer. He took no notice of it, and his men almost as little, some saying she was a Portuguese ship, others a French slave ship, but the major part swore it was the French ranger returning, and were merrily debating for some time on the manner of reception whether they should salute or not. But as the swallow approached nigher, things appeared plainer, and though they were stigmatized with the name of cowards who showed any apprehension of danger, yet some of them, now undeceived, declared it to Roberts, especially one Armstrong who had deserted from that ship and knew her well. Those Roberts swore at as cowards, who meant to dishearten the men, asking them if it were so, whether they were afraid to fight or no, and hardly refrained from blows what his own apprehensions were, till she hauled up her ports and hoisted their proper colors, is uncertain. But then being perfectly convinced, he slipped his cable, got under sail, and ordered his men to arms, without any show of timidity, dropping a first-rate oath that it was a bite, but at the same time resolved, like a gallant rogue, to get clear or die. There was one Armstrong, as I just mentioned, a deserter from the Swallow, whom they inquired of concerning the trim and sailing of that ship. He told them she sailed best upon a wind, and therefore if they designed to leave her they should go before it. 
The danger was imminent, and time very short, to consult of means to extricate himself. His resolution in this strait was as follows, to pass close to the swallow with all her sails and receive her broadside before they returned to shot. If disabled by this, or that they could not depend on sailing, then to run on shore at the point, which is steep too, and every one to shift for himself among the negroes, or sailing in these, to board and blow up together, for he saw that the greatest part of his men were drunk, passively courageous, unfit for service. Roberts himself made a gallant figure at the time of the engagement, being dressed in a rich crimson damask waistcoat and breeches, a red feather in his hat, a gold chain round his neck, and a diamond cross hanging to it, a sword in his hand, and two pair of pistols hanging at the end of a silk sling, flung over his shoulder, according to the fashion of the pirates, and is said to have given his orders with boldness and spirit. Coming, according to what he had proposed, close to the man of war, received her fire, and then hoisted his black flag and returned it, shooting away from her, with all the sail he could pack, and had he took Armstrong's advice to have gone before the wind, he had probably escaped. But keeping his tacks down, either by the wind's shifting or ill steerage or both, he was taken aback with his sails, and the swallow came to a second time very nigh to him. He had now perhaps finished the fight very desperately, if death, who took a swift passage in a grape-shot, had not interposed and struck him directly on the throat. He settled himself on the tackles of a gun, which one Stevenson, from the helm observing, ran to his assistance, and not perceiving him wounded, swore at him and bid him stand up and fight like a man. But when he found his mistake, and that his captain was certainly dead, he gushed into tears and wished the next shot might be his lot. They presently threw him overboard, with his arms and ornaments on, according to the repeated request he made in his lifetime. Roberts was a tall black man, near forty years of age, born at Newey Bay, nigh Haverford West, in Pembrokeshire, of good natural parts and personal bravery, though he applied them to such wicked purposes as made them of no commendation, frequently drinking, damned to him who ever lived to wear a halter. He was forced himself at first among this company out of the prince. Captain Plam, at Anameba, about three years before, where he served as second mate, and shed, as he used to tell the French men, as many crocodile tears then as they did now, but time and good company had warred off. He could not plead want of employment, nor incapacity of getting his bread in an honest way, to favor so vile a change, nor was he so much a coward as to pretend it but frankly owned it was to get rid of the disagreeable superiority of some masters he was acquainted with, and the love of novelty and change maritime peregrinations had accustomed him to. In an honest service, says he, there is thin commons, low wages, and hard labor. In this, plenty and satiety, pleasure and ease, liberty and power. And who would not balance creditor on this side, when all the hazard that is run for it, at worst, is only a sour look or two at choking. No, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. Thus he preached himself into an approbation of what he at first abhorred, and being daily regaled with music, drinking, and the gaiety and diversions of his companions, these depraved propensities were quickly edged and strengthened to the extinguishing of fear and conscience. Yet among all the vile and ignominious acts he had perpetrated, he is said to have had an aversion towards forcing men into that service, and had procured some their discharge, notwithstanding so many made it their plea. End of Chapter 9, Part 7《Chapter Nine, Part Eight of the General History of the Pirates, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Mackenzie.《The General History of the Pirates, Volume One by Charles Johnson. Chapter Nine, Part Eight. When Roberts was gone, as though he had been the life and soul of the gang, their spirits sunk. Many deserted their quarters and all stupidly neglected any means for defence or escape, and their mainmast soon after being shot by the board. They had no way left but to surrender and call for quarters. The swallow kept aloof while her boat passed and repassed for the prisoners, 
because they understood they were under an oath to blow up, and some of the desperadoes showed a willingness that way, matches being lighted, and scuffles happening between those who would and those who opposed it. But I cannot easily account for this humour, which can be termed no more than a false courage, since any of them had power to destroy his own life, either by pistol or drowning, without involving others in the same fate, who are in no temper of mind for it. And, at best, it had been only dying for fear of death. She had forty guns and a hundred and fifty-seven men, forty-five were of were negroes. Three only were killed in the action without any loss to the swallow. There was found upwards of two thousand pounds in gold dust in her. The flag could not be got easily from under the fallen mast, and was therefore recovered by the swallow. It had the figure of a skeleton in it, and a man portrayed with a flaming sword in his hand, intimating a defiance of death itself. The swallow returned back into Cape Lopez Bay, and found the little ranger, whom the pirates had deserted in haste, for the better defence of the ship. She had been plundered, according to what I could learn, of two thousand pounds in gold dust, the shares of those pirates who belonged to her, and Captain Hill in the Neptune, not unjustly suspected, for he would not wait the man of war's returning into the bay again, but sailed away immediately, making no scruple afterwards to own the seizure of other goods out of her, and surrendered, as a confirmation of all, fifty ounces at Barbados, for which see the article at the end of this book. All persons who after the 29th of September, 1690, etc. To sum up the whole, if it be considered, first, that the sickly state of the men of war, when they sailed from princes, was the misfortune that hindered their being as far as Sierra Leone, and consequently out of the track the pirates then took. That those pirates, directly contrary to their design, in the second expedition, should get above Cape Corso, and that nigh Axim, a chase should offer that inevitably must discover them, and be soon communicated to the men of war that the satiating their evil and malicious tempers at wider in burning the porcupine and running off with the french ship had strengthened the swallow with thirty men that the swallow should miss them in that road where probably she had not or at least so effectually obtained her end that they should be so far infatuated at cape lopez as to divide their strength which when collected might have been so formidable and lastly that the conquest should be without bloodshed. I say, considering all these circumstances, it shows that the hand of Providence was concerned in their destruction. As to their behaviour after they were taken, it was found that they had great inclinations to rebel, if they could have laid hold of any opportunity. For they were very uneasy under restraint, having been lately all commanders themselves, nor could they brook their diet or quarters without cursing and swearing, and upbraiding each other with the folly that had brought them to it. So that to secure themselves against any mad desperate undertaking of theirs, they strongly barricaded the gun-room, and made another prison before it, an officer with pistols and cutlasses, doing duty night and day, and the prisoners within, manacled and shackled. They would yet in these circumstances be impudently merry, saying, when they viewed their nakedness, that they had not left them a harpony to give old Sharon to ferry them over the sticks. And at their thin commons, they would observe, that they fell away so fast that they should not have weight left to hang them. Sutton used to be very profane, he happening to be in the same irons with another prisoner, who was more serious than ordinary, and read and prayed often, as became his condition. This man Sutton used to swear at and ask him, what he proposed by so much noise and devotion heaven says the other i hope heaven you fool says sutton did you ever hear of any pirates going thither give me hell it's a merrier place i'll give roberts a salute of thirteen guns at entrance and when he found such ludicrous expressions had no effect on him he made a formal complaint and requested that the officer would either remove this man or take his prayer-book away as a common disturber. A combination and conspiracy was formed betwixt Moody, Ashplant, Magnus, Mare, and others to rise and kill the officers and run away with the ship. This, 
they had carried on by means of a mulatto boy who was allowed to attend them and proved very trusty in his messages between the principals but the evening of that night they were to have made this struggle two of the prisoners that sat next to ashplant heard the boy whisper them upon the project and naming to him the hour they should be ready presently gave notice of it to the captain which put the ship in an alarm for a little time and on examination several of them had made shift to break off or lose their shackles no doubt for such purpose but it tended only to procure to themselves worse usage and confinement in the same passage to cape corso the prize royal fortune was in the same danger she was left at the island of st thomas's in the possession of an officer and a few men to take in some fresh provisions which was scarce at cape corso with orders to follow the ship there were only some of the pirates negroes three or four wounded prisoners and scudamore their surgeon from whom they seemed to be under no apprehension especially from the last who might have hoped for favour on account of his employ and had stood so much indebted for his liberty eating and drinking constantly with the officer yet this fellow regardless of the favour and lost to all sense of reformation endeavoured to bring over the negroes to his design of murdering the people and running away with the ship he easily prevailed with the negroes to come into the design but when he came to communicate it to his fellow prisoners and would have drawn them into the same measures by telling them he understood navigation that the negroes were stout fellows and by a smattering he had in the angolan language he had found willing to undertake such an enterprise and that it was better venturing to do this run down the coast and raise a new company than to proceed to cape corso and be hanged like a dog and sun-dried one of them abhorring the cruelty or fearing the success discovered it to the officer who made him immediately a prisoner and brought the ship safe when they came to be lodged in cape corso castle their hopes of this kind all cut off and that they were assured they must there soon receive a final sentence the note was changed among most of them and from vain insolent jesting they became serious and devout begging for good books and joining in public prayers and singing of psalms twice at least every day as to their trials if we should give them at length it may appear tedious to the reader for which reason i have for the avoiding tautology and repetition put as many of them together as were tried for the same fact reserving the circumstances which are most material with observations on the dying behaviour of such of them as came to my knowledge and first it may be observed from the list that a great part of these pirate ships crews were men entered on the coast of africa not many months before they were taken from whence it may be concluded that the pretended constraint of roberts on them was very often a complotment between parties equally willing and this roberts several times openly declared particularly to the onslow's people whom he called aft and asked of them who was willing to go as he would force nobody as was deposed by some of his best hands after acquittal nor is it reasonable to think he should reject irish volunteers only from a pique against kennedy and force others that might hazard and in time destroy his government but their behaviour soon put him out of this fear and convinced him that the plea of force was only the best artifice they had to shelter themselves under in case they should be taken and that they were less rogues than other only in point of time it may likewise be taken notice of that the country wherein they happen to be tried is among other happinesses exempted from the lawyers and law-books so that the office of register of necessity fell on one not versed in those affairs which might justify the court in want of form more essentially supplied with integrity and impartiality but perhaps if there was less law there might be more justice than in some other courts for if the civil law be a law of universal reason judging of the rectitude or obliquity of men's actions every man of common sense is endued with a portion of it at least sufficient to make him distinguish right from wrong or what the civilians call malum in se therefore here if two persons were equally guilty of the same fact there was no convicting one and bringing the other off by any quirk or turn of law for they formed their judgments upon the constraint or willingness the aim and intention of the parties and all other circumstances which make a material difference besides in crimes of this nature men bred up to the sea must be more knowing and much abler than others more learned in the law 
for before a man can have a right idea of a thing he must know the terms standing for that thing the sea terms being a language by itself which no lawyer can be supposed to understand he must of consequence want that discriminating faculty which should direct him to judge right of the facts meant by those terms the court well knew it was not possible to get the evidence of every sufferer by this crew and therefore first of all considered how that deficiency should be supplied whether or no they could pardon one john dennis who had early offered himself as king's evidence and was the best read in their lives and conversations here indeed they were at a loss for law and concluded in the negative because it looked like compounding with a man to swear falsely losing by it those great helps he could have afforded another great difficulty in their proceedings was how to understand those words in the act of parliament of particularly specifying in the charge the circumstances of time place etc that is so to understand them as to be able to hold a court for if they had been indicted on particular robberies the evidence had happened mostly from the royal african company ships on which these gentlemen of cape corso castle were not qualified to sit their oath running that they have no interest directly or indirectly in the ship or goods for the robbery of which the party stands accused and this they thought they had commissions being paid them on such goods and on the other side if they were incapacitated no court could be formed the commission absolutely requiring three of them by name to reconcile all things therefore the court resolved to bottom the whole of their proceedings on the swallow's depositions which were clear and plain and had the circumstance of time when place where manner how and the like particularly specified according to the statute in that case made and provided but this admitted only a general intimation of robbery in the indictment therefore to approve their clemency it looking arbitrary on the lives of men to lump them to the gallows in such a summary way as must have been done had they solely adhered to the swallow's charge they resolved to come to particular trials secondly that the prisoners might not be ignorant whereon to answer and so have all fair advantages to excuse and defend themselves the court farther agreed with justice and equanimity to hear any evidence that could be brought to weaken or corroborate the three circumstances that complete a pirate first being a volunteer amongst them at the beginning secondly being a volunteer at the taking or robbing of any ship or lastly voluntarily accepting a share in the booty of those that did for by a parity of reason where these actions were of their own disposing and yet committed by them it must be believed their hearts and hands joined together in what they acted against his majesty's ship the swallow End of chapter 9, part 8Chapter 9, part 9 of the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, part 9. The Trials of the Pirates. Taken by His Majesty's ship the Swallow, begun at Cape Corso Castle on the coast of Africa, March the 28th, 1722. The commission empowered any three named therein to call to their assistance such a number of qualified persons as might make the court always consist of seven, and, accordingly, summons were signed to Lieutenant Joseph Barnsley, Lieutenant Christopher Fanshaw, Captain Samuel Hartsees, and Captain William Mingus, viz., by virtue of a power and authority to us given by a commission from the king under the seal of admiralty you are hereby required to attend and make one of the court for the trying and the judging of the pirates lately taken on this coast by his majesty's ship the swallow given under our hands this twenty eighth of march seventeen twenty two at cape castle castle mungo herdman james phipps henry dodson francis boy edward hyde the commissioners being met in the hall of the castle the commission was first read after which the president and then the other members took the oath prescribed in the act of parliament and having directed the form of that for witnesses as follows the court was opened i 
A.B., solemnly promise and swear on their holy evangelists to bear true and faithful witness between the king and prisoner or prisoners in relation to the fact or facts of piracy and robbery he or they do now stand accused of. So help me God. The court consisted of Captain Mungo Herdman, President, James Phipps, Esquire, General of the Coast, Mr. H. Dobson, Merchant, Mr. Francis Boy, Merchant, Mr. Edward Hyde, Secretary to the Company, Lieutenant John Barnsley, Lieutenant Christopher Fanshaw. The following prisoners, out of the pirate ship Ranger, having been commanded before them, the charge or indictment was exhibited. There now follows a list of prisoners taken in the Ranger. It lists their names, the ships they're from, and the time when they were captured. James Skirm, Greyhound Sloop, October 1720. Richard Hardy, Pirate with Davis, 1718. William Maine, Brigantine Captain, Pete. June 1720. Henry Dennis, Pirates with Captain Davis, 1718. Valerie Ashplant, Pirates with Captain Davis, 1719. Robert Birdson, Pirates with Captain Davis, 1719. Richard Harris, Phoenix of Bristol, Captain Richards. June 1720. D. Littlejohn, Phoenix of Bristol, Captain Richards. June 1720. Thomas Howe, at Newfoundland. June 1720. Herbert Hunkins, Success Sloop. Hugh Harris, Willing Mind, July 1720. William McIntosh, July 1720. Ship Unlisted. Thomas Wills, Richard of Biddeford, July 1720. John Wilden, Mary and Martha, July 1720. James Greenham, Little York, Phillips Master, July 1720. John Jameson, Love of Lancaster, July 1720. Christopher Lang, Thomas Brigantine, September 1720. John Mitchell, Norman Galley, October 1720. T. Withstamnot, Norman Galley, October 1720. Peter Lefevre, Jeremiah and Anne, April 1720. William Shurin, Jeremiah and Anne, April 1720. William Watts, Sierra Leone, of Master, Glynn, July 1721. William Davis, Sierra Leone, of Seigneur José, July 1721. James Barrow, Martha, Snow, Captain Lady, no date. Joshua Lee, Martha, Snow, Captain Lady, no date. Robert Hartley, the first. Robinson of Liverpool, Captain Canning, August 1721. James Crane, Robinson of Liverpool, Captain Canning, August 1721. George Smithson, Stanwich Galley, Captain Tarleton, August 1721. Roger Pye, Stanwich Galley, Captain Tarleton, August 1721. Robert Fletcher, Stanwich Galley, Captain Tarleton, August 1721. Robert Hartley II, Stanwich Galley, Captain Tarleton, August 1721. Andrew Rantz, a Dutch ship, August 1721. Cuthbert Goss, Mercy, Galley of Bristol at Calabar, October 1721. Thomas Giles, Mercy, Galley of Bristol at Calabar, October 1721. Israel Hind, Mercy, Galley of Bristol at Calabar, October 1721. The following list of men were captured in January 1721-2. William Church, Gertreicht of Holland. Philip Hark, Flushingham of Holland. William Smith, Elizabeth, Captain Sharp. Adam Comrie, Elizabeth, Captain Sharp. William Graves, King Solomon, Captain Traherne of Cape Apollonia. Peter Devine, King Solomon, Captain Traherne of Cape Apollonia. John Johnson, King Solomon, Captain Traherne of Cape Apollonia. John Stodgill, King Solomon, Captain Traherne of Cape Apollonia. Henry Dawson, Wider Sloop at Jacquin. William Glass, Wider Sloop at Jacquin. Josiah Robinson, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. John Arnott, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. John Davis, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. Henry Graves, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. Thomas Howard, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. John Rymer, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. Thomas Clappin, Tarleton, Captain Thomas Tarleton. William Guineas, Porcupine, Captain Fletcher. James Cozins, No Ship Listed. Thomas Stretton, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. William Petty, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. Michael Lemon, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. William Wood, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. Edward Watts, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. John Horn, Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos.
The following were captured from the French ship in Wider Road, February 1721-22. to 22. Pierre Ravin, Peter Grossi, John Duggan, from the Rents Frugia, James Argin, of the Louis Arnaud, Etrian Gilio, Rents Toby, Renaud Marot, Mefrelac, John Gittin, the John Goumar, Joseph Richardeux, the Jean Paquette, John Lavogue, from the Alain Pigan, Jean Duplessis, Pierre Chilot. You, James Skirm, Michael Lemon, Robert Hartley, etc., ye and every one of you are, in the name and by the authority of our dread sovereign lord, George, King of Great Britain, indicted as follows. For as much as in open contempt of the laws of your country, ye have all of you been wickedly united and articled together for the annoyance and disturbance of his majesty's trading subjects by sea, and have in conformity to the most evil and mischievous intentions been twice down the coast of Africa with two ships, once in the beginning of August and a second time in January last, sinking, burning, or robbing such ships and vessels as then happened in your way. Particularly, ye stand charged at the instance and information of Captain Chalonet Ogle as traitors and pirates for the unlawful opposition ye made to His Majesty's ship, the Swallow, under his command. For, that on the 5th of February last past, upon sight of the aforesaid king's ship, ye did immediately weigh anchor from under Cape Lopez on the southern coast of Africa in a French-built ship of thirty-two guns, called the Ranger, and did pursue and chase the aforesaid king's ship with such dispatch and precipitancy as declared ye common Roberts and pirates. That about ten o'clock the same morning, drawing within gunshot of his majesty's aforesaid ship, the Swallow, ye hoisted a piratical black flag and fired several chase guns to deter, as much as ye were able, his majesty's servants from their duty. That an hour after this, being very nigh to the aforesaid king's ship, ye did audaciously continue in a hostile defence and assault for about two hours more, in open violation of the laws, and in defiance of the king's colours and commission. And, lastly, that in the acting and compassing of all this, ye were all, and every one of you, in a wicked combination, voluntarily to exert, and actually did, in your several stations, use your utmost endeavours to distress the said king's ship, and murder his majesty's good subjects. To which they severally pleaded, not guilty. Then the court called for the officers of the Swallow, Mr. Isaac's son, Lieutenant, Ralph Baldrick, Boatswain, Daniel McLaughlin, Mate, desiring them to view the prisoners, whether they knew them, and to give an account in what manner they had attacked and fought the king's ship, and they agreed as follows. That they had viewed all the prisoners as they stood now before the court, and were assured that they were the same taken out of one or other of the pirate ships, Royal Fortune or Ranger, but verily believed them to be taken out of the Ranger, that they did in the king's ship at break of day on Monday, the 5th of February, 1721-2, to discover three ships at anchor under Cape Lopez on the southern coast of Africa, the Cape bearing then west-south-west about three leagues. And, perceiving one of them to have a pendant flying, and having heard their morning gun before, they immediately suspected them to be Roberts the pirate, his consort, and a French ship they knew had been lately carried out of wider road. The king's ship was obliged to haul off north-west and west-north-west to avoid a sand, called the Frenchman's Bank, the wind then at south-south-east, and found in half an hour's time one of the three had got under sail from the careen, and was bending her sails in a chase towards them. To encourage this rashness and precipitancy, they kept away before the wind, as though afraid, but with their tacks on board, their main-yard braced and making at the same time very bad steerage. About half an hour after ten in the morning, the pirate ship came within gunshot, and fired four chase guns, hoisted a black flag at the mizzen peak, and got their spirit sail yard under their bowsprit for boarding. In half an hour more, approaching still nigher, they starboarded their helm, and gave her a broadside, the pirate bringing to and returning the same. After this, the opponents say, their fire grew slack for some time, because the fire it was shot so far ahead on the weather bow that few of their guns could point to her. Yet in this interval their black flag was either shot away or hauled down a little space and hoisted again. At length, by their ill steerage in favour of the wind, they came near a second time, and about two in the afternoon shot away their main topmast. The colours they fought under, besides a black flag, were a red English ensign, a king's jack, and a Dutch pendant, which they struck at or about three in the afternoon, and called for quarters, it proving to be a French-built ship of thirty-two guns, called the Ranger. 
Isaac's son, Ralph Baldrick, Daniel McLaughlin. When the evidence had been heard, the prisoners were called upon to answer how they came on board this pirate ship, and their reason for so audacious a resistance as had been made against the king's ship. To this, each, in his reply, owned himself to be one of those taken out of the ranger, that he had signed their piratical articles and shared in their plunder, some few only excepted who had been there too short a time, but that neither in this signing or sharing, nor in the resistance had been made against his majesty's ship, had they been volunteers, but had acted in these several parts from a terror of death, which a law amongst them was to be the portion of those who refused. The court then asked, who made those laws? How those guns came to be fired? Or why they had not deserted their stations and mutinied when so fair a prospect of redemption offered? They replied still with the same answers, and could extenuate their crimes with no other plea than being forced men. Wherefore, the court were of opinion that the indictment, as it charged them with an unlawful attack and resistance of the king's ship, was sufficiently proved. But then it being undeniably evident that many of these prisoners had been forced, and some of them of very short standing, they did, on mature deliberation, come to this merciful resolution. That they would hear further evidence for or against each person singly, in relation to those parts of the indictment which declared them volunteers, or charged them with aiding and assisting, at the burning, sinking, and robbing of other ships. For, if they acted or assisted in any robberies or devastations, it would be a conviction they were volunteers. Here such evidence, though it might want the form, still carried the reason of the law with it. The charge was exhibited also against the following pirates taken out of the royal fortune. Michael Mare, in the Rover, five years ago. Christopher Moody, under Davis, 1718. Mark Johnson, a Dutch ship, 1718. James Phillips, The Revenge, Pirate Sloop, 1717. David Simpson, Pirates with Davis, no date. Thomas Sutton, Pirates with Davis, no date. Hag Jacobson, A Dutch Ship, 1719. William Williams I, Sadbury, Captain Thomas Newfoundland, 1719. William Fernan, Sadbury, Captain Thomas Newfoundland, June, 1720. William Williams II, Sadbury, Captain Thomas Newfoundland, June 1720. Roger Scott, Sadbury, Captain Thomas Newfoundland, no date. Thomas Owen, York of Bristol, May 1720. William Taylor, York of Bristol, May 1720. Joseph Nossiter, Expedition of Topson, May 1720. John Parker, Willing Mind of Poole, July 1720. Robert Crow, Happy Return, Sloop, July 1720. George Smith, Mary and Martha, July 1720. James Clements, Success, Sloop, July 1720. John Walden, Blessing of Lymington, July 1720. Jonathan Mansfield, From Martinique, No Date. James Harris, Richard, Pink, No Date. John Phillips, A Fishing Boat, No Date. Harry Glasby, Samuel, Captain Carey, July 1720. Hugh Mingus, Samuel, Captain Carey, July 1720. William Magnus, No Details. Joseph Moore, Mayflower, Sloop, February 1720. John Dufrock, Lloyd, Galley, Captain Hingston, May 1721. William Champneys, Lloyd, Galley, Captain Hingston, May 1721. George Danson, Lloyd, Galley, Captain Hingston, May 1721. Isaac Russell, Lloyd, Galley, Captain Hingston, deceased. Robert Lilburn, Jeremiah and Anne, Captain Turner, April 1721. Robert Johnson, Jeremiah and Anne, Captain Turner, April 1721. William Darling, Jeremiah and Anne, Captain Turner, April 1721. William Mead, Jeremiah and Anne, Captain Turner, deceased. Thomas Diggles, Christopher, Snow, April 1721. Benjamin Jeffries, Norman Galley, April 1721. John Frantier, a sloop at St. Nicholas, April 1721. D. Harding, a Dutch ship, April 1721. John Coleman, Adventure Sloop, April 1721. Charles Bunce, a Dutch galley, April 1721. R. Armstrong, a Dutch run from the Swallow, April 1721. The following were captured in May 1721, taken from the Onslow, Captain G. at Sestos. Abraham Harper, Peter Leslie, John Jessup I, Thomas Watkins, Philip Bill, Jonathan Stevenson, James Crombie, Thomas Garrett, and George Ogle, deceased. Roger Gorsuch, Martha, Snow, August 1721. John Watson, Martha, Snow, August 1721. William Child, Mercy Galliot Calabar, October 1721. 
John Griffin, Mercy, Galliot Calabar, October 1721. Peter Scudamore, Mercy, Galliot Calabar, no date. The following were from the ship Cornwall, Galliot Calabar. Christopher Granger, Nicholas Brattle, James White, in October 1721. Thomas Davis, October 1721. Thomas Seaver, October 1721. Robert Bevins, T. Otelaney, David Rice. Robert Hawes, Jocelyn, Captain Lewan, October 1721. Hugh Riddle, Diligence, Boat, January 1721. Stephen Thomas, Diligence, Boat, January 1721. The following were taken January 1721, and the King Solomon. John Lane, Samuel Fletcher, William Phillips, Jacob Johnson, John King. Benjamin Parr, Robinson, Captain Canning, January 1721. William May, Elizabeth, Captain Sharp, January 1721. Ed Thorndon, Elizabeth, Captain Sharp. January 1721. George Wilson, Tarleton of Liverpool, at Cape Lahu. January 1721. Edward Tarleton, Tarleton of Liverpool, at Cape Lahu. January 1721. Robert Hayes, Tarleton of Liverpool, at Cape Lahu. Undated. Thomas Roberts, Charlton, Captain Allwright, February 1721. John Richards, Charlton, Captain Allwright, February 20, 1721. John Kane, Charlton, Captain Allwright, February 1721. The following were taken from the porcupine Captain Fletcher, the wider road. Richard Wood, Richard Scott, February 1721. William Davison, February 1721. Samuel Morwell, February 1721. Edward Evans. John Jessup II surrendered up at Prince's. You, Harry Glasby, William Davison, William Champneys, Samuel Morwell, etc. Ye, and every one of you are, in the name and by the authority of our most dread sovereign Lord George, King of Great Britain, indicted as follows. For as much as in open contempt and violation of the laws of your country, to which ye ought to have been subject, ye have all of you been wickedly united and articled together, for the annoyance and destruction of his majesty's trading subjects by sea, and, in conformity to so wicked an agreement and association, ye have been twice lately down this coast of Africa, once in August and a second time in January last, spoiling and destroying many goods and vessels of his majesty's subjects and other trading nations. Particularly, ye stand indicted at the information and instance of Captain Chalonet Ogle as traitors, robbers, pirates, and common enemies to mankind. For, that on the 10th of February last, in a ship you were possessed of called the Royal Fortune of Forty Guns, ye did maintain a hostile defence and resistance for some hours against His Majesty's ship the Swallow, nigh Cape Lopez Bay on the southern coast of Africa. That this fight and insolent resistance against the King's ship was made not only without any pretense of authority, more than that of your own private depraved wills, but was done also under a black flag, flagrantly by that, denoting yourselves common robbers and traitors, opposers and violators of the laws. And lastly, that in this resistance, ye were all of you volunteers, and did as such contribute your utmost efforts for disabling and distressing the aforesaid king's ship, and deterring his majesty's servants therein from their duty to which they severally pleaded, not guilty. Whereupon, the officers of His Majesty's ship, the Swallow, were called again, and testified as follows, that they had seen all the prisoners now before the court, and knew them to be the same which were taken out of one or other of the pirate ships, Royal Fortune or Ranger, and verily believed them to be those taken out of the Royal Fortune, that the prisoners were possessed of a ship of forty guns, called the Royal Fortune, and were at an anchor under Cape Lopez on the coast of Africa with two others, when His Majesty's ship the Swallow, to which the deponents belonged and were officers, stood in for the place on Saturday the 10th of February 1721-2. to two. The largest of them had an ensign and pendant flying, being this royal fortune, who on sight of them had their boats passing and repassing from the other two, which they supposed to be with men. The wind not favouring the aforesaid king's ship, she was obliged to make two trips to gain nigh enough the wind, to set in with the pirates, and being at length little more than random shot from them, they found she slipped her cable and got under sail. At eleven, the pirate was within pistol shot, abreast of them, and a black flag and pendant hoisted at their main topmast head. The deponents say, they then struck the French ensign, that had continued hoisted at the staff all the morning till then, and displayed the king's colours, giving her at the same time their broadside, which was immediately returned. The pirate's mizzen-topmast fell, 
and some of her rigging was torn, yet she still outsailed the man of war, and slid half gunshot from them, while they continued to fire without intermission, and the other to return such guns as could be brought to bear, till, by favour of the winds, they were advanced very nigh again, and after exchanging a few more shots about half an hour past one, his main mast came down, having received a shot a little below the parrel. At two, she struck her colours, and called for quarters, proving to be a ship formerly called the Onslow, but, by them, the royal fortune, and the prisoners from her assured them that the smallest ship of the two, then remaining in the road, belonged to them by the name of the Little Ranger, which they had deserted on this occasion. Signed, Isaacson, Ralph Baldrick, Daniel McLaughlin. The prisoners were asked by the court to the same purpose the others had been in the morning, what exception they had to make against what had been sworn, and what they had to say in their defence, and their reply were much the same with the other prisoners that they were forced men, had not fired a gun in this resistance against the swallow, and that what little assistance they did give on this occasion was to the sails and rigging, to comply with the arbitrary commands of Roberts, who had threatened, and they were persuaded would, have shot them on refusal. The court, to dispense equal justice, mercifully resolved for these, as they had done for the other pirate crew, that further evidence should be heard against each man singly, to the two points of being a volunteer at first, and to their particular acts of piracy and robbery since. That, so men who had been lately received amongst them, and as yet had not been at the taking or plundering of any ship, might have the opportunity and benefit of clearing their innocence, and not fall promiscuously, with the guilty. End of chapter 9, part 9。Chapter 9, part 10 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 9, Part 10. By order of the court, John Atkins, Register. William Magnus, Thomas Outerlawney, William Main, William McIntosh, Val Ashplant, John Walden, Israel Hind, Marcus Johnson, William Petty, William Fernan, Abraham Harper, William Wood, Thomas Howe, John Stephenson, Charles Bunce, and John Griffin. Against these it was disposed by Captain Joseph Traherne and George Fenn, his mate, that they were all of them, either at the attacking and taking of the ship King Solomon, or afterwards at the robbing and plundering of her, and in this manner that on the 6th of January last, their ship, riding an anchor near Cape Apollonia, in Africa, discovered a boat rowing towards them, against wind and stream, from a ship that lay about three miles to leeward. They judged from the number of men in her, as she nearer advanced, to be a pirate, and made some preparation for receiving her, believing, on a nigher view, they would think fit to withdraw from an attack that must be on their side with great disadvantage in an open boat, and against double the number of men. Yet by the rashness and pusillanimity of his own people, who laid down their arms and immediately called for quarter, the ship was taken, and afterwards robbed by them. President, can you charge your memory with any particulars in the seizure and robbery? Evidence. We know that Magnus, quartermaster of the pirate ship, commanded the men in this boat that took us, and assumed the authority of ordering her provisions and stores out, which being of different kinds we soon found, were seized and sent away under more particular directions. For Maine, as boatswain of the pirate ship, carried away two cables and several coils of rope as what belonged to his province, beating some of our own men for not being brisk enough at working in the robbery. Petty, as sailmaker, saw to the sails and canvas. Harper, as cooper, to the cask and tools. Griffin, to the carpenter's stores. And Outerlawney, as pilot, having shifted himself with a suit of my clothes, a new tie wig, and called for a bottle of wine, ordering the ship, very arrogantly, to be steered under Commodore Robert's stern, I suppose to know what orders there were concerning her. So far particularly, in the general, sir, they were very outrageous and emulous in mischief. President, Mr. Castile, acquaint the court of what you know in relation to this robbery of the King Solomon, after what manner the pirate boat was dispatched for this attempt. Thomas Gastel, I was a prisoner, sir, with the pirates when their boat was ordered upon that service, and found, upon a resolution of going, 
word was passed through the company, who would go, and I saw all that did, did it voluntarily, no compulsion, but rather pressing who should be foremost. The prisoners yielded to what had been sworn about the attack and robbery, but denied the latter evidence, saying, Roberts hectored, and upbraided them of cowardice on this very occasion, and told some they were very ready to step on board of a prize when within command of the ship, but now there seemed to be a trial of their valor, backward and fearful. President, so that Roberts forced ye upon this attack? Prisoners, Roberts commanded us into the boat, and the quartermaster to rob the ship, neither of whose commands we dared to have refused. President, and granting it so, those are still your own acts, since done by orders from officers of your own election. Why would men, honestly disposed, give their votes for such a captain and such a quartermaster as were every day commanding them on distasteful services? Here succeeded a silence among the prisoners, but at length Fernand very honestly owned that he did not give his vote to Magnus, but to David Simpson, the old quartermaster, for in truth, says he, I took Magnus for too honest a man, and unfit for the business. The evidence was plain and home, and the court, without any hesitation, brought them in guilty. William Church, Philip Hake, James White, Nicholas Brattle, Hugh Riddle, William Thomas, Thomas Roberts, Joseph Richards, Joseph Kane, R. Wood, R. Scott, William Davison, Samuel Morwell, Edward Evans, William Guineas, and eighteen French men. The first four of these prisoners, it was evident to the court, served as music on board the pirate, were forced lately from the several merchant ships they belonged to, and that they had, during this confinement, an uneasy life of it, having sometimes their fiddles, and often their heads broke, only for excusing themselves, or saying they were tired, when any fellow took it in his head to demand a tune. The other English had been a very few days on board the pirate, only from Wida to Cape Lopez, and no capture or robbery done by them in that time. And the Frenchmen were brought with a design to reconduct their own ship, or the little ranger in exchange, to Wida Road, and were used like prisoners, neither quartered nor suffered to carry arms, so that the court immediately acquiesced in acquitting them. Thomas Sutton, David Simpson, Christopher Moody, Philip Bill, R. Hardy, Henry Dennis, David Rice, William Williams, R. Harris, George Smith, Edward Watts, Joseph Mitchell, and James Burrow. The evidence against these prisoners were Garrett de Haan, master of the Flushingham, taken nigh Axum, the beginning of January last, Benjamin Crest, master, and James Grote, mate of the Gertruich, taken nigh Gabon in December last, and Mr. Castell, Wingfield, and others, that had been prisoners with the pirates. The former disposed that all these prisoners, excepting Hardy, were on board at the robbery and plunder of their ships, behaving in a vile outrageous manner, putting them in bodily fears, sometimes for the ship and sometimes for themselves, and in particular, Crift charged it on Sutton, that he had ordered all their gunners' stores out, on which that prisoner presently interrupted and said he was perjured, that he had not taken half, a reply, I believe, not designed as any saucy way of jesting, but to give their behavior an appearance of more humanity than the Dutch would allow. From Mr. Castile, Wingfeld, and others, they were proved to be distinguished men, men who were consulted as chiefs in all enterprises, belonged most of them to the House of Lords, as they called it, and could carry an authority over others. The former said, particularly of Hardy, quartermaster of the ranger, that when the diligent sloop was taken— whereto he belonged, none was busier in the plunder, and was the very man who scuttled and sunk the vessel. From some of the prisoners acquitted, it was farther demanded whether the acceptance or refusal of any office was not in their own option, and it was declared that every officer was chose by a majority of votes, and might refuse, if he pleased, since others gladly embraced what brought with it an additional share of prize. Guilty. The court on the 31st of March remanded the following six before them for sentence, viz. David Simpson, William Magnus, R. Hardy, Thomas Sutton, Christopher Moody, and Valen Ashplant, to whom the President spoke to the following purpose. The crime of piracy, of which all of ye have been justly convicted, is of all other robberies the most aggravating and inhumane. 
in that being removed from the fears of surprise in remote and distant parts ye do in wantonness of power often add cruelty to theft pirates unmoved at distress or poverty not only spoil and rob but do it from men needy and who are purchasing their livelihoods through hazards and difficulties which ought rather to move compassion and what is still worse do often by persuasion or force engage an inconsiderate part of them to their own and family's ruin removing them from their wives and children and by that from the means that should support them from misery and want to a trading nation nothing can be so destructive as piracy or call for more exemplary punishment besides the national reflection it infers it cuts off the returns of industry and those plentiful importations that alone can make an island flourishing and it is your aggravation that ye have been the chiefs and rulers in these licentious and lawless practices however contrary to the measures ye have dealt ye have been heard with patience and though little has or possibly could have been said in excuse or extenuation of your crimes yet charity makes us hope that a true and sincere repentance which we heartily recommend may entitle ye to mercy and forgiveness after the sentence of the law has taken place which now remains upon me to pronounce you david simpson william magnus r hardy thomas sutton christopher moody and val ashplant ye and each of you are adjudged and sentenced to be carried back to the place from whence ye came from thence to the place of execution, without the gates of this castle, and there, within the flood-marks, to be hanged by the neck till ye are dead. After this ye and each of you shall be taken down, and your bodies hanged in chains. Warrant for Execution Pursuant to the sentence given on Saturday, by the Court of Admiralty at Cape Corso Castle, against David Simpson, William Magnus, R. Hardy, Thomas Sutton, Christopher Moody, and Valentine Ashplant, you are hereby directed to carry the aforesaid malefactors to the place of execution, without the gates of this castle, to-morrow morning at nine of the clock, and there, within the flood-marks, cause them to be hanged by the neck till they are dead, for which this shall be your warrant, given under my hand this second day of April, 1722, to Joseph Gordon, Provost Marshal, Mungo Herdman, the bodies remove in chains to the gibbets already erected on the adjacent hillocks. M. H. William Phillips. It appeared by the evidence of Captain Joe Traherne and George Fenn, mate of the King Solomon, that this prisoner was boatswain of the same ship when she was attacked and taken off Cape Apollonia, the sixth of January last, by the pirate's boat. When the boat drew nigh, they say, it was judged from the number of men in her that they were pirates, and being hailed, answered defiance at which the commander snatched a musket from one of his men, and fired, asking them at the same time whether they would stand by him to defend the ship. The pirates returning a volley and crying out they would give no quarters if any resistance was made, this prisoner took upon him to call out for quarters, without the master's consent, and misled the rest to the lying down their arms, and giving up the ship, to half the number of men, and in an open boat." It was further evident he became, after this, a volunteer amongst them, first because he was presently very forward and brisk in robbing the ship King Solomon of her provisions and stores, secondly because he endeavoured to have his captain ill-used, and lastly because he had confessed to Fenn that he had been obliged to sign their articles that night, a pistol being laid on the table to signify he must do it or be shot. When the whole appeared to be an untruth from other evidence, who also asserted his being armed in the action against the swallow. In answer to this he first observed upon the unhappiness of being friendless in this part of the world, which elsewhere, by witnessing to the honesty of his former life, would, he believed, in a great measure, have invalidated the wrong evidence had been given of his being a volunteer with the pirates. He owns, indeed, he made no application to his captain to intercede for a discharge, but excuses it with saying he had a dislike to him, and therefore was sure that such application would have availed him nothing. The court observed the pretenses of this, and other of the pirates, of a pistol and their articles being served up in a dish together, or of their being misused and forced from an honest service, was often a complotment of the parties to render them less suspected of those they came from, and was to answer the end of being put in a newspaper or affidavit, 
and the pirates were so generous as not to refuse a compliment to a brother that cost them nothing, and, at the same time, secured them the best hands, the best, I call them, because such a dependence made them act more boldly. Guilty. Harry Glasby, Master. There appearing several persons in court who had been taken by Roberts's ship, whereof the prisoner was master, their evidence was accepted as follows. Joe Traherne, commander of the King Solomon, deposed the prisoner, indeed to act as master of the pirate ship, while he was under restraint there, but was observed like no master, every one obeying at discretion, of which he had taken notice and complained to him, how hard a condition it was to be a chief among brutes, and that he was weary of his life, and such other expressions, now out of his memory, as showed in him a great disinclination to that course of living. Joe Wingfield, a prisoner with them at Calabar, says the same, as to the quality he acted in, but that he was civil beyond any of them, and verily believes that when the brigantine he served on board of, as a factor of the African company, was voted to be burnt, this man was the instrument of preventing it, expressing himself with a great deal of sorrow, for this and the malicious rogueries of the company he was in, that to him showed he had acted with reluctancy, as one who could not avoid what he did. He adds further, that when one Hamilton, a surgeon, was taken by them, and the articles about to be imposed on him, he opposed and prevented it. And that Hunter, another surgeon among them, was cleared at the prisoner's instance and persuasion, from which last this despondent had it assured to him that Glasby had once been under sentence of death on board of them with two more, for endeavouring an escape in the West Indies, and that the other two were really shot for it. Elizabeth Trengrove, who was taken a passenger in the African Company's ship Onslow, strengthened the evidence of the last witness, for having heard a good character of this Glasby, she inquired of the quartermaster, who was then on board a robbing, whether or no she could see him, and he told her no. They never ventured him from the ship, for he had once endeavoured his escape, and they had ever since continued jealous of him. Edward Crisp, Captain Trengrove, and Captain Sharp, who had all been taken in their turns, acknowledged for themselves and others who had unluckily fallen into those pirates' hands that the good usage they had met with was chiefly through the prisoners' means, who often interposed, for leaving sufficient stores and instruments on board the ships they had robbed, allegedly they were superfluous and unnecessary there. James White, whose business was music, and was on the poop of the pirate ship in time of action with the Swallow, deposed that during the engagement and defence she made, he never saw the prisoner busied about the guns or giving orders, either to the loading or firing of them, but that he wholly attended to the setting or trimming of the sails, as Roberts commanded, and that in the conclusion he verily believed him to be the man who prevented the ships being blown up, by setting trusty sentinels below, and opposing himself against such hot-headed fellows as had procured lighted matches, and were going down for that purpose. Isaac's son, lieutenant of the man-of-war, deposed, that when he came to take possession of the prize in the king's boat, he found the pirates in a very distracted and divided condition, some being for blowing up, and others, who perhaps supposed themselves less culpable, opposing it, that in this confusion he inquired for the prisoner of whom he had before heard a good character, and thinks he rendered all the service in his power for preventing it. In particular he understood by all hands that he had seized and taken from one James Phillips a lighted match, at the instant he was going down to the magazine, swearing that he should send them all to hell together. He had heard also that after Roberts was killed, the prisoner ordered the colors to be struck, and had since shown how opposite his practice and principles had been by discovering who were the greatest rogues among them. The prisoner, in his own defence, says, when he had the misfortune of falling into the pirate's hands, he was chief mate of the Samuel, of London, Captain Carey, and when he had hid himself to prevent the design of carrying him away, they found him, and beat and threw him overboard. Seven days afterwards, upon his objecting against and refusing to sign their articles, he was cut and abused again that though after this he ingratiated himself by a more humble carriage, it was only to make life easy. 
the shares they had given him having been from time to time returned again to such prisoners as fell in his way, till of late, indeed, he had made a small reservation, and had desired Captain Lone to take two or three Madores from him to carry to his wife. He was once taken, he says, at making his escape in the West Indies, and with two more sentenced to be shot for it by a drunken jury. The latter actually suffered, and he was preserved only by one of the chief pirates taking a sudden liking to him, and bullying the others. A second time he ran away at Hispaniola, carrying a pocket compass, for conducting him through the woods. But that being a most desolate and wild part of the island he fell upon, and he ignorant how to direct his course, was obliged, after two or three days' wandering, to return towards the ship again, denying with egregious oaths the design he was charged with, for fear they would shoot him. From this time he hopes it will be some extenuation of his fault, that most of the acquitted prisoners can witness, they entertain jealousies of him, and Roberts would not admit him into his secrets, and with all that Captain Carey, and four other prisoners with him, had made affidavit of his having been forced from his employ, which though he could not produce, yet he humbly hoped the court would think highly probable from the circumstances offered. On the whole, the court was of opinion. Artists had the best pretension to the plea of force, from the necessity pirates are sometimes under of engaging such, and that many parts of his own defence had been confirmed by the evidence, who had asserted he acted with reluctance, and had expressed a concern and trouble for the little hopes remained to him of extricating himself that he had used all prisoners, as they were called, well, at the hazard of ill-usage to himself, that he had not in any military capacity assisted their robberies, that he had twice endeavoured his escape with the utmost danger. Acquitted him. Captain James Skirm. It appeared from the evidence of several prisoners acquitted that this Skirm commanded the ranger, in that defence she made against the king's ship, that he ordered the men to their quarters, and the guns to be loaded and fired, having a sword in his hand to enforce those commands, and beat such to their duty whom he espied any way negligent or backward, that although he had lost a leg in the action, his temper was so warm as to refuse going off the deck till he found all was lost. In his defence, he says, he was forced from a mate's employ on board a sloop called the Greyhound, of St. Christopher's, October 1720. The pirate having drubbed him, and broke his head only for offering to go away when that sloop was dismissed. Custom and success had since indeed blunted, and in some measure worn out the sense of shame, but that he had really for several months past been sick, and disqualified for any duty, and though Roberts had forced him on this expedition much against his will, yet the evidence must be sensible. The title of captain gave him no preeminence, for he could not be obeyed, though he had often called to them, to leave off their fire, when he perceived it to be the king's ship. The sickness, he alleged, but more especially the circumstance of losing his leg, were aggravations of his fault, showing him more alert on such occasions than he was now willing to be thought. As to the name of captain, if it were allowed to give him no precedence out of battle, yet here it was proved a title of authority, such an authority as could direct an engagement against the king's colours, and therefore he was in the highest degree guilty. End of chapter 9, part 10 Chapter 9, part 11 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Barry Eads The General History of the Pirates, volume 1 by Charles Johnson Chapter 9, part 11 John Walden. Captain John Traherne and George Fenn deposed, the prisoner to be one of the number, who, in an open boat, piratically assailed and took their ship, and was remarkably busy at mischief, having a pole-axe in his hand, which served him instead of a key, to all the locked doors and boxes he came nigh. Also, in particular, he cut the cable of our ship, when the other pirates were willing and busied at heaving up the anchor, saying, Captain, which signifies this trouble of yo hope and straining in hot weather, that there are more anchors at London, and besides, your ship is to be burnt. William Smith, a prisoner acquitted, says Walden was known among the pirates mostly by the nickname of Miss Nanny, 
Ironically, it's presumed from the hardiness of his temper, that he was one of the twenty who voluntarily came on board the ranger, in the chase she made out after the swallow, and by a shot from that ship lost his leg, his behavior in the fight till then being bold and daring. The President called for Harry Glasby, and bid him relate a character of the prisoner and what custom was among them, in relation to these voluntary expeditions, out of their proper ship and this of going on board the ranger in particular. And he gave in for evidence that the prisoner was looked on as a brisk hand, i.e., as he farther explained it, a staunch pirate, a great rogue, that when the swallow first appeared in sight every one was willing to believe her a Portuguese, because sugar was very much in demand, and had made some jarring and dissension between the two companies. The fortunes, people drinking punch, when the rangers could not, that Roberts, on sight of the swallow, hailed the new ranger, and bid them right ship and get under sail. There is, says he, sugar in the offing, bring it in, that we may have no more mumbling, ordering at the same time the word to be passed among the crew, who would go to their assistance, and immediately the boat was full of men to transport themselves. President, then every one that goes on board of any prize does it voluntarily, or were there here any other reasons for it? H. Glasby. Every man is commonly called by list, and insists in his turn to go on board of a prize, because they then are allowed a shift of clothes, the best they can find, over and above the dividend from the robbery, and this they are so far from being compelled to, that it often becomes the occasion of contest and quarrel amongst them. But in the present or such like cases, where there appears a prospect of trouble, the lazy and timorous are often willing to decline this turn, and yield to their betters, who thereby establish a greater credit. The prisoner and the rest of those men who went from the fortune on board the ranger to assist in this expedition were volunteers, and the trustiest men among us. President, were there no jealousies of the rangers leaving you in this chase, or at any other time, in order to surrender? H. Glasby. Most of the ranger's crew were fresh men, men who had been entered only since their being on the coast of Guinea, and therefore had not so liberal a share in fresh provisions or wine as the fortunes' people, who thought they had borne the burthen and heat of the day, which had given occasion indeed to some grumblings and whispers, as though they would take an opportunity to leave us, but we never supposed, if they did, it would be with any other design than setting up for themselves, they having, many of them, behaved with greater severity than the old standers. The prisoner appeared undaunted and rather solicitous about resting his stump than giving any answer to the court or making any defense for himself till called upon. Then he related in a careless or rather hopeless manner the circumstances of his first entrance, being forced, he said, out of the blessing of Leamington at Newfoundland, about twelve months past. This, he is sure, most of the old pirates knew, and that he was for some time as sick of the change as any man. But custom and ill company had altered him, owning very frankly that he was at the attack, and taking of the King Solomon, that he did cut her cable, and that none were forced on those occasions. As to the last expedition in the ranger, he confesses he went on board of her, but that it was by Roberts's order, and in the chase loaded one gun to bring her to, but when he saw it was a bite, he declared to his comrades that it was not worth while to resist. Sore bore firing, and assisted to reeve the braces, in order, if they could, to get away, in which sort of service he was busied, when a shot from the man of war took off his leg, and being asked that supposing the chase had proved a Portuguese. Why then, says he, I don't know what I might have done, intimating with all that everybody then would have been ready enough at plundering. Guilty. Peter Scudamore, Harry Glasby, Joe Wingfield, and Nicholas Brattle, deposed thus much, as to his being a volunteer with the pirates, from Captain Rolls at Calabar. First, that he quarreled with Moody, one of the heads of the gang, and fought with him because he opposed his going, asking Rolls in a leering manner whether he would not be so kind as to put him into the Gazette when he came home, and, at another time, when he was going from the pirate ship in his boat, a tornado arose. I wish, says he, the rascal may be drowned, for he is a great rogue, and has endeavored to do me all the ill offices he could among these gentlemen, i.e. pirates. 
and secondly, that he had signed the pirates' articles with a great deal of alacrity, and gloried in having been the first surgeon that had done so, for before this it was their custom to change their surgeons, when they desired it, after having served a time and never obliged them to sign, but he was resolved to break through this, for the good of those who were to follow. Swearing immediately upon it, he was now, he hoped, as great a rogue as any of them. Captain Joe Treherne and George Fenn, his mate, deposed the prisoner to have taken out of the King Solomon their surgeon's capital instruments, some medicines, and a backgammon table, which later became the means of a quarrel between one Wincon and he whose property they should be, and were yielded to the prisoner. Joe Sharp, master of the Elizabeth, heard the prisoner ask Roberts leave to force Cumry, his surgeon, from him, which was accordingly done, and with him carried also some of the ship's medicines. But what gave a fuller proof of the dishonesty of his principles was the treacherous design he had formed of running away with the prize, in her passage to Cape Corso, though he had been treated with all humanity, and very unlike a prisoner, on account of his employ and better education, which had rendered him less to be suspected. Mr. Child, acquitted, deposed, that in their passage from the island of St. Thomas, in the Fortune Prize, this prisoner was several times tempted him, into measures of rising with the negroes, and killing the swallow's people, showing him how easily the white men might be demolished, and a new company raised at Angola, and that part of the coast, for, says he, I understand how to navigate a ship, and can soon teach you to steer, and is it not better to do this than to go back to Cape Corso and be hanged and sun-dried? To which the deponent, replying, he was not afraid of being hanged, Scudamore bid him be still, and no harm should come to him. But before the next day evening, which was the design time of executing this project, the deponent discovered it to the officer, and assured him Scudamore had been talking all the preceding night to the negroes in Angolian language. Isaac Burnett heard the prisoner ask James Harris, a pirate, left with the wounded in the prize, whether he was willing to come into the project of running away with the ship, and endeavor the raising of a new company, but turned the discourse to horse-racing, as the deponent crept nigher. He acquainted the officer with what he had heard, who kept the people under arms all night, their apprehensions of the negroes not being groundless, for many of them, having lived a long time in this piratical way, were, by the thin commons they were now reduced to, as ripe for mischief as any. The prisoner, in his defense, said, he was a forced man from Captain Rolls, in October last, and if he had not shown such a concern as became him, at the alteration he must remark the occasion to be, the disagreement and enmity between them but that both Roberts and Val Asplant threatened him into signing their articles, and that he did it in terror. The King Solomon and Elizabeth medicine chest he owns he plundered, by order of Hunter, the then chief surgeon who, by the pirate's laws, always directs in this province, and Mr. Child, though acquitted, had by the same orders taken out a whole French medicine chest, which he must be sensible for me, as well as for himself, we neither of us dared to have denied, it was their being the proper judges, made so ungrateful an office imposed, if after this he was elected chief surgeon himself, both Comrie and Wilson were set up also, and it might have been their chance to have carried it, and as much out of their power to have refused. As to the attempt of rising and running away with the prize, he denies it altogether as untrue a few foolish words, but only by way of supposition, that if the negroes should take it in their heads, considering the weakness and ill lookout that was kept, it would have been an easy matter, in his opinion, for them to have done it. But that he encouraged such a thing was false. His talking to them in the Angolan language was only a way of spending his time, and trying his skill to tell twenty, he being incapable of further talk. As to his understanding navigation, he had frequently acknowledged it to the deponent child, and wonders he should now so circumstantiate this skill against him. Guilty. Robert Johnson. It appeared to the court that the prisoner was one of the twenty men in the boat of the pirates, which afterwards robbed the King Solomon, at an anchor near Cape Apollonia, that all pirates on this and the like service were volunteers, and he, in particular, had contested his going on board a second time, though out of his turn. The prisoner in his defense called for Harry Glasby, 
who witnessed to his being so very drunk when he first came among their crew, that they were forced to hoist him out of one ship into the other, with a tackle, and therefore without his consent, but he had since been a trusty man, and was placed to the helm in that running battle they made with the swallow. He insisted for himself likewise on Captain Turner's affidavit of his being forced, on which others, his shipmates, had been cleared. The court, considering the partiality that might be objected in acquitting one, and condemning another of the same standing, thought sit to remark it as a clear testimony of their integrity, that their care and indulgence to each man in allowing his particular defence was to exempt from the rigour of the law such who it must be allowed would have stood too promiscuously condemned. If they had not been heard upon any other fact than that of the swallow, and herein what could better direct them than a character and behaviour from their own associates, for though a voluntary entry with the pirates may be doubtful, yet his consequent actions are not, and it is not so material how a man comes among pirates as how he acts when he is there. Guilty. George Wilson. John Sharp, master of the Elizabeth, in which ship the prisoner was passenger, and fell a second time into the pirate's hands, deposes that he took the said Wilson off from Sestos, on this coast, paying to the negroes for his ransom, the value of three pound five shillings in goods, for which he had taken a note, that he thought he had done a charitable act in this, till meeting with one Captain Canning, he was asked why he would release such a rogue as Wilson was, for that he had been a volunteer with the pirates, out of John Tarleton, and when the deponent came to be a prisoner himself, he found Thomas, the brother of this John Tarleton, a prisoner with the pirates also, who was immediately on Wilson's instigation, in a most sad manner misused and beat, and had been shot, through the fury and rage of some of those fellows, if the town side, i.e. Liverpool, men, had not hid him in a stay-stale, under the bowsprit, for Moody and Harper, with their pistols cocked, searched every corner of the ship to find him, and came to this deponent's hammock, whom they had like fatality to have mistaken for Tarleton, but on his calling out they found their error and left him with this comfortable anodyne, that he was the honest fellow who brought the doctor, at coming away the prisoner asked about his note, whether the pirates had it or no, who not being able readily to tell, he replied, It's no matter, Mr. Sharp, I believe I shall hardly ever come to England to pay it. Adam Comrie, surgeon of the Elizabeth, says that although the prisoner had, on account of his indisposition and want, received many civilities from him before meeting with the pirates, he yet understood it was through his and Scudamore's means that he had been compelled among them. The prisoner was very alert and cheerful, he says, at meeting with Roberts, hailed him, told him he was glad to see him, and would come on board presently, borrowing of the deponent a clean shirt and drawers for his better appearance and reception. He signed their articles willingly, and used arguments with him to do the same, saying they should make their voyage in eight months, to Brazil, share six or seven hundred per a man, and then break up. Again, when the crew came to an election of a chief surgeon, and this deponent was set up with the others, Wilson told him he hoped he should carry it from Scudamore, for that a quarter share, which they had more than others, would be worth looking after. But the deponent missed the preservment, by the good will of the rangers' people, who in general voted for Scudamore, to get rid of him, the chief surgeon being always to remain with the Commodore. It appeared likewise by the evidence of Captain Joe Traherne, Thomas Castell, and others, who had been taken by the pirates, and thence had opportunities of observing the prisoner's conduct, that he seemed thoroughly satisfied with that way of life, and was particularly intimate with Roberts, they often scoffing at the mention of a man of war, and saying, if they should meet with any of the turnips men's ships, they would blow up and go to hell together. Yet setting aside these silly freaks, to recommend himself, his laziness had got him many enemies, even Roberts told him, on the complaint of a wounded man, whom he had refused to dress, that he was a double rogue, to be there a second time, and threatened to cut his ears off. The evidence further assured the court, from Captain Thomas Tarleton, that the prisoner was taken out of his brother's ship, some months before, a first time, and being forward to oblige his new company, had presently asked for the pirate's boat, to fetch the medicine chest away, when the wind and current proving too hard to contend with, they were drove on shore at Cape Monserrato. 
The prisoner called for William Darling and Samuel Morwell, acquitted, and Nicholas Butler. William Darling deposed, the first time the prisoner fell into their hands, Roberts mistook him for Joel Tarleton, the master, and being informed it was the surgeon who came to represent him, then indisposed, he presently swore he should be his messmate, to which Wilson replied, he hoped not, he had a wife and child, which the other laughed at, and that he had been two days on board, before he went in that boat, which was drove on shore at Cape Monserrato, and at his second coming in the Elizabeth, he heard Robert's order he should be brought on board in the first boat. Samuel Morwell says that he has heard him bewail his condition, while on board the pirate, and desired one Thomas to use his interest with Robert's for a discharge, saying his employ, and the little fortune he had left at home, would, he hoped, exempt him the further trouble of seeking his bread at sea. Nicholas Butler, who had remained with the pirates about forty-eight hours, when they took the French ships at Wida, deposes that in this space the prisoner addressed him in the French language several times, deploring the wretchedness and ill fortune of being confined in such company. The prisoner, desiring liberty of two or three questions, asked whether or no he had not expostulated with Roberts, for a reason of his obliging surgeons to sign their articles, when heretofore they did not, whether he had not expressed himself glad to having formally escaped from them, whether he had not said, at taking the ships in Wida Road, that he could like the sport were it lawful, and whether if he had not told him, should the company discharge any surgeon, that he would insist on it as his turn. The deponent answered yes to every question separately, and farther, that he believed Scudamore had not seen Wilson when he first came and found him out of the Elizabeth. He added in his own defense, that being surgeon with one John Tarleton of Liverpool, he was met a first time on this coast of Guinea by Roberts the pirate, who, after a day or two, told him to his sorrow that he was to stay there, and ordered him to fetch his chest, not medicines, as asserted, which opportunity he took to make his escape, for the boat's crew happening to consist of five French and one Englishman, all as willing as himself they agreed to push the boat on shore and trust themselves with the negroes of Cape Montserrado. Hazardous not only in respect of the dangerous seas that run there, but the inhumanity of the natives who sometimes take a liking to human carcasses. Here he remained five months, till Thomas Tarleton, brother to his captain, chanced to put in the road for trade, to whom he represented his hardships and starving condition, but was, in an unchristian manner, both refused a release of this captivity, or so much as a small supply of biscuit and salt meat, because, as he said, he had been among the pirates. A little time after this the master of a French ship paid a ransom for him, and took him off. But, by reason of a nasty leprous indisposition he had contracted by hard and bad living, was, to his great misfortune, set ashore at Sestos again, when Captain Sharp met him, and generously procured his release in the manner himself has related, and for which he stands infinitely obliged. That ill luck threw him a second time into the pirate's hands in this ship Elizabeth, where he met Thomas Tarleton, and thoughtlessly used some reproaches of him, for his severe treatment at Montserrado, but protests without design his word should have had so bad a consequence, for Roberts took upon him, as a dispenser of justice, the correction of Mr. Tarleton, beating him unmercifully, and he hopes it will believe, contrary to any intention of his, it should so happen because as a stranger he might be supposed to have no influence, and believes there were some other motives for it. He could not remember he expressed himself glad to see Roberts the second time, or that he dropped those expressions about Comrie, as are sworn. But if immaturity of judgment had occasioned him to slip rash and inadvertent words, or that he had paid any undue compliments to Roberts, it was to ingratiate himself, as every prisoner did, for a more civil treatment, and in particular to procure his discharge, which he had been promised, and was afraid would have been revoked, if such a person as Comrie did not remain there to supply his room, and of this, he said, all the gentlemen, meaning the pirates, could witness for him. He urged also his youth in excuse for his rashness. The first time he had been with them, only a month in all, and that in no military employ, 
but in particular the service he had done in discovering the design of the pirates had to rise in their passage on board the Swallow. Guilty. But execution respited till the king's pleasure be known, because the commodore of the Swallow had declared the first notice he received of this design of the pirates to rise was from him. End of chapter 9, part 11《Chapter Nine, Part Twelve of the General History of the Pirates, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume One by Charles Johnson. Chapter Nine, Part Twelve. Benjamin Jeffreys. By the depositions of Glasby and Lilburn, acquitted against this prisoner. It appeared that his drunkenness was what at first detained him from going away in his proper ship, the Norman galley, and next morning, for having been abusive in his drink, saying to the pirates, there was not a man amongst them, he received for a welcome six lashes from every person in the ship, which disordered him for some weeks, but, on recovery, was made boatswain's mate, the serving of which, or any office on board a pirate, is at their own option, though elected, because others are glad to accept what brings an additional share in prize. The deponents further say that at Sierra Leone every man had more especially the means of escaping, and that this prisoner in particular neglected it, and came off from that place after their ship was under sail and going out of the river. The prisoner in his defence protests he was at first forced, and that the office of boatswain's mate was imposed on him, and what he would have been glad to have relinquished, that the barbarous whipping he had received from the pirates at first was for telling them that none who could get their bread in an honest way would be on such an account, and he had certainly taken the opportunity which presented at Sierra Leone of ridding himself from so distasteful a life if there had not been three or four of the old pirates on shore at the same time, who, he imagined, must know of him, and would doubtless have served him the same, if not worse, than they since had done William Williams, who, for such a design, being delivered up by the treacherous natives, had received two lashes through the whole ship's company. The court observed the excuses of these pirates about want of means to escape was oftentimes as poor and evasive as their pleas of being forced at first, for here, at Sierra Leone, every man had his liberty on shore, and it was evident might have kept it if he or they had so pleased. And such are further culpable, who, having been introduced into the society by such uncivil methods as whipping or beating, neglect less likely means of regaining liberty. It shows strong inclinations to dishonesty, and they stand, inexcusably, guilty. John Mansfield, it was proved against this prisoner by Captain Traherne and George Fenn, that he was one of those volunteers who was at the attack and robbery of the company's ship, called the King Solomon. That... He bullied well among them who dared not make any reply, but was very easy with his friends who knew him, for Moody on this occasion took a large glass from him and threatened to blow his brains out, a favourite phrase with these pirates, if he muttered at it. From others acquitted, it likewise appeared that he was at first a volunteer among them from an island called Dominica, in the West Indies and had to recommend himself told them he was a deserter from the rose man of war and before that had been on the highway he was always drunk they said and so bad at the time they met with the swallow that he knew nothing of the action but came up vapouring with his cutlass after the fortune had struck her colours to know who would go on board the prize and it was some time before they could persuade him into the truth of their condition he could say little in defence of himself acknowledged this latter part of drunkenness a vice he says that had too great a share in ensnaring him into this course of life and had been a greater motive with him than gold guilty william davis william allen deposed he knew this prisoner at sierra leone belonging to the anne galley that he had a quarrel with and beat the mate of that ship for which as he said being afraid to return to his duty he consorted to the idle customs and ways of living among the negroes from whom he received a wife and ungratefully sold her one evening for some punch to quench his thirst after this 
having put himself under the protection of mr plunkett governor there for the royal african company the relations and friends of the woman applied to him for redress who immediately surrendered the prisoner and told them he did not care if they took his head off but the negroes wisely judging it would not fetch so good a price they sold him in his turn again to seigneur jose a christian black and native of that place who expected and agreed for two years service from him on consideration of what he had dispersed for the redemption of the woman but long before the expiration of this time roberts came into sierra leone river where the prisoner as seigneur jose assured the deponent entered a volunteer with them the deponent further corroborates this part of the evidence in that he being obliged to call at cape mount in his passage down hither met there with two deserters from roberts ship who assured him of the same and that the pirates did design to turn davis away the next opportunity as an idle good-for-nothing fellow from glasby and lilburn it was evident that every pirate while they stayed at sierra leone went on shore at discretion that roberts had often assured mr glynn and other traders at that place that he would force no body and in short there was no occasion for it in particular the prisoner's roommate went away and thinks he might have done the same if he had pleased the prisoner alleged his having been detained against his will and says that returning with elephant's teeth for sierra leone the pirate's boat pursued and brought him on board where he was kept on account of his understanding the pilotage and navigation of that river it was obvious to the court not only how frivolous excuses of constraint and force were among these people at their first commencing pirates but also it was plain to them from these two deserters met at cape mount and the discretional manner they lived in at sierra leone through how little difficulty several of them did and others might have escaped afterwards if they could but have obtained their own consents for it guilty this is the substance of the trials of Roberts's crew, which may suffice for others that occur in this book. The foregoing list shows by an asterisk before the names who were condemned. Those names with a cross were referred for trial to the marshalsy, and all the rest were acquitted. The following pirates were executed, according to their sentence, without the gates of Cape Corso Castle, within the flood marks, viz. There now follows a list of all the pirates who were executed, gives their names their age, and their origin. William Magnus, 35, Minehead. Richard Hardy, 25, from Wales. David Simpson, 36, North Berwick. Christopher Moody, 28, place unknown. Thomas Sutton, 23, Berwick. Valentine Ashplant, 32, Minories. Peter Devine, 42, Stepney. William Phillips, 29, from Lower Shadwell. Philip Bill, 27, St. Thomas's. William Main, 28, Origin Unknown. William Mackintosh, 21, from Canterbury. William Williams, 40, Nigh Plymouth. Robert Hawes, 31, Yarmouth. William Petty, 30, Deptford. John Janeson, 22, Nigh Lancaster. Marcus Johnson, 21, Smyrna. Robert Crow, 44, from the Isle of Man. Michael Mayer, 41, Ghent. Daniel Harding, 26, Croomsbury in Somersetshire. William Fernan, age 22, Somersetshire. Jonathan Moore, 19, Mere in Wiltshire. Abraham Harper, 23, from Bristol. Jonathan Parker, 22, Winford in Dorsetshire. Jonathan Phillips, 28, Alloway in Scotland. James Clement, age 20, Jersey. Peter Scudamore, 35, from Bristol. James Skirm, 44, from Wales. John Walden, 24, Somersetshire. Jonathan Stevenson, 40, from Whitby. Jonathan Mansfield, 30, from the Orkneys. Israel Hind, aged 30, Bristol. Peter Leslie, 21, Aberdeen. Charles Bunce, 26, Exeter. Robert Burtson, aged 30, other St. Mary's, Devonshire. Richard Harris, 45, Cornwall. Joseph Nossiter, 26, from Sadbury in Devonshire. William Williams, aged 30, speechless at execution. Arge Jacobson, 30, from Holland. Benjamin Jeffries, 21, from Bristol. Cuthbert Goss, 21, Topson. 
John Jessop, 20, from Plymouth. Edward Watts, 22, Dunmore. Thomas Giles, 26, Minehead. William Wood, aged 27, York. Thomas Armstrong, aged 34, from London, executed on board the Weymouth. Robert Johnson, 32, but wider. George Smith, 25, from Wales. William Watts, 23, from Ireland. James Phillips, 35, Antigua. John Coleman, 24, from Wales. Robert Hayes, 20, Liverpool. William Davis, 23, Wales. The remainder of the pirates, whose names are under-mentioned, upon their humble petition to the court, had their sentence changed from death to seven years' servitude conformable to our sentence of transportation. The petition is as follows. To the Honourable, the President and Judges of the Court of Admiralty, for trying of pirates sitting at Cape Corso Castle, the 20th day of April, 1722. The humble petition of Thomas Howe, Samuel Fletcher, etc., humbly showeth that your petitioners being unhappily and unwarily drawn into that wretched and detestable crime of piracy for which they now stand justly condemned, they most humbly pray the clemency of the court in the mitigation of their sentence, that they may be permitted to serve the Royal African Company of England in this country for seven years, in such a manner as the court shall think proper, that by their just punishment, being made sensible of the error of their former ways, they will for the future become faithful subjects, good servants, and useful in their stations, if it please the Almighty to prolong their lives. And your petitioners as in duty, etc. The resolution of the court was, that the petitioners have leave by this court of admiralty to interchange indentures with the captain-general of the Gold Coast for the Royal African Company for seven years' servitude at any of the Royal African Company settlements in Africa, in such a manner as he, the said captain-general, shall think proper. On Thursday, the 26th day of April, the indentures being all drawn out, according to the grant made to the petitioners by the court held on Friday, the 20th of this instant, each prisoner was sent for up, signed, sealed, and exchanged them in the presence of Captain Mungo Herdman, President, James Phipps, Esquire, Mr. Edward Hyde, Mr. Charles Fanshaw, and Mr. John Atkins, Register. A copy of the indenture. The indenture of a person condemned to serve abroad for piracy, which, upon the humble petition of the pirates therein mentioned, was most mercifully granted by His Imperial Majesty's commissioners and judges appointed to hold a court of admiralty for the trial of pirates at Cape Corso Castle in Africa, upon condition of serving seven years and other conditions are as follows, viz. This indenture made the 26th day of April, Anno Regni Regis Georgi Magnae Britannae, etc., Septimo Domini Millesimo Septentesimo Viginti Duo, between Roger Scott, late of the city of Bristol, Mariner, of the Wumpart, and the Royal African Company of England, their captain-general and commander-in-chief for the time being on the other part, witnesseth that the said Roger Scott doth hereby covenant and agree to, and with, the said Royal African Company, their captain-general and commander-in-chief for the time being, to serve him or his lawful successors in any of the Royal African Company settlements on the coast of Africa, from the day of the date of these presents to the full term of seven years, from hence next ensuing, fully to be complete and ended, there to serve in such employment as the said captain-general or his successors shall employ him, according to the custom of the country in like kind. In consideration whereof the said captain-general and commander-in-chief doth covenant and agree to and with the said Roger Scott to find and allow him meat, drink, apparel and lodging according to the custom of the country. In witness whereof the parties aforesaid to these presents have interchangeably put their hands and seals the day and year first above written. Signed, sealed and delivered in the presence of us at Cape Corso Castle in Africa, where no stamped paper was to be had. Mungo Herdman, President, Witnesses. John Atkins, Register, Witnesses. In like manner was drawn out and exchanged the indentures of Thomas Howe of Barnstable in the County of Devon. Samuel Fletcher of East Smithfield, London. John Lane of Lombard Street, London. David Littlejohn of Bristol. John King of Shadwell Parish, London. Henry Dennis of Biddeford. Hugh Harris of Corfe Castle, Devonshire. William Taylor of Bristol. Thomas Owen of Bristol. 
John Mitchell of Shadwell Parish, London, Joshua Lee of Liverpool, William Shuren of Wapping Parish, London, Robert Hartley of Liverpool, John Griffin of Blackwall, Middlesex, James Crombie of London, Wapping, James Greenham of Marshfield, Gloucestershire, John Horn of St. James's Parish, London, John Jessop of Wisbech, Cambridgeshire, David Rice of Bristol, none of which I hear are now living, two others, viz. George Wilson and Thomas Outerlaney, were respited from execution, till his majesty's pleasure should be known. The former died abroad, and the latter came home, and received his majesty's pardon. The account of the whole stands thus. Acquitted, 74. Executed, 52. Respited, 2. To servitude, 20. To the marshalsea, 17. Killed in the ranger, 10. Killed in the fortune, 3. Died in the passage to Cape Corso, 15. Died afterwards in the castle, 4. Negroes in both ships, 70. Total, 276 men. I am not ignorant how acceptable the behaviour and dying words of malefactors are to the generality of our countrymen, and therefore shall deliver what occurred worthy of notice in the behaviour of these criminals. The first fix that were called to execution were Magnus, Moody, Simpson, Sutton, Ashplant, and Hardy, all of them old standers and notorious offenders. When they were brought out of the hold on the parade, in order to break off their fetters and fit the halters, none of them, it was observed, appeared the least dejected, unless Sutton, who spoke faint, but it was rather imputed to a flux that had seized him two or three days before than fear. A gentleman who was surgeon of the ship was so charitable at this time to offer himself in the room of an ordinary and represented to them as well as he was able the heinousness of their sin and necessity which lay on them of repentance one particular part of which ought to be acknowledging the justice they had met with they seemed heedless for the present some calling for water to drink and others applying to the soldiers for caps but when this gentleman pressed them for an answer they all exclaimed against the severity of the court, and were so hardened as to curse and wish the same justice might overtake all the members of it, as had been dealt to them. They were poor rogues, they said, and so hanged, while others, no less guilty in another way, escaped. When he endeavoured to compose their minds, exhorting them to die in charity with all the world, and would have diverted them from such vain discourse by asking them their country, age, and the like, some of them answered, what was that to him? They suffered the law, and should give no account but to God. Walking to the gallows, without a tear, in token of sorrow for their past offences, or showing as much concern as a man would express at travelling a bad road, nay, Simpson, at seeing a woman that he knew, he said, he had lain with that bitch three times, and now she was come to see him hanged. And Hardy, when his hands were tied behind him, which happened from their not being acquainted with the way of bringing malefactors to execution, observed that he had seen many a man hanged, but this way of the hands being tied behind them he was a stranger to, and never saw before in his life. I mention these two little instances to show how stupid and thoughtless they were of their end, and that the same abandoned and reprobate temper that had carried them through their rogueries abided with them to the last. Samuel Fletcher, another of the pirates ordered for execution, but reprieved, seemed to have a quicker sense of his condition, for when he saw those he was allotted with gone to execution, he sent a message by the provost marshal to the court to be informed of the meaning of it, and humbly desired to know whether they designed him mercy or not. If they did, he stood infinitely obliged to them, and thought the whole service of his life an incompetent return for so great a favour, but that if he was to suffer, the sooner the better, he said, that he might be out of his pain. There were others of these pirates the reverse of this, and though destitute of ministers or fit persons to represent their sins, and assist them with spiritual advice, were yet always employing their time to good purposes, and behaved with a great deal of seeming devotion and penitence. Among these may be reckoned Scudamore, Williams, Phillips, Stevenson, Jeffreys, Leslie, Harper, Armstrong, Bunce, and others. Scudamore too lately discerned the folly and wickedness of the enterprise that had chiefly brought him under sentence of death, from which, seeing there was no hopes of escaping, he petitioned for two or three days' reprieve which was granted, and, for that time, applied himself incessantly to prayer, 
and, reading the scriptures, seemed to have a deep sense of his sins, of this in particular, and desired at the gallows they would have patience with him to sing the first part of the thirty-first psalm, which he did by himself throughout. Armstrong, having been a deserter from his majesty's service, was executed on board the Weymouth, and the only one that was. There was no body to press him to an acknowledgment of the crime he died for, nor of sorrowing in particular for it, which would have been exemplary and made suitable impressions on seamen, so that his last hour was spent in lamenting and bewailing his sins in general, exhorting the spectators to an honest and good life, in which alone they could find satisfaction. In the end, he desired they would join with him in singing two or three latter verses of the 140th Psalm, and that being concluded, he was, at the firing of a gun, triced up at the foreyard arm. Bunce was a young man, not above twenty-six years old, but made the most pathetical speech of any at the gallows. He first declaimed against the gilded baits of power, liberty, and wealth that had ensnared him among the pirates, his unexperienced years not being able to withstand the temptation, but that the briskness he had shown, which so fatally had procured him favour amongst them, was not so much a fault in principle as the liveliness and vivacity of his nature. He was now extremely afflicted for the injuries he had done to all men, and begged theirs and God's forgiveness, very earnestly exhorting the spectators to remember their Creator in their youth, and guard betimes that their minds took not a wrong bias, concluding with this apt similitude, that he stood there as a beacon upon a rock, the gallows standing on one, to warn erring mariners of danger. End of chapter 9, part 12《Chapter X of the General History of the Pirates》Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer The General History of the Pirates Volume 1 by Charles Johnson Chapter X Captain Anstice and his crew. Thomas Anstis shipped himself at Providence in the year 1718 aboard the Buck Sloop, and was one of six that conspired together to go off a pirating with the vessel. The rest were Howell Davis, Robert's predecessor, killed at the island of Princess, Dennis Topping, killed at the taking of the rich Portuguese ship on the coast of Brazil, Walter Kennedy, hanged at execution dock, and two others, which I forbear to name, because I understand they are, at this day, employed in an honest vocation in the city. What followed concerning Antist's piracies has been included in the two preceding chapters. I shall only observe that the combination of these six men, above mentioned, was the beginning of that company that afterwards proved so formidable under Captain Roberts, for whom Anstis separated the 18th of April, 1721, in the good fortune brigantine, leaving his commodore to pursue his adventures upon the coast of Guinea, whilst he returned to the West Indies upon the like design. About the middle of June, these pirates met with one Captain Marston between Hispaniola and Jamaica, bound on a voyage to New York, from whom they took all the wearing apparel they could find, also his liquors and provisions, and five of his men, but did not touch his cargo. Two or three other vessels were also plundered by them. In this cruise, out of whom they stocked themselves with provisions and men. Among the rest, I think, was the Irwin, Captain Ross, from Cork in Ireland, but this I won't be positive of, because they denied it themselves. This ship had six hundred barrels of beef aboard, besides other provisions, and was taken off Martinico, where Colonel Doyle of Montserrat and his family were passengers. The colonel was very much abused and wounded for endeavoring to save a poor woman that was also a passenger from the insults of that brutish crew, and the pirates prevailing, Twenty-one of them forced the poor creature successively, afterwards broke her back, 
and flung her into the sea. I say, I will not be positive that it was Anstis' crew that acted this unheard of violence and cruelty, though the circumstances of the place, the time, the force of the vessel, and the number of men do all concur, and I can place the villainy nowhere else. But that such a fact was done, there is too much evidence for it to be doubted of. When they thought fit to put an end to this cruise, they went into one of the islands to clean, which they effected without any disturbances, and came out again, and stretching away toward Bermudas, met with a stout ship called the Morning Star, bound from Guinea to Carolina. They made a prize of her, and kept her for their own use. In a day or two, a ship from Barbados bound to New York fell into their hands, and taking out her guns and tackle, mounted the Morning Star with thirty-two pieces of cannon, manned her with a hundred men, and appointed one John Fenn captain. For the brigantine, being of less force, the Morning Star would have fallen to Anstis, as elder officer, yet he was so in love with his own vessel, she being an excellent sailor, that he made it his choice to stay in her, and let Fenn, who was before his gunner, command the great ship. Now they had two good ships well manned, it may be supposed they were in a condition to undertake something bold. But their government was disturbed by malcontents, and a kingdom divided within itself cannot stand. They had such a number of new men amongst them that seemed not so violently inclined for the game that whatever the captain proposed, it was certainly carried against him, so that they came to no fixed resolution for the undertaking any enterprise. Therefore, there was nothing to be done but break up the company, which seemed to be the inclination of the majority. But the manner of doing so concerned their common safety, to which purpose various means were proposed. At length it was concluded to send home a petition to His Majesty, there being no act of indemnity in force, for a pardon, and wait the issue. At the same time, one Jones, boatswain of the good fortune, proposed a place of safe retreat, it being an uninhabited island near Cuba, which he had been used to in the late war, when he went to privateering against the Spaniards. This being approved of, it was unanimously resolved on, and the underwritten petition drawn up and signed by the whole company in the manner of what they call a round robin, that is, the names were writ in a circle, to avoid all appearance of preeminence, and least any person should be marked out by the government as a principal rogue among them. To His Most Sacred Majesty George, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc. The humble petition of the company now belonging to the ship Morning Star and Brigantine Good Fortune lying under the ignominious name and denomination of pirates, humbly showeth that we, your majesty's most loyal subjects, have at sundry times been taken by Bartholomew Roberts, the then captain of the above said vessels and company, together with another ship, in which we left him, and have been forced by him and his wicked accomplices to enter into and serve in the said company as pirates, much contrary to our wills and inclinations. And we, your loyal subjects, utterly abhorring and detesting that impious way of living, did, with unanimous consent and contrary to the knowledge of the said Roberts or his accomplices, on or about the 18th day of April, 1721, leave and ran away with the aforesaid ship Morning Star. And brigantine good fortune, with no other intent and meaning than the hopes of obtaining your majesty's most gracious pardon, and that we, your majesty's most loyal subjects, may with more safety return to our native country and serve the nation unto which we belong in our respective capacities, without fear of being prosecuted by the injured, whose estates have suffered by the said Roberts and his accomplices during our forcible detainment by the said company." We most humbly implore Your Majesty's most royal assent to this our humble petition. And your petitioners shall ever pray. 
The petition was sent home by a merchant ship bound to England. From Jamaica, who promised to speak with the petitioners in their return, about twenty leagues to the windward of that island, and let them know what success their petition met with. When this was done, the pirates retires to the island before proposed with the ship and brigantine. The island, which I have no name for, lies off the southwest end of Cuba, uninhabited and little frequented. On the east end is a lagoon, so narrow that a ship can but just go in, though there is some fifteen to twenty-two foot water, for almost a league up. On both sides of the lagoon grows red mangrove trees, very thick, that the entrance of it, as well as the vessels lying there, is hardly to be seen. In the middle of the island are here and there a small thick wood of tall pines and other trees scattered about in different places. Here they stayed about nine months, but not having provisions for above two, they were forced to take what the island offered, which was fish of several sorts, particularly turtle, which latter was the chiefest food they lived on, and was found in great plenty on the coasts of the island. Whether there might be any wild hogs, beef, or other cattle, common to several islands of the West Indies, or that the pirates were too idle to hunt them, or whether they preferred other provisions to that sort of diet, I know not. But I was informed by them that for the whole time they eat not a bit of any kind of flesh meat nor bread. The latter was supplied by rice, of which they had a great quantity aboard. This was boiled and squeezed dry and so eat with the turtle. There are three or four sorts of these creatures in the West Indies, the largest of which will weigh 150 or 200 pounds weight, or more. But those that were found upon this island were of the smallest kind, weighing 10 or 12 pounds each, with a fine natural wrought shell, and beautifully clouded. The meat sweet and tender, some part of it eating like chicken, and some like veal, etc., so that it was no extraordinary hardship for them to live upon this provision alone, since it affords varieties of meats to the taste of itself. The manner of catching this fish is very particular. You must understand that in the months of May, June, and July, they lay their eggs in order to hatch their young, and this three times in a season, which is always in the sand of the seashore, each laying eighty or ninety eggs at a time. The male accompanies the female, and come ashore in the night only, when they must be watched without making any noise, or having a light. As soon as they land, the men that watch for them, turn them on their backs, and haul them above high water mark, and leave them till next morning, where they are sure to find them, for they can't turn again, nor move from the place. It is to be observed that beside their lying time, they come ashore to feed, but then, what's very remarkable in these creatures, they always resort to a different place to breed, leaving their usual haunts for two or three months, and tis thought they eat nothing in all that season. They pass their time here in dancing and other diversions, agreeable to these sorts of folks, and among the rest they appointed a mock court of judicature to try one another for piracy." and he that was criminal one day was made judge another. I had an account given me of one of these merry trials, and as it appeared diverting, I shall give the readers a short account of it. The court and criminals being both appointed, and also counsel to plead, the judge got up in a tree, and had a dirty tarpaulin hung over his shoulders. This was done by way of robe, with a thrun cap on his head, and a large pair of spectacles upon his nose. Thus equipped, he settled himself in his place, and abundance of officers attending him below, with crows, handspikes, etc., instead of wands, tipstaves, and such like. The criminals were brought out, making a thousand four faces, and one who acted as attorney general opened the charge against them. Their speeches were very laconic, and their whole proceeding concise. We shall give it by way of dialogue. Attorney General, as it please your lordship and your gentlemen of the jury, 
Here is a fellow before you that is a sad dog, a sad, sad dog, and I humbly hope your lordships will order him to be hanged out of the way immediately. He has committed piracy upon the high seas, and we shall prove, and it please your lordship, that this fellow, this sad dog before you, has escaped a thousand storms. Nay, he has got safe ashore when the ship has been cast away, which was a certain sign that he was not born to be drowned. Yet, not having the fear of hanging before his eyes, he went on robbing and ravishing man, woman, and child, plundering the ship's cargoes fore and aft, burning and sinking ship, bark, and boat, as if the devil had been in him. But this is not all, my lord. He has committed worse villainies than all these, for we shall prove that he has been guilty of drinking small beer. And your lordships know that there never was a sober fellow but what was a rogue. My lord, I should have spoke much finer than I do now, but that, as your lordship knows, our rum is all out, and how should a man speak good law that has not drank a dram? However, I hope your lordship will order the fellow to be hanged. Judge, here come he, Sarah, you lousy, pitiful, ill-looked dog. What have you to say? Why should you not be tucked up immediately and set a sun-drying like a scarecrow? Are you guilty or not guilty? Prisoner, not guilty, and it please your worship. Judge, not guilty? Say so again, Sarah, and I'll have you hanged without any trial. Prisoner, and it please your worship's honor, my lord, I am as honest a poor fellow as ever went between stem and stern of a ship, and can hand, reef, steer, and clap two ends of a rope together, as well as he that ever crossed salt water. But I was taken by one George Bradley, the name of him who sat as judge, a notorious pirate, a sad rogue as ever was unhanged, and he forced me, and it please your honor, Judge, answer me, Sarah. How will you be tried? Prisoner, by G and my country. Judge, the devil you will. Why then, gentlemen of the jury, I think we have nothing to do but proceed to judgment. Attorney General, right, my lord, for if the fellow should be suffered to speak, he may clear himself, and that's an affront to the court. Prisoner, pray, my lord, I hope you lordships will consider. Judge, consider? How dare you talk of considering? Sirrah, Sirrah, I never considered in all my life. I'll make it treason to consider. Prisoner, but I hope your lordship will hear some reason. Judge, do you hear now how the scoundrel prates? What have we to do with reason? I'll have you know, rascal, we don't sit here to hear reason. We go according to law. Is our dinner ready? Attorney General. Yes, my lord. Judge. Then here, you rascal at the bar. Hear me, Sarah. Hear me. You must suffer. For three reasons. First, because it is not fit I should sit here as judge and nobody be hanged. Secondly, you must be hanged because you have a damned hanging look. And thirdly, you must be hanged because I am hungry. For you know, Sarah, that tis a custom that whenever the judge's dinner is ready before the trial is over, the prisoner is to be hanged, of course. There's law for you, ye dog, so take him away, jailer. This is the trial, just as it was related to me. The design of my setting it down is only to show how these fellows can jest upon things, the fear and dread of which should make them tremble. The beginning of August, 1722, the pirates made ready the brigantine, and came out to sea, and beating up to windward, lay in the track for their correspondent in her voyage to Jamaica, and spoke with her. But finding nothing was done in England in their favor, as t'was expected, they returned to their consorts at the island with the ill news, and found themselves under a necessity, as they fancied, to continue the abominable course of life they had lately practiced. In order, thereto, they sailed with the ship and brigantine to the southward, and the next night, by intolerable neglect, 
they run the Morning Star upon the Grand Caymans and wrecked her. The brigantine, seeing the fate of her consort, hauled off in time, and so weathered the island. The next day Captain Anstis put in and found that all, or the greatest part of the crew, were safe ashore, whereupon she came to an anchor in order to fetch them off, and having brought Fenn the captain, Phillips the carpenter, and a few others aboard, two men of war came down upon them, viz. the Hector and Adventure, so that the brigantine had but just time to cut their cable and get to sea, with one of the men of war after her, keeping within gunshot for several hours. Anstis and his crew were now under the greatest consternation imaginable, finding the gale freshen and the man of war gaining ground upon them, so that in all probability they must have been prisoners in two hours more. But it pleased God to give them a little longer time. The wind dying away, the pirates got out their oars and rowed for their lives, and thereby got clear of their enemy. The Hector landed her men upon the island and took forty of the Morning Star's crew without any resistance made by them, but on the contrary, alleging that they were forced men and that they were glad of this opportunity to escape from the pirates. The rest hid themselves in the woods and could not be found. George Bradley, the master, and three more surrendered afterwards to a Bermuda's sloop and were carried to that island. The brigantine, after her escape, sailed to a small island near the Bay of Honduras to clean and refit, and in her way thither took a Rhode Island sloop, Captain Durfee, commander, and two or three other vessels, which they destroyed, but brought all hands aboard their own. While she was cleaning, a scheme was concerted between Captain Durfee, some other prisoners, and two or three of the pirates, for to seize some of the chiefs and carry off the brigantine. But the same being discovered before she was fit for sailing, their design was prevented. However, Captain Durfee and four or five more got ashore with some arms and ammunition, and when the pirate's canoe came in for water, he seized the boat with the men, upon which Anstis ordered another boat to be manned with thirty hands and sent ashore, which was accordingly done. But Captain Durfee and the company he had by that time got together gave them such a warm reception that they were contented to betake themselves to their vessel again. About the beginning of December 1722, Anstis left this place and returned to the islands, designing to accumulate all the power and strength he could, since there was no looking back. He took in the crews a good ship, commanded by Captain Smith, which he mounted with twenty-four guns, and Fenn, a one-handed man who commanded the Morning Star when she was lost, went aboard to command her. They cruised together and took a vessel or two, and then went to the Bahama Islands, where they met with what they wanted, viz. a sloop loaded with provisions from Dublin, called the Antelope. It was now time to think of a place to fit up and clean their frigate lately taken, and put her in a condition to do business. Accordingly, they pitched upon the island of Tobago, where they arrived the beginning of April 1723, with the Antelope sloop and her cargo. They fell to work immediately, got the guns, stores, and everything else out upon the island, and put the ship upon the heel. And just then, as ill luck would have it, came in the Winchelsea, man of war, by way of visit, which put the marooners in such a surprise that they set fire to the ship and sloop, and fled ashore to the woods. Ansys, in the brigantine, escaped by having a light pair of heels, but it put his company into such a disorder that their government could never be set to rights again. For some of the newcomers, and those who had been tired with the trade, put an end to the reign by shooting Thomas Ansys in his hammock, and afterwards the quartermaster, and two or three others. The rest submitting, they put into irons and surrendered them up, and the vessel, at Caraco, a Dutch settlement, where they were tried and hanged, and those concerned in delivering up the vessel acquitted. But to return to Captain Fenn. He was taken straggling with his gunner and three more a day or two after their misfortune, 
by the man of war's men, and carried to Antigua, where they were all executed, and Fenn hanged in chains. Those who remained stayed some time in the island, keeping up and down in the woods, with a hand to look out. At length Providence so ordered it that a small sloop came into the harbor, which they all got aboard of, except two or three negroes, and those they left behind. They did not think fit to pursue any further adventures, and therefore unanimously resolved to steer for England, which they accordingly did, and in October last came into Bristol Channel, sunk the sloop, and getting ashore in the boat, dispersed themselves to their abodes. End of chapter 10 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Real Medina, Texas Chapter 11 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1 by Charles Johnson Chapter 11 Of Captain Worley and His Crew His reign was but short, but his beginning somewhat particular, setting out in a small open boat with eight others from New York. This was as resolute a crew as ever went upon this account. They took with them a few biscuits and a dried tongue or two, a little cag of water, half a dozen old muskets and ammunition accordingly. Thus provided, they left New York the latter end of September 1718, but it cannot be supposed that such a man of war as this could undertake any considerable voyage or attempt any extraordinary enterprise. So they stood down the coast till they came to Delaware River, which is about a hundred and fifty miles distant, and not meeting with anything in their way, they turned up the same river as high as Newcastle, near which place they fell upon a shallop belonging to George Grant, who was bringing household goods, plate, etc., from Upper Quenemy to Philadelphia. They made prize of the most valuable part of them, and let the shallop go. This fact could not come under the article of piracy, it not being committed super altum mare, upon the high sea therefore was a simple robbery only. But they did not stand for a point of law in the case, but, easing the shallop man of his lading, the bold adventurers went down the river again. The shallop came straight to Philadelphia, and brought the ill news thither, which so alarmed the government as if war had been declared against them. Expresses were sent to New York and other places, and several vessels fitted out against this powerful rover, but to no manner of purpose, for, after several days' cruise, they all returned, without so much as hearing what became of the robbers. Worley and his crew, in going down the river, met with a sloop of Philadelphia, belonging to a mulatto, whom they called Black Robin. They quitted their boat for this sloop, taking one of Black Robin's men along with them, as they had also done from George Grant, besides two negroes, which increased the company one-third. A day or two after, they took another sloop belonging to Hull, homeward bound, which was somewhat fitter for their purpose. They found aboard her provisions and necessaries, which they stood in need of, and enabled them to prosecute their design in a manner more suitable to their wishes. Upon the success of these rovers, the governor issued out a proclamation for the apprehending and taking all pirates who had refused or neglected to surrender themselves by the time limited in His Majesty's proclamation of pardon and thereupon ordered his majesty's ship phoenix of twenty guns which lay at sandy hook to sea to cruise upon this pirate and secure the trade to that and the adjoining colonies in all probability the taking this sloop saved their bacons for this time though they fell into the trap presently afterwards for they finding themselves in tolerable good condition having a vessel newly cleaned with provisions etc they stood off to sea and so missed the phoenix who expected them to be still on the coast about six weeks afterwards they returned, having taken both a sloop and a brigantine among the Bahama Islands. The former they sunk, and the other they let go. The sloop belonged to New York, and they thought the sinking of her good policy to prevent her returning to tell tales at home. Worley had by this time increased his company to about five and twenty men, had six guns mounted, and small arms as many as were necessary for them, and seemed to be in a good thriving sort of a way. He made a black ensign, with a white death's head in the middle of it, and other colours suitable to it. 
they all signed articles and bound themselves under a solemn oath to take no quarters but to stand by one another to the last man which was rashly fulfilled a little afterwards for going into an inlet in north carolina to clean the governor received information of it and sitted out two sloops one of eight guns and the other with six and about seventy men between them worley had cleaned his sloop and sailed before the carolina sloops reached the place and steered to the northward but the sloops just mentioned pursuing the same course came in sight of worley as he was cruising off the capes of virginia and being in the offing he stood in as soon as he saw the sloops intending thereby to have cut them off from james river for he verily believed they had been bound thither not imagining in the least they were in pursuit of him the two sloops standing towards the capes at the same time and worley hoisting of his black flag the inhabitants of jamestown were in the utmost consternation thinking that all three had been pirates and that their design had been upon them so that all the ships and vessels that were in the road or in the rivers up the bay had orders immediately to hail into the shore for their security or else to prepare for their defence if they thought themselves in a condition to fight soon after two boats which were sent out to get intelligence came crowding in and brought an account that one of the pirates was in the bay being a small sloop of six guns the governor expecting the rest would have followed and altogether make some attempt to land for the sake of plunder beat to arms and collected all the force that could be got together to oppose them he ordered all the guns out of the ships to make a platform and in short put the whole colony in a warlike posture but was very much surprised at last to see all the supposed pirates fighting with one another the truth of the matter is worley gained the bay thinking to make sure of his two prizes by keeping them from coming in but by the hoisting of the king's colours and firing a gun he quickly was sensible of his mistake and too soon perceived that the tables were turned upon him that instead of keeping them out he found himself by a superior force kept in when the pirates saw how things went they resolutely prepared themselves for a desperate defence and though three to one odds worley and his crew determined to fight to the last gasp and receive no quarters agreeably to what they had before sworn so that they must either die or conquer upon the spot the carolina men gave the pirate a broadside and then boarded him one sloop getting upon his quarter and the other on his bow worley and the crew drew up upon the deck and fought very obstinately hand to hand so that in a few minutes abundance of men lay weltering in their gore the pirates proved as good as their words not a man of them cried out for quarter nor would accept of such when offered but were all killed except the captain and another man and those very much wounded whom they reserved for the gallows they were brought ashore in irons and the next day which was the seventeenth of february seventeen eighteen to nineteen they were both hanged up for fear they should die and evade the punishment as was thought due to their crimes End of chapter eleven recording by Kate Mackenzie Chapter twelve part one of the General History of the Pirates Volume one This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit Librivox org. Recording by Rain the General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 12, Part 1 Of Captain George Lowther and His Crew George Lowther sailed out of the River of Thames in one of the Royal African Company's ships, called the Gambia Castle, of sixteen guns and thirty men, Charles Russell Commander, of which ship the said Lowther was second mate. Aboard of the same ship was a certain number of soldiers, commanded by one John Massey, who were to be carried to one of the company's settlements on the river of Gambia, to garrison a fort which was some time ago taken and destroyed by Captain Davis the pirate. In May 1721 the Gambia Castle came safe to her port in Africa, and landed Captain Massey and his men on James's Island, where he was to command under the governor, Colonel Whitney, who arrived there at the same time in another ship and here, by a fatal misunderstanding between the military folks and the trading people, the fort and garrison not only came to be lost again to the company, 
but a fine galley, well provided and worth ten thousand pounds, turned against her masters. The names of governor and captain sounded great, but when the gentlemen found that the power that generally goes along with those titles was overswayed and borne down by the merchants and factors, mechanic fellows as they thought them, they grew very impatient and dissatisfied, especially Massey, who was very loud in his complaints against them, particularly at the small allowance of provisions to him and his men. For the garrison and governor, too, were victualled by the merchants, which was no small grievance and mortification to them. And as the want of eating was the only thing that made the great Sancho quit his government, so did it here rend and tear theirs to pieces. For Massey told them that he did not come there to be a guinea slave, and that he had promised his men good treatment and provisions fitting for soldiers, that as he had the care of so many of his majesty's subjects, if they would not provide for them in a handsome manner, he should take suitable measures for the preservation of so many of his countrymen and companions. The governor at this time was very ill of a fever, and for the better accommodation in his sickness, was carried aboard the ship Gambia Castle, where he continued for about three weeks, and therefore could have little to say in this dispute though he resolved not to stay in a place where there was so little occasion for him and where his power was so confined. The merchants had certainly orders from the company to issue the provisions out to the garrison, and the same is done along the whole coast. But whether they had cut them short of the allowance that was appointed them, I can't say. But if they did, then is the loss of the ship and garrison owing principally to their ill conduct. However, an accident that happened on board the ship did not a little contribute to this misfortune, which was a pique that the captain of her took against his second mate, George Lowther, the man who is the subject of this short history, and who, losing his favor, found means to ingratiate himself into the good liking of the common sailors, insomuch that when Captain Russell ordered him to be punished, the men took up handspikes and threatened to knock that man down that offered to lay hold of the mate. This served but to widen the differences between him and the captain, and more firmly attached Lowther to the ship's company, the greatest part of which he found ripe for any mischief in the world. Captain Massey was no whit the better reconciled to the place by a longer continuance, nor to the usage he met with there, and having often opportunities of conversing with Lowther, with whom he had contracted an intimacy in the voyage, they aggravated one another's grievances to such a height that they resolved upon measures to curb the power that controlled them, and to provide for themselves after another manner. When the governor recovered of his fever, he went ashore to the island, but took no notice of Massey's behavior, though it was such as might give suspicion of what he designed, and Lowther and the common sailors, who were in the secret of affairs, grew insolent and bold, even refusing to obey when commanded to their duty by Captain Russell and the chief mate. The captain, seeing how things were carried, goes ashore early one morning to the governor and factory in order to hold a council which Lowther apprehending was in order to prevent his design, so sent a letter in the same boat to Massey, intimating it to him, and that he should repair on board, for it was high time to put their project in execution. As soon as Massey received this letter, he went to the soldiers at the barracks, and said to them and others, You that have a mind to go to England, now is your time. And they generally consenting, Massey went to the storeroom, burst open the door, set two sentinels upon it, and ordered that nobody should come near it. Then he went to the governor's apartment and took his bed, baggage, plate, and furniture, in expectation that the governor himself, as he had promised Massey, would have gone on board, which he afterwards refused, by reason, as he said, he believed they were going a-pirating, which at first, whatever Lowther designed, Massey certainly proposed only the going to England. When this was done, he sent the boat off to the chief mate with this message, that he should get the guns ready, for that the king of Baro, a negro kingdom near the royal African settlement, would come aboard to dinner. But Lowther, understanding best the meaning of those orders, he confined the chief mate, shotted the guns, and put the ship in a condition for sailing. In the afternoon, Massey came on board with the governor's son, having sent off all the provisions of the island, and eleven pipes of wine, leaving only two half-pipes behind in the storehouse, and dismounted all the guns of the fort. In the afternoon they weighed one anchor, but fearing to be too late to get out of the river, they slipped the other and so fell down, in doing of which they run the ship aground. Massey shewed himself a soldier upon this accident, for as soon as the misfortune happened, he left the ship with about sixteen hands, 
and rows directly to the fort, rebounds the guns, and keeps the garrison there all the night while the ship was ashore, and obliged some of the factory to assist in getting her clear. In the meanwhile, Russell came off, but not being suffered to come on board, he called to Lowther, and offered him and the company whatever terms they would be pleased to accept of, upon condition of surrendering up the ship, which had no effect upon any of them. In the morning they got her afloat, and Massey and his men came aboard, after having nailed up and dismounted all the cannon of the fort. They put the governor's son and two or three others ashore, who were not willing to go without the governor, and sailed out of the river, having exchanged several shot with the Martha, Otter, etc. that lay there, without doing execution on either side. When the ship came out to sea, Lowther called up all the company, and told them, it was the greatest folly imaginable to think of returning to England, for what they had already done could not be justified upon any pretense whatsoever, but would be looked upon in the eye of the law a capital offense, and that none of them were in a condition to withstand the attacks of such powerful adversaries as they would meet with at home. For his part, he was determined not to run such a hazard, and therefore, if his proposal was not agreed to, he desired to be set ashore in some place of safety. That they had a good ship under them, a parcel of brave fellows in her, that it was not their business to starve or be made slaves, and therefore, if they were all of his mind, they should seek their fortunes upon the seas, as other adventurers had done before them. They one and all came into the measures, knocked down the cabins, made the ship flush fore and aft, prepared black colors, new-named her the Delivery, having about fifty hands and sixteen guns, and the following short articles were drawn up, signed, and sworn to upon the Bible. The Articles of Captain George Lowther and His Company 1. The captain is to have two full shares. The master is to have one share and a half. The doctor, mate, gutter, and boatswain, one share and a quarter. 2. He that shall be found guilty of taking up any unlawful weapon on board the privateer, or any prize by us taken, so as to strike or abuse one another in any regard, shall suffer what punishment the captain and majority of the company shall think fit. 3. He that shall be found guilty of cowardice in the time of engagement shall suffer what punishment the captain and majority shall think fit. 4. If any gold, jewels, silver, etc. be found on board of any prize or prizes to the value of a piece of eight, and the finder do not deliver it to the quartermaster in the space of twenty-four hours, he shall suffer what punishment the captain and majority shall think fit. 5. He that is found guilty of gaming or defrauding another to the value of a shilling shall suffer what punishment the captain and majority of the company shall think fit. 6. He that shall have the misfortune to lose a limb in time of engagement shall have the sum of 150 pounds sterling and remain with the company as long as he shall think fit. 7. Good quarters to be given when called for. 8. He that sees a sail first shall have the best pistol or small arm on board her. It was the 13th of June that Lowther left the settlement, and on the 20th, being then within twenty leagues of Barbados, he came upon a brigantine belonging to Boston, called the Charles, James Douglas Master, which they plundered in a piratical manner and let the vessel go. But lest she should meet with any of the station ships, and so give information of the robbery in Terrorum, to prevent a pursuit, Lowther contrived a sort of a certificate, which he directed the master to shew to their consort, if they should meet with her, and upon sight of it the brigantine would pass unmolested. This consort, he pretended, was a forty-gun ship, and cruising thereabouts. After this the delivery proceeded to Hispaniola, where, near the west end of the island, she met with a French sloop, loaden with wine and brandy. Aboard of this vessel went Captain Massey as a merchant, and asked the price of one thing, and then another, bidding money for the greatest part of the cargo. But after he had trifled a while, he whispered a secret in the French man's ear, peace, that they must have it all without money. Monsieur presently understood his meaning, and unwillingly agreed to the bargain. They took out of her thirty casks of brandy, five hogsheads of wine, several pieces of chintzes, and other valuable goods, and about seventy pounds English in money, of which Lowther generously returned five pounds back to the French master for his civilities. But as all constitutions grow old, and thereby shake and totter, so did our commonwealth in about a month of its age feel commotions and intestine disturbances by the divisions of its members, 
which had near hand terminated in its destruction. These civil discords were owing to the following occasion. Captain Massey had been a soldier almost from his infancy, but was but very indifferently acquainted with maritime affairs, and having an enterprising soul, nothing would satisfy him but he must be doing business his own way. Therefore he required Lowther to let him have thirty hands to land with, and he would attack the French settlements, and bring aboard the devil and all of plunder. Lowther did all that he could do, and said all that he could say, to dissuade Massey from so rash and dangerous an attempt, pointing out to him the hazard the company would run, and the consequences to them all, if he should not succeed, and the little likelihood there was to expect success from the undertaking. But t'was all one for that, Massey would go and attack the French settlements, for anything Lowther could say against it, so that he was obliged to propose the matter to the company, among whom Massey found a few fellows as resolute as himself. However, a great majority being against it, the affair was overruled in opposition to Captain Massey, notwithstanding which Massey grew fractious, quarreled with Lowther, and the men divided into parties, some siding with the land pirate, and some with the sea rover, and were all ready to fall together by the ears when the man at the masthead cried out, A sail! A sail! Then they gave over the dispute, set all their sails, and steered after the chase. In a few hours they came up with her, she being a small ship from Jamaica, bound to England. They took what they thought fit out of her, and a hand or two, and then Lowther was for sinking the ship, with several passengers that were in her, for what reason I know not. But Massey, so that he interposed, prevented their cruel fate, and the ship safely arrived afterwards in England. The next day they took a small sloop, an interloping trader which they detained with her cargo. All this while Massey was uneasy, and declared his resolution to leave them, and Lowther, finding him a very troublesome man to deal with, consented that he should take the sloop last made prize of, with what hands had a mind to go with him, and shift for himself. Whereupon Massey, with about ten more malcontents, goes aboard the sloop, and comes away in her directly for Jamaica. Notwithstanding what had passed, Captain Massey puts a bold face upon the matter, and goes to Sir Nicholas Laws, the governor, informs him of his leaving Lowther the pirate, owns that he had assisted in going off with the ship at the river Gambia, but said twas to save so many of his majesty's subjects from perishing, and that his design was to return to England. But Lowther, conspiring with the greater part of the company, went a-pirating with the ship, and that he had taken this opportunity to leave him, and surrender himself and vessel to his excellency. Massey was very well received by the governor, and had his liberty given him, with a promise of his favor and so forth, and, at his own request, he was sent on board the happy sloop, Captain Laws, to cruise off Hispaniola for Lowther. But not being so fortunate as to meet with him, Captain Massey returned back to Jamaica in the sloop, and getting a certificate and a supply of money from the governor, he came home passenger to England. When Massey came to town, he writes a long letter to the deputy governor and directors of the African Company, wherein he imprudently relates the whole transactions of his voyage, the going off with the ship, and the acts of piracy he had committed with Lowther, but excuses it as rashness and inadvertency in himself, occasioned by his being ill-used, contrary to the promises that had been made him, and the expectations he had entertained, but owned that he deserved to die for what he had done, yet if they had generosity enough to forgive him, as he was still capable to do them service as a soldier, so he should be very ready to do it. But if they resolved to prosecute him, he begged only this favor, that he might not be hanged like a dog, but to die like a soldier, as he had been bred from his childhood, that is, that he might be shot. This was the substance of the letter, which, however, did not produce so favorable an answer as he hoped for, word being brought back to him that he should be fairly hanged. Whereupon Massey resolved not to be out of the way, when he found what important occasion there was likely to be for him, but takes a lodging in Aldersgate Street. The next day went to the Lord Chief Justice's chambers, and inquired if my lord had granted the warrant against Captain John Massey for piracy. But being told by the clerks that they knew of no such thing, he informed them he was the man, that my lord would soon be applied to for that purpose, and the officer might come to him at such a place where he lodged. They took the directions in writing, and in a few days, a warrant being issued, the tip staff went directly by his own information and apprehended him, without any other trouble than walking to his lodging. There was then no person in town to charge him with any fact upon which he could be committed. 
nor could the letter be proved to be of his handwriting, so that they had been obliged to let him go again if he had not helped his accusers out at pinch. The magistrate was reduced to the putting of his question to him, Did you write this letter? He answered, He did. And not only that, but confessed all the contents of it, upon which he was committed to Newgate, but was afterwards admitted to a hundred pounds bail, or thereabouts. On the 5th of July, 1723, he was brought to his trial at a court of admiralty held at the Old Bailey, when Captain Russell, Governor Whitney's son, and others appeared as evidences, by whom the indictment was plainly proved against him, which, if it had not been done, the captain was of such an heroic spirit that he would have denied nothing. For instead of making a defense, he only entertained the court with a long narrative of his expedition, from the first setting out to his return to England, mentioning two acts of piracy committed by him which he was not charged with, often challenging the evidences to contradict him if in anything he related the least syllable of an untruth, and instead of denying the crime set forth in the indictment, he charged himself with various circumstances which fixed the facts more home upon him. Upon the whole, the captain was found guilty, received sentence of death, and was executed three weeks after at execution dock. End of chapter 12, part 1「We return now to Lowther, whom we left cruising off Hispaniola, from whence he plied to windward, and near Puerto Rico chased two sail and spoke with them, they proving to be a small Bristol ship, commanded by Captain Smith, and a Spanish pirate, who had made prize of the said ship. Lowther examined into the Spaniard's authority for taking an English vessel, and threatened to put every man of them to death for so doing, so that the Spaniards fancied themselves to be in a very pitiful condition, till matters cleared up, and they found their masters as great rogues as themselves, from whom some mercy might be expected in regard to the near relation they stood with them as to their profession. In short, Lowther first rifled and then burnt both ships, sending the Spaniards away in their launch, and turning all the English sailors into pirates. After a few days' cruise, Lowther took a small sloop belonging to St. Christopher's, which they manned and carried along with them to a small island, where they cleaned and stayed some time to take their diversions, which consisted in unheard-of debaucheries, with drinking, swearing, and rioting, in which there seemed to be a kind of emulation among them, resembling rather devils than men, striving who should outdo one another in new invented oaths and execrations. They all got aboard about Christmas, observing neither times nor seasons for perpetrating their villainous actions, and sailed towards the Bay of Honduras, but stopping at the Grand Caymans for water, they met with a small vessel with thirteen hands, in the same honorable employment with themselves. The captain of this gang was one Edward Lowe, whom we shall particularly discourse of in a chapter by itself. Lowther received them as friends, and treated them with all imaginable respect, inviting them, as they were few in number, and in no condition to pursue the account, as they called it, to join their strength together, which on the consideration aforesaid was accepted of, Lowther still continuing commander, and Low was made lieutenant. The vessel the new pirates came out of, they sunk, and the Confederates proceed on the voyage as Lowther before intended. The 10th of January the pirates came into the bay, and fell upon a ship of two hundred ton, called the Greyhound, Benjamin Edwards' commander, belonging to Boston. Lowther hoisted his piratical colors, and fired a gun for the Greyhound to bring to, which she refusing, the happy delivery, the name of the pirate, edged down, and gave her a broadside, which was returned by Captain Edwards very bravely, and the engagement held for an hour. But Captain Edwards, finding the pirate too strong for him, and fearing the consequence of too obstinate a resistance against those lawless fellows, ordered his ensign to be struck. The pirate's boat came aboard, and not only rifled the ship, but whipped, beat, and cut the men in a cruel manner, turned them aboard their own ship, and then set fire to theirs. In cruising about the bay, 
they met and took several other vessels without any resistance, viz. two brigantines of Boston and New England, one of which they burnt and sunk the other, a sloop belonging to Connecticut, Captain Ayres, which they also burnt, a sloop of Jamaica, Captain Hamilton, they took for their own use, a sloop of Virginia they unladed, and was so generous as to give her back to the master that owned her. They took a sloop of one hundred ton, belonging to Rhode Island, which they were pleased to keep, and mount with eight carriage and ten swivel guns. With this little fleet, viz. Admiral Lowther and the Happy Delivery, Captain Lowe in the Rhode Island sloop, Captain Harris, who was second mate in the Greyhound when taken, in Hamilton's sloop, and the little sloop formerly mentioned serving as a tender, I say with this fleet the pirates left the bay, and came to Port Mayo in the Gulf of Matik, and there made preparations to careen. They carried ashore all their sails, and made tents by the waterside, wherein they laid their plunder, stores, etc., and fell to work. And at the time that the ships were up on the heel, and the good folks employed in heaving down, scrubbing, tallowing, and so forth, of a sudden came down a considerable body of the natives, and attacked the pirates unprepared. As they were in no condition to defend themselves, they fled to their sloops, leaving them masters of the field and the spoil thereof, which was of great value, and set fire to the happy delivery, their capital ship. Lowther made the best provision he could in the largest sloop, which he called the Ranger, having ten guns and eight swivels, and she sailing best, the company went all aboard of her and left the other at sea. Provisions was now very short, which, with the late loss, put them in a confounded ill humor, insomuch that they were every now and then going together by the ears, laying the blame of their ill conduct sometimes upon one, then upon another. The beginning of May, 1722, they got to the West Indies, and near the island of Desieda took a brigantine, one pain master, that afforded them what they stood in need of, which put them in better temper, and business seemed to go on well again. After they had pretty well plundered the brigantine, they sent her to the bottom. They went into the island and watered, and then stood to the northward, intending to visit the main coast of America. In the latitude of thirty-eight they took a brigantine called the Rebecca of Boston, Captain Smith, bound thither from St. Christopher's. At the taking of this vessel the crews divided, for lo, whom Lowther joined at the Grand Caymans, proving always a very unruly member of the Commonwealth, always aspiring and never satisfied with the proceedings of the commander, he thought it the safest way to get rid of him, upon any terms, and according to the vote of the company, they parted the bare skin between them. Lo, with forty-four hands, went aboard the brigantine, and Lowther, with the same number, stayed in the sloop, and separated that very night, being the twenty-eighth of May, 1722. Lowther, proceeding on his way to the main coast, took three or four fishing vessels off New York, which was no great booty to the captors. The third of June they met with a small New England ship, bound home from Barbados, which stood in attack a small time, but finding it to no purpose, yielded herself a prey to the booters. The pirates took out of her fourteen hogsheads of rum, six barrels of sugar, a large box of English goods, several casks of loaf sugar, a considerable quantity of pepper, six negroes, besides a sum of money and plate, and then let her go on her voyage. The next adventure was not so fortunate for them, for coming pretty near the coast of South Carolina, they met with a ship just come out on her voyage to England. Lowther gave her a gun and hoisted his piratical colors. But this ship, which was called the Amy, happening to have a brave, gallant man to command her, who was not any ways daunted with that terrible ensign, the black flag, he, instead of striking immediately as was expected, let fly a broadside at the pirate. Lowther, not at all pleased with the compliment, though he put up with it for the present, was for taking leave. But the Amy, getting the pirate between her and the shore, stood after him to clap him aboard, to prevent which, Lowther run the sloop aground and landed all the men with their arms. Captain Guatkins, the captain of the Amy, was obliged to stand off, for fear of running his own ship ashore, but at the same time thought fit for the public good to destroy the enemy, and thereupon went into the boat and rowed towards the sloop in order to set her on fire. But before he reached the vessel, a fatal shot from Lowther's company ashore put an end to their design and Captain Guatkins' life. After this unfortunate blow... The mate returned aboard with the boat, and not being inclined to pursue them any further, took charge of the ship. Lowther got off the sloop after the departure of the Amy, and brought all his men aboard again, but was in a poor shattered condition, having suffered much in the engagement, 
and had a great many men killed and wounded. He made shift to get into an inlet somewhere in North Carolina, where he stayed a long while before he was able to put to sea again. He and his crew laid up all winter and shifted as well as they could among the woods, divided themselves into small parties, and hunted generally in the daytimes, killing of black cattle, hogs, etc., for their subsistence, and in the night retired to their tents and huts, which they made for lodging, and sometimes when the weather grew very cold they would stay aboard of their sloop. In the spring of the year 1723 they made shift to get to sea and steered their course for Newfoundland, and upon the banks took a schooner called the Swift, John Hood Master. They found a good quantity of provisions aboard her, which they very much wanted at that time, and after taking three of their hands and plundering her of what they thought fit, they let her depart. They took several other vessels upon the banks and in the harbor, but none of any great account, and then steering for a warmer climate, in August arrived at the West Indies. In their passage thither they met with a brigantine called the John and Elizabeth, Richard Stanny, master, bound for Boston, which they plundered, took two of her men, and discharged her. Lowther cruised a pretty while among the islands without any extraordinary success, and was reduced to a very small allowance of provisions, till they had the luck to fall in with a Martinico man, which proved a seasonable relief to them, and after that a guinea man had the ill fortune to become a prey to the rovers. She was called the Princess, Captain Wickstead Commander. It was now thought necessary to look out for a place to clean their sloop in, and prepare for new adventures. Accordingly, the island of Blanco was pitched upon for that purpose, which lies in the latitude of 11 degrees 50 minutes north, about 30 leagues from the main of the Spanish America, between the islands of Margarita and Rocas, and not far from Tortuga. It is a low, even island, but healthy and dry, uninhabited, and about two leagues in circumference, with plenty of lignum vitae trees thereon, growing in spots with shrubby bushes of other wood about them. There are, besides turtle, great numbers of guanos, which is an amphibious creature, like a lizard, but much larger, the body of it being as big as a man's leg. They are very good to eat, and are much used by the pirates that come here. They are of diverse colors, but such as live upon dry ground, as here at Blanco, are commonly yellow. On the northwest end of this island there is a small cove or sandy bay. All around the rest of the island is deep water, and steep close to the island. Here Lowther resorted to, the beginning of October last, unrigged his sloop, sent his guns, sail, rigging, etc. ashore, and put his vessel upon the careen. The Eagle Sloop of Barbados, belonging to the South Sea Company, with thirty-five hands, commanded by Walter Moore, coming near this island in her voyage to Comena on the Spanish continent, saw the said sloop just careened, with her guns out and sails unbent, which she supposed to be a pirate, because it was a place where traders did not commonly use, so took the advantage of attacking her, as she was then unprepared. The eagle, having fired a gun to oblige her to shew her colors, the pirate hoisted the St. George's flag at their topmost mast, as it were to bid defiance to her. But when they found Moore and his crew resolved to board them in good earnest, the pirates cut their cable and hauled their stern on shore, which obliged the eagle to come to anchor athwart their hawse where she engaged them till they called for quarter and struck, at which time Lowther and twelve of the crew made their escape out the cabin window. The master of the eagle got the pirate sloop off, secured her, and went ashore with twenty-five hands in pursuit of Lowther and his gang. But after five days' search they could find but five of them, which they brought aboard, and then proceeded with the sloop and pirates to Camena aforesaid, where they soon arrived. The Spanish governor, being informed of this brave action, condemned the sloop to the captors, and sent a small sloop with twenty-three hands to scour the bushes and other places of the island of Blanco for the pirates that remained there, and took four more with seven small arms, leaving behind them Captain Lowther, three men, and a little boy which they could not take. The above four the Spaniards tried and condemned to slavery for life, three to the galleys and the other to the castle of Araria. The Eagle's sloop brought all their prisoners afterwards to St. Christopher's, where the following were tried by a court of vice-admiralty, there held March the 11th, 1722, viz. John Churchill, Edward MacDonald, Nicholas Lewis, Richard West, Sam Levercott, Robert White, John Shaw, Andrew Hunter, Jonathan Delve, Matthew Freebarn, Henry Watson, Roger Grange, 
Ralph Candor, and Robert Willis. The last three were acquitted, the other thirteen were found guilty, two of which were recommended to mercy by the court, and accordingly pardoned, and the rest executed at that island on the twentieth of the same month. As for Captain Lowther, it is said that he afterwards shot himself upon that fatal island where his piracies ended, being found by some sloop's men dead and a pistol burst by his side. End of chapter 12, part 2 Chapter 13, part 1 of The General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 13, Part 1. Of Captain Edward Lowe and His Crew. Edward Lowe was born in Westminster, and had his education there, such as it was, for he could neither write or read. Nature seemed to have designed him for a pirate from his childhood, for very early he began the trade of plundering, and was wont to raise contributions among all the boys of Westminster. And if any were bold enough to refuse it, a battle was the consequence. But Lowe was so hardy, as well as bold, there was no getting the better of him, so that he robbed the youths of their farthings with impunity. When he grew bigger, he took to gaming in a low way— for it was commonly among the footmen in the lobby of the House of Commons, where he used to play the whole game, as they term it, that is, cheat all he could, and those who pretended to dispute it with him must fight him. The virtues of some of his family were equal to his. One of his brothers was a youth of genius when he was but seven years old. He used to be carried in a basket upon a porter's back into a crowd and snatch hats and wigs. According to the exact chronology of Newgate, he was the first who practiced this ingenious trick. After this, he applied himself to picking of pockets. When he increased in strength, he attempted greater things, such as housebreaking in company. But after he had run a short race, he had the misfortune of ending his days at Tyburn, in company with Stephen Bunce and the celebrated Jack Hall the chimney sweeper. But to return to Ned... When he came to man's estate, at his eldest brother's desire, he went to sea with him, and so continued three or four years, and then parted. And Ned worked in a rigging house in Boston in New England for a while. About six years ago, he took a trip home to England to see his mother, who is yet living. His stay was not long here, but taking leave of his friends and acquaintance for the last time, he should see them, for so he was pleased to say. He returned to Boston and worked a year or two longer at the rigging business, but being too apt to disagree with his masters, he left them and shipped himself in a sloop that was bound to the Bay of Honduras. When the sloop arrived in the bay, Ned Lowe was appointed patron of the boat, which was employed in cutting of logwood, and bringing it aboard to lade the ship, for that is the commodity they make the voyage for. In the boat were twelve men besides Low, who all go armed because of the Spaniards, from whom this logwood is but little better than stole. It happened that the boat one day came aboard just before dinner was ready, and Low desired that they might stay and dine. But the captain, being in a hurry for his lading, ordered them a bottle of rum and to take the other trip, because no time should be lost. This provoked the boat's crew, but particularly Low, who takes up a loaded musket and fires at the captain, but missing him, shot another poor fellow through the head, then put off the boat, and with his twelve companions goes to sea. The next day they took a small vessel and go in her, make a black flag, and declare war against all the world. They then proceeded to the island of the Grand Caymans, intending to have fitted up their small vessel and prepare themselves as well as their circumstances were permit for their honorable employment. But falling in company with George Lowther, another pirate there, who paying his compliments to Low, as great folks do to one another when they meet, and offering himself as an ally, Low accepted of the terms, and so the treaty was presently signed without plenipose or any other formalities. 
We have already given an account of their joint piracies under Lothar as chief commander till the 28th of May, 1722, when they took a brigantine of Boston bound thither from St. Christopher's, at which time they parted, and Edward Lowe went into the brigantine with forty or others, who chose him their captain. They took with them two guns, four swivels, six quarter casks of powder, provisions and some stores, and so left Lothar to prosecute his adventures with the men he had left. Their first adventure in the brigantine was on Sunday, the third day of June, when they took a vessel belonging to Amboy, John Hance, master, whom he rifled of his provisions and let go. The same day he met with a sloop, James Calhoun, master, off of Rhode Island, bound into that port, whom he first plundered and then cut away his bolt sprit and all his rigging, also his sails from the yards, and wounded the master to prevent his getting in to give intelligence, and then stood away to southeastward with all the sail he could make, there being but little wind. Low judged right in making sail from the coast for a longer stay had proved fatal to him, for notwithstanding the disabled condition he had rendered the sloop in, she made shift to get into Block Island at twelve o'clock that night, and immediately dispatched a whaleboat to Rhode Island, which got thither by seven the next morning, with an account of the pirate, his force, and what had happened to him. As soon as the governor had received this information, he ordered a drum to beat up for volunteers, and two of the best sloops then in the harbor, to be fitted out. He gave commissions to one Captain John Headland and Captain John Brown for ten days. The former had eight guns and two swivels, and the latter six guns, well fitted with small arm, and in both sloops, 140 stout fellows. All this was performed with so much expedition that before sunset they were under sail, turning out of the harbor at the same time the pirate was seen from Block Island, which gave great hopes that the sloops would be masters of her the next day, which, however, did not happen, for the sloops returned into harbor some days afterwards without so much as seeing their enemy. After this escape, Captain Lowe went into port upon the coast, for he had not fresh water enough to run to the islands where he stayed a few days getting provisions and what necessaries the crew wanted, and then sailed for purchase, as they call it, steering their course towards Marblehead. About the 12th of July, the brigantine sailed into the harbor of Port Rosemary, and there found thirteen ships and vessels, but none of force at anchor. They spread their black flag and ran in among them, low telling them from the brigantine they should have no quarters if they resisted. In the meantime, they manned and armed their boat and took possession of every one of them, plundered them of what they thought fit and converted one to their own use, the a schooner of eighty tons, aboard of which they put ten carriage guns and fifty men, and Lo himself went captain, and named her the Fancy, making one Charles Harris, who was at first forced into their service out of the Greyhound of Boston by Lothar, of which ship Harris was second mate, captain of the brigantine. Out of these vessels they took several hands and increased the company to eighty men, who all signed the articles, some willing, and a few perhaps by force, and so sailed away from Marblehead. Some time after this they met with two sloops bound for Boston with provisions for the garrison, and the schooner coming up first attacked them, but there happening to be an officer and some soldiers on board who gave them a warm reception, Lo chose to stay till he should be joined by the brigantine. In the meanwhile, the sloops made the best of their way, and the pirates gave them chase two days, and at last lost sight of them in a fog. They now steered for the Leeward Islands, but in their voyage met with such a hurricane of wind that the like had not been known. The sea ran mountains high and seemed to threader them every moment with destruction. It was no time now to look out for plunder, but to save themselves, if possible, from perishing. All hands were continually employed night and day on board the brigantine, and all little enough, for the waves went over her, so that they were forced to keep the pump constantly going, besides bailing with buckets. But finding themselves not able to keep her free, and seeing the utmost danger before their eyes, they turned to the tackle, and hoisted out their provisions and other heavy goods, and threw them overboard, 
with six of their guns, so that by lightening the vessel she might rise to the top of the sea with the waves. They were also going to cut away their mast, but considering how dangerous it would be to be left in such a condition, they resolved to delay it to the last, which was prudence in them to do. For a ship without masts or sails lies like a log upon the water, and if attacked, must fight with disadvantage, the working of her being the most artful part of the engagement, because she may sometimes bring all her great guns on one side to bear on her enemy, when the disabled ship can do little or nothing. But to proceed, by throwing overboard their heavy goods, the vessel made considerable less water, and they could keep it under with the pump only, which gave them hopes and new life, so that instead of cutting all away, they took necessary measures to secure the mast by making preventer shrouds and company, and then wore and lay to upon the other tack till the storm was over. The schooner made somewhat better weather of it of the two, but she was pretty roughly handled, notwithstanding, having split her mainsail, sprung her bolt sprit, and cut her anchors from her bows. The brigantine, by running away to leeward, when she wore upon the larboard tack, had lost sight of the schooner. But not knowing whether she might be safe or not, as soon as the wind abated, she set her mainsail and topsail, and made short trips to windward, and the next day had the good fortune to come in sight of their consort, who upon a signal, which the other knew, bore down to her, and the crew were overjoyed to meet again, after such ill treatment from the winds and seas. After the storm, Lo got safe to a small island, one of the weathermost of the Caribbees, and there fitted their vessels, as well as the place could afford. They got provisions of the natives in exchange for goods of their own, and as soon as the brigantine was ready, "'Twas judged necessary to take a short cruise "'and leave the schooner in the harbor till her return. "'The brigantine sailed out accordingly "'and had not been out many days "'before they met a ship at sea "'that had lost all her mast, "'on board of whom they went "'and took her in money and goods "'to the value of one thousand pounds, "'and so left her in the condition they found her. "'This ship was bound home from Barbados, "'but losing her masts in the late storm was making for Antigua to refit, where afterwards she arrived. The storm just spoken of was found to have done incredible damage in those parts of the world, but however it appeared to have been more violent at Jamaica, both to the island and shipping. There was such a prodigious swell of sea that several hundred tons of stones and rocks were thrown over the wall of the town of Port Royal, and the town itself was overflowed and above half destroyed, there being the next morning five foot water from one end to the other. The cannon of Fort Charles were dismounted and some washed into the sea, and four hundred people lost their lives. A more melancholy sight was scarce ever seen when the water ebbed away, all the streets being covered with ruins of houses, wrecks of vessels, and a great number of dead bodies, for forty sail of ships in the harbor were cast away. The brigantine returned to the island where she had left the schooner, who being ready to sail it was put to the vote of the company what voyage to take next, and herein they followed the advice of the captain, who thought it not advisable to go any farther to leeward because of the men of war who were cruising in their several stations, which they were not at all fond of meeting, and therefore it was agreed to go to the Azores, or Western Islands. The latter end of July, Lowe took a French ship of thirty-four guns and carried her along with him to the Azores. He came into St. Michael's Road the 3rd of August and took seven sail that were lying there, v. the Nostradam, Mer de Den, Captain Roach Commander, the Dove, Captain Cox, the Rose Pink, formerly of Man of War, Captain Thompson, another English ship, Captain Chandler, and three other vessels. He threatened all with present death who resisted, which struck such a terror to them that they yielded themselves up a prey to the villains without firing a gun. The pirates being in great want of water and fresh provisions, Lowe sent to the governor of St. Michael's for a supply, and promised upon that condition to release the ships he had taken, but otherwise to burn them all, which demand the governor thought it not prudent to refuse but sent the provision he required, upon which he released six of the ships, 
after he had plundered of them what he thought fit, and the other, V. the Rose Pink, was made a pirate ship, which Lowe himself took command of. The pirates took several of the guns out of the French ship and mounted them aboard the Rose, which proved very fit for their turn, and condemned the former to the flames. They took all of the crew out of her but the cook, who they said, being a greasy fellow, would fry well in the fire. So the poor man was bound to the mainmast and burnt in the ship, to the no small diversion of Lowe and his myrmidons. Lowe ordered the schooner to lie in the fair between St. Michael's and St. Mary's, where, about the 20th of August, Captain Carter, in the right galley, had the ill fortune to come in her way. And because at first they showed inclination to defend themselves and what they had, the pirates cut and mangled them in a barbarous manner, particularly some Portuguese passengers, two of which, being friars, they triced up at each arm of the foreyard, but let them down again before they were quite dead, and this they repeated several times out of sport. Another Portuguese, who was also Captain Carter's passenger, putting on a sorrowful countenance at what he saw acted, one of this vile crew attacked him upon the deck, saying he did not like his looks, and thereupon gave him a blow across his belly with his cutlash that cut out his bowels, and he fell down dead without speaking a word. At the same time, another of these rogues, cutting out a prisoner, missed his mark, and Captain Lowe, standing in the way, very opportunely received the stroke upon his under jaw, which laid the teeth bare. Upon this, the surgeon was called, who immediately stitched up the wound. But Lowe, finding fault with the operation, the surgeon being tolerably drunk, as it was customary for everybody to be, struck Lowe such a blow with his fist that broke out all the stitches, and then bid him sew up his chops himself and be damned, so that Lowe made a very pitiful figure for some time after. When they had plundered Captain Carter's ship, several of them were for burning her, as they had done the French man, but it was otherwise resolved at last, for after they had cut her cables, rigging, and sails to pieces, they left her to the mercy of the sea. After these depredations, they steered for the islands of Madeira, where missing other booty they took up with a fishing boat and t with two old men and a boy in her, one of which they detained on board, and s but sent the other ashore with a flag of truce, demanding a boat of water of the governor, on pain of taking away the old man's life, whom they threatened to hang at the yardarm, upon their refusal. But the thing being complied with, the old man was honorably, as the pirates say, discharged, and all three much handsomer clothed than when they took them. From this island they sailed to the Canaries, but meeting with no prey there, they continued their course for the Cape de Verde Islands, and at Bonavista took a ship called the Liverpool Merchant, Captain Golding, from whom they stole a great quantity of provisions and dry goods, three hundred gallons of brandy, two guns and carriages, a mast, yard, and housers, besides six of his men and then would not let them trade there, nor at St. Nicholas, but obliged Captain Golding to go with his ship to the Isle of May. The pirate also took among these islands a ship belonging to Liverpool, Scott commander, two Portuguese sloops bound for Brazil, a small English sloop trading there, James P.'s master, bound to Santa Cruz, and three sloops from St. Thomas bound to Curaçao, the master's names were Lily, Staples, and Simpkins, all which they plundered and then let go about their business, except for one sloop which they fitted up for the following purpose. Lowe had heard by one of the above-mentioned ships that two small galleys were expected every day at the Western Islands, v. the Greyhound, Captain Glass, and the Joliffe, Captain Aram, the former of which was designed to be fitted for the piratical trade to Brazil, if things happened to their minds. They manned the sloop and sent her in quest of one or both of these ships to the western islands aforesaid, while they careened their ship rose at one of the Cape de Verdes. But now fortune that had hitherto been so propitious to them left her minions and baffled for the present all their hopes, for the sloop missing of their prey was reduced to great necessities for want of provisions and water, so they ventured to go ashore at St. Michael's for a supply and pass for a trader. 
but they played their part so awkwardly that they were suspected by the governor to be what they really were, and he soon was put out of doubt by a visit some Portuguese made them, who happened unluckily to be the passengers in Captain Carter's ship when Lowe took her and knew the gentlemen's faces very well upon which the whole crew was conducted into the castle, where they were provided for as long as they lived. Lowe, in the meantime, did not fare quite so ill, but had his intended voyage to Brazil spoiled by the oversettling of his ship when she was upon the careen, whereby she was lost, so that he was reduced to his old schooner, which he called the Fancy, aboard of which they all went to the number of one hundred, as vile rogues as ever ended their lives at Tyburn. They proceeded now to the West Indies, but before they had gotten far on their voyage, they attacked a rich Portuguese ship called the Nostra Signora de Victoria, bound home from Baia, and after some resistance took her. Lo tortured several of the men to make them declare where the money, which he supposed they had on board, lay, and extorted by that means a confession that the captain had, during the chase, hung out of the cabin window a bag with eleven thousand more doors which as soon as he was taken, he cut the rope off and let drop into the sea. Lo, upon hearing what a prize had escaped him, raved like a fury, swore a thousand oaths, and ordered the captain's lips to be cut off, which he broiled before his face, and afterwards murthered him and all the crew, being thirty-two persons. After this bloody action, they continued their course till they came to the northward of all the islands, and there they cruised for about a month, in which time they made prizes of the following vessels, v. a snow from New York to Curaçao, Robert Leonard Master, a sloop from the bay, bound to New York, Craig Master, a snow from London and Jamaica, bound to New York, and a Stanhope Pink, Andrew Delbridge Master, from Jamaica to Boston which last they burnt because of Lowe's irreconcilable aversion to New England men. End of chapter 13, part 1. Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas, April 2010. Chapter 13, part 2 of A General History of the Pirates, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 13, Part 2 of A General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. After this cruise, they went into one of the islands and cleaned, and then steered for the Bay of Honduras, where they arrived about the middle of March 1722-3 and met a sloop turning out of the said bay. The pirates had hoisted up Spanish colors and continued them till they drew near the sloop. Then they hauled them down, hoisted their black flag, fired a broadside, and boarded her. The sloop was a Spaniard of six guns and seventy men that came into the bay that morning, and meeting there with five English sloops and a pink made prizes of them all plundered them, and brought the masters of the vessels away, prisoners, for the ransom of the logwood. Their names were Tuthill, Norton, Newbury, Sprayfort, Clark, and Parrot. The Spaniards made no resistance, so that the English pirates soon became their masters, and fell to rifling. But finding the above-mentioned people in the hold, and several English goods, they consulted Low the captain thereupon, and without examining any further, the resolution passed to kill all the company, and the pirates, without any ceremony, fell pell-mell to execution with their swords, cutlashes, pole-axles, and pistols, cutting, slashing, and shooting the poor Spaniards at a sad rate. Some of the miserable creatures jumped down into the hold, but could not avoid the massacre. They met death everywhere, for if they escaped it from one hand, they were sure to perish by another. The only prospect they had of life was to fly from the rage of those merciless men, and to trust the more merciful sea. And accordingly a great many leaped overboard and swam for the shore. But lo, perceiving it, ordered the canoa to be manned and sent in pursuit of them, by which means several of the poor unhappy men were knocked in the head in the water, as they were endeavoring to get to land. 
However, about twelve of them did reach the shore, but in a miserable condition, being very much wounded, and what became of them afterwards was not known, except one, who, while the pirates were at their sports and pastimes ashore, finding himself very weak and fainting with his wounds, and not knowing where to go for help and relief, in this extremity he came back to them and begged, for God's sakes, in the most earnest manner possible, that they would give him quarters. Upon which one of the villains took hold of him and said, God damn him, he would give him good quarters presently, and made the poor Spaniard kneel down on his knees, then taking his fusil, put the muzzle of it in his mouth, and fired down his throat. "'Twas thought the rest did not survive their miserable condition, "'and could only prolong their lives to add to the misery of them. "'When the murdering work was over, "'they rummaged the Spanish pirate "'and brought all the booty aboard their own vessels. "'The six masters aforementioned, found in the hold, "'they restored to their respective vessels. "'They forced away the carpenter from the pink "'and then set fire to the Spanish sloop and burnt her.' which last scene concluded the destruction of their enemy, ship, and crew. Lowe set the masters of the vessels free, but would not suffer them to steer for Jamaica, where they were then bound, for fear the men of war should get intelligence of them, but forced them all to go to New York, threatening them with death when they met them again, if they refused to comply with their demands. In the next cruise, which was between the Leeward Islands and the Maine, they took two snows, bound from Jamaica to Liverpool, and a snow from Jamaica to London, Brid's master, as also a ship from Bidford to Jamaica, John Pinkham commander, and two sloops from Jamaica to Virginia. On the 27th of May, Lowe and his consort Harris came off South Carolina and met with three good ships, V, the Crown, Captain Lovrain, the King William, the Carteret, and a Brigantine who all came out of Carolina together two days before. The pirates were at the trouble of chasing them, and Captain Lovrain being the sternmost, she fell a prey into their hands, and they spent all the day in coming up with the rest. Within a few days they took a ship called the Amsterdam, merchant Captain Willard, from Jamaica but belonging to New England, as Low let none of that country depart without some marks of his rage, he cut off this gentleman's ears, slit up his nose, and cut him in several places of his body, and, after plundering his ship, let him pursue his voyage. After this he took a sloop bound to Amboy, William Fraser, master, with whom Mr. Low happening to be displeased, he ordered lighted matches to be tied between the men's fingers, which burnt all the flesh off the bones. He then cut them in several parts of their bodies with knives and cutlashes, afterwards took all their provisions away, and set some of them ashore in an uninhabited part of the country. The Kingston, Captain Estwick, another ship, one Burrington master, two brigantines from Carolina to London, a sloop from Virginia to Bermudas, a ship from Glasgow to Virginia, a schooner from New York to South Carolina, a pink from Virginia to Dartmouth, and a sloop from Philadelphia to Suriname fell a prey to these villains upon this cruise, besides those above mentioned. It happened that at this time one of His Majesty's ships was upon a cruise on this station and got intelligence of some of the mischievous actions of this miscreant by one of the vessels that had been plundered by him, who, steering as directed, came in sight of the pirates by break of day on the 10th of June of all days in the year. The rovers looking out for prey soon saw and gave chase to the man-of-war, which was called the Greyhound, a ship of twenty guns and a hundred and twenty men, rather inferior in force to the two pirate vessels. The Greyhound finding them so eager was in no doubt what they should be, and therefore tacked and stood from them, giving the pirates an opportunity to chase her for two hours, till all things were in readiness for an engagement, and the pirates about gun shot off. Then the greyhound tacked again and stood towards the two sloops, one of them called the Fancy, commanded by Lowe himself, and the other the Ranger, commanded by Harris, both which hoisted their piratical colors and fired each a gun. When the greyhound came within musket shot, she hauled up her mainsail and clapped close upon a wind to keep the pirates from running to leeward, and then engaged. 
but when the rogues found who they had to deal with, they edged away under the man-of-war's stern, and the greyhound, standing after them, they made a running fight for about two hours. But little wind happening, the sloops gained from her, by the help of their oars, upon which the greyhound let off firing and turned all hands to her own oars, and at three in the afternoon came up with them. The pirates hauled upon a wind to receive the man-of-war, and the fight was immediately renewed, with a brisk fire on both sides till the ranger's main-yard was shot down, and the greyhound, pressing close upon the disabled sloop, lo, in the other, thought fit to bear away and leave his consort a sacrifice to his enemy, who, seeing the cowardice and treachery of his commodore and leader having ten or twelve men killed and wounded, and that there was no possibility of escaping— called out for quarters, and surrendered themselves to justice, which proved severe enough to them a while afterwards. The conduct of Lowe was surprising in this adventure, because his reputed courage and boldness had, hitherto, so possessed the minds of all people that he became a terror, even to his own men. But his behavior throughout this whole action showed him to be a base, cowardly villain, for had Lowe's sloop fought half so briskly as Harris's had done— as they were under a solemn oath to do, the man-of-war, in my opinion, could never have herded them. The Greyhound carried in their prize to Rhode Island to the great joy of the whole province, though it had been more complete if the great Lowe himself had graced the triumph. The prisoners were strongly secured in a gale till a court of vice-admiralty could be held for their trials, which begun on the 10th of July, at Newport, and continued three days. The court was made up of the following gentlemen. William Dummer, Esquire, Lieutenant Governor of the Massachusetts, President. Nathaniel Payne, Esquire. Addington Davenport, Esquire. Thomas Fitch, Esquire. Spencer Phipps, Esquire. John Lechmere, Esquire, Surveyor General. John Valentine, Esquire, Advocate General. Samuel Cranston, Governor of Rhode Island. John Menzies, Esquire, Judge of the Admiralty. Richard Ward, Esquire, Register. Mr. Jaleel Brinton, Provost Marshal. Robert Akmuda, Esquire, was assigned by the court counsel for the prisoners here under mentioned. Prisoners' names, ages, place of birth. Charles Harris, Captain, 25, London. William Blads, 28, Rhode Island. Daniel Hyde, 23, Virginia. Thomas Powell, Jr., 21, Connecticut, New England. Stephen Munden, 20, London. Thomas Huggett, 30, London. William Reed, 35, Londonderry, Ireland. Peter Neves, 32, Exeter, in Devon. James Brinkley, 28, Suffolk, in England. Joseph Sound, 28, City of Westminster. William Shutfield, 40, Lancaster in England. Edward Eaton, 38, Wrexham in Wales. John Brown, 29, County of Durham. Edward Lawson, 20, Isle of Man. Owen Rice, 27, South Wales. John Tompkins, 23, Gloucestershire. John Fitzgerald, 21, Limerick in Ireland. Abraham Lacey, 21, Devonshire. Thomas Linnister, 21, Lancashire. Francis Layton, 39, New York. John Waters, Quartermaster, 35, County of Devon. William Jones, 28, London. Charles Church, 21, St. Margaret's, Westminster. Thomas Hazel, 50. John Bright, 25. These 25 were found guilty and executed the 19th of July, 1723, near Newport in Rhode Island. John Brown, 17, Liverpool. Patrick Cunningham, 25. These two were found guilty but respited for one year's and recommended to the king's favor. John Wilson, 23, New London County. Henry Barnes, 22, Barbados. Thomas Jones, 17, Fleur in Wales. Joseph Switzer, 24, Boston in New England. Thomas Mumper, Indian, Mathers Vineyard, New England. John Hinscher, Doctor, 22, near Edinburgh, Scotland. John Fletcher, 17. 
Thomas Child, 15. These eight were found not guilty. The destroying this pirate was looked upon by the province to be of such signal service to the public and particular advantage to the colony of New York that it was thought necessary to make some handsome acknowledgment to Captain Peter Solgard for it, and therefore it was resolved in an assembly of the Common Council to compliment him with the freedom of their corporation. The resolution, together with the preamble of the captain's freedom, being curious in their kind, I subjoin them for the satisfaction of the reader. Resolution of the Mayor and Common Council of the City of New York at a Common Council held at the City Hall of said city on Thursday, the 25th of July, Anno Domini, 1723. Present, Robert Walter, Esquire, Mayor, City of New York. This court having taken into their consideration the great service lately done to this province in particular, as well to all his other majesty's good subjects in general, by Captain Peter Solgard, commander of his majesty's ship, the Greyhound, the station ship of the province, who lately in a cruise upon this coast, in due execution and discharge of his duty, upon intelligence given him, sought for, pursued, and engaged two pirate sloops, commanded by one Lowe, a notorious and inhumane pirate, one of which sloops he took after a resolute resistance, and very much shattered the other, who, by the favor of night, escaped. Twenty-six of which pirates, so taken, being lately executed at Rhode Island, not only eased the city and province of a very great trouble, but of a very considerable expense, etc., it is therefore resolved, ni mine contradicente, that this corporation do present the said Captain Solgard with the freedom of this corporation as a mark of the great esteem they have for his person as well as for the aforesaid great and good services, and that the seal of the said freedom be enclosed in a gold box that Mr. Recorder and Mr. Bickley do draw the draft of the said freedom, signifying therein the grateful sense of this corporation for so signal a service to the public and benefit and advantage of mankind, that Alderman Kipp and Alderman Kruger do prepare the said box, that the arms of the corporation be engraved on one side thereof, and a representation of the engagement on the other, with this motto, v. Quisitos Humani Generos Hostes del Bar Superbum, 10 Juni, 1723. That the town clerk caused the same freedom to be handsomely engrossed on parchment, and that the whole corporation do wait upon him to present the same. By order of the Common Council, William Sharpus, clerk. The Preamble of Captain Peter Solgard's Copy of His Freedom, Robert Walter, Esquire Mayor, and the Alderman of the City of New York. City of New York. To all whom these persons shall come, send greeting. Whereas, Captain Peter Solgard, commander of His Majesty's ship the Greyhound, the present station ship of this province, in his cruise, having intelligence of two pirate sloops of considerable force in consort ship, under the command of one low, a notorious pirate, that had for upward of two years committed many depredations, murders, and barbarities upon many of His Majesty's subjects and allies, lately come upon this coast, hath, with great diligence and utmost application, pursued, overtaken, and after a stubborn resistance, vanquished and overcome both of them, taking one and driving the other from our coast, which action, as it is glorious in itself, so it is glorious in the public benefits and advantages that slow from it, to wit, the safety and freedom of our own trade and commerce, and of all the neighboring provinces on this continent. Such signal service done against the enemies of mankind merits the applause of all good men, but more immediately from those of this province who are appointed his particular care and charge. We, therefore, the mayor, aldermen, and commonality of the city of New York assembled in common council to express our grateful sense and acknowledgment to the said Captain Peter Solgard for so noble and faithful a discharge of his duty, and as a particular mark of the great esteem and just regard we bear to his kind acceptance of the freedom of the corporation of the city of New York, and that he will please to become a fellow citizen with us. These are therefore to certify and declare 
the said Captain Peter Solgard is hereby admitted, received, and allowed a freeman and citizen of the said city of New York to have, hold, enjoy, and partake of all and singular advantages, benefits, liberties, privileges, franchises, freedoms, and immunities whatsoever granted or belonging to the same city. In testimony thereof, the said mayor hath hereunto subscribed his name, and caused the seal of the said city to be affixed the twenty-fifth day of July, in the ninth year of the reign of our sovereign lord, George, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, etc. Anno Domini, 1723. William Sharpest Clerk, R. Walter Mayer. This narrow escape of Lowe and his companions, one would have thought might have brought them to a little consideration of their black and horrid crimes, and to look upon this interval as an opportunity put into their hands by Providence to reconcile themselves to God by a hearty and sincere repentance. But alas, they were dead to all goodness, and had not so much as one spark of virtue to stir them up to be thankful for such an eminent deliverance. But instead thereof vented a million of oaths and curses upon the captain of the Greyhound, vowing to execute vengeance upon all they should meet with afterwards for the indignity he put upon them. The first prey that they met with after their flight was a small sloop belonging to Nantucket, a whale fishing, about eighty miles from land, the master of which, one Nathan Skiff, a brisk young fellow, the pirates cruelly whipped naked about the deck, making his torture their sport, after which they cut off his ears, and last of all shot him through the head, and then sunk his vessel, putting the rest of the hands into their whale-boat, with a compass, a little water, and a few biscuits, and it being good weather, they providentially got safe to Nantucket beyond all expectation. There was another whale-boat belonging to this sloop, last mentioned, which happened to be at some distance from her, and perceiving what was doing, rowed with all speed to another sloop not far off, to acquaint her with the misfortune, that the men might take care of themselves, and she happily got away in time. Some days after, Lowe took a fishing boat off of Block Island, but did not perpetrate so much cruelty to her, contenting himself with only cutting off the master's head. But after taking two whale-boats near Rhode Island, he caused one of the master's bodies to be ripped up and his entrails to be taken out, and cut off the ears of the other, and made him eat them with pepper and salt, which hard injunction he complied with, without making a word. Several other persons he would have murthered, but humanity prevailing in the tender hearts of his companions, they refused to put his savage orders in execution. From the coast of New England, Low sailed directly for Newfoundland, and, near Cape Britain, took two or three and twenty French vessels, and one of them of twenty-two guns he manned with pirates, making a sort of man-of-war of her, with which he scoured the harbors and banks of Newfoundland, and they took sixteen or eighteen other ships and vessels, all which they plundered and some destroyed. Thus these inhumane wretches went on, who could not be contented to satisfy their avarice only, and travel in the common road of wickedness? But, like their patron, the devil, must make mischief their sport, cruelty their delight, and damning of souls their constant employment. Of all the piratical crews that were ever heard of, none of the English name came up to this in barbarity. Their mirth and their anger had much the same effect, for both were usually gratified with the cries and groans of their prisoners, so that they almost as often murthered a man from the excess of good humor as out of passion and resentment, and the unfortunate could never be assured of safety from them, for danger lurked in their very smiles. An instance of this had likened to have happened to one Captain Graves, master of a Virginia ship last taken. For as soon as he came aboard of the pirate, Lowe takes a bowl of punch in his hand and drinks to him, saying, Captain Graves, here's half this to you. But the poor gentleman, being too sensibly touched at the misfortune of falling into his hands, modestly desired to be excused, for that he could not drink. Whereupon Lowe draws out a pistol, cocks it, and with the bowl in the other hand, told him he should either take one or the other. So Graves, without hesitation, made choice of the vehicle that contained the punch, and guttled down about a quart, when he had the least inclination that he had ever in his life to be merry. 
The latter end of July, 1723, Lowe took a large ship, called the Merry Christmas, and fitted her for a pirate, cut several ports in her, and mounted her with 34 guns. Lowe goes aboard of this ship, assumes the title of Admiral, and hoists a black flag, with the figure of death in red, at the main topmast head, and takes another voyage to the Western Islands, where he arrived the beginning of September. The first vessel he met with there was a brigantine, formerly an English sloop, commanded by Elias Wilde, but lately bought by a Portuguese nobleman and altered. She was manned partly with English and partly Portuguese. The latter low caused to be hanged by a way of reprisal for some of his own men sent thither in a sloop from the Cape de Verde Islands, as has been mentioned. The English men he thrust into their own boat to shift for themselves and set fire to the vessel. At St. Michael's, they sent in their boats and cut out of the road. A new London-built ship of 14 guns, commanded by Captain Thompson, who was taken there the year before by Lowe in the Rose Pink. The boats had fewer men than the ship, and Captain Thompson would have defended himself, but his men, through cowardice or too great an inclination of becoming pirates themselves, refused to stand by him, and he was obliged to surrender and when he came aboard the pirate, had his ears cut off close to his head, for only proposing to resist Admiral Lowe's black flag. They gave him one of his own boats, and burnt his ship. The next was a Portuguese bark that fell into their hands, whose men came off somewhat better than usual, for they only cut them with their cut lashes out of wantonness, and turned them all into their boat, and set their vessel on fire. When the boat was going from the side of the ship, one of Lowe's men, who, we may suppose, was forced into his gang, was drinking with a silvered tankard at one of the ports, and took his opportunity to drop into the boat among the Portuguese, and lie down in the bottom, in order to escape along with them. After he had stowed himself in the boat so as not to be seen, it came into his head that the tankard might prove of some use to him where he was going, so he got up again, laid hold of the utensil, and went off, without being discovered in which attempt, had he failed, no doubt his life, if not the lives of all the people in the boat, would have paid for it. The name of this man is Richard Haynes. Lowe took his old tour to the Canaries, Cape de Verde Islands, and so to the coast of Guinea, but nothing extraordinary happened till they arrived near Sierra Leone in Africa, where they met with a ship called the Delight, Captain Hunt Commander. This ship they thought fit for their own purpose, for she had been a small man-of-war and carried twelve guns. However, they mounted sixteen on board her, manned her with sixty men, and appointed one Spriggs, who was then their quartermaster, to be captain of her, who, two days after, separated from the Admiral, and went to the West Indies a-pirating, upon his own and particular company's account, where, for the present, we shall leave him. In January last, Lowe took a ship called the Squirrel, Captain Stevenson, but what became of him afterwards I can't tell. We have had no news concerning him come to England, since this I have now mentioned. But I have heard that he talked of going to Brazil, and if so, it is likely we may too soon hear of some exploit or other." though the best information we could receive would be that he and all his crew were at the bottom of the sea. End of chapter 13, part 2. Recording by Kathleen Nelson, Austin, Texas, May 2010. Chapter 14 of The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. The General History of the Pirates, Volume 1, by Charles Johnson. Chapter 14 of Captain John Evans and His Crew. John Evans was a Welshman, had been formerly master of a sloop belonging to Nevis, but losing his employ there, he sailed for some time out of Jamaica as mate till happening in company of three or four of his comrades and wages not being so good as formerly and berths scarce because of the great number of seamen they agreed to go abroad in search of adventures they sailed or rather rowed out of port royal in jamaica the latter end of september seventeen twenty two in a canoe and coming on the north side of the island went ashore in the night 
broke open a house or two, and robbed them of some money, and everything else they could find that was portable, and brought the booty on board the canoe. This was very well for the first time, but this kind of robbery did not please so well. They wanted to get out to sea, but having no vessel but their canoe, they were prevented in their laudable design. However, they kept a good lookout, and traversed the island, in expectation that Providence would send some unfortunate vessel as a sacrifice, and in a few days their wishes were accomplished, for at Dunn's Hall they found a small sloop at an anchor belonging to Bermudas. They made bold and went aboard, and Evans informed the folks that belonged to her that he was captain of the vessel, which was a piece of news they knew not before. After they had put their affairs in a proper disposition aboard, they went ashore to a little village for refreshments, and lived jovially the remaining part of the day, at a tavern, spending three pistols, and then departed. The people of the house admired at the merry guests they had got, were mightily pleased, and wished for their company at another time, which happened too soon for their profit, for, in the middle of the night, they came ashore all hands, rifled the house, and carried what they could aboard their sloop. The next day they weighed in the sloop, aboard of which they mounted four guns, called her the Scourer, and sailed to Hispaniola, on the north part of which island they took a Spanish sloop, which proved an extraordinary rich prize, as it fell among so few persons as this company consisted of, for they shared upwards of a hundred and fifty pounds a man. In pursuance of the game, and beating up for the Windward Islands, the Scourer met with a ship from New England, bound to Jamaica, one hundred and twenty tons, called the Dove, Captain Diamond Master, off Puerto Rico. They plundered her, and strengthened their own company, by taking out the mate and two or three other men. They discharged the prize, and run into one of the islands for fresh water and necessaries, and stayed there some time. The next prize they made was the Lucretia and Catherine, Captain Mills, of two hundred ton burthen. They came up with her near the island Deseda, January 11th. Upon seizing of this ship, the pirates began to take upon themselves the distribution of justice, examining the men concerning their master's usage of them, according to the custom of other pirates. But the captain, overhearing the matter, put an end to the judicial proceedings, and fell to rummaging the ship, saying to them, "'What have we to do to turn reformers? Tis money we want.' And speaking to the prisoners, he asked them, "'Does your captain give you victuals enough?' And they answering in the affirmative, "'Why, then,' said he, "'he ought to give you work enough.' After the taking of this prize, they went to the little island of Avis, with a design to clean, and carried the Lucretia along with them, in order to heave down the scourer by her. But, meeting there with the sloop, the pirate gave chase till the evening, when she was within gunshot of her, but, fearing to lose company with the Lucretia, who was a heavy sailor, they left off and saw her no more. This chase brought them to leeward of their port, so that they were obliged to look out for another place of retreat, and the island of Ruby not being far distant, they steered for that, and anchored there accordingly. But the next day a Dutch sloop, coming as it were, into their mouths, they could not forbear dealing, and so making her their prize, they plundered her of what came, when shared, to fifty pounds a man. They found this sloop more for their purpose than the Lucretia, to clean their own sloop by, as being much lower in the wast, and therefore capable of heaving her bottom farther out of the water, so she was discharged, and the Dutchman kept in her room. But, not thinking it convenient to lay up here, for fear a discovery should be made, they turned their thoughts another way, and steered to the coast of Jamaica, where they took a sugar drover, and then run to the Grand Caymans, about thirty leagues to leeward of Jamaica, with intention to clean there. But an unhappy accident put an end to their piracies, which hitherto had proved very successful to them. The boatswain of the pirate being a noisy, surly fellow, the captain had at several times words with him, relating to his behaviour, who, thinking himself ill-treated, not only returned ill-language, but also challenged the captain to fight him on the next shore they came to, with pistols and sword, as is the custom among these outlaws. When the sloop arrived, as above mentioned, the captain proposed the duel, but the cowardly boatswain refused to fight or go ashore, though it was his own challenge. When Captain Evans saw there was nothing to be done with him, he took his cane and gave him a hearty drubbing, but the boatswain, not being able to bear such an indignity, drew out a pistol and shot Evans through the head, so that he fell down dead. 
and the boatswain immediately jumped overboard and swam towards the shore, but the boat was quickly manned and sent after him, which took him up and brought him aboard. The death of the captain in that manner provoked all the crew, and they resolved the criminal should die by the most exquisite tortures. But, while they were considering of the punishment, the gunner, transported with passion, discharged a pistol and shot him through the body, but, not killing him outright, the delinquent, in very moving words, desired a week for repentance only. But, another stepping up to him, told him that he should repent and be damned to him, and without more ado, shot him dead. I should have observed that, when the Lucretia and Catherine were suffered to go away, the pirates detained their mate, who was now the only man aboard who understood navigation, and him they desired to take upon him the command of the sloop in the room of Captain Evans deceased. But he desired to be excused that honour, and at length positively refused it, so they agreed to break up the company and leave the mate in possession of the vessel. Accordingly, they went ashore at the Caymans, carrying with them about nine thousand pounds among thirty persons, and, it being fair weather, the mate and a boy brought the vessel into Port Royal in Jamaica. End of chapter 14 Recording by Kate McKenzie